War and Peace, Book Ten, Chapter Thirty Five, read for LibriVox.org, by Philippa Brody. On the rug-covered bench where Pierre had seen him in the morning sat Kutuzov, his grey head hanging, his heavy body relaxed. He gave no orders, but only assented to or dissented from what others suggested. Yes, yes, do that," he replied to various proposals. "Yes, yes, go, dear boy, and have a look," he would say to one or other of those about him. Or, "No, don't. We'd better wait." He listened to the reports that were brought him and gave directions when his subordinates demanded that of him. But when listening to the reports, it seemed as if he were not interested in the import of the words spoken, but rather in something else. In the expression of face and tone of voice of those who were reporting, by long years of military experience, he knew, and with the wisdom of age, understood, that it is impossible for one man to direct hundreds of thousands of others struggling with death, and he knew that the result of a battle is decided not by the orders of a commander in chief, nor the place where the troops are stationed, nor by the number of cannon or of slaughtered men, but by that intangible force called the spirit of the army, and he watched this force and guided it. In as far as that was in his power, Kutuzov's general expression was one of concentrated, quiet attention, and his face wore a strained look, as if he found it difficult to master the fatigue of his old and feeble body. At eleven o'clock, they brought him news that the flèches captured by the French had been retaken, but that Prince Bagration was wounded. Kutuzov groaned and swayed his head. "Ride over to the Prince Peter Ivanovitch and find out about it exactly," he said to one of his adjutants. And then turned to the Duke of Wurtemberg, who was standing behind him. Will your Highness please take command of the first army? Soon after the Duke's departure, before he could possibly have reached Semenovsk, his adjutant came back from him and told Kutuzov that the Duke asked for more troops. Kutuzov made a grimace and sent an order to Dokhtarov to take over the command of the first army, and a request to the Duke, whom he said he could not spare at such an important moment, to return to him. When they brought him the news that Murat had been taken prisoner, and the staff officers congratulated him, Kutuzov smiled. "Wait a little, gentlemen," said he. "The battle is won, and there is nothing extraordinary in the capture of Murat. Still, it is better to wait before we rejoice." But he sent an adjutant to take the news round the army. When Sherbinin came galloping from the left flank with news that the French had captured the flèches and the village of Semenovsk. Kutuzov, guessing by the sounds of the battle and by Sherbinin's looks that the news was bad, rose as if to stretch his legs and, taking Sherbinin's arm, led him aside. "Go, my dear fellow," he said to Emelov, "and see whether something can't be done." Kutuzov was in Gorki, near the center of the Russian position. The attack directed by Napoleon against our left flank had been several times repulsed. In the center, the French had not got beyond Borodino, and on their left flank, Uvarov's cavalry had put the French to flight. Towards three o'clock, the French attack ceased. On the faces of all who came from the field of battle and of those who stood around him, Kutuzov noticed an expression of extreme tension. He was satisfied with the day's success, a success exceeding his expectations, but the old man's strength was failing him. Several times his head dropped low as if it were falling, and he dozed off. Dinner was brought him. Adjutant General Volzogen, the man who, when riding past Prince Andrew, had said. The war should be extended widely, and whom Bagration so detested, rode up while Kutuzov was at dinner. Vorzigen had come from Barclay de Tolly to report on the progress of affairs on the left flank. The sagacious Barclay de Tolly, seeing crowds of wounded men running back and the disordered rear of the army, weighed all the circumstances, concluded that the battle was lost, and sent his favorite officer to the commander in chief with that news. Kutuzov was chewing a piece of roast chicken with difficulty, and glanced at Volzogen with eyes that brightened under their puckering lids. Volzogen, nonchalantly stretching his legs, approached Kutuzov with a half-contemptuous smile on his lips, scarcely touching the peak of his cap. He treated his serene highness with a somewhat affected nonchalance, intended to show that, as a highly trained military man, he left it to Russians to make an idol of this useless old man, but that he knew whom he was dealing with. Der alte Herr, as in their own set the Germans called Kutuzov, is making himself very comfortable," thought Volzogen, and looking severely at the dishes in front of Kutuzov, he began to report to the old gentleman the position of affairs on the left flank as Barclay had ordered him to, and as he himself had seen and understood it. 
all the points of our position are in the enemy's hands, and we cannot dislodge them for lack of troops. The men are running away, and it is impossible to stop them, he reported. Kutuzov ceased chewing and fixed an astonished gaze on Volzogen, as if not understanding what was said to him. Volzogen, noticing the old gentleman's agitation, said with a smile, I have not considered it right to conceal from your serene highness what I have seen. The troops are in complete disorder. You have seen? You have seen? Kutuzov shouted, frowning, and rising quickly he went up to Volzogen. How? How dare you? he shouted, choking and making a threatening gesture with his trembling arms. How dare you, sir, say that to me? You know nothing about it. Tell General Barclay from me that his information is incorrect, and that the real course of the battle is better known to me, the commander-in-chief, than to him. Volzogen was about to make a rejoinder, but Kutuzov interrupted him. The enemy has been repulsed on the left and defeated on the right flank. If you have seen amiss, sir, do not allow yourself to say what you don't know. Be so good as to ride to General Barclay and inform him of my firm intention to attack the enemy tomorrow," said Kutuzov sternly. All was silent, and the only sound audible was the heavy breathing of the panting old general. They are repulsed everywhere, for which I thank God and our brave army. The enemy is beaten, and tomorrow we shall drive him from the sacred soil of Russia said Kutuzov, crossing himself, and he suddenly sobbed as his eyes filled with tears. Volzogen, shrugging his shoulders and curling his lips, stepped silently aside, marvelling at the old gentleman's conceited stupidity. "'Ah, here he is, my hero,' said Kutuzov to a portly, handsome, dark-haired general, who was just descending the knoll. This was Revsky, who had spent the whole day at the most important part of the field of Borodino. Revsky reported that the troops were firmly holding their ground, and that the French no longer ventured to attack. After hearing him, Kutuzov said in French, "'Then you do not think, like some others, that we must retreat?' "'On the contrary, Your Highness, in indecisive actions, it is always the most stubborn who remain victors,' replied Revsky, and in my opinion. "'Kaiserov,' Kutuzov called to his adjutant, "'sit down and write out the order of the day for tomorrow. "'And you,' he continued, addressing another, ride along the line, and that tomorrow we attack. While Kutuzov was talking to Revsky and dictating the order of the day, Volzogen returned from Barclay and said that General v Barclay wished to have written confirmation of the order the field marshal had given. Kutuzov, without looking at Volzogen, gave directions for the order to be written out which the former commander-in-chief, to avoid personal responsibility, very judiciously wished to receive and by means of that mysterious, indefinable bond which maintains throughout an army one and the same temper, known as the spirit of the army, and which constitutes the sinew of war. Kutuzov's words, his order for a battle the next day, immediately became known from one end of the army to the other. It was far from being the same words or the same order that reached the farthest links of the chain. The tales passing from mouth to mouth at different ends of the army did not even resemble what Kutuzov had said. But the sense of his words spread everywhere, because what he was said was not the outcome of cunning calculations, but of a feeling that lay in the commander-in-chief's soul, as in that of every Russian. And on learning that tomorrow they were to attack the enemy, and hearing from the highest quarters a confirmation of what they wanted to believe, the exhausted, wavering men felt comforted and inspirited. End of chapter 35 Recording by Philippa Brody laspecola.blogspot.com War and Peace Book 10 Chapter 36 Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick Prince Andrew's regiment was among the reserves which, till after one o'clock, were stationed inactive behind Semonovsk under heavy artillery fire. Toward two o'clock, the regiment, having already lost more than two hundred men, was moved forward 
intertrampled oatfield in the gap between Semenovsk and the Knoll battery where thousands of men perished that day and on which an intense concentrated fire from several hundred enemy guns was directed between one and two o'clock. Without moving from that spot or firing a single shot, the regiment here lost another third of its men. From in front, and especially from the right, in the unlifting smoke, the guns boomed, and out of the mysterious domain of smoke that overlay the whole space in front, quick hissing cannon walls and slow whistling shells flew unceasingly. At times, as if to allow them a respite, a quarter of an hour passed, during which the cannonballs and shells all flew overhead. But sometimes several men were torn from the regiment in a minute, and the slain were continually being dragged away and the wounded carried off. With each fresh blow, less and less chance of life remained for those not yet killed. The regiment stood in columns of battalion, three hundred paces apart, but nevertheless the men were always in one and the same mood. All alike were taciturn and morose. Talk was rarely heard in the ranks, and it ceased altogether every time the thud of a successful shot and the cry of stretchers was heard. Most of the time, by their officer's order, the men sat on the ground. One having taken off his shako, carefully loosened the gutters of its lining and drew them tight again. Another, rubbing some dry clay between his palms, polished his bayonet. Another fingered the strap and pulled the buckle of his bandolier, while another smoothed and refolded his leg bands and put his boots on again. Some built little houses of the tufts in the ploughed ground, or plated baskets from the straw in the cornfield. All seemed fully absorbed in these pursuits. When men were killed or wounded, when rows of stretchers went past, when some troops retreated, and when great masses of the enemy came into view through the smoke, no one paid any attention to these things. But when our artillery or cavalry advanced, or some of our infantry were seen to move forward, words of approval were heard on all sides. But the liveliest attention was attracted by occurrences quite apart from and unconnected with the battle. It was as if the minds of these morally exhausted men found relief in everyday commonplace occurrences. A battery of artillery was passing in front of the regiment. The horse of an ammunition cart put its leg over a trace. Hey, look at the trace horse. Get her leg out. She'll fall. Ah, oh, they don't see it came identical shouts from the ranks all along the regiment. Another time, general attention was attracted by a small brown dog, coming heaven knows whence, which trotted in a preoccupied manner in front of the ranks, with tail stiffly erect, till suddenly a shell fell close by, when it yelped, tucked its tail between its legs and darted aside. Yells and shrieks of laughter rose from the whole regiment. But such distractions lasted only a moment, and for eight hours the man had been inactive, without food, in constant fear of death, and their pale and gloomy faces grew even paler and gloomier. Prince Andrew, pale and gloomy, like everyone in the regiment, paced up and down from the border of one patch to another, at the edge of the meadow beside an oatfield, with head bowed and arms behind his back. There was nothing for him to do, 
and no orders to be given. Everything went on off itself. The killed were dragged from the front, the wounded carried away, and the ranks closed up. If any soldiers ran to the rear, they returned immediately and hastily. At first, Prince Andrew, considering it his duty to rouse the courage of the men and to set them an example, walked about among the ranks. But he soon became convinced that this was unnecessary and that there was nothing he could teach them. All the powers of his soul, as of every soldier there, were unconsciously bent on avoiding the contemplation of the horrors of their situation. He walked along the meadow, dragging his feet, rustling the grass, and gazing at the dust that covered his boots. Now he took big strides, trying to keep to the footprints left on the meadow by the mowers, then he counted his steps, calculating how often he must walk from one strip to another to walk a mile. Then he stripped the flowers from the wormwood that grew along a boundary rut, rubbed them in his palms, and smelled their pungent, sweetly bitter scent. Nothing remained of the previous day's thoughts. He thought of nothing. He listened with weary ears to the ever-recurring sounds distinguishing the whistle of flying projectiles from the booming of the reports, glanced at the tiresomely familiar faces of the men of the 1st Battalion and waited. Here it comes. This one is coming our way again, he thought, listening to an approaching whistle in the hidden region of smoke. One, another, again, it has hit. He stopped and looked at the ranks. No, it has gone over, but this one has hit. And again he started trying to reach the boundary strip in sixteen paces. A whiz and a thud. Five paces from him, a cannonball tore up the dry earth and disappeared. A chill ran down his back. Again he glanced at the ranks. Probably many had been hit. A large crowd had gathered near the second battalion. Adjutant, he shouted, order them not to crowd together. The adjutant, having obeyed this instruction, approached Prince Andrew. From the other side, a battalion commander rode up. Look out! came a frightened cry from a soldier, and like a bird whirring in rapid flight and alighting on the ground, a shell dropped with little noise within two steps of Prince Andrew and close to the battalion commander's horse. The horse, first regardless of whether it was right or wrong to show fear, snorted, reared almost throwing the major, and galloped aside. The horse's terror infected the man. Lie down, cried the adjutant, throwing himself flat on the ground. Prince Andrew hesitated. The smoking shell spun like a top between him and the prostrate adjutant, near a wormwood plant between the field and the meadow. Can this be death? thought Prince Andrew, looking with a quite new envious glance at the grass, the wormwood, and the streamlet of smoke that curled up from the rotating black ball. I cannot, I do not wish to die. I love life, I love this grass, this earth, this air. He thought this and at the same time remembered that people were looking at him. It is shameful, sir, he said to the adjutant. What? He did not finish speaking. At one and the same moment came the sound of an explosion, a whistle of splinters as from a breaking window frame, a suffocating smell of powder, and Prince Andrew started to one side, raising his arm and fell on his chest. Several officers ran up to him. 
from the right side of his abdomen blood was welling out making a large stain on the grass the militiamen with stretchers who were called up stood behind the officers prince andrew lay on his chest with his face in the grass breathing heavily and noisily what are you waiting for come along the peasants went up and took him by his shoulders and legs, but he moaned piteously, and exchanging looks, they set him down again. "'Pick him up! Lift him! It is all the same!' cried someone. They again took him by the shoulders and laid him on the stretcher. "'Oh, God, my God, what is it? The stomach! That means death! My God!' Voices among the officers were heard saying. It flew a hair's breadth past my ear, said the adjutant. The peasants, adjusting the stretcher to their shoulders, started hurriedly along the path they had trodden down to the dressing station. Keep in step! Oh, those peasants! shouted an officer, seizing by their shoulders and checking the peasants who were walking unevenly and jolting the stretcher. Get into step, Fedor! I say, Fedor! said the foremost peasant now that is right said the one behind joyfully when he had got into step your excellency eh prince said the trembling voice of timokin who had run up and was looking down on the stretcher prince andrew opened his eyes and looked up at the speaker from the stretcher into which his head had sunk deep and again his eyelids drooped. The militiaman carried Prince Andrew to the dressing station by the wood, where wagons were stationed. The dressing station consisted of three tents with flaps turned back, pitched at the edge of a birch wood. In the wood, wagons and horses were standing. The horses were eating oats from the movable troughs, and sparrows flew down and pecked the grains that fell. Some crows, scenting blood, flew among the birch trees, cawing impatiently. Around the tents, over more than five acres, bloodstained men in various garbs stood, sat, or lay. Around the wounded stood crowds of soldier stretcher bearers with dismal and attentive faces whom the officers keeping order tried in vain to drive from the spot disregarding the officers orders the soldiers stood leaning against their stretchers and gazing intently as if trying to comprehend the difficult problem of what was taking place before them from the tents came now loud angry cries, now plaintive groans. Occasionally dressers ran out to fetch water or to point out those who were to be brought in next. The wounded men awaiting their turn outside the tents groaned, sighed, wept, screamed, swore, or asked for vodka. Some were delirious. Prince Andrew's bearers, stepping over the wounded who had not yet been bandaged, took him as a regimental commander close up to one of the tents and there stopped awaiting instructions. Prince Andrew opened his eyes and for a long time could not make out what was going on around him. He remembered the meadow, the wormwood, the field, the whirling black ball, and his sudden rush of passionate love of life. Two steps from him, leaning against a branch and talking loudly and attracting general attention, stood a tall, handsome, black-haired, non-commissioned officer with a bandaged head. He had been wounded in the head and leg by bullets. Around him, eagerly listening to his talk, a crowd of wounded and stretcher bearers were gathered. We kicked him out from there so that he chucked everything. We grabbed the king himself, cried he, looking around him with eyes that glittered with fever. 
If only reserves had come up just then, lads, there wouldn't have been nothing left of him. I tell you, surely. Like all the others near the speaker, Prince Andrew looked at him with shining eyes and experienced a sense of comfort. But isn't it all the same now, thought he? And what will be there? And what has there been here? Why was I so reluctant to part with life? There was something in this life I did not and do not understand. End of chapter 36 Recording by Eva Harnick Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 10, Chapter 37 Read for LibriVox.org by David Anton One of the doctors came out of the tent in a blood-stained apron, holding a cigar between the thumb and little finger of one of his small, blood-stained hands, so as not to smear it. He raised his head and looked about him, but above the level of the wounded men. He evidently wanted a little respite. After turning his head from right to left for some time, he sighed and looked down. All right, immediately, he replied to a dresser who pointed Prince Andrew out to him, and he told them to carry him into the tent. Murmurs arose among the wounded who were waiting. It seems that even in the next world only the gentry are to have a chance, remarked one. Prince Andrew was carried in and laid on a table that had only just been cleared, and which a dresser was washing down. Prince Andrew could not make out distinctly what was in that tent. The pitiful groans from all sides and the torturing pain in his thigh, stomach, and back distracted him. All he saw about him merged into a general impression of naked, bleeding human bodies that seemed to fill the whole of the low tent, as a few weeks previously on that hot August day such bodies had filled the dirty pond beside the Smolensk road. Yes, it was the same flesh, the same Sheral Canon, the sight of which had even then filled him with horror, as by a presentiment. There were three operating tables in the tent. Two were occupied, and on the third they placed Prince Andrew. For a little while he was left alone and involuntarily witnessed what was taking place on the other two tables. On the nearest one sat a Tartar, probably a Cossack, judging by the uniform thrown down beside him. Four soldiers were holding him, and a spectacle doctor was cutting into his muscular brown back. Oh, 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 grunted the Tartar, and suddenly lifting up his swarthy, snub-nosed face with its high cheekbones and baring his white teeth. He began to wriggle and twitch his body, and utter piercing, ringing, and prolonged yells. On the other table, round which many people were crowding, a tall, well-fed man lay on his back with his head thrown back. His curly hair, its color, and the shape of his head seemed strangely familiar to Prince Andrew. Several dressers were pressing on his chest to hold him down. One large, white, plump leg twitched rapidly all the time with a feverish tremor. The man was sobbing and choking convulsively. Two doctors, one of whom was pale and trembling, were silently doing something to this man's other gory leg. When he had finished with the tartar, whom they covered with an overcoat, the spectacled doctor came up to Prince Andrew, wiping his hands. He glanced at Prince Andrew's face and quickly turned away. "'Undress him! What are you waiting for?' he cried angrily to the dressers. His very first, remotest recollections of childhood came back to Prince Andrew's mind when the dresser with sleeves rolled up, began hastily to undo the buttons of his clothes, and undress him. The doctor bent down over the wound, felt it, and sighed deeply. Then he made a sign to someone, and the torturing pain in his abdomen caused Prince Andrew to lose consciousness. When he came to himself, the splintered portions of his thigh bone had been extracted, the torn flesh cut away, 
and the wound bandaged. Water was being sprinkled on his face. As soon as Prince Andrew opened his eyes, the doctor bent over, kissed him silently on the lips, and hurried away. After the sufferings he had been enduring, Prince Andrew enjoyed a blissful feeling such as he had not experienced for a long time. All the best and happiest moments of his life, especially his earliest childhood, when he used to be undressed and put to bed, and when, leaning over him, his nurse sang him to sleep, and he, burying his head in his pillow, felt happy in the mere consciousness of life, returned to his memory, not merely as something past, but as something present. The doctors were busily engaged with the wounded man, the shape of whose head seemed familiar to Prince Andrew. They were lifting him up and trying to quiet him. "'Show it to me!' "'Oh, oh, oh, oh!' His frightened moans could be heard, subdued by suffering and broken by sobs. Hearing those moans, Prince Andrew wanted to weep. Whether because he was dying without glory, or because he was sorry to part with life, or because of those memories of a childhood that could not return, or because he was suffering, and others were suffering, and that man near him was groaning so piteously, he felt like weeping childlike, kindly, and almost happy tears. The wounded man was shown his amputated leg, stained with clotted blood, and with the boot still on. Oh, 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 oh. he sobbed like a woman. The doctor, who had been standing beside him, preventing Prince Andrew from seeing his face, moved away. "'My God! What is this? Why is he here?' said Prince Andrew to himself. In the miserable, sobbing, enfeebled man, whose leg had just been amputated, he recognized Anatole Kirajin. Men were supporting him in their arms and offering him a glass of water, but his trembling, swollen lips could not grasp its rim. Anatole was sobbing painfully. Yes, it is he. Yes, that man is somehow closely and painfully connected with me, thought Prince Andrew, not yet clearly grasping what he saw before him. What is the connection of that man with my childhood and my life? he asked himself without finding an answer. And suddenly, a new unexpected memory from that realm of pure and loving childhood presented itself to him. He remembered Natasha as he had seen her for the first time at the ball in 1810, with her slender neck and arms, and with a frightened, happy face ready for rapture, and love and tenderness for her, stronger and more vivid than ever, awoke in his soul. He now remembered the connection that had existed between himself and this man who was dimly gazing at him through tears that filled his swollen eyes. He remembered everything, an ecstatic pity and love for that man overflowed his happy heart. Prince Andrew could no longer restrain himself and wept tender loving tears for his fellow men, for himself, and for his own and their errors. Compassion, love of our brothers, for those who love us and for those who hate us, love of our enemies. Yes, that love which God preached on earth and which Princess Mary taught me and I did not understand. That is what made me sorry to part with life. That is what remained for me had I lived. But now it is too late. I know it. End of chapter 37「War and Peace」Book 10 Chapter 38 Read for LibriVox.org By Anna Simon The terrible spectacle of the battlefield covered with dead and wounded, together with the heaviness of his head, and the news that some twenty generals he knew personally had been killed or wounded, and the consciousness of the impotence of his once mighty arm, produced an unexpected impression on Napoleon, who usually liked to look at the killed and wounded, thereby, he considered, testing his strength of mind. This day, the horrible appearance of the battlefield overcame that strength of mind 
which he thought constituted his merit and his greatness. He rode hurriedly from the battlefield, and returned to the Chevardino Knoll, where he sat on his camp-stool, his sallow face swollen and heavy, his eyes dim, his nose red, and his voice hoarse, involuntarily listening, with downcast eyes, to the sounds of firing. With painful dejection he awaited the end of this action, in which he regarded himself as a participant, and which he was unable to arrest. A personal, human feeling, for a brief moment, got the better of the artificial phantasm of life he had served so long. He felt in his own person the sufferings and death he had witnessed on the battlefield. The heaviness of his head and chest reminded him of the possibility of suffering and death for himself. At that moment he did not desire Moscow, or victory, or glory. What need had he for any more glory? The one thing he wished for was rest, tranquillity, and freedom. But when he had been on the Semenovsk heights, the artillery commander had proposed to him to bring several batteries of artillery up to those heights to strengthen the fire on the Russian troops crowded in front of Knyaskovo. Napoleon had assented, and had given orders that news should be brought to him of the effect those batteries produced. An adjutant came now to inform him that the fire of two hundred guns had been concentrated on the Russians, as he had ordered, but that they still held their ground. "'Our fire is mowing them down by rows, but still they hold on,' said the adjutant. "'They want more,' said Napoleon, in a hoarse voice. "'Sire?' asked the adjutant, who had not heard the remark. "'They want more,' croaked Napoleon, frowning. "'Let them have it.' Even before he gave that order, the thing he did not desire, and for which he gave the order only because he thought it was expected of him, was being done, and he fell back into that artificial realm of imaginary greatness, and again, as a horse walking a treadmill thinks it is doing something for itself, he submissively fulfilled the cruel, sad, gloomy, and inhuman role predestined for him. And not for that day and hour alone, were the mind and conscience darkened of this man, on whom the responsibility for what was happening lay more than on all the others who took part in it. Never to the end of his life could he understand goodness, beauty, or truth, or the significance of his actions, which were too contrary to goodness and truth, too remote from everything human, for him ever to be able to grasp their meaning. He could not disavow his actions, be lauded as they were by half the world, and so he had to repudiate truth, goodness, and all humanity. Not only on that day, as he rode over the battlefield strewn with men killed and maimed, by his will, as he believed, did he reckon, as he looked at them, how many Russians there were for each Frenchman, and, deceiving himself, find reason for rejoicing in the calculation that there were five Russians for every Frenchman. Not on that day alone did he write in a letter to Paris that the battlefield was superb, because fifty thousand corpses lay there, but even on the island of St. Helena, in the peaceful solitude where he said he intended to devote his leisure to an account of the great deeds he had done, he wrote, The Russian war should have been the most popular war of modern times. It was a war of good sense, for real interests, for the tranquillity and security of all, it was purely pacific and conservative. It was a war for a great cause, the end of uncertainties and the beginning of security. A new horizon and new labours were opening out, full of well-being and prosperity for all. The European system was already founded. All that remained was to organise it. Satisfied on these great points, and with tranquillity everywhere, I too should have had my Congress and my Holy Alliance, those ideas were stolen from me. In that reunion of great sovereigns we should have discussed our interests like one family, and have rendered account to the peoples as clerk to master. Europe would in this way soon have been, in fact, but one people, and any one who travelled anywhere would have found himself always in the common fatherland. I should have demanded the freedom of all navigable rivers for everybody, that the seas should be common to all, and that the great standing armies should be reduced henceforth to mere guards for the sovereigns. On returning to France, to the bosom of the great, strong, magnificent, peaceful, and glorious fatherland, I should have proclaimed her frontiers immutable, all future wars purely defensive, 
all aggrandizement anti-national. I should have associated my son in the empire, my dictatorship would have been finished, and his constitutional reign would have begun. Paris would have been the capital of the world, and the French the envy of the nations. My leisure then, and my old age, would have been devoted, in company with the empress and during the royal apprenticeship of my son, to leisurely visiting, with our own horses and like a true country couple, every corner of the empire, receiving complaints, redressing wrongs, and scattering public buildings and benefactions on all sides and everywhere. Napoleon, predestined by Providence for the gloomy role of executioner of the peoples, assured himself that the aim of his actions had been the people's welfare, and that he could control the fate of millions, and by the employment of power confer benefactions. Of four hundred thousand who crossed the Vistula, he wrote further of the Russian war, half were Austrians, Prussians, Saxons, Poles, Bavarians, Württembergers, Mecklenburgers, Spaniards, Italians, and Neapolitans. The imperial army, strictly speaking, was one-third composed of Dutch, Belgians, men from the borders of the Rhine, Piedmontese, Swiss, Givanese, Tuscans, Romans, inhabitants of the 32nd Military Division, of Bremen, of Hamburg, and so on. It included scarcely a hundred and forty thousand who spoke French. The Russian expedition actually cost France less than fifty thousand men. The Russian army in its retreat from Vilna to Moscow lost in the various battles four times more men than the French army. The burning of Moscow cost the lives of a hundred thousand Russians who died of cold and want in the woods. Finally, in its march from Moscow to the Oder, the Russian army also suffered from the severity of the season, so that by the time it reached Vilna it numbered only fifty thousand, and at Kalish less than eighteen thousand. He imagined that the war with Russia came about by his will, and the horrors that occurred did not stagger his soul. He boldly took the whole responsibility for what happened, and his darkened mind found justification in the belief that among the hundreds of thousands who perished there were fewer Frenchmen than Hessians and Bavarians. End of chapter 38「War and Peace」Book 10 Chapter 39 Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon Several tens of thousands of the slain lay in diverse postures and various uniforms on the fields and meadows belonging to the Davidov family and to the crown serfs, those fields and meadows where for hundreds of years the peasants of Borodino, Gorky, Shevardino, and Semenovsk had reaped their harvests and pastured their cattle. At the dressing stations the grass and earth were soaked with blood for a space of some three acres around. Crowds of men of various arms, wounded and unwounded, with frightened faces, dragged themselves back to Mozhaisk from the one army and back to Valuevo from the other. Other crowds, exhausted and hungry, went forward, led by their officers. Others held their ground and continued to fire. Over the whole field, previously so gaily beautiful with a glitter of bayonets and cloudlets of smoke in the morning sun, there now spread a mist of damp and smoke and a strange acid smell of saltpetre and blood. Clouds gathered, and drops of rain began to fall on the dead and wounded, on the frightened, exhausted, and hesitating men, as if to say, Enough, men, enough! Cease, bethink yourselves, what are you doing? To the men of both sides alike, worn out by want of food and rest, it began equally to appear doubtful whether they should continue to slaughter one another. All the faces expressed hesitation, and the question arose in every soul, For what, for whom, must I kill and be killed? You may go and kill whom you please, but I don't want to do so any more. By evening this thought had ripened in every soul. At any moment these men might have been seized with horror at what they were doing, and might have thrown up everything and run away anywhere. But, though toward the end of the battle the men felt all the horror of what they were doing, though they would have been glad to leave off, some incomprehensible, mysterious power continued to control them, and they still brought up the charges, loaded, aimed, and applied the match, though only one artilleryman survived out of every three, 
and though they stumbled and panted with fatigue, perspiring and stained with blood and powder. The cannonballs flew just as swiftly and cruelly from both sides, crushing human bodies, and that terrible work, which was not done by the will of a man, but at the will of him who governs men and worlds, continued. Anyone looking at the disorganized rear of the Russian army would have said that, if only the French made one more slight effort, it would disappear. And anyone looking at the rear of the French army would have said that the Russians need only make one more slight effort, and the French would be destroyed. But neither the French nor the Russians made that effort, and the flame of battle burned slowly out. The Russians did not make that effort, because they were not attacking the French. At the beginning of the battle they stood blocking the way to Moscow, and they still did so at the end of the battle, as at the beginning. But even had the aim of the Russians been to drive the French from their positions, they could not have made this last effort, for all the Russian troops had been broken up, there was no part of the Russian army that had not suffered in the battle, and though still holding their positions, they had lost one half of their army. The French, with the memory of all their former victories during fifteen years, with the assurance of Napoleon's invincibility, with the consciousness that they had captured part of the battlefield and had lost only a quarter of their men, and still had their guards intact, twenty thousand strong, might easily have made that effort. The French had attacked the Russian army in order to drive it from its position, ought to have made that effort, for as long as the Russians continued to block the road to Moscow as before, the aim of the French had not been attained, and all their efforts and losses were in vain. But the French did not make that effort. Some historians say that Napoleon need only have used his old guards who were intact, and the battle would have been won. To speak of what would have happened had Napoleon sent his guards is like talking of what would happen if autumn became spring. It could not be. Napoleon did not give his guards, not because he did not want to, but because it could not be done. All the generals, officers, and soldiers of the French army knew it could not be done, because the flagging spirit of the troops would not permit it. It was not Napoleon alone who had experienced that nightmare feeling of the mighty arm being stricken powerless, but all the generals and soldiers of his army, whether they had taken part in the battle or not, after all their experience of previous battles, when after one-tenth of such efforts the enemy had fled, experienced a similar feeling of terror before an enemy who, after losing half his men, stood as threateningly at the end as at the beginning of the battle. The moral force of the attacking French army was exhausted. Not that sort of victory which is defined by the capture of pieces of material fastened to sticks, called standards, and of the ground on which the troops had stood and were standing, but a moral victory that convinces the enemy of the moral superiority of his opponent and of his own impotence, was gained by the Russians at Borodino. The French invaders, like an infuriated animal that has in its onslaught received a mortal wound, felt that they were perishing, but could not stop, any more than the Russian army, weaker by one half, could help swerving. By impetus gained, the French army was still able to roll forward to Moscow, but there, without further effort on the part of the Russians, it had to perish, bleeding from the mortal wound it had received at Borodino. The direct consequence of the Battle of Borodino was Napoleon's senseless flight from Moscow, his retreat along the old Smolensk road, the destruction of the invading army of five hundred thousand men, and the downfall of Napoleonic France, on which, at Borodino, for the first time, the hand of an opponent of stronger spirit had been laid. End of chapter 39 End of War and Peace, Book 10, by Leo Tolstoy. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Aylmer and Louise Maud. Book 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Patinama. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, Book 11, Chapter 1. 1812.
Absolute continuity of motion is not comprehensible to the human mind. Laws of motion of any kind become comprehensible to man only when he examines arbitrarily selected elements of that motion. But at the same time, a large portion of human error comes from the arbitrary division of continuous motion into discontinuous elements. There is a well-known so-called sophism of the ancients consisting in this, that Achilles could never catch up with the tortoise he was following, in spite of the fact that he travelled ten times as fast as a tortoise. By the time Achilles has covered the distance that separated him from the tortoise, the tortoise has covered one-tenth of the distance ahead of him. When Achilles has covered that tenth, the tortoise has covered another one-hundredth, and so on forever. This problem seemed to the ancients insoluble. The absurd answer, that Achilles could never overtake the tortoise, resulted from this, that motion was arbitrarily divided into discontinuous elements, whereas the motion both of Achilles and of the tortoise was continuous. By adopting smaller and smaller elements of motion, we only approach a solution of the problem, but never reach it. Only when we have admitted the conception of the infinitely small and the resulting geometrical progression with the common ratio of one-tenth, and have found the sum of this progression to infinity, do we reach a solution of the problem. A modern branch of mathematics, having achieved the art of dealing with the infinitely small, can now yield solutions in other, more complex problems of motion, which used to appear insoluble. This modern branch of mathematics, unknown to the ancients when dealing with problems of motion, admits the conception of the infinitely small, and so conforms to the chief condition of motion, absolute continuity, and thereby corrects the inevitable error which the human mind cannot avoid when it deals with separate elements of motion instead of examining continuous motion. In seeking the laws of historical movement, just the same thing happens. The movement of humanity, arising as it does from innumerable arbitrary human wills, is continuous. To understand the laws of this continuous movement is the aim of history. But to arrive at these laws, resulting from the sum of all those human wills, man's mind postulates arbitrary and disconnected units. The first method of history is to take an arbitrarily selected series of continuous events and examine it apart from others, though there is and can be no beginning to any event, for one event always flows uninterruptedly from another. The second method is to consider the actions of some one man, a king or a commander, as equivalent to the sum of many individual wills, whereas the sum of individual wills is never expressed by the activity of a single historic personage. Historical science in its endeavour to draw nearer to truth continually takes smaller and smaller units for examination. But however small the units it takes, we feel that to take any unit disconnected from others, or to assume a beginning of any phenomenon, or to say that the will of many men is expressed by the actions of any one historic personage, is in itself false. It needs no critical exertion to reduce utterly to dust any deductions drawn from history. It is merely necessary to select some larger or smaller unit as the subject of observation, as criticism has every right to do, seeing that whatever unit history observes must always be arbitrarily selected. Only by taking infinitesimally small units for observation, the differential of history, that is, the individual tendencies of men, and attaining to the art of integrating them, 
that is, finding the sum of these infinitesimals, can we hope to arrive at the laws of history. The first fifteen years of the nineteenth century in Europe present an extraordinary movement of millions of people. Men leave their customary pursuits, hasten from one side of Europe to the other, plunder and slaughter one another, triumph and are plunged in despair, and for some years the whole course of life is altered and presents an intensive movement which first increases and then slackens. What was the cause of this movement? By what laws was it governed? asks the mind of man. The historians, replying to this question, lay before us the sayings and doings of a few dozen men in a building in the city of Paris, calling these sayings and doings the Revolution. Then they give a detailed biography of Napoleon and of certain people favorable or hostile to him, tell of the influence some of these people had on others, and say that is why this movement took place, and those are its laws. But the mind of man not only refuses to believe this explanation, but plainly says that this method of explanation is fallacious, because in it a weaker phenomenon is taken as the cause of a stronger. The sum of human wills produced a revolution and a Napoleon, and only the sum of those wills first tolerated and then destroyed them. But every time there have been conquests, there have been conquerors. Every time there has been a revolution, in any state there have been great men, says history. And indeed, human reason replies, every time conquerors appear, there have been wars. But this does not prove that the conquerors caused the wars, and that it is possible to find the laws of a war in the personal activity of a single man. Whenever I look at my watch, and its hands point to ten, I hear the bells of the neighboring church. But because the bells begin to ring when the hands of the clock reach ten, I have no right to assume that the movement of the bells is caused by the position of the hands of the watch. Whenever I see the movement of a locomotive, I hear the whistle, and see the valves opening and wheels turning. But I have no right to conclude that the whistling and the turning of wheels are the cause of the movement of the engine. The peasants say that a cold wind blows in late spring, because the oaks are budding, and really every spring cold winds do blow when the oak is budding. But though I do not know what causes the cold winds to blow when the oak buds unfold, I cannot agree with the peasants that the unfolding of the oak buds is the cause of the cold wind, for the force of the wind is beyond the influence of the buds. I see only a coincidence of occurrences, such as happens with all phenomena of life, and I see that, however much and however carefully I observe the hands of the watch, and the valves and wheels of the engine and the oak, I shall not discover the cause of the bells ringing, the engine moving, or of the winds of spring. To that I must entirely change my point of view and study the laws of the movement of steam, of the bells, and of the wind. History must do the same, and attempts in this direction have already been made. To study the laws of history, we must completely change the subject of our observation, must leave aside kings, ministers and generals, and the common, infinitesimally small elements by which the masses are moved. No one can say in how far it is possible for man to advance in this way toward an understanding of the laws of history, but it is evident that only along that path does the possibility of discovering the laws of history lie, and that as yet not a millionth part as much mental effort has been applied in this direction by historians as has been devoted to describing the actions of various kings, commanders, and ministers, and propounding the historian's own reflections concerning these actions. End of chapter 1 
Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Ernst Patinama. The forces of a dozen European nations burst into Russia. The Russian army and people avoided a collision till Smolensk was reached, and again from Smolensk to Borodino. The French army pushed on to Moscow its goal, its impetus ever increasing as it neared its aim, just as the velocity of a falling body increases as it approaches the earth. Behind it were seven hundred miles of hunger-stricken, hostile country. Ahead were a few dozen miles separating it from its goal. Every soldier in Napoleon's army felt this, and the invasion moved on by its own momentum. The more the Russian army retreated, the more fiercely a spirit of hatred of the enemy flared up, and while it retreated, the army increased and consolidated. At Borodino, a collision took place. Neither army was broken up, but the Russian army retreated immediately after the collision, as inevitably as a ball recoils after colliding with another, having a greater momentum. And with equal inevitability, the ball of invasion that had advanced with such momentum rolled on for some distance, though the collision had deprived it of all its force. The Russians retreated eighty miles to beyond Moscow, and the French reached Moscow and there came to a standstill. For five weeks after that there was not a single battle. The French did not move. As a bleeding, mortally wounded animal licks its wounds, they remained inert in Moscow for five weeks, and then suddenly, with no fresh reason, fled back. They made a dash for the Kaluga road, and, after a victory, for at Malo Yaroslavitz, the field of conflict again remained theirs, Without undertaking a single serious battle, they fled still more rapidly back to Smolensk, beyond Smolensk, beyond the Beryozina, beyond Vilna, and farther still. On the evening of the 26th of August, Kutuzov and the whole Russian army were convinced that the Battle of Borodino was a victory. Kutuzov reported so to the Emperor. He gave orders to prepare for a fresh conflict to finish the enemy and did this not to deceive any one, but because he knew that the enemy was beaten, as every one who had taken part in the battle knew it. But all that evening and next day reports came in, one after another, of unheard-of losses, of the loss of half the army, and a fresh battle proved physically impossible. It was impossible to give battle before information had been collected, the wounded gathered in, the supplies of ammunition replenished, the slain reckoned up, new officers appointed to replace those who had been killed, and before the men had had food and sleep. And meanwhile, the very next morning after the battle, the French army advanced of itself upon the Russians, carried forward by the force of its own momentum, now seemingly increased in inverse proportion to the square of the distance from its aim. Kutuzov's wish was to attack next day, and the whole army desired to do so. But to make an attack, the wish to do so is not sufficient. There must also be a possibility of doing it, and that possibility did not exist. It was impossible not to retreat a day's march, and then, in the same way, it was impossible not to retreat another, and a third day's march, and at last, on the 1st of September, when the army drew near Moscow, despite the strength of the feeling that had arisen in all ranks, the force of circumstances compelled it to retire beyond Moscow, and the troops retired one more last day's march, and abandoned Moscow to the enemy. Four people, accustomed to think that plans of campaign and battles are made by generals, as any one of us, sitting over a map in his study, may imagine, how he would have arranged things in this or that battle, the questions present themselves. Why did Kutuzov during the retreat not do this or that? 
Why did he not take up a position before reaching Fili? Why did he not retire at once by the Kaluga road, abandoning Moscow, and so on? People accustomed to think in that way forget, or do not know, the inevitable conditions which always limit the activities of any commander-in-chief. The activity of a commander-in-chief does not at all resemble the activity we imagine to ourselves when we sit at ease in our studies, examining some campaign on the map, with a certain number of troops on this and that side in a certain known locality, and begin our plans from some given moment. The commander-in-chief is never dealing with the beginning of any event, the position from which we always contemplate it. The commander-in-chief is always in the midst of a series of shifting events, and so he never can, at any moment, consider the whole import of an event that is occurring. Moment by moment, the event is imperceptibly shaping itself, and at every moment of this continuous, uninterrupted shaping of events, the commander-in-chief is in the midst of a most complex play of intrigues, worries, contingencies, authorities, projects, councils, threats, and deceptions, and is continually obliged to reply to innumerable questions addressed to him, which constantly conflict with one another. Learned military authorities quite seriously tell us that Kutuzov should have moved his army to the Kaluga road long before reaching Fili, and that somebody actually submitted such a proposal to him. But a commander-in-chief, especially at a difficult moment, has always before him not one proposal, but dozens simultaneously, and all these proposals, based on strategics and tactics, contradict each other. The commander-in-chief's business, it would seem, is simply to choose one of these projects, but even that he cannot do. Events and time do not wait. For instance, on the 28th it is suggested to him to cross to the Kaluga road, but just then an adjutant gallops up from Miloradovich, asking whether he is to engage the French or retire. An order must be given him at once, that instant, and the order to retreat carries us past the turn to the Kaluga road, and after the adjutant comes the commissary general, asking where the stores are to be taken, and the chief of the hospitals asks where the wounded are to go, and a courier from Petersburg brings a letter from the sovereign, which does not admit of the possibility of abandoning Moscow, and the commander-in-chief's rival, the man who is undermining him, and there are always not merely one but several such, presents a new project, diametrically opposed to that of turning to the Kaluga road, and the commander-in-chief himself needs sleep and refreshment to maintain his energy, and a respectable general, who has been overlooked in the distribution of rewards, comes to complain, and the inhabitants of the district pray to be defended, and an officer, sent to inspect the locality, comes in and gives a report quite contrary to what was said by the officer previously sent. And a spy, a prisoner, and a general who has been on reconnaissance all describe the position of the enemy's army differently. People, accustomed to misunderstand or to forget these inevitable conditions of a commander-in-chief's actions, describe to us, for instance, the position of the army at Fili, and assume that the commander-in-chief could, on the 1st of September, quite freely decide whether to abandon Moscow or defend it, whereas, with a Russian army less than four miles from Moscow, no such question existed. When had that question been settled? At Drissa and at Smolensk, and, most palpably of all, on the 24th of August at Shevardino, and on the 26th at Borodino, and each day and hour and minute of the retreat from Borodino to Fili. End of chapter 2 Recording by Ernst Patinama, Amsterdam, the Netherlands This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11, Section 3 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer and Louise Mott. Kutsov to inspect the position. 
told the field marshal that it was impossible to fight there before Moscow and that they must retreat, Kutsov looked at him in silence. Give me your hand, said he, and turning it so as to feel the pulse, added, You are not well, my dear fellow. Think what you are saying. Kutsov could not yet admit the possibility of retreating beyond Moscow without a battle. On the Pokliny Hill, four miles from the Dormoglov gate of Moscow, Kutsov got out of his carriage and sat down on a bench by the roadside. A great crowd of generals gathered round him, and the Count Rostepin, who had come out from Moscow, joined them. This brilliant company separated into several groups who all discussed the advantages and disadvantages of the position. The state of the army, the plan suggested, the situation of Moscow, and the military questions generally. Though they had not been summoned for the purpose, and though it was not so called, they all felt that this was really a council of war. The conversations all dealt with public questions. If anyone gave or asked for personal news, it was done in a whisper, and they immediately reverted to general matters. No jokes or laughter or smiles even were seen among all these men. They evidently all made an effort to hold themselves at the height of the situations demanded. And all these groups, while talking among themselves, tried to keep the near commander-in-chief, whose bench formed the center of the gathering, and to speak so that he might overhear them. The commander-in-chief listened to what was being said, and sometimes asked them to repeat their remarks, but did not himself take part in the conversations, or express any opinion. After hearing what was being said by one or other of these groups, he generally turned away with an air of disappointment, as though they were not speaking of anything he wished to hear. Some discussed the positions that he had chosen, criticizing not the position itself so much as the mental capacity of those who had chosen it. Others argued that a mistake had been made earlier and that a battle should have been fought two days before. Others again spoke of the Battle of Salamaca, which was described by Crossard as a newly arrived Frenchman in a Spanish uniform. This Frenchman and one of the German princes serving with the Russian army were discussing the siege of Saragossa and considering the possibility of defending Moscow in a similar manner. Count Rostepin was telling a fourth group that he was prepared to die with the city's train band under the wall of the capital, but that he still could not help regretting having been left in ignorance of what was happening, and that he had known it sooner things would have been different. A fifth group, displaying the profoundity of their strategic perceptions, discussed the directions the troops would now have to take. A sixth group was talking about absolute nonsense. Kutsov's expression grew more and more preoccupied and gloomy. From all this talk, he saw only one thing, that to defend Moscow was a physical impossibility. In the full meaning of these words, that is to say, so utterly impossible that if... Any senseless commander would have given orders to fight, confusion would result from the battle would still not take place. It would not take place because the commanders not merely all recognized the position to be impossible, but in their conversations were only discussing what would happen after its inevitable abandonment. How could the commanders lead their troops to a field of battle they considered impossible to hold? The lower grade officers and even the soldiers, who to reason, also considered the position impossible and therefore could not go to fight, fully convinced as they were of defeat. If Bensigan insisted on the position being defended and others still discussed it, the question was no longer important in itself, but only as a pretext for disputes and intrigue. This Kutsov knew well. Bennigsen, who had chosen this position, warmly displayed his Russian patriotism. Kutsov could not listen to this without wincing. By insisting that Moscow must be defended, his aim was as clear as daylight to Kutsov. If the defenses failed to throw the blame on Kutsov, who had brought the army as far as the Sparrow Hills without giving battle, if it succeeded, to claim the success as its own, or if battle were not given, to clear himself of the crime of abandoning Moscow. But this intrigue did not occupy the old man's mind. One terrible question absorbed him, and to that question he heard no reply from anyone. The question for him now was, have I really allowed Napoleon to reach Moscow? And when did I do so? When was it decided? <laughs> Can it have been yesterday when I ordered Platov to retreat, or was it in the evening before, when I had that nap and told Bensigan to issue orders? Or was it earlier still when my... When was this terrible affair decided? Moscow must be dependent. The army must retreat. 
and the order to do so must be given. To give that terrible order seemed to him equivalent to resigning the command of the army. And not only did he love power, to which he was accustomed, the honors awarded to Prince Przowski, under whom he was served in Turkey, galled him. But he was convinced that he was destined to save Russia, and that that was why, against the Emperor's wishes, by the will of the people, he had been chosen commander-in-chief. He was convinced that he alone could maintain command of the army in these difficult circumstances, and that in all the world he alone could encounter the invincible Napoleon without fear, and he was horrified at the thought of the orders he had to issue. But something had to be decided, and these conversations around him with which were assuming to free a character must be stopped. He called the most important generals to him. My head, be it good or bad, must depend on itself, said he, rising from the bench, and he rose to Philly with his carriages were waiting. End of chapter 11, section 3. Recorded by John Ellis. Chapter 4, Book 11 of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4, Book 11 of Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. Read by Father Ziley of Detroit. The Council of War began to assemble at two in the afternoon, in the better and roomier part of Andrew Sevastyanov's hut. The men, women, and children of the large peasant family crowded into the back room across the passage. Only Malasha, Andrew's six-year-old granddaughter, whom His Serene Highness had petted and to whom he had given a lump of sugar while drinking his tea, remained on the top of the brick oven in the larger room. Malasha looked down from the oven with shy delight at the faces, uniforms, and decorations of the generals, who, one after another, came into the room and sat down on the broad benches in the corner under the icons. Grandad himself, as Malasha in her own mind called Kutuzov, sat apart in a dark corner behind the oven. He sat sunk deep in a folding armchair, and continually cleared his throat and pulled at the collar of his coat, which, though it was unbuttoned, still seemed to pinch his neck. Those who entered went up one by one to the field marshal. He pressed the hands of some and nodded to others. His adjutant, Kaiserov, was about to draw back the curtain of the window facing Kutuzov, but the latter moved his hand angrily, and Kaiserov understood that His Serene Highness did not wish his face to be seen. Round the peasant's deal table, on which lay maps, plans, pencils, and papers, so many people gathered that the orderlies brought in another bench and put it beside the table. Ermolov, Kaiserov, and Tol, who had just arrived, sat down on this bench. In the foremost place, immediately under the icons, lay Barclay de Tolly, his high forehead merging into his bald crown. He had a St. George's cross round his neck, and looked pale and ill. He had been feverish for two days, and was now shivering and in pain. Beside him sat Uvarov, who, with rapid gesticulations, was giving him some information, speaking in low tones, as they all did. Chubby little Doktorov was listening attentively with eyebrows raised and arms folded on his stomach. On the other side sat Count Osterman Tolstoy, seemingly absorbed in his own thoughts. His broad head, with its bold features and glittering eyes, was resting on his hand. Raevsky, twitching forward the black hair on his temples, as was his habit, glanced now at Kutuzov, and now at the door with a look of impatience. Konovnitsyn's firm, handsome, and kindly face was lit up by a tender, sly smile. 
His glance met Malasha's, and the expression of his eyes caused the little girl to smile. They were all waiting for Benningson, who, on the pretext of inspecting the positions, was finishing his savoury dinner. They waited for him from four till six o'clock, and did not begin their deliberations all that time, talked in low tones of other matters. Only when Benningson had entered the hut did Kutuzov leave his corner and draw toward the table, but not near enough for the candles that had been placed there to light up his face. Benningson opened the council with the question, Are we to abandon Russia's ancient and sacred capital without a struggle, or are we to defend it? A prolonged and general silence followed. There was a frown on every face, and only Kutuzov's angry grunts and occasional cough broke the silence. All eyes were gazing at him. Malasha, too, looked at Grandad. She was nearest to him and saw how his face puckered. He seemed about to cry, but this did not last long. Russia's ancient and sacred capital, he suddenly said, repeating Benningson's words in an angry voice, and thereby drawing attention to the false note in them. Allow me to tell you, Your Excellency, that that question has no meaning for a Russian. He lurched his heavy body forward. Such a question cannot be put. It is senseless. The question I have asked these gentlemen to meet to discuss is a military one. The question is that of saving Russia. Is it better to give up Moscow without a battle, or by accepting battle to risk losing the army as well as Moscow? That is the question on which I want your opinion. And he sank back in his chair. The discussion began. Benningson did not yet consider his game lost. Admitting the view of Barclay and others that a defensive battle at Philly was impossible, but imbued with Russian patriotism and the love of Moscow, he proposed to move troops from the right to the left flank during the night and attack the French right flank the following day. Opinions were divided, and arguments were advanced for and against that project. Ermolov, Doktorov, and Raevsky agreed with Benningson. Whether feeling it necessary to make a sacrifice before abandoning the capital, or guided by other personal considerations, these generals seemed not to understand that this council could not alter the inevitable course of events, and that Moscow was, in effect, already abandoned. The other generals, however, understood it and, leaving aside the question of Moscow, of the direction of the army should take in its retreat. Malasha, who kept her eyes fixed on what was going on before her, understood the meaning of the council differently. It seemed to her that it was only a personal struggle between Grandad and Longcoat, as she termed Benningson. She saw that they grew spiteful when they spoke to one another, and in her heart she sided with Grandad. In the midst of the conversation she noticed Grandad give Benningson a quick, subtle glance, and then, to her joys, he saw that Grandad said something to Longcoat which settled him. Benningson suddenly reddened and paced angrily up and down the room. What so affected him was Kutuzov's calm and quiet comment on the advantage or disadvantage of Benningson's proposal to move troops by night from the right to the left flank, to attack the French right wing. "'Gentlemen,' said Kutuzov, "'I cannot approve of the Count's plan. Moving troops in close proximity to an enemy is always dangerous, and military history supports that view. For instance,' Kutuzov seemed to reflect, searching for an example. Then, with a clear, naive look at Benningson, he added, "'Oh, yes, take the Battle of Friedland.' which I think the Count well remembers, and which was not fully successful, only because our troops were rearranged too near the enemy. There followed a momentary pause, which seemed very long to them all. The discussion recommenced, but pauses frequently occurred, and they all felt that there was no more to be said. During one of these pauses, Kutuzov 
heaved a deep sigh as if preparing to speak. They all looked at him. Well, gentlemen, I see that it is I who will have to pay for the broken crockery, said he, and rising slowly he moved to the table. Gentlemen, I have heard your views. Some of you will not agree with me, but I, he paused, by the authority entrusted to me by my sovereign and country, order a retreat. After that the generals began to disperse with the solemnity and circumspect silence of people who are leaving after a funeral. Some of the generals, in low tones, and in a strain very different from the way they had spoken during the council, communicated something to their commander-in-chief. Malasha, who had long been expected for supper, climbed carefully backwards down from the oven, her bare little feet catching at its projections, and slipping between the legs of the generals, she darted out of the room. When he had dismissed the generals, Kutuzov sat a long time with his elbows on the table, thinking always of the same terrible question. When? When did the abandonment of Moscow become inevitable? When was that done which settled the matter? And who was to blame for it? I did not expect this, said he to his adjutant, Schneider, when the latter came in late that night. I did not expect this. I did not think it would happen. You should take some rest, your serene highness, replied Schneider. But no, they shall eat horse flesh yet, like the Turks, exclaimed Kutuzov without replying, striking the table with his podgy fist. They shall too, if only. End of chapter 4 of Book 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Read by Father Ziley of Detroit War and Peace Book 11, Chapter 5 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick at that very time, in circumstances even more important than retreating without a battle, namely the evacuation and burning of Moscow, Rostopchin, who is usually represented as being the instigator of that event, acted in an altogether different manner from Kutuzov. After the battle of Borodino, the abandonment and burning of Moscow was as inevitable as the retreat of the army beyond Moscow without fighting. Every Russian might have predicted it, not by reasoning, but by the feeling implanted in each of us and in our fathers. The same thing that took place in Moscow had happened in all the towns and villages on Russian soil, beginning with Smolensk, without the participation of Count Rostopchin and his broadsheets. The people awaited the enemy unconcernedly, did not riot or become excited or tear anyone to pieces, but faced its fate, feeling within it the strength to find what it should do at that most difficult moment. And as soon as the enemy drew near, the wealthy classes went away, abandoning their property, while the poorer remained and burned and destroyed what was left. The consciousness that this would be so, and would always be so, was and is present in the heart of every Russian, and the consciousness of this, and the foreboding that Moscow would be taken, was present in Russian Moscow society, in 1812. Those who had quitted Moscow already in July and at the beginning of August showed that they expected this. Those who went away, taking what they could and abandoning their houses and half their belongings, 
did so from the latent patriotism which expresses itself not by phrases or by giving one's children to save the fatherland and similar unnatural exploits, but unobtrusively, simply, organically, and therefore in the way that always produces the most powerful results. It is disgraceful to run away from danger. Only cowards are running away from Moscow, they were told. In his broadsheets, Rostopchin impressed on them that to leave Moscow was shameful. They were ashamed to be called cowards, ashamed to leave, but still they left knowing it had to be done. Why did they go? It is impossible to suppose that Rostopchin had scared them by his accounts of horrors Napoleon had committed in conquered countries. The first people to go away were the rich, educated people who knew quite well that Vienna and Berlin had remained intact and that during Napoleon's occupation the inhabitants had spent their time pleasantly in the company of the charming Frenchmen whom the Russians, and especially the Russian ladies, then liked so much. They went away because for Russians there could be no question as to whether things would go well or ill under French rule in Moscow. It was out of the question to be under French rule. It would be the worst thing that could happen. They went away even before the Battle of Borodino, and still more rapidly after it, despite Rostopchin's calls to defend Moscow or the announcement of his intention to take the wonder-working icon of the Iberian Mother of God and go to fight or of the balloons that were to destroy the French, and despite all the nonsense Rostopchin wrote in his broadsheets. They knew that it was for the army to fight, and that if it could not succeed, it would not do to take young ladies and house serfs to the Three Hills quarter of Moscow to fight Napoleon, and that they must go away, sorry as they were to abandon their property to destruction. They went away without thinking of the tremendous significance of that immense and wealthy city being given over to destruction, for a great city with wooden buildings was certain, when abandoned by its inhabitants, to be burned. They went away each on his own account, and yet it was only in consequence of their going away that the momentous event was accomplished that will always remain the greatest glory of the Russian people. The lady who, afraid of being stopped by Count Rostopchin's orders, had already in June moved with her Negroes and her women jesters from Moscow to her Saratov estate, with a vague consciousness that she was not Bonaparte's servant, was really, simply and truly carrying out the great work which saved Russia. But Count Rostopchin who now taunted those who left Moscow, and now had the government officers removed, now distributed quite useless weapons to the drunken rabble, now had processions displaying the icons, and now forbade Father Augustine to remove icons or the relics of saints, now seized all the private carts in Moscow, and on 136 of them removed the balloon that was being constructed by Lepic. Now hinted that he would burn Moscow, and related how he had set fire to his own house. Now wrote a proclamation to the French solemnly upbraiding them for having destroyed his orphanage. Now claimed the glory of having hinted that he would burn Moscow, and now repudiated the deed now ordered the people to catch all spies and bring them to him, and now reproached them for doing so, now expelled all the French residents from Moscow, 
and now allowed Madame Aubert-Charme, the center of the whole French colony in Moscow, to remain, but ordered the venerable old postmaster Klucherev to be arrested and exiled for no particular offense. Now assembled the people at the Three Hills to fight the French, and now to get rid of them, handed over to them a man to be killed and himself drove away by a back gate. Now declared that he would not survive the fall of Moscow, and now wrote French verses in albums concerning his share in the affair. This man did not understand the meaning of what was happening, but merely wanted to do something himself that would astonish people. To perform some patriotically heroic feat, and like a child he made sport of the momentous and unavoidable event, the abandonment and burning of Moscow, and tried with his puny hand now to speed and now to stay the enormous popular tide that bore him along with it. End of chapter 5 Recording by Eva Harnick, Ponta Vedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 6, read for LibriVox.org, by Philippa Brody. Helene, having returned with the court from Vilna to Petersburg, found herself in a difficult position. In Petersburg she had enjoyed the special protection of a grandee who occupied one of the highest posts in the empire. In Vilna she had formed an intimacy with a young foreign prince. When she returned to Petersburg, both the magnate and the prince were there, and both claimed their rights. Helen was faced by a new problem, how to preserve her intimacy with both, without offending either. What would have seemed difficult or even impossible to another woman did not cause the least embarrassment to Countess Bezukhova, who evidently deserved her reputation of being a very clever woman. Had she attempted concealment or tried to extricate herself from her awkward position by cunning, she would have spoiled her case by acknowledging herself guilty. But Helene, like a really great man who can do whatever he pleases, at once assumed her own position to be correct, as she sincerely believed it to be, and that everyone else was to blame. The first time the young foreigner allowed himself to reproach her, she lifted her beautiful head, and half turning to him, said firmly, "'That's just like a man, selfish and cruel. I expected nothing else.' A woman sacrifices herself for you, she suffers, and this is her reward. What right have you, Monseigneur, to demand an account of my attachments and friendships? He is a man who has been more than a father to me. The prince was about to say something, but Alain interrupted him. Well, yes, said she. It may be that he has other sentiments for me than those of a father, but that is not a reason for me to shut my door on him. I am not a man that I should repay kindness with ingratitude. No, Monseigneur, that in all that relates to my intimate feelings I render account only to God and to my conscience, she concluded, laying her hand on her beautiful, fully expanded bosom and looking up to heaven. But for heaven's sake listen to me. Marry me and I will be your slave. But that's impossible. You won't deign to demean yourself by marrying me, you—' said Helene, beginning to cry. The prince tried to comfort her, but Helene, as if quite distraught, said through her tears that there was nothing to prevent her marrying, that there were precedents. There were up to that time very few, but she mentioned Napoleon and some other exalted personages, that she had never been her husband's wife, and that she had been sacrificed. "'But the law, religion—' said the prince, already yielding. "'The law, religion! What have they been invented for if they can't arrange that?' said Helene. The prince was surprised that so simple an idea had not occurred to him, and he applied for advice to the Holy Brethren of the Society of Jesus, with whom he was on intimate terms. A few days later, at one of those enchanting fetes which Helene gave at her country house on the Stone Island, 
the charming Monsieur de Jabou, a man no longer young, with snow-white hair and brilliant black eyes, a Jesuit, a robe court, was presented to her, and in the garden by the light of the illuminations and to the sound of music talked to her for a long time of the love of God, of Christ, of the Sacred Heart, and of the consolations the one true Catholic religion affords in this world and the next. Helene was touched, and more than once tears rose to her eyes and to those of Monsieur de Jabeur, and their voices trembled. A dance, for which her partner came to seek her, put an end to her discourse with her future directeur de conscience, but the next evening Monsieur de Jabeur came to see Helene when she was alone, and after that often came again. One day he took the Countess to a Roman Catholic church, where she knelt down before the altar to which she was led. The enchanting middle-aged Frenchman laid his hands on her head, and, as she herself afterwards described it, she felt something like a fresh breeze wafted into her soul. It was explained to her that this was la grâce. After that, a long-frocked abbé was brought to her. She confessed to him, and he absolved her from her sins. Next day she received a box containing the sacred host, which was left at her house for her to partake of. A few days later Helene learned with pleasure that she had now been admitted to the true Catholic Church, and that in a few days the Pope himself would hear of her, and would send her a certain document. All that was done around her and to her at this time, all the attention devoted to her by so many clever men, and expressed in such pleasant, refined ways, and the state of dove-like purity she was now in. She wore only white dresses and white ribbons all that time, gave her pleasure, but her pleasure did not cause her for a moment to forget her aim. And as it always happens in contests of cunning that a stupid person gets the better of cleverer ones, Helene, having realised that the main object of all these words and all this trouble was, after converting her to Catholicism, to obtain money from her for Jesuit institutions, as to which she received indications, before parting with her money, insisted that the various operations necessary to free her from her husband should be performed. In her view, the aim of every religion was merely to preserve certain proprieties while affording satisfaction to human desires. And with this aim, in one of her talks with her father confessor, she insisted on an answer to the question, in how far was she bound by her marriage? They were sitting in the twilight by a window in the drawing-room. The scent of flowers came in at the window. Helene was wearing a white dress, transparent over her shoulders and bosom. The abbé, a well-fed man with a plump, clean-shaven chin, a pleasant, firm mouth, and white hands meekly folded on his knees, sat close to Helene, and with a subtle smile on his lips and a peaceful look of delight at her beauty, occasionally glanced at her face as he explained his opinion on the subject. Helene, with an uneasy smile, looked at his curly hair and his plump, clean-shaven, blackish cheeks, and every moment expected the conversation to take a fresh turn. But the abbé, though he evidently enjoyed the beauty of his companion, was absorbed in his mastery of the matter. The course of the father confessor's arguments ran as follows. Ignorant of the import of what you were undertaking, you made a vow of conjugal fidelity to a man who, on his part, by entering the marriage state without faith in the religious significance of marriage, committed an act of sacrilege. That marriage lacked the dual significance it should have had. Yet in spite of this your vow was binding. You swerved from it. What did you commit by so acting? A venial or a mortal sin? A venial sin, for you acted without evil intention. If now you married again with the object of bearing children, your sin might be forgiven. But the question is again a twofold one. Firstly, but suddenly Helene, who was getting bored, said with one of her bewitching smiles, but I think that having espoused the true religion, I cannot be bound by what a false religion laid upon me. The director of her conscience was astounded at having the case presented to him thus, with the simplicity of Columbus's egg. He was delighted at the unexpected rapidity of his pupil's progress, but could not abandon the edifice of argument he had laboriously constructed. "'Let us understand one another, Countess,' said he with a smile, and began refuting his spiritual daughter's arguments." End of chapter 6 Recording by Philippa Brody LaSpecula.blogspot.com
War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Seven, read for LibriVox.org by Philippa Brody. Helen understood that the question was very simple and easy from the ecclesiastical point of view, and that her directors were making difficulties only because they were apprehensive as to how the matter would be regarded by the secular authorities. So she decided that it was necessary to prepare the opinion of society. She provoked the jealousy of the elderly magnate and told him what she had told her other suitor. That is, she put the matter so that the only way for him to obtain a right over her was to marry her. The elderly magnate was at first as much taken aback by the suggestion of marriage with a woman whose husband was alive as the younger man had been, but Helene's imperturbable conviction that it was as simple and natural as marrying a maiden had its effect on him too. Had Helene herself shown the least sign of hesitation? Shame or secrecy, her cause would certainly have been lost. But not only did she show no signs of secrecy or shame; on the contrary, with good-natured naivety, she told her intimate friends, and these were all Petersburg, that both the prince and the magnate had proposed to her, and that she loved both and was afraid of grieving either. A rumor immediately spread in Petersburg, not that Helene wanted to be divorced from her husband. Had such a report spread, many would have opposed so illegal an intention. But simply that the unfortunate and interesting Helen was in doubt which of the two men she should marry. The question was no longer whether this was possible, but only which was the better match and how the matter would be regarded at court. There were, it is true, some rigid individuals unable to rise to the height of such a question, who saw in the project a desecration of the sacrament of marriage. But there were not many such, and they remained silent. While the majority were interested in Helen's good fortune, and in the question which match would be the more advantageous, whether it was right or wrong to remarry while one had a husband living, they did not discuss, for that question had evidently been settled by people wiser than you or me, as they said, and to doubt the correctness of that decision would be to risk exposing one's stupidity and incapacity to live in society. Only Maria Dmitrievna Krozimova, having come to Petersburg that summer to see one of her sons. Allowed herself plainly to express an opinion contrary to the general one. Meeting Helena at a ball, she stopped her in the middle of the room and, amid general silence, said in her gruff voice, "So wives of living men have started marrying again. Perhaps you think you have invented a novelty. You've been forestalled, my dear. It was thought of long ago. It's done in all the brothels." And with these words, Maria Dmitrievna. Turning up her wide sleeves with her usual threatening gesture and glancing sternly round, moved across the room. Though people were afraid of Maria Dmitrievna, she was regarded in Petersburg as a buffoon, and so of what she had said they only noticed and repeated in a whisper the one coarse word she had used, supposing the whole sting of her remark to lie in that word. Prince Vasily, who of late very often forgot what he had said and repeated one and the same thing a hundred times. Remarked to his daughter whenever he chanced to see her, "Helen, I have a word to say to you," and he would lead her aside, drawing her hand downward. "I have heard of certain projects concerning, you know, well, my dear child, you know how much your father's heart rejoices to know that you, you have suffered so much, but my dear child, consult only your own heart." That is all I have to say. And concealing his unvarying emotion, he would press his cheek against his daughter's and move away. Belibin, who had not lost his reputation of an exceedingly clever man, and who was one of the disinterested friends so brilliant a woman as Helen always has, men friends who can never change into lovers, once gave her his view of the matter at a small and intimate gathering. Listen, Belibin," said Helen. She always called friends of that sort by their surnames, and she touched his coat sleeve with her white, beringed fingers. Tell me, as you would a sister, what ought I to do? Which of the two? Bilibin wrinkled up the skin over his eyebrows and pondered, with a smile on his lips. You're not taking me unawares, you know," said he. "As a true friend, I've thought and thought again about your affair. You see, if you marry the prince." He meant the younger man, and he crooked one finger. You forever lose the chance of marrying the other, and you will displease the court besides. You know there is some kind of connection. 
but if you marry the old count you'll make his last days happy, and as a widow of the grand the prince would no longer be making a misalliance by marrying you. And Bilibin smoothed out his forehead. That's a true friend, said Helene, beaming, and again touching Bilibin's sleeve. But I love them, you know, and don't want to distress either of them. I would give my life for the happiness of them both. Bilibin shrugged his shoulders, as much as to say that not even he could help in that difficulty. Une maîtresse femme, a masterly woman. That's what is called putting things squarely. She would like to be married to all three at the same time, thought he. But tell me, how will your husband look at the matter? Bilibin asked, his reputation being so well established that he did not fear to ask so naive a question. Will he agree? Oh, he loves me so, said Helene. Who, for some reason, imagined that Pierre too loved her? He will do anything for me. Pelimin puckered his skin in preparation for something witty. Even divorce you," said he. Helen laughed. Among those who ventured to doubt the justifiability of the proposed marriage was Helen's mother, Princess Kuragina. She was continually tormented by jealousy of her daughter, and now that jealousy concerned a subject near to her own heart, she could not reconcile herself to the idea. She consulted a Russian priest as to the possibility of divorce and remarriage during her husband's lifetime, and the priest told her that it was impossible. And to her delight, showed her a text in the Gospel which, as it seemed to him, plainly forbade remarriage while the husband is alive. Armed with these arguments, which appeared to her unanswerable, she drove to her daughter's early one morning so as to find her alone. Having listened to her mother's objections, Helen smiled blandly and ironically. But it says plainly, "Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced," said the old princess. "Ah, maman, ne dites pas des bêtises. Vous ne comprenez rien. Dans ma position, j'ai des devoirs." "Oh, mamma, don't talk nonsense. You don't understand anything. In my position, I have obligations," said Helene, changing from Russian, in which language she always felt that her case did not sound quite clear, into French, which suited it better. But my dear, oh, mamma, how is it that you don't understand that the Holy Father, who has the right to grant dispensations, just then the lady companion who lived with Helen, came in to announce that His Highness was in the ballroom and wished to see her. Non, dites-lui que je ne veux pas le voir, que je suis furieuse contre lui, parce qu'il m'a manqué parole. No. Tell him I don't wish to see him. I am furious with him for not keeping his word to me. Comtesse, a tout péché miséricorde," said a fair-haired young man with a long face and nose as he entered the room. Countess, there is mercy for every sin. The old princess rose respectfully and curtsied. The young man who had entered took no notice of her. The princess nodded to her daughter and sidled out of the room. Yes, she is right," thought the old princess, all her convictions dissipated by the appearance of his highness. She is right, but how is it that we, in our irrecoverable youth, did not know it? Yet it is so simple," she thought, as she got into her carriage. By the beginning of August, Helen's affairs were clearly defined, and she wrote a letter to her husband, who, as she imagined, loved her very much, informing him of her intention to marry N. N. And of her having embraced the one true faith, and asking him to carry out all the formalities necessary for a divorce, which would be explained to him by the bearer of the letter. And so I pray God to have you, my friend, in His holy and powerful keeping, your friend Helen. This letter was brought to Pierre's house when he was on the field of Borodino. End of chapter seven. Recording by Philippa Brody. La Specula. Blogspot.com. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Eight, read for Relibrivox.org by David Rehm. Toward the end of the Battle of Borodino, Pierre, having run down from Raevsky's battery a second time, made his way through a gully to Knioskovo with a crowd of soldiers, reached the dressing station, and seeing blood and hearing cries and groans, hurried on, still entangled in the crowds of soldiers. The one thing he now desired with his whole soul was to get away, 
quickly from the terrible sensations amid which he had lived that day and returned to ordinary conditions of life and sleep quietly in a room in his own bed. He felt that only in the ordinary conditions of life would he be able to understand himself and all he had seen and felt. But such ordinary conditions of life were nowhere to be found. Though shells and bullets did not whistle over the road along which he was going still on all sides, there was what there had been on the field of battle. There were still the same suffering, exhausted, and sometimes strangely indifferent faces, the same blood, the same soldiers' overcoats, the same sounds of firing, which, though distant now, still aroused terror, and besides this, there were the foul air and the dust. Having gone a couple of miles along the Mojaisk road, Pierre sat down by the roadside. Dusk had fallen, and the roar of guns died away. Pierre lay, leaning on his elbow for a long time, gazing at the shadows that moved past him in the darkness. He was continually imagining that a cannonball was flying toward him with a terrific whiz, and then he shuddered and sat up. He had no idea how long he had been there. In the middle of the night, three soldiers, having brought some firewood, settled down near him and began lighting a fire. The soldiers, who threw a sidelong glances at Pierre, got the fire to burn and placed an iron pot on it into which they broke some dried bread and put a little dripping. The pleasant odor of greasy viands mingled with the smell of smoke. Pierre sat up and sighed. The three soldiers were eating and talking among themselves, taking no notice of him. "'And who may you be?' one of them suddenly asked Pierre, evidently meaning what Pierre himself had in mind, namely, "'If you want to eat, we'll give you some food.' Only let us know whether you are an honest man. Aye, aye, said Pierre, feeling it necessary to minimize his social position as much as possible, so as to be nearer to the soldiers and better understood by them. By rights I am a militia officer, but my men are not here. I came to the battle and have lost them. There now, said one of the soldiers. Another shook his head. Would you like a little mash? The first soldier asked, and handed Pierre a wooden spoon after licking it clean. Pierre sat down by the fire and began eating the mash, as they called the food in the cauldron, and he thought it more delicious than any food he had ever tasted. As he sat, bending greedily over it, helping himself to large spoonfuls and chewing one after another, his face was lit up by the fire, and the soldiers looked at him in silence. "'Where have you to go to? Tell us,' said one of them. "'To, to Mojaisk. You're a gentleman, aren't you?' "'Yes. And what's your name?' Peter Kirillich. Well then, Peter Kirillich, come along with us. We'll take you there. In the total darkness, the soldiers walked with Pierre to Mojaisk. By the time they got near Mojaisk and began ascending the steep hill into the town, the cocks were already crowing. Pierre went on with the soldiers, quite forgetting that his inn was at the bottom of the hill and that he had already passed it. He would not soon have remembered this, such was his state of forgetfulness, had he not halfway up the hill stumbled upon his groom, who had been to look for him in the town and was returning to the inn. The groom recognized Pierre in the darkness by his white hat. "'Your Excellency,' he said, "'why, we were beginning to despair. How is it you are on foot? What, and where are you going, please?' "'Oh, yes,' said Pierre. The soldier stopped. "'So you've found your folk,' said one of them. "'Well, good-bye, Peter. Kirillich, isn't it?' "'Good-bye, Peter Kirillich. Pierre heard the other voices repeat. "'Good-bye,' he said, and turned with his groom toward the inn. "'I ought to give them something,' he thought, and felt in his pocket. "'No, better not,' said another inner voice. "'There was not a room to be had at the inn. They were all occupied. "'Pierre went out into the yard.' and, covering himself up, head and all, lay down in his carriage. End of chapter 8, recording by David Ream, Sacramento, California, April 3, 2009. War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org, by David Ream. Scarcely had Pierre laid his head on the pillow before he felt himself falling asleep, but suddenly, almost with the distinctness of reality, he heard the boom, boom, boom of firing, the thud of projectiles, groans and cries, and smelled blood and powder, and a feeling of horror and dread of death seized him. Filled with fright, 
He opened his eyes and lifted his head from under his cloak. All was tranquil in the yard. Only someone's orderly passed through the gateway, splashing through the mud, and talked to the innkeeper. Above Pierre's head some pigeons, disturbed by the movement he had made in sitting up, fluttered under the dark roof of the penthouse. The whole courtyard was permeated by a strong, peaceful smell of stable yards, delightful to Pierre at that moment. He could see the clear, starry sky between the dark roofs of two penthouses. Thank God there is no more of that, he thought, covering up his head again. Oh, what a terrible thing is fear, and how shamefully I yielded to it. But they, they were steady and calm all the time, to the end, thought he. They, in Pierre's mind, were the soldiers those who had been at the battery, those who had given him food, and those who had prayed before the icon. They, those strange men he had not previously known, stood out clearly and sharply from everyone else. To be a soldier, just a soldier, thought Pierre as he fell asleep. To enter communal life completely, to be imbued by what makes them what they are. But how cast off all the superfluous, devilish burden of my outer man? There was a time when I could have done it, I could have run away from my father, as I wanted to, or I might have been sent to serve as a soldier after the duel with Dolokhov, and the memory of the dinner at the English club when he had challenged Dolokhov flashed through Pierre's mind, and then he remembered his benefactor at Torzok. And now a picture of solemn meeting of the lodge presented itself to his mind. It was taking place at the English club, and someone near and dear to him sat at the end of the table. Yes, that is he. It is my benefactor. But he died, thought Pierre. Yes, he died, and I did not know he was alive. How sorry I am that he died, and how glad I am that he is alive again. On one side of the table sat Anatoly Dolokhov, Nezvitsky, Denisov, and others like them. In his dream, the category to which these men belonged was as clearly defined in his mind as the category of those he termed they, and he heard those people, Anatoly and Dolokhov, shouting and singing loudly. Yet through their shouting, the voice of his benefactor was heard speaking all the time, and the sound of his words was as weighty and uninterrupted as the booming on the battlefield, but pleasant and comforting. Pierre did not understand what his benefactor was saying, but he knew, the categories of thoughts were also quite distinct in his dream, that he was talking of goodness and the possibility of being what they were, and they, with their simple, kind, firm faces, surrounded his benefactor on all sides. But though they were kindly, they did not look at Pierre, and did not know him. Wishing to speak and to attract their attention, he got up, but at that moment his legs grew cold and bare. He felt ashamed, and with one arm covered his legs from which his cloak had in fact slipped. For a moment, as he was rearranging his cloak, Pierre opened his eyes and saw the same penthouse roofs, posts, and yard, but now they were all bluish, lit up, and glittering with frost or dew. It is dawn, thought Pierre, but that's not what I want. I want to hear and understand my benefactor's words. Again he covered himself up with his cloak, but now neither the lodge nor his benefactor was there. There were only thoughts, clearly expressed in words, thoughts that someone was uttering, or that he himself was formulating. Afterwards, when he recalled those thoughts, Pierre was convinced that someone outside himself had spoken them though the impressions of that day had evoked them. He had never, it seemed to him, been able to think and express his thoughts like that when awake. To endure war is the most difficult subordination of man's freedom to the law of God, the voice had said. Simplicity is submission to the will of God. You could not escape from him, and they are simple. They do not talk, but act. The spoken word is silver, but the unspoken is golden. Man can be master of nothing while he fears death, but he who does not fear it possesses all. If there were no suffering, man would not know his limitations, would not know himself. The hardest thing, Pierre went on thinking or hearing in his dream, is to be able, in your soul, to unite the meaning of all. To unite all? he asked himself. No, not to unite. Thoughts cannot be united, but to harness all these thoughts together is what we need. Yes, one must harness them, must harness them, he repeated to himself with inner rapture, feeling that these words, and they alone expressed what he wanted to say, and solved the question that tormented him. Yes, one must harness, it is time to harness, time to harness, time to harness, your excellency, your excellency, some voice was repeating, we must harness, it is time to harness. It was the voice of the groom trying to wake him. 
The sun shone straight into Pierre's face. He glanced at the dirty inyard, in the middle of which soldiers were watering their lean horses at the pump while carts were passing out of the gate. Pierre turned away with repugnance, and closing his eyes quickly fell back on the carriage seat. No, I don't want that. I don't want to see and understand that. I want to understand what was revealing itself to me in my dream. One second more, and I should have understood it all. But what am I to do? Harness. But how can I harness everything? And Pierre felt with horror that the meaning of all he had seen and thought in the dream had been destroyed. The groom, the coachman, and the innkeeper told Pierre that an officer had come with the news that the French were already near Mosiasque, and that our men were leaving it. Pierre got up and, having told them to harness and overtake him, went on foot through the town. The troops were moving on, leaving about ten thousand wounded behind them. There were wounded in the yards, at the windows of the houses, and the streets were crowded with them. In the streets, around carts that were to take some of the wounded away, shouts, curses, and blows could be heard. Pierre offered the use of his carriage, which had overtaken him, to a wounded general he knew, and drove with him to Moscow. On the way Pierre was told of the death of his brother-in-law Anatoly, and of that of Prince Andrew. End of chapter 9. Recorded Sacramento, California, April 25th, 2009. War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 10, Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. On the 13th of August, Pierre reached Moscow. Close to the gates of the city, he was met by Count Rostopchin's adjutant. We have been looking for you everywhere, said the adjutant. The Count wants to see you particularly. He asks you to come to him at once on a very important matter. Without going home, Pierre took a cab and drove to see the Moscow commander-in-chief. Count Rostopchin had only that morning returned to town from his summer villa at Sokolniki. The anteroom and reception room of his house were full of officials, who had been summoned or had come for orders. Vasilchikov and Platov had already seen the count and explained to him that it was impossible to defend Moscow and that it would have to be surrendered. Though this news was being concealed from the inhabitants, the officials, the heads of the various government departments, knew that Moscow would soon be in the enemy's hands, just as Count Rostopchin himself knew it, and to escape personal responsibility, they had all come to the governor to ask how they were to deal with their various departments. As Pierre was entering the reception room, a courier from the army came out of Rostopchin's private room. In answer to questions with which he was greeted, the courier made a despairing gesture with his hand and passed through the room. While waiting in the reception room, Pierre with weary eyes watched the various officials, old and young, military and civilian, who were there. They all seemed dissatisfied and uneasy. Pierre went up to a group of men, one of whom he knew. After greeting Pierre, they continued their conversation. If they were sent out and brought back again later on, it will do no harm. But as things are now, one can't answer for anything. But you see what he writes, said another, pointing to a printed sheet he held in his hand. That is another matter. That is necessary for the people, said the first. What is it? asked Pierre. Oh, it's a fresh broadsheet. Pierre took it and began reading. His Serene Highness has passed through Mosheisk in order to join up with the troops moving toward him and has taken up a strong position where the enemy will not soon attack him. 
48 guns with ammunition had been sent him from here, and His Serene Highness says he will defend Moscow to the last drop of blood and is even ready to fight in the streets. Do not be upset, brothers, that the law courts are closed, things have to be put in order, and we will deal with villains in our own way. When the time comes, I shall want both town and peasant lads, and will raise the cry a day or two beforehand, but they are not wanted yet, so I hold my peace. An axe will be useful, a hunting spear not bad, but a three-pronged fork will be best of all. A Frenchman is no heavier than a sheaf of rye. Tomorrow, after dinner, I shall take the Iberian icon of the Mother of God to the wounded in the Katrin Hospital, where we will have some water blessed. That will help them to get well quicker. I, too, am well now. One of my eyes was sore, but now I am on the lookout with both. But military men have told me that it is impossible to fight in the town, said Pierre, and that the position... Well, of course, that is what we were saying, replied the first speaker. And what does he mean by one of my eyes was sore, but now I am on the lookout with both, asked Pierre. The count had a sigh, replied the adjutant, smiling, and was very much upset when I told him people had come to ask what was the matter with him. By the by, Count, he added suddenly, addressing Pierre with a smile, we heard that you have family troubles, and that the countess, your wife... I have heard nothing, Pierre replied unconcernedly. But what have you heard? Oh, well, you know, people often invent things. I only say what I heard. But what did you hear? Well, they say, continued the adjutant with the same smile, that the countess, your wife, is preparing to go abroad. I expect it is nonsense. Possibly, remarked Pierre, looking about him absent-mindedly. And who is that? he asked, indicating a short old man in a clean blue peasant overcoat with a big snow-white beard and eyebrows and a ruddy face. He, that's a tradesman, that is to say, he is the restaurant keeper, Vereshchagin. Perhaps you have heard of that affair with the proclamation. Oh, so that is Vereshchagin, said Pierre, looking at the firm, calm face of the old man, and seeking any indication of his being a traitor. That is not he himself, that is the father of the fellow who wrote the proclamation, said the adjutant. The young man is in prison, and I expect it will go hard with him. An old gentleman wearing a star, and another official, a German wearing a cross round his neck, approached the speaker. It is a complicated story, you know, said the adjutant. That proclamation appeared about two months ago. The count was informed of it. He gave orders to investigate the matter. Gabriel Ivanovich here made the inquiries. The proclamation had passed through exactly 63 hands. He asked one, From whom did you get it? From so-and-so. He went to the next one. From whom did you get it? And so on till he reached Vereshchagin, a half-educated tradesman, you know, a pet of a trader, said the adjutant, smiling. They asked, who gave it you? And the point is that we knew whom he had it from. 
he could only have had it from the postmaster but evidently they had come to some understanding he replied from no one i made it up myself they threatened and questioned him but he stuck to that i made it up myself and so it was reported to the count who sent for the man from whom did you get the proclamation i wrote it myself well you know the count said the adjutant cheerfully with a smile of pride he fled up dreadfully and just think of the fellow's audacity lying and obstinacy and the count wanted him to say it was from klyucharev i understand said pierre not at all rejoined the adjutant in dismay klyucharev had his own sins to answer for without that and that is why he has been banished but the point is that the count was much annoyed how could you have written it yourself said he and he took up the hamburg gazette that was lying on the table here it is you did not write it yourself but translated it and translated it abominably because you don't even know french you fool and what do you think no said he i have not read any papers i made it up myself if that is so you are a traitor and i will have you tried and you will be hanged say from whom you had it i have seen no papers i made it up myself and that was the end of it the count had the father fetched but the fellow stuck to it he was sent for trial and condemned to hard labor, I believe. Now the father has come to intercede for him. But he's a good-for-nothing lad. You know, that sort of tradesman's son, a dandy and lady killer. He attended some lectures somewhere and imagines that the devil is no match for him. That is the sort of fellow he is. His father keeps a cookshop here by the stone bridge, and you know there was a large icon of God Almighty painted with a scepter in one hand and an orb in the other. Well, he took that icon home with him for a few days, and what did he do? He found some scoundrel of a painter. End of chapter 10 Recording by Eva Harnick Ponte Vedra, Florida. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Eleven, read for LibriVox.org by Geneva. In the middle of this fresh tale, Pierre was summoned to Commander in Chief. When he entered the private room, Count Rostopchin, puckering his face, was rubbing his forehead and eyes with his hand. A short man was saying something, but when Pierre entered, he stopped speaking and went out. "'Oh, how do you do, great warrior?' said Rostopchin as soon as the short man had left the room. "'We have heard of a powers, but that's not the point. Between ourselves, monsieur, do you belong to the Masons?' He went on severely as though there was something wrong about it which he nevertheless intended to pardon pierre remained silent i am well informed my friend but i am aware that they are masons and i hope that you are not one of those who on pretence of saving mankind wish to ruin russia yes i am a mason pierre replied there you see monsieur I expect to know that Messias Spronsky and Magnitsky have been deported to their proper place. Mr. Klusharev has been treated in the same way, and so have others who on the plea of building up the Temple of Solomon have tried to destroy the Temple of their fatherland. You can understand that there are reasons for this, and that I could not have excited Postmaster had he not been a harmful person. 
It has now come to my knowledge that you lent him your carriage for his removal from town, and that you have even accepted papers from him for safe custody. I like you and don't wish you any harm, and, as you are only half my age, I advise you, as a father would, to cease all communication with men of that stamp and to leave here as soon as possible. But what did Klusharev do wrong, Count? asked Pierre. That is for me to know, but not for you to ask, shouted Rostopchin. If he is accused of circulating Napoleon's proclamation, it is not proved that he did so, said Pierre without looking at Rostopchin and Vershchagin. There we are, Rostopchin shouted at Pierre louder than before, frowning suddenly. Vershchagin is a renegade and a traitor who will be punished as he deserves said he with the vindictive heat with which people speak when recalling an insult. But I did not summon you to discuss my actions, but to give you advice, or an order if you prefer it. I beg you to leave the town and break off all communication with such men as Klusha Raff, and I will knock the nonsense out of anybody. But, probably realizing that he was shouting at Bazukhov, who so far was not guilty of anything, he added, taking Pierre's hand in a friendly manner. We are on the eve of a public disaster, and I haven't time to be polite to everybody who has business with me. My head is sometimes in a whirl. Well, mon cher, what are you doing personally? Why, nothing, answered Pierre without raising his eyes or changing the thoughtful expression on his face. The Count frowned. A word of friendly advice, mon cher. Be off as soon as you can. That's all I have to tell you. Happy he who has ears to hear. Goodbye, my dear fellow. Oh, by the by, he shouted through the doorway after Pierre. Is it true that the contest has fallen into the clutches of the Holy Fathers of the Society of Jesus? Pierre did not answer and left Rostopchin's room, more sullen and angry than he had ever before shown himself. When he reached home, it was already getting dark. Some eight people had come to see him that evening the secretary of our committee, the colonel of his battalion, his steward, his major-domo, and the various petitioners. They all had business with Pierre and wanted decisions from him. Pierre did not understand and was not interested in any of these questions and only answered them in order to get rid of these people. When left alone at last, he opened and read his wife's letter. They, the soldiers at the battery, Prince Andrew killed. That old man. Simplicity is submission to God. Suffering is necessary. The meaning of all. One must harness. My wife is getting married. One must forget and understand. And going to his bed, he threw himself on it, without undressing and immediately fell asleep. When he awoke next morning, the major domo came to inform him that a special messenger, a police officer, had come from Count Rostopchin to know whether Count Bezukhov had left or was leaving the town. A dozen persons who had business with Pierre were waiting him in the drawing room. Pierre dressed hurriedly and, instead of going to see them, went to the back porch and out through the gate. From that time till the end of the destruction of Moscow, no one of Bezukhov's household, despite all the search they made, saw Pierre again or knew where he was. End of chapter 11《Peace, Book 11, Chapter 12, Read for LibriVox.org by Paul McCartan. The Rostovs remained in Moscow till the 1st of September, that is, till the eve of the enemy's entry into the city. After Petya had joined Obolensky's regiment of Cossacks and left for Belaya Serkov, where that regiment was forming, the countess was seized with terror. The thought that both her sons were at the war, had both gone from under her wing, that today or tomorrow either or both of them might be killed like the three sons of one of her acquaintances, 
struck her that summer, for the first time, with cruel clearness. She tried to get Nicholas back, and wished to go herself to join Petya, or to get him an appointment somewhere in Petersburg, but neither of these proved possible. Petya could not return unless his regiment did so, or unless he was transferred to another regiment on active service. Nicholas was somewhere with the army, and had not sent a word since his last letter, in which he had given a detailed account of his meeting with Princess Mary. The Countess did not sleep at night, or when she did fall asleep, dreamed that she saw her sons lying dead. After many consultations and conversations, the Count at last devised means to tranquilize her. He got Petya transferred from Obolensky's regiment to Basukov's, which was in training near Moscow. Though Petya would remain in the service, this transfer would give the Countess the consolation of seeing at least one of her sons under her wing, and she hoped to arrange matters for her Petya so as not to let him go again, but always get him appointed to places where he could not possibly take part in the battle. As long as Nicholas alone was in danger, the Countess imagined that she loved her firstborn more than all her other children, and even reproached herself for it. But when her youngest, the scapegrace who had been bad at lessons, was always breaking things in the house and making himself a nuisance to everybody, that snub-nosed Petya with his merry black eyes and fresh rosy cheeks where soft down was just beginning to show, when he was thrown amid those big, dreadful, cruel men who were fighting somewhere about something, and apparently finding pleasure in it, then his mother thought she loved him more, much more, than all her other children. The nearer the time came for Petya to return, the more uneasy grew the Countess. She began to think she would never live to see such happiness. The presence of Sonia, of her beloved Natasha, or even of her husband, irritated her. What do I want with them? I want no one but Petya, she thought. At the end of August, the Rostovs received another letter from Nicholas. He wrote from the province of Arones where he had been sent to procure remounts. But that letter did not set the Countess at ease. Knowing that one son was out of danger, she became the more anxious about Petya. Though by the 20th of August, nearly all of the Rostov's acquaintances had left Moscow, and though everybody tried to persuade the Countess to get away as quickly as possible, she would not bear of leaving before her treasure, her adored Petya, returned. On the 28th of August he arrived. The passionate tenderness with which his mother received him did not please the 16-year-old officer. Though she concealed from him her intention of keeping him under her wing, Petya guessed her designs, and instinctively fearing that he might give way to emotion when with her, might become womanish, as he termed it to himself. He treated her coldly, avoided her, and during his stay in Moscow, attached himself exclusively to Natasha, for whom he had always had a particularly brotherly tenderness, almost lover-like. Owing to the Count's customary carelessness, nothing was ready for their departure by the 28th of August and the carts that were to come from their Ryazan and Moscow estates to remove their household belongings did not arrive till the 30th. From the 28th till the 31st, all Moscow was in a bustle and commotion. Every day, thousands of men wounded at Borodino were brought in by the Dorogomilov gate and taken to various parts of Moscow and thousands of carts conveyed the inhabitants and their possessions out by the other gates. In spite of Rostopchin's broadsheets, or because of them, or independently of them, 
the strangest and most contradictory rumours were current in the town. Some said that no one was to be allowed to leave the city. Others, on the contrary, said that all the icons had been taken out of the churches and everybody was to be ordered to leave. Some said there had been another battle after Borodino at which the French had been routed, while others, on the contrary, reported that the Russian army had been destroyed. Some talked about the Moscow militia which, preceded by the clergy, would go to the Three Hills. Others whispered that Augustine had been forbidden to leave, that traitors had been seized, that the peasants were rioting and robbing people on their way from Moscow, and so on. But all this was only talk. In reality, though the Council of Philly, at which it was decided to abandon Moscow, had not yet been held, both those who went away and those who remained behind felt, though they did not show it, that Moscow would certainly be abandoned, and that they ought to get away as quickly as possible and save their belongings. It was felt that everything would suddenly break up and change, but up to the 1st of September nothing had done so. As a criminal who is being led to execution knows that he must die immediately, but yet looks about him and straightens the cap that is awry on his head. So Moscow involuntarily continued its wanted life, though it knew that the time of its destruction was near, when the conditions of life, to which its people were accustomed to submit, would be completely upset. During the three days preceding the occupation of Moscow, the whole Rostov family was absorbed in various activities. The head of the family, Count Ilya Rostov, continually drove about the city, collecting the current rumours from all sides, and gave superficial and hasty orders at home about the preparations for their departure. The Countess watched the things being packed, was dissatisfied with everything, was constantly in pursuit of Petya, who was always running away from her and was jealous of Natasha, with whom he spent all his time. Sonia alone directed the practical side of matters by getting things packed. But of late, Sonia had been particularly sad and silent. Nicholas's letter, in which he mentioned Princess Mary, had elicited, in her presence, joyous comments from the Countess, who saw an intervention of Providence in this meeting of the Princess and Nicholas. I was never pleased at Balkonsky's engagement to Natasha, said the Countess, but I always wanted Nicholas to marry the Princess, and had a presentiment that it would happen. What a good thing it would be! Sonia felt that this was true, that the only possibility of retrieving the Rostov's affairs was by Nicholas marrying a rich woman and that the princess was a good match. It was very bitter for her, but despite her grief, or perhaps just because of it, she took on herself all the difficult work of directing the storing and packing of their things, and was busy for whole days. The count and countess turned to her when they had any orders to give. Petya and Natasha, on the contrary, far from helping their parents, were generally a nuisance and hindrance to everyone. Almost all day long the house resounded with their running feet, their cries and their spontaneous laughter. They laughed and were gay, not because there was any reason to laugh, but because gaiety and mirth were in their hearts, and so everything that happened was a cause for gaiety and laughter to them. Petya was in high spirits, because having left home a boy, he had returned, as everybody told him, a fine young man. Because he was at home, because he had left Belias Serkov, where there was no hope of soon taking part in a battle, and had come to Moscow, where there was to be fighting in a few days. And chiefly because Natasha, 
whose lead he always followed, was in high spirits. Natasha was gay because she had been sad too long, and now nothing reminded her of the cause of her sadness, and because she was feeling well. She was also happy because she had someone to adore her. The adoration of others was a lubricant the wheels of her machine needed to make them run freely, and Petya adored her. Above all, they were gay because there was a war near Moscow. There would be fighting at the town gates. Arms were being given out. Everybody was escaping, going away somewhere. And in general, something extraordinary was happening. And that is always exciting, especially to the young. End of chapter 12. Recording by Paul McCartan in Waterford, Ireland, February 2009. War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 13, read for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. On Saturday, the 31st of August, everything in the Rostovs' house seemed topsy-turvy. All the doors were open, all the furniture was being carried out or moved about, and the mirrors and pictures had been taken down. There were trunks in the rooms, and hay, wrapping paper, and ropes were scattered about. The peasants and house serfs carrying out the things were treading heavily on the parquet floors. The yard was crowded with peasant carts, some loaded high and already corded up, others still empty. The voices and footsteps of the many servants and of the peasants who had come with the carts resounded as they shouted to one another in the yard and in the house. The count had been out since morning. The countess had a headache brought on by all the noise and turmoil and was lying down in the new sitting-room with a vinegar compress on her head. Petya was not at home. He had gone to visit a friend with whom he meant to obtain a transfer from the militia to the active army. Sonya was in the ballroom looking after the packing of the glass and china. Natasha was sitting on the floor of her dismantled room with dresses, ribbons and scarves strewn all about her, gazing fixedly at the floor and holding in her hands the old ball dress already out of fashion which she had worn at her first Petersburg ball. Natasha was ashamed of doing nothing when everyone else was so busy, and several times that morning had tried to set to work, but her heart was not in it, and she could not and did not know how to do anything except with all her heart and all her might. For a while she had stood beside Sonya while the china was being packed and tried to help, but soon gave it up and went to her room to pack her own things. At first she found it amusing to give away dresses and ribbons to the maids, but when that was done and what was left had still to be packed, she found it dull. Dunyasha, you pack. You will, won't you, dear? And when Dunyasha willingly promised to do it all for her, Natasha sat down on the floor, took her old ball dress and fell into a reverie quite unrelated to what ought to have occupied her thoughts now. She was roused from her reverie by the talk of the maids in the next room, which was theirs, and by the sound of their hurried footsteps going to the back porch. Natasha got up and looked out of the window. An enormously long row of carts full of wounded men had stopped in the street. 
the housekeeper the old nurse the cooks coachmen maids footmen postilions and scullions stood at the gate staring at the wounded natasha throwing a clean pocket handkerchief over her hair and holding an end of it in each hand went out into the street the former housekeeper old mavra kuzminichnya had stepped out of the crowd by the gate gone up to a cart with a hood constructed of bast mats and was speaking to a pale young officer who lay inside natasha moved a few steps forward and stopped shyly still holding her handkerchief and listened to what the housekeeper was saying then you have nobody in moscow she was saying you would be more comfortable somewhere in a house in ours for instance the family are leaving i don't know if it would be allowed replied the officer in a weak voice here is our commanding officer ask him and he pointed to a stout major who was walking back along the street past the row of carts natasha glanced with frightened eyes at the face of the wounded officer and at once went to meet the major may the wounded man stay in our house she asked the major raised his hand to his cap with a smile which one do you want mamselle said he screwing up his eyes and smiling natasha quietly repeated her question and her face and whole manner were so serious though she was still holding the ends of her handkerchief that the major ceased smiling and after some reflection as if considering in how far the thing was possible replied in the affirmative oh yes why not they may he said with a slight inclination of her head natasha stepped back quickly to mavra kuzminichnya who stood talking compassionately to the officer they may he says they may whispered natasha the cart in which the officer lay was turned into the rostov's yard and dozens of carts with wounded men began at the invitation of the townsfolk to turn into the yards and to draw up at the entrances of the houses in povarskaya street natasha was evidently pleased to be dealing with new people outside the ordinary routine of her life she and mavra kuzminichnya tried to get as many of the wounded as possible into their yard your papa must be told though said mavra kuzminichnya never mind never mind what does it matter for one day we can move into the drawing-room they can have all our half of the house there now young lady you do take things into your head even if we put them into the wing the men's room or the nurse's room we must ask permission well i will ask natasha ran into the house and went on tiptoe through the half-open door into the sitting-room where there was a smell of vinegar and hoffman's drops are you asleep mamma oh what sleep said the countess waking up just as she was dropping into a doze Mama, darling, said Natasha, kneeling by her mother and bringing her face close to her mother's. I am sorry, forgive me. I will never do it again. I woke you up. Mavra Kuzminichnya had sent me. They have brought some wounded here, officers. Will you let them come? They have nowhere to go. I knew you would let them come, she said quickly, all in one breath. What officers? Whom have they brought? i don't understand anything about it said the countess natasha laughed and the countess too smiled slightly i knew you would give permission so i will tell them and having kissed her mother natasha got up and went to the door in the hall she met her father who had returned with bad news we have stayed too long said the count with involuntary vexation the club is closed and the police are leaving papa is it all right i have invited some of the wounded into the house said natasha of course it is he answered absently 
that is not the point. I beg you not to indulge in trifles now, but to help to pack, and tomorrow we must go. Go, go! And the count gave a similar order to the major domo and the servants. At dinner, Petya, having returned home, told them the news he had heard. He said the people had been getting arms in the Kremlin, and that though Rostopchin's broadsheet had said that he would sound a call two or three days in advance, the order had certainly already been given for everyone to go armed to the three hills tomorrow, and that there would be a big battle there. The countess looked with timid horror at her son's eager, excited face as he said this. She realized that if she said a word about his not going to the battle, she knew he enjoyed the thought of the impending engagement, he would say something about man, honor, and the fatherland, something senseless, masculine, and obstinate, which there would be no contradicting, and her plans would be spoiled, and so, hoping to arrange to leave before then and take Petya with her as their protector and defender, she did not answer him, but after dinner called the count aside and implored him with tears to take her away quickly that very night, if possible. With a woman's involuntary loving cunning, she who till then had not shown any alarm, said that she would die of fright if they did not leave that very night. Without any pretense, she was now afraid of everything. End of chapter 13 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 14 Recording for DeepliVox.org by Eva Harnick Madame Schoss, who had been out to visit her daughter, increased the countess's fear still more by telling her what she had seen at a spirit dealer's in Miaznitsky Street. When returning by that street, she had been unable to pass because of a drunken crowd rioting in front of the shop. She had taken a cab and driven home by a side street, and the cabman had told her that the people were breaking open the barrels at the drink store, having received orders to do so. After dinner... The whole Rostov household set to work with enthusiastic haste, packing their belongings and preparing for their departure. The old count, suddenly setting to work, kept passing from the yard to the house and back again, shouting confused instructions to the hurrying people and flurrying them still more. Petya directed things in the yard. Sonya, owing to the Count's contradictory orders, lost her head and did not know what to do. The servants ran noisily about the house and yard, shouting and disputing. Natasha, with the ardor characteristic of all she did, suddenly set to work too. At first her intervention in the business of packing was received skeptically. Everybody expected some prank from her and did not wish to obey her. But she resolutely and passionately demanded obedience, grew angry and nearly cried because they did not heed her, and at last succeeded in making them believe her. Her first exploit, which cost her immense effort and established her authority, was the packing of the carpets. The Count had valuable goblin tapestries and Persian carpets in the house. When Natasha set to work, two cases were standing open in the ballroom, one almost full up with crockery, the other with carpets. There was also much china standing on the tables, and still more was being brought in from the storeroom. 
A third case was needed, and servants had gone to fetch it. Sonya, wait a bit. We'll pack everything into these, said Natasha. You can't, miss. We have tried to, said the butler's assistant. No, wait a minute, please. And Natasha began rapidly taking out of the case dishes and plates wrapped in paper. The dishes must go in here among the carpets, said she. Why, it is a mercy if we can get the carpets alone into three cases, said the butler's assistant. Oh, wait, please. And Natasha began rapidly and deftly sorting out the things. These aren't needed, said she, putting aside some plates of Kiev ware. These, yes, these must go among the carpets, she said, referring to the Saxony china dishes. Don't, Natasha, leave it alone. We'll get it all packed, urged Sonya reproachfully. What a young lady she is, remarked the major domo. But Natasha would not give in. She turned everything out and began quickly repacking, deciding that the inferior Russian carpets and unnecessary crockery should not be taken at all. When everything had been taken out of the cases, they recommenced packing, and it turned out that when the cheapest things not worth taking had nearly all been rejected, the valuable ones really did all go into the two cases. Only the lid of the case containing the carpets would not shut down. A few more things might have been taken out, but Natasha insisted on having her own way. She packed, repacked, pressed, bade the butler's assistant and Petya, whom she had drawn into the business of packing, press on the lid and made desperate efforts herself. That's enough, Natasha, said Sonya. I see you were right, but just take out the top one. I won't, cried Natasha. With one hand holding back the hair that hung over her perspiring face, while with the other she pressed down the carpets. Now, press, Petya, press, Vasilich, press hard, she cried. The carpets yielded and the lid closed. Natasha, clapping her hands, screamed with delight and tears fell from her eyes. But this only lasted a moment. She at once set to work afresh, and they now trusted her completely. The count was not angry even when they told him that Natasha had countermanded an order of his, and the servants now came to her to ask whether a cart was sufficiently loaded and whether it might be corded up. Thanks to Natasha's directions, the work now went on expeditiously, unnecessary things were left, and the most valuable packed as compactly as possible. But hard as they all worked, till quite late that night, they could not get everything packed. The countess had fallen asleep, and the count, having put off their departure till next morning, went to bed. Sonya and Natasha slept in the sitting room without undressing. That night, another wounded man was driven down the Povarskaya, and Mavra Kuzminichnya, who was standing at the gate, had him brought into the Rostov's yard. Mavra Kuzminichnya concluded that he was a very important man. He was being conveyed in a calèche with a raised hood and was quite covered by an apron. On the box beside the driver sat a venerable old attendant. A doctor and two soldiers followed the carriage in a cart. Please come in here. The masters are going away and the whole house will be empty, said the old woman to the old attendant. Well, perhaps, said he with a sigh, we don't expect to get him home alive. We have a house of our own in Moscow, but it is a long way from here, and there's nobody living in it. Do us the honor to come in, 
There is plenty of everything in the master's house. Come in, said Mavra Kuzminichnya. Is he very ill? she asked. The attendant made a hopeless gesture. We don't expect to get him home. We must ask the doctor. And the old servant got down from the box and went up to the cart. All right, said the doctor. The old servant returned to the calèche, looked into it, shook his head disconsolately, told the driver to turn into the yard, and stopped beside Mavra Kuzminichnya. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, she murmured. She invited them to take the wounded man into the house. The masters won't object, she said. But they had to avoid carrying the man upstairs, and so they took him into the wing and put him in the room that had been Madame Chaucer's. This wounded man was Prince Andrew Bolkonsky. End of chapter 14 Recording by Eva Harnick War and Peace Book 11, Chapter 15 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick Moscow's last day had come. It was a clear, bright autumn day, a Sunday. The church bells everywhere were ringing for service, just as usual on Sundays. Nobody seemed yet to realize what awaited the city. Only two things indicated the social condition of Moscow. The rebel, that is the poor people, and the price of commodities. An enormous crowd of factory hands, house serfs and peasants, with whom some officials, seminarists and gentry were mingled, had gone early that morning to the three hills. Having waited there for Rostopchin, who did not turn up, they became convinced that Moscow would be surrendered and then dispersed all about the town to the public houses and cookshops. Prices, too, that day indicated the state of affairs. The price of weapons, of gold, of carts and horses kept rising, but the value of paper money and city articles kept falling, so that by midday there were instances of carters removing valuable goods such as cloths and receiving in payment a half of what they carted, while peasant horses were fetching five hundred rubles each, and furniture, mirrors and bronzes were being given away for nothing. In the Rostov stayed old-fashioned house, the dissolution of former conditions of life was but little noticeable. As to the serfs, the only indication was that three out of their huge retinue disappeared during the night, but nothing was stolen. And as to the value of their possessions, the thirty peasant carts that had come in from their estates and which many people envied proved to be extremely valuable, and they were offered enormous sums of money for them. Not only were huge sums offered for the horses and carts, but on the previous evening and early in the morning of the 1st of September, orderlies and servants sent by wounded officers came to the Rostovs and wounded men dragged themselves there from the Rostovs and from neighboring houses where they were accommodated, and treating the servants to try to get them a lift out of Moscow. The major domo to whom these entreaties were addressed, though he was sorry for the wounded, resolutely refused, saying that he dared not even mention the matter to the count. Pity these wounded men as one might, 
it was evident that if they were given one card there would be no reason to refuse another or all the cards and one's own carriages as well thirty cards could not save all the wounded and in the general catastrophe one could not disregard oneself and one's own family so thought the major domo on his master's behalf on waking up that morning count Ilya rostov left his bedroom softly so as not to wake the countess who had fallen asleep only toward morning and came out to the porch in his lilac dressing gown in the yard stood the carts ready corded the carriages were at the front porch the major domo stood at the porch talking to an elderly orderly and a pale young officer with a bandaged arm on seeing the count the major domo made a significant and stern gesture to them both to go away well vasilich is everything ready asked the count and stroking his bald head he looked good-naturedly at the officer and the orderly and nodded to them he liked to see new faces we can harness at once your excellency well that is right as soon as the countess wakes we'll be off god willing what is it gentlemen he added turning to the officer are you staying in my house the officer came nearer and suddenly his face flushed crimson count be so good as to allow me for god's sake to get into some corner of one of your carts i have nothing here with me i shall be all right on a loaded cart before the officer had finished speaking the orderly made the same request on behalf of his master oh yes 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 said the count hastily i shall be very pleased very pleased vasilich you see to it just unload one or two carts well what of it do what is necessary said the count muttering some indefinite order but at the same moment an expression of warm gratitude on the officer's face had already sealed the order the count looked around him in the yard at the gates at the window of the wings wounded officers and their orderlies were to be seen they were all looking at the count and moving toward the porch Please step into the gallery, Your Excellency, said the Major Domo. What are your orders about the pictures? The Count went into the house with him, repeating his order not to refuse the wounded who asked for a lift. Well, never mind. Some of the things can be unloaded, he added in a soft, confidential voice, as though afraid of being overheard. At nine o'clock, the countess woke up, and Matrina Timofeevna, who had been her lady's maid before her marriage, and now performed a sort of chief gendarme's duty for her, came to say that Madame Schoss was much offended, and the young lady's summer dresses could not be left behind. On inquiry, the countess learned that Madame Schoss was offended because her trunk had been taken down from its cart and all the loads were being uncorded and the luggage taken out of the carts to make room for wounded men whom the count, in the simplicity of his heart, had ordered that they should take with them. The countess sent for her husband. What is this, my dear? i hear that the luggage is being unloaded you know love i wanted to tell you countess dear an officer came to me to ask for a few cards for the wounded after all ours are things that can be bought but think what being left behind means to them really now in our own yard we ask them in ourselves and there are officers among them. You know, I think, my dear, 
Let them be taken. Where is the hurry? The Count spoke timidly, as he always did when talking of money matters. The Countess was accustomed to this tone as a precursor of news of something detrimental to the children's interests, such as the building of a new gallery or conservatory, the inauguration of a private theatre or an orchestra. She was accustomed always to oppose anything announced in that timid tone and considered it her duty to do so. She assumed her dolefully submissive manner and said to her husband, Listen to me, Count. You have managed matters so that we are getting nothing for the house, and now you wish to throw away all our all the children's property. You said yourself that we have a hundred thousand rubles worth of things in the house. I don't consent, my dear. I don't. Do as you please. It is the government's business to look after the wounded. They know that. Look at the Lopukins opposite. They cleared out everything two days ago. That is what other people do. It is only we who are such fools. If you have no pity on me, have some for the children. Flourishing his arms in despair, the Count left the room without replying. Papa, what are you doing that for? asked Natasha, who had followed him into her mother's room. Nothing. What business is it of yours? muttered the Count angrily. But I heard, said Natasha. Why does Mama object? What business is it of yours? cried the Count. Natasha stepped up to the window and pondered. Papa, here is Burr coming to see us, said she, looking out of the window. End of chapter 15 Recording by Eva Harnick Pontevedra, Florida. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Sixteen. Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick. Berg. The Rostov son-in-law was already a colonel wearing the orders of Vladimir and Anna, and he still filled the quiet and agreeable post of assistant to the head of the staff of the assistant commander of the first division of the second army. On the 1st of September he had come to Moscow from the army. He had nothing to do in Moscow but he had noticed that everyone in the army was asking for leave to visit Moscow and had something to do there. So he considered it necessary to ask for leave of absence for family and domestic reasons. Berg drove up to his father-in-law's house in his spruce little trap with a pair of sleek roans exactly like those of a certain prince. He looked attentively at the carts in the yard, and while going up to the porch, took out a clean pocket handkerchief and tied a knot in it. From the anteroom, Berg ran with smooth though impatient steps into the drawing room, where he embraced the count, kissed the hands of Natasha and Sonya, and hastened to inquire after Mamma's health. Health at a time like this, said the Count. Come, tell us the news. Is the army retreating, or will there be another battle? God Almighty alone can decide the fate of our fatherland, Papa, said Berg. The army is burning with a spirit of heroism, and the leaders, so to say, have now assembled in council. No one knows what is coming. But, in general, I can tell you, Papa, that such a heroic spirit, the truly antique valor of the Russian army, which they, which it, 
he corrected himself, has shown or displayed in the battle of the twenty-sixth, there are no words worthy to do it justice. I tell you, papa. He smote himself on the breast as a general he had heard speaking had done. But Berg did it a trifle late, for he should have stuck his breast at the words Russian army. I tell you frankly that we, the commanders, far from having to urge the man on or anything of that kind, could hardly restrain those, those, yes, those exploits of antique valor, he went on rapidly. General Barclay de Tolly risked his life everywhere at the head of the troops, I can assure you. Our corps was stationed on a hillside, you can imagine. And Berg related all that he remembered of the various tales he had heard those days. Natasha watched him with an intent gaze that confused him, as if she were trying to find in his face the answer to some question. Altogether, such heroism as was displayed by the Russian warriors cannot be imagined or adequately praised, said Berg, glancing round at Natasha, as if anxious to conciliate her, replying to her intent look with a smile. Russia is not in Moscow. She lives in the hearts of her sons. Isn't it so, papa? said he. Just then the countess came in from the sitting room with a weary and dissatisfied expression. Burke hurriedly jumped up, kissed her hand, asked about her house, and, swaying his head from side to side to express sympathy, remained standing beside her. Yes, mamma, I tell you sincerely that these are hard and sad times for every Russian. But why are you so anxious? You have still time to get away. I can't think what the servants are about, said the countess, turning to her husband. I have just been told that nothing is ready yet. Somebody, after all, must see to things. One misses Mitenka at such times. There won't be any end to it. The count was about to say something, but evidently restrained himself. He got up from his chair and went to the door. At that moment, Berg drew out his handkerchief as if to blow his nose, and, seeing the knot in it, pondered, shaking his head sadly and significantly. And I have a great favor to ask of you, papa, said he. Hm, said the count and stopped. I was driving past Yusupov's house just now, said Berg with a laugh, when the steward, a man I know, ran out and asked me whether I wouldn't buy something. I went in out of curiosity, you know, and there is a small chiffonier and a dressing table. You know how dear Vera wanted a chiffonier like that, and how we had a dispute about it. At the mention of the chiffonier and dressing table, Berg involuntarily changed his tone to one of pleasure at his admirable domestic arrangements. And it is such a beauty. It pulls out and has a secret English drawer, you know. And dear Vera has long wanted one. I wish to give her a surprise, you see. I saw so many of those peasant carts in your yard. Please let me have one. I will pay the man well and... The Count frowned and coughed. Ask the Countess. I don't give orders. If it is inconvenient, please don't, said Berg. Only I so wanted it for dear Vera's sake. Oh, go to the devil, all of you. To the devil, the devil, the devil, cried the old count. My head is in a whirl. And he left the room. The countess began to cry. Yes, mamma, yes, these are very hard times, said Berg. Natasha left the room with her father, and, as if finding it difficult to reach some decision, first followed him and then ran downstairs.
Petya was in the porch, engaged in giving out weapons to the servants who were to leave Moscow. The loaded carts were still standing in the yard. Two of them had been uncorded, and the wounded officer was climbing into one of them, helped by an orderly. Do you know what it is about? Petya asked Natasha. She understood that he meant what were their parents quarreling about. She did not answer. It is because Papa wanted to give up all the cards to the wounded, said Petya. Vasilich told me. I consider... I consider... Natasha suddenly almost shouted, turning her angry face to Petya. I consider it so horrid, so abominable, so... I don't know what. Are we despicable Germans? Her throat quivered with convulsive sobs, and afraid of weakening and letting the force of her anger run to waste, she turned and rushed headlong up the stairs. Berg was sitting beside the countess, consoling her with the respectful attention of a relative. The count, pipe in hand, was pacing up and down the room, when Natasha, her face distorted by anger, burst in like a tempest, and approached her mother with rapid steps. It is horrid, it is abominable, she screamed. You can't possibly have ordered it. Berg and the countess looked at her, perplexed and frightened. The count stood still at the window and listened. Mama, it is impossible. See what is going on in the yard, she cried. They will be left. What's the matter with you? Who are they? What do you want? Why, the wounded? It is impossible, Mama. It is monstrous. No, Mama, darling, is not the thing. Please forgive me, darling, Mama. What does it matter what we take away? Only look what is going on in the yard. Mama, it is impossible. The count stood by the window and listened without turning round. Suddenly he sniffed and put his face closer to the window. The countess glanced at her daughter, saw her face full of shame for her mother, saw her agitation, and understood why her husband did not turn to look at her now, and she glanced round quite disconcerted. Oh, do as you like. Am I hindering anyone? she said, not surrendering at once. Mama, darling, forgive me. But the countess pushed her daughter away and went up to her husband. My dear, you order what is right. You know I don't understand about it, said she, dropping her eyes shamefacedly. The eggs, the eggs are teaching the hen, muttered the count through tears of joy, and he embraced his wife, who was glad to hide her look of shame on his breast. Papa, Mama, may I see to it? May I? asked Natasha. We will still take all the most necessary things. The count nodded affirmatively, and Natasha, at the rapid pace at which she used to run when playing at tag, ran through the ballroom to the anteroom and downstairs into the yard. The servants gathered round Natasha, but could not believe the strange order she brought them until the count himself, in his wife's name, confirmed the order to give up all the carts to the wounded and take the trunks to the storerooms. When they understood that order, the servants set to work at this new task with pleasure and zeal. It no longer seemed strange to them, but on the contrary, it seemed the only thing that could be done just as a quarter of an hour before, it had not seemed strange to anyone that the wounded should be left behind and the goods carted away, but that had seemed the only thing to do. The whole household, as if to atone for not having done it sooner, set eagerly to work at the new task of placing the wounded in the carts. The wounded dragged themselves out of their rooms and stood 
with pale but happy faces round the carts. The news that carts were to be had spread to the neighboring houses from which wounded men began to come into the Rostov's yard. Many of the wounded asked them not to unload the carts, but only to let them sit on the top of the things. But the work of unloading once started could not be arrested. It seemed not to matter whether all or only half the things were left behind. Cases full of china, bronzes, pictures and mirrors that had been so carefully packed the night before now lay about the yard and still they went on searching for and finding possibilities of unloading this or that and letting the wounded have another and yet another cart. We can take four more men, said the steward. They can have my trap or else what is to become of them? Let them have my wardrobe cart, said the countess. Dunyasha can go with me in the carriage. They unloaded the wardrobe cart and sent it to take wounded men from a house two doors off. The whole household, servants included, was bright and animated. Natasha was in a state of rapturous excitement, such as she had not known for a long time. What could we fasten this on to? asked the servants, trying to fix a trunk on the narrow footboard behind the carriage. We must keep at least one cart. What is in it? asked Natasha. The Count's books. Leave it. Vasilich will put it away. It is not wanted. The phaeton was full of people, and there was a doubt as to where Count Peter could sit. On the box. You will sit on the box, won't you, Petya? cried Natasha. Sonya, too, was busy all this time, but the aim of her efforts was quite different from Natasha's. She was putting away the things that had to be left behind and making a list of them as the countess wished and she tried to get as much taken away with them as possible. End of chapter 16 Recording by Eva Harnick, Ponta Vedra, Florida War and Peace Book 11, Chapter 17 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick Before two o'clock in the afternoon, the Rostov's four carriages, packed full and with the horses harnessed, stood at the front door. One by one, the carts with the wounded had moved out of the yard. The calash in which Prince Andrew was being taken attracted Sonya's attention as it passed the front porch. With the help of a maid, she was arranging a seat for the countess in the huge high coach that stood at the entrance. Whose calash is that? she inquired, leaning out of the carriage window. Why, didn't you know, miss? replied the maid. The wounded prince, he spent the night in our house and is going with us. But who is it? What is his name? It is our intended, that was, Prince Bolkonsky himself. They say he's dying, replied the maid with a sigh. Sonya jumped out of the coach and ran to the countess. The countess, tired out and already dressed in shawl and bonnet for her journey, was pacing up and down the drawing-room, waiting for the household to assemble for the usual silent prayer with closed doors before starting. Natasha was not in the room. Mama, said Sonya. Prince Andrew is here, mortally wounded. He's going with us. The countess opened her eyes in dismay and, seizing Sonya's arm, glanced around. Natasha, she murmured. At that moment, this news 
had only one significance for both of them. They knew their Natasha, and alarm as to what would happen if she heard this news stifled all sympathy for the man they both liked. Natasha does not know yet, but he is going with us, said Sonya. You say he is dying? Sonya nodded. The countess put her arms around Sonya and began to cry. The ways of God are past finding out, she thought, feeling that the almighty hand, hitherto unseen, was becoming manifest in all that was now taking place. Well, Mamma, everything is ready. What's the matter? asked Natasha, as with animated face she ran into the room. Nothing, answered the countess. If everything is ready, let us start. And the countess bent over her reticule to hide her agitated face. Sonia embraced Natasha and kissed her. Natasha looked at her inquiringly. What is it? What has happened? Nothing. No. Is it something very bad for me? What is it? persisted Natasha with her quick intuition. Sonia sighed and made no reply. The Count, Petya, Madame Schoss, Mavra Kuzminichnya, and Vasilich came into the drawing room and, having closed the doors, they all sat down and remained for some moments silently seated without looking at one another. The Count was the first to rise and with a loud sigh crossed himself before the icon. All the others did the same. Then the Count embraced Mavra, Kuzminichnya and Vasilich, who were to remain in Moscow, and while they caught at his hand and kissed his shoulder, he patted their backs lightly with some vaguely affectionate and comforting words. The Countess went into the oratory, and there Sonya found her on her knees before the icons that had been left here and there hanging on the wall. The most precious ones, with which some family tradition was connected, were being taken with them. In the porch and in the yard, the man whom Petya had armed with swords and daggers, with trousers tucked inside their high boots and with belts and girdles tightened, were taking leave of those remaining behind. As is always the case at a departure, much had been forgotten or put in the wrong place, and for a long time two men-servants stood one on each side of the open door and the carriage steps waiting to help the countess in, while maids rushed with cushions and bundles from the house to the carriages, the calash, the phaeton, and back again. They always will forget everything, said the countess. Don't you know I can't sit like that? And Dunyasha, with clenched teeth, without replying, but with an aggrieved look on her face, hastily got into the coach to rearrange the seat. Oh, those servants, said the count, swaying his head. Ephim, the old coachman, who was the only one the countess trusted to drive her, sat perched up high on the box and did not so much as glance around at what was going on behind him. From thirty years' experience, he knew it would be some time yet before the order be off in God's name, would be given him. And he knew that even when it was said, he would be stopped once or twice more while they sent back to fetch something that had been forgotten, and even after that, he would again be stopped, and the countess herself would lean out of the window and beg him for the love of heaven to drive carefully down the hill. He knew all this, 
and therefore waited calmly for what would happen with more patience than the horses, especially the near one, the chestnut falcon, who was pawing the ground and chomping his bit. At last all were seated, the carriage steps were folded and pulled up, the door was shut, somebody was sent for a travelling case, and the countess leaned out and said what she had to say. Then Efim deliberately doffed his hat and began crossing himself. The postilion and all the other servants did the same. Off in God's name, said Efim, putting on his head. Start! The postilion started the horses. The off-pole horse tugged at his collar, the high springs creaked, and the body of the coach swayed. The footman sprang onto the box of the moving coach, which jolted as it passed out of the yard onto the uneven roadway. The other vehicles jolted in their turn, and the procession of carriages moved up the street. In the carriages, the Kalesh and the Peton all crossed themselves as they passed the church opposite the house. Those who were to remain in Moscow walked on either side of the vehicles, seeing the travellers off. Rarely had Natasha experienced so joyful a feeling as now, sitting in the carriage beside the countess and gazing at the slowly receding walls of forsaken, agitated Moscow. Occasionally she leaned out of the carriage window and looked back and then forward at the long train of wounded in front of them. Almost at the head of the line she could see the raised hood of Prince Andrew's calash. She did not know who was in it, but each time she looked at the procession her eyes sought that calash. She knew it was right in front. In Kudrino, from the Nikitsky, Preznya, and Podnovinsk streets came several other trains of vehicles similar to the Rostovs, and as they passed along the Sadovaya street, the carriages and carts formed two rows abreast. As they were going round the Sukhara water tower, Natasha, who was inquisitively and alertly scrutinizing the people driving or walking past, suddenly cried out in joyful surprise, Dear me, Mamma, Sonia, look, it is he. Who? Who? Look, yes, on my word, it is Bezukov, said Natasha, putting her head out of the carriage and staring at a tall, stout man, in a coachman's long coat, who from his manner of walking and moving was evidently a gentleman in disguise, and who was passing under the arch of the Sukharev Tower, accompanied by a small, sallow-faced, beardless old man in a frieze coat. Yes, it really is Bezukov in a coachman's coat, with a queer-looking old boy. Really, said Natasha, look, look. No, it isn't he. How can you talk such nonsense? Mamma, screamed Natasha, I will stake my head. It is he. I assure you. Stop, stop, she cried to the coachman. But the coachman could not stop, for from the Meschansky street came more carts and carriages, and the Rostovs were being shouted at to move on and not block the way. In fact, however, though now much farther off than before, the Rostovs all saw Pierre or someone extraordinarily like him, in a coachman's coat, going down the street with head bent and a serious face, beside a small, beardless old man who looked like a footman. That old man noticed a face thrust out of a carriage window, gazing at them, 
and respectfully touching Pierre's elbow, said something to him and pointed to the carriage. Pierre, evidently engrossed in thought, could not at first understand him. At length, when he had understood and looked in the direction the old man indicated, he recognized Natasha and, following his first impulse, stepped instantly and rapidly toward the coach. But having taken a dozen steps, he seemed to remember something and stopped. Natasha's face, leaning out of the window, beamed with quizzical kindliness. Peter Kirillovich, come here. We have recognized you. This is wonderful, she cried, holding out her hand to him. What are you doing? Why are you like this? Pierre took her outstretched hand and kissed it awkwardly as he walked along beside her while the coach still moved on. What is the matter, Count? asked the countess in a surprised and commiserating tone. What? What? Why? Don't ask me, said Pierre, and looked round at Natasha, whose radiant, happy expression, of which he was conscious without looking at her, filled him with enchantment. Are you remaining in Moscow, then? Pierre hesitated. In Moscow? he said in a questioning tone. Yes, in Moscow. Goodbye. Ah! Oh. If only I were a man, I would certainly stay with you. How splendid, said Natasha. Mama, if you will let me, I will stay. Pierre glanced absently at Natasha and was about to say something, but the countess interrupted him. You were at the battle, we heard. Yes, I was, Pierre answered. There will be another battle tomorrow, he began, but Natasha interrupted him. But what is the matter with you, Count? You are not like yourself. Oh, don't ask me. Don't ask me. I don't know myself. Tomorrow? But no, goodbye. Goodbye, he muttered. It is an awful time and dropping behind the carriage, he stepped onto the pavement. Natasha continued to lean out of the window for a long time, beaming at him with her kindly, slightly quizzical, happy smile. End of chapter 17 Recording by Eva Harnick, Ponte Vedra, Florida War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Eighteen. Read for LibriVox.org by Jeff. Chapter Eighteen. For the last two days, ever since leaving home, Pierre had been living in the empty house of his deceased benefactor, Basadev. This is how it happened. When he woke up on the morning after his return to Moscow and his interview with Count Rostovshin. He could not for some time make out where he was and what was expected of him. When he was informed that among others awaiting him in his reception room, there was a Frenchman who had brought a letter from his wife, the Countess Helene. He felt suddenly overcome by that sense of confusion and hopelessness to which he was up to scum. He felt that everything was now at an end, and all was in confusion and crumbling to pieces, that nobody was right or wrong. The future held nothing, and there was no escape from this position. Smiling unnaturally and muttering to himself, he first sat down on the sofa in an attitude of despair, then rose, went to the door of the reception room and peeped through the crack, returned flourishing his arms, and took up a book. His majordomo came in a second time to say that the Frenchman who had brought the letter from the Countess was very anxious to see him, if only for a minute 
and that someone from Bazadeep's widow had called to ask Pierre to take charge of her husband's book, as she herself was leaving for the country. Oh yes, in a minute. Wait. Well, no, no, of course. Go and say I will come directly. Pierre replied to the major domo. But as soon as the man had left the room, Pierre took up his hat, which was lying on the table, and went out of his study room by the other door. There was no one in the passage. He went along the whole length of this passage to the stairs, and frowning and rubbing his forehead with both hands, went down as far as the first landing. The hall porter was standing at the front door. From the landing where Pierre stood, there was a second staircase leading to the back entrance. He went down that staircase and out into the yard. No one had seen him, but there were some carriages waiting. And as soon as Pierre stepped out of the gate, the coachman and the yard porter noticed him and raised their caps to him. When he felt that he was being looked at, he behaved like an ostrich, which hid his head in a bush in order not to be seen. He hung his head and, quickening his pace, went down the street. Of all the affairs waiting Pierre that day, the sorting of Joseph Bazadeep's book and the papers appeared to him the most necessary. He hired the first cab he met and told the driver to go to the Patriarch's Ponds, where the widow Bazadeep's house was. Continually turning around to look at the rows of loaded cars that were making their way from all sides out of Moscow, and balancing his bulky body so as not to slip out of the ramshackle old vehicle. Pierre, experiencing the joyful feeling of a boy escaping from school, began to talk to his driver. The man told him that the arms were being distributed today at the Kremlin, and that tomorrow everyone would be sent out beyond the Three Hills gates, and a great battle would be fought there. Having reached the Patriarch's Ponds, Pierre found the Bastille's house, where he had not been for a long time past. He went up to the gate. Gerasim, that shallow beardless old man Pierre had seen at the Tulsa five years before with Joseph Bastille, came out in answer to his knock. Owing to the present state of things, Sofia Danielovna has gone to the Sofia Danielovna has gone to the Tozok estate with the children, Your Excellency. Sofia Danielovna has gone to the Tozok estate. Sofia Danielovna has gone to the Tozok estate with the children, Your Sofia Danielovna has gone to the Tozok estate with the children, Your Excellency. I will come in. I will come in all the same. I have to look through the books," said Pierre. "Be so good as to step in, Mark Alex, Mark Alexevich, the brother of my the brother of my late master. May the kingdom of heaven be his. Has remained here, but he is a weak state, as you know," said the old servant. Pierre knew that Mark Alexevich was Joseph Bazadeev's half insane brother and a hard drinker. Yes, yes, and yes, yes, I know. Let us go in," said Pierre and entered the house. A tall, bald-headed old man with a right nose, wearing a dressing gown, wearing a dressing gown, and with a a tall, bald-headed old man with a red nose, wearing a dressing gown, and with glasses on his bare feet, stood in the ante room. On seeing Pierre, he muttered something angrily and went away along the passage. He was a very clever man, but he has now grown quite feeble, as your honor sees. He was a very, he was a very clever man, but he has now grown quite feeble, as your honor sees," said Jerazim. "Will you step into the study?" Pierre nodded. "As it was sealed up, as it was sealed up, so it has remained." But Sofia, but Sofia Danielovna gave, but Sofia Danielovna gave orders that if anyone should come from you, they were to have the books. Pierre went into that gloomy study, which he had entered with such trepidation in his benefactor's lifetime. The room, dusty and untouched since the death of Joseph Bazadeev, was now even gloomier. Gerasim opened one of the shutters and left the room on tiptoe. Pierre went around the study, approached the cupboard in which the manuscripts were kept, 
and took out what had once been one of the most important and the holy of holies of the order. This was the authentic Scotch axe with Beth Deep's notes and explanations. He sat down at the dusty writing table, and having laid the manuscript before him, opened them out, closed them, finally pushed them away, and resting his head on his hand sank into meditation. Jensen looked cautiously into the study several times, and saw Pierre always sitting in the same attitude. More than two hours passed, and Jensen took the liberty of making a slight noise at the door to attract his attention, but Pierre did not hear him. Is the cabman to be discharged, your honor? Oh yes, said Pierre, rousing himself and rising hurriedly. Look here, taking Jensen by a button of his coat. And looking down at the old man with moist, shining, and exacting eyes, and Jerusalem heard him pacing restlessly from one corner to another and talking to himself, and he spent the night on a bed made up for him there. Jerusalem, being a servant who in his time had seen many strange things, accepted Pierre's taking up his residence in the house without surprise, and seemed to please to have someone to wait on. That same evening, without even asking himself what they were wanted for, he procured a coachman's coat and a cap for Pierre, and promised to get him the pistol next day. Makar Alexeyevich came twice that evening, shuffling along in his glasses as far as the door, and stopped and looked ingratiatingly at Pierre. But as soon as Pierre turned toward him, he wrapped his dressing gown around him with a shamefaced and angry look, and hurried away. It was when Pierre, wearing the coachman's coat which Jerusalem had procured for him and had disinfected by steam, was on his way with the old man to buy the pistol at the Sacrif Market that he met the Rostovs. End of chapter 18. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Nineteen, Read for LibriVox.org by Jeff. Chapter Nineteen. Kutuzov's order to retreat through Moscow at the Rising Road was issued at night on the first of September. The first troops started at once, and during the night they marched slowly and steadily without hurry. At daybreak, however. Those nearing the town at the Darogamalev Bridge saw ahead of them masses of soldiers crowding and hurrying across the bridge, ascending on the opposite side and blocking the streets and the alleys, while endless masses of troops were bearing down on them from behind. And the unreasoning hurry and alarm overcame them. They all rushed forward to the bridge, onto it, and to the forts and the boats. Kutuzov himself had driven round by side streets. To the other side of Moscow. By ten o'clock in the morning of the second of September, only the rear guard remained in the Darogamlev suburb, where they had ample room. The main army was on the other side of Moscow, or beyond it. At that very time, at ten in the morning of the second of September, Napoleon was standing among his troops on the Pokrovny Hill, looking at the panorama spread out before him. From the 26th of August to the 2nd of September, that is, from the Battle of Borodino to the entry of the French into Moscow, during the whole of that agitating, memorable week, there had been the extraordinary autumn weather that always comes as a surprise, when the sun hangs low and gives more heat than in spring, when everything shines so brightly in the rear, clear atmosphere that the eyes smart. When the lungs are strengthened and refreshed by inhaling the aromatic autumn air, when even the nights are warm, and when in those dark warm nights golden stars startle and delight us continually by falling from the sky. At ten in the morning of the second of September, this weather still held. The brightness of the morning was magical. Moscow, seen from the Pokrovny Hill, lay spaciously. Spread out with her river, her gardens, and her churches, and she seemed to be living her usual life, the cupolas glittering like stars in the sunlight, 
the view of the strange city with its peculiar architecture, such as he had never seen before, filled Napoleon with his rather envious and uneasy curiosity men feel when they see an alien form of life that has no knowledge of them. This city was evidently living with the full force of its own life, by the indefinite signs which, even at a distance, distinguish a living body from a dead one. Napoleon from the Pacloni Hill perceived the throb of life in the town, and felt, as it were, the breathing of that great and beautiful body. Every Russian looking at Moscow feels her to be a mother. Every foreigner who sees her, even if ignorant of her significance as the mother city, must feel her feminine character, and Napoleon feels it. That Asiatic city of the innumerable churches, holy Moscow, here it is, then at last, the famous city, it was high time, said he. And dismounting, he ordered the plain of Moscow to be spread out before him, and summoned Lalorni de Devio, the interpreter. A tongue captured by the enemies like a maid who has lost her honor, thought he. He had said so to Tarkov at Smolensk. From that point of view, he gazed at the oriental beauty he had now seen before. It seemed strange to him that his long felt wish, which had seemed attainable, had at last been realized. In the clear morning light, he gazed now at the city and now at the plain, considering its details, and the assurance of possessing it agitated and awed him. But could it be otherwise, he thought. Here is the capital at my feet. Where is Alexander now, and of what he sees thinking? A strange, beautiful and majestic city, and a strange and majestic moment. In what light must I appear to them, thought he, thinking of his troops. Here she is, the reward for all those faint-hearted men, he reflected, glancing at those near him and at the troop who were approaching and forming up. One word from me, one movement of my hand, and that ancient capital of the Tsars would perish. But my clemency is always ready to descend upon the vanquished. It must be magnanimous and truly great. But no, it can't be true that I am in Moscow, he suddenly thought. Yet here she is lying at my feet, with her golden domes and crosses, scintillating and twinkling in the sunshine. But I shall spare her. On the ancient monuments of barbarism and despotism, I will inscribe great words of justice and mercy. It is just this Alexander will feel most painfully. I know him. It seemed to Napoleon that the chief import of what was taking place lay in the personal struggle between himself and Alexander. From the height of the Kremlin, yes, there is the Kremlin. Yes, I will give them just the laws. I will teach them the meaning of true civilization. I will make generations of boyars remember their conqueror with love. I will tell the deputation that I did not and do not desire war, that I have waged the war only against the false policy of their court, that I love and respect Alexander, and that in Moscow I will accept terms of peace worthy of myself and of my people. I do not wish to utilize the fortunes of war to humiliate and honor the monarch. Boyars, I will say to them, I do not desire war. I desire the peace and welfare of my subjects. However, I know their presence will inspire me, and I shall speak to them as I always do, clearly, impressively, and majestically. But can it be true that I am in Moscow? Yes, there she lies. Bring the boyars to me, said he to his suite. A general with a brilliant suite clapped off at once to fetch the boyars. Two hours passed. Napoleon had a lunch and was again standing in the same place on the Pacloni Hill, awaiting the deputation. His speech to the boyars had already taken definite shape in his imagination. That the speech was full of dignity and greatness as Napoleon understood it. 
He was himself carried away by the tone of magnanimity he intended to adopt toward Moscow. In his imagination, he appointed days for assemblies at the palace of the Tsars, at which Russian notables and his own would mingle. He mentally appointed a governor, one who would win the hearts of the people. Having learned that there were many charitable institutions in Moscow, he mentally decided that he would shower favor on them all. He thought that as in Africa, he had to put on a burnous and sit in a mosque. He must be beneficent like the Tsars. And in order to finally to touch the hearts of the Russians, and being like all Frenchmen and able to imagine anything sentimental without a reference to Marcia, Matenda, Mapova Mia, he decided that he would place an inscription on all these establishments in large letters. This establishment is dedicated to my dear mother. Or no, it should be simply, Maison de ma Mia, he concluded. But am I really in Moscow? Yes, here it lies before me. But why is the deputation from the city so long in appearing, he wondered. Meanwhile, an agitated consultation was being carried on in whispers among his general and the marshals, at the rear of his suite. Those sent to fetch the deputation had returned with the news that the massacre was empty, that everyone had left it. The faces of those who were not conferring together were pale and perturbed. They were not alarmed by the fact that the Moscow had been abandoned by its inhabitants, grave as the fact seemed, but by the question how to tell the emperor, without putting him in the terrible position of appearing ridiculous, that he had been waiting the boyar so long in vain, that there were drunk mobs left in Moscow but no one else. Some said that a deputation of some sort must be scraped together. Others disputed that opinion and maintained that the emperor should first be carefully and skillfully prepared and then told the truth. He would have to be told, all the same, said some gentlemen of the suite. But gentlemen, the position was the more awkward because the emperor, meditating upon his magnanimous plans, was pacing patiently up and down before the outspread map, occasionally glancing along the road to Moscow from under his lifted hand with a bright and proud smile. But it's impossible, declared the gentlemen of the suite, shrugging their shoulders, but not venturing to utter the impolite word of ridicule. At last the emperor, tired of futile expectation, his actor's instinct suggesting to him that the sublime moment had been too long drawn out was beginning to lose its sublimity, gave a sign with his hand. A single report of the signaling gun followed, and the troops who were already spread out on different sides of Moscow moved into the city through Ver, Kaluga, and Dargamalev gates, faster and faster, vying with one another. They moved at the double were at a trot, vanishing amid the clouds of dust. They raced and making the air ring with a deafening roll of mingled shouts. Joined on by the movement of his troops, Napoleon rode with them as far as the Dargamlev gate, but there again stopped and dismounting from his horse, paced for a long time by the camera Kolaski rampart, awaiting the deputation. End of chapter 19「War and Peace」Book 11 Chapter 20 Read for LibriVox.org by Harry Inc. Meanwhile Moscow was empty. There were still people in it, perhaps a fiftieth part of its former inhabitants had remained, but it was empty. It was empty in the sense that a dying, queenless hive is empty. In a queenless hive no life is left, though to a superficial glance it seems as much alive as other hives. The bees circle around a queenless hive in the hot beams of the midday sun as gaily as around the living hives. From a distance it smells of honey, like the others, 
and bees fly in and out in the same way, but one only has to observe that hive to realize that there is no longer any life in it. The bees do not fly in the same way. The smell and the sound that meet the beekeeper are not the same. To the beekeeper's tap on the wall of the sick hive, instead of the former instant unanimous humming of tens of thousands of bees with their abdomens threateningly compressed and producing by the rapid vibration of their wings an aerial living sound, the only reply is a disconnected buzzing from different parts of the deserted hive. From the alighting board, instead of the former spirituous fragrant smell of honey and venom, and the warm whiffs of crowded life come an odour of emptiness and decay, mingling with the smells of honey. There are no longer sentinels sounding alarm with their abdomens raised and ready to die in defence of the hive. There is no longer the measured quiet sound of throbbing activity like the sound of boiling water, but diverse discordant sounds of disorder. In and out of the hive, long black robber bees smeared with honey fly timidly and shiftily. They do not sting, but they crawl away from danger. Formerly only bees laden with honey flew into the hive, and they flew out empty. Now they fly out laden. The beekeeper opens the lower part of the hive and peers in. Instead of black, glossy bees, tamed by toil, clinging to one another's legs and drawing out the wax, with a ceaseless hum of labour that used to hang in long clusters down to the floor of the hive, drowsy, shriveled bees crawl about separately in various directions on the floor and the walls of the hive. Instead of a neatly glued floor swept by the bees with the fanning of their wings, there is a floor littered with bits of wax, excrement, dying bees scarcely moving their legs, and dead ones that have not been cleared away. The beekeeper opens the upper part of the hive and examines the super. Instead of serried rows of bees sealing up every gap in the combs and keeping the brood warm, he sees the skilful complex structures of the combs, but no longer in their former state of purity. All is neglected and foul. Black robber bees are swiftly and stealthily prowling about the combs, and the short home bees, shriveled and listless as if they were old, creep slowly about without trying to hinder the robbers, having lost all motive and all sense of life. Drones, bumblebees, wasps and butterflies knock awkwardly against the wall of the hive in their flight. Here and there among the cells containing dead brood and honey, an angry buzzing can sometimes be heard. Here and there a couple of bees, by force of habit and custom, cleaning out the brood cells, with efforts beyond their strength, laboriously drag away a dead bee or a bumblebee, without knowing why they do it. In another corner two old bees are languidly fighting, or cleaning themselves, or feeding one another, without themselves knowing whether they do it with a friendly or hostile intent. In a third place, a crowd of bees crushing one another attack some victim and fight and smother it, and the victim, enfeebled or killed, drops from above slowly and lightly as a feather among the heap of corpses. The keeper opens the two centre partitions to examine the brood cells. In place of the former close dark circles formed by thousands of bees sitting back to back and guarding the high mystery of generation, he sees hundreds of dull, listless and sleeping shells of bees. They have almost all died unawares, sitting in the sanctuary they had guarded and which is now no more. They reek of decay and death. 
Only a few of them still move, rise and feebly fly to settle on the enemy's hand, lacking the spirit to die, stinging him. The rest are dead and fall as lightly as fish scales. The beekeeper closes the hive, chalks a mark on it, and when he has time, tears out its contents and burns it clean. So, in the same way, Moscow was empty when Napoleon, weary, uneasy and morose, paced up and down in front of the Kamakozelevsky rampart, awaiting what, to his mind, was a necessary, if but formal, observance of the proprieties, a deputation. In various corners of Moscow there still remained a few people aimlessly moving about, but following their old habits and hardly aware of what they were doing. When, with due circumspection, Napoleon was informed that Moscow was empty, he looked angrily at his informant, turned away, and silently continued to walk to and fro. "'My carriage,' he said. He took his seat beside the aide-de-camp on duty and drove into the suburb. "'Moscow is deserted,' he said to himself. What an incredible event! He did not drive into the town, but put up at an inn in the Dorogomilov suburb. The coup de théâtre had not come off. End of chapter 20 Recording by Harry Inc. Melbourne, Australia War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 21 Read for LibriVox.org by Harry Inc. The Russian troops were passing through Moscow from two o'clock at night till two in the afternoon, and bore away with them the wounded and the last of the inhabitants who were leaving. The greatest crush during the movement of the troops took place at the Stone, Moskva, and Yalza bridges. While the troops, dividing into two parts when passing around the Kremlin, were thronging the Moskva and the stone bridges, a great many soldiers, taking advantage of the stoppage and the congestion, turned back from the bridges and slipped stealthily and silently past the church of Vasily the Beatified and under the Borovitsky gate, back up the hill to the Red Square, when some instinct told them they would easily take things not belonging to them. Crowds of the kind seen at cheap sales filled all the passages and alleys of the bazaar, but there were no dealers with voices of ingratiating affability inviting customers to enter. There were no hawkers, nor the usual motley crowd of female purchasers, but only soldiers, in uniforms and overcoats though without muskets, entering the bazaar empty-handed, and silently making their way out through its passages with bundles. Tradesmen and their assistants, of whom there were but few, moved about among the soldiers quite bewildered. They unlocked their shops and locked them up again, and themselves carried goods away with the help of their assistants. On the square in front of the bazaar were drummers beating the muster call, but the roll of the drums did not make the looting soldiers run in the direction of the drums as formerly, but made them, on the contrary, run farther away. Among the soldiers in the shops and the passages, some men were to be seen in grey coats with closely shaven heads. Two officers, one with a scarf over his uniform and mounted on a lean, dark grey horse, the other in an overcoat and on foot, stood at the corner of Ilyinka Street, talking. A third officer galloped up to them. The general orders them all to be driven out at once, without fail. This is outrageous. Half the men have dispersed. Where are you off to? Where? He shouted to three infantrymen without muskets, who, holding up the skirts of their overcoats, were slipping past him into the bizarre passage. Stop, you rascals! "'But how are you going to stop them?' replied another officer. 
There is no getting them together. The army should push on before the rest bolt, that's all. How can one push them on? They are stuck there, wedged on the bridge, and they don't move. Shouldn't we put a cord in the round to prevent the rest from running away? Come, go in there, drive them out, shouted the senior officer. The officer in the scarf dismounted, called up a drummer, and went with him into the arcade. Some soldiers started running away in a group. A shopkeeper with red pimples on his cheek near the nose and a calm, persistent, calculating expression on his plump face hurriedly and ostentatiously approached the officer, swinging his arms. "'Your honour, he said, "'be so good as to protect us. "'We won't grudge trifles. "'You are welcome to anything. "'We shall be delighted. "'Pray, I'll fetch a piece of cloth at once "'for such an honourable gentleman, "'and even two pieces with pleasure, "'for we feel how it is. "'But what's all this? "'Sheer robbery! "'If you please, could not guards be placed "'if only to let us close the shop?' Several shopkeepers crowded around the officer. "'Ah, what twaddle!' said one of them, a thin, stern-looking man. "'When one's head is gone, one doesn't weep for one's hair. Take what any of you like.' And flourishing his arms energetically, he turned sideways to the officer. "'It's all very well for you, Ivan Sidorich, to talk,' said the first tradesman angrily. "'Please, step inside, Your Honour. "'Talk indeed,' cried the thin one. "'In my three shops here I have a hundred thousand rubles worth of goods. "'Can they be saved when the army is gone? "'Aye, what people? "'Against God's might our hands can't fight.' "'Come inside, Your Honour,' repeated the tradesman, bowing. "'The officer stood perplexed, and his face showed indecision.' "'It's not my business,' he exclaimed, and strode on quickly down one of the passages. From one open shop came the sound of blows and vituperation, and just as the officer came up to it, a man in a grey coat with shaven head was flung out violently. This man, bent double, rushed past the tradesman and the officer. The officer pounced on the soldiers who were in the shop, but at that moment fearful screams reached them from the huge crowd on the Moskva bridge, and the officer ran out into the square. "'What is it? What is it?' he asked, but his comrade was already galloping off past Vasily the Beatified in the direction from which the screams came. The officer mounted his horse and rode after him. When he reached the bridge, he saw two unlimbered guns. The infantry crossing the bridge several overturned carts, and frightened and laughing faces among the troops. Beside the cannon a cart was standing, to which two horses were harnessed. Four boyzois, with collars, were pressing close to the wheels. The cart was loaded high, and at the very top, beside a child's chair with its legs in the air, sat a peasant woman uttering piercing and desperate shrieks. He was told by his fellow officers that the screams of the crowd and the shrieks of the woman were due to the fact that General Ermolov, coming up to the crowd and learning that soldiers were dispersing among the shops while the crowds of civilians blocked the bridge, had ordered two guns to be unlimbered and made a show of firing at the bridge. The crowd, crushing one another, upsetting carts and shouting and squeezing desperately, had cleared off the bridge and the troops were now moving forward. End of chapter 21 Recording by Harry Inc. Melbourne, Australia War and Peace Book 11, Chapter 22 Read for LibriVox.org by Harry Inc. Meanwhile, the city itself was deserted. There was hardly anyone in the streets. The gates and the shops were all closed. Only here and there around the taverns, solitary shouts or drunken songs could be heard. 
Nobody drove through the streets, and footsteps were rarely heard. The Povarskaya was quite still and deserted. The huge courtyard of the Rostovs' house was littered with wisps of hay and with dung from the horses, and not a soul was to be seen there. In the great drawing-room of the house which had been left with all it contained, there were two people. They were the yard-porter Ignat and the page-boy Mishka, Vasilich's grandson, who had stayed in Moscow with his grandfather. Mishka had opened the clavichord and was strumming on it with one finger. The yard-porter, his arms akimbo, stood smiling with satisfaction before the large mirror. "'Isn't it fine, eh, Uncle Ignat?' said the boy, suddenly beginning to strike the keyboard with both hands. "'Only fancy,' answered Ignat, surprised at the broadening grin on his face in the mirror. "'Impudent! Impudence!' they heard behind them the voice of Marva Kuzmanitra, who had entered silently. "'How he's grinning, the fat mug! Is that what you're here for? Nothing's cleared away down there, and Vasilich is worn out. Just you wait a bit!' Ignat left off smiling, adjusted his belt, and went out of the room with meekly downcast eyes. "'Aunt, I did it gently,' said the boy. "'I'll give you something gently, you monkey, you!' cried Marva Kuzminichna, raising her arm threateningly. "'Go and get the samovar to boil for your grandfather!' Marva Kuzminichna flicked the dust off the clavichord and closed it, and, with a deep sigh, left the drawing-room and locked its main door. Going out into the yard, she paused to consider where she should go next, to drink tea in the servant's wing with Vasilich, or into the storeroom to put away what still lay about. She heard the sound of quick footsteps in the quiet street. Someone stopped at the gate, and the latch rattled as someone tried to open it. Marva Kuzminich now went to the gate. Who do you want? The Count. Count Ilya Andreevich Rostov. And who are you? An officer. I have to see him, came the reply in a pleasant, well-bred Russian voice. Marva Kuzminichna opened the gate, and an officer of eighteen, with the round face of a Rostov, entered the yard. They have gone away, sir. Went away yesterday at vesper time, said Marva Kuzminichna cordially. The young officer standing in the gateway, as if hesitating whether to enter or not, clicked his tongue. "'Ah! How annoying!' he muttered. "'I should have come yesterday. Ah! Oh, what a pity!' Meanwhile, Mavra Kuzminichna was attentively and sympathetically examining the familiar Rostov features of the young man's face, his tattered coat and trodden-down boots. "'What did you want to see the Count for?' she asked. "'Oh, well, it can't be helped,' he said in a tone of vexation, and he placed his hand on the gate as if to leave. He again paused in indecision. "'You see,' he suddenly said, "'I am a kinsman of the Count's, and he has been very kind to me, as you see.' He glanced with an amused air and good-natured smile at his coat and boots. My, my things are worn out, and I have no money, so I was going to ask the Count. Mavra Kuzminicha did not let him finish. Just wait a minute, sir. One little moment, she said. And as soon as the officer let go of the gate handle, she turned and, hurrying away on her old legs, went through the backyard to the servants' quarters. While Mavra Kuzminichna was running to her room, the officer walked about the yard, gazing at his worn-out boots with lowered head and a faint smile on his lips. Oh, what a pity I've missed uncle. What a nice old woman. Where has she run off to? And how am I to find the nearest way to overtake my regiment, which must now be getting near the Rogozki gate? thought he. Just then, Mavra Kuzmanichna appeared from behind the corner of the house with a frightened yet resolute look, carrying a rolled-up check kerchief in her hand. 
While still a few steps from the officer, she unfolded the kerchief and she took out of it a white twenty-five rouble assignat and hastily handed it to him. If his excellency had been at home, as a kinsman he would of course, but as it is. Mavra Kuzminichna grew abashed and confused. The officer did not decline, but he took the note quietly and thanked her. If the Count had been at home, Mavra Kuzminichna went on apologetically, Christ be with you, sir. May God preserve you, said she, bowing as she saw him out. Swaying his head and smiling as if amused at himself, the officer ran almost at a trot through the deserted streets toward the Yalza bridge to overtake his regiment. But Mavra Kuzminichna stood at the closed gate for some time with moist eyes, pensively swaying her head and feeling an unexpected flow of motherly tenderness and pity for the unknown young officer. End of chapter 22 War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 23, read for LibriVox.org by Harry Inc. From an unfinished house on the Vavaka, the ground floor of which was a dram shop, came drunken shouts and songs. On benches around the tables in a dirty little room sat some ten factory hands. Tipsy and perspiring with dim eyes and wide open mouths, they were all laboriously singing some song or other. They were singing discordantly, arduously, and with great effort, evidently not because they wished to sing, but because they wanted to show they were drunk and on a spree. One, a tall, fair-haired lad in a clean blue coat, was standing over the others. His face, with its fine, straight nose, would have been handsome had it not been for his thin, compressed twitching lips and dull, gloomy, fixed eyes. Evidently possessed by some idea, he stood over those who were singing and solemnly and jerkily flourished above their heads his white arm with the sleeve turned up to the elbow, trying unnaturally to spread out his dirty fingers. The sleeve of his coat kept slipping down and he always carefully rolled it up again with his left hand as if it were most important that the sinewy white arm he was flourishing should be bare. In the midst of the song cries were heard, fighting and blows in the passage and porch. The tall lad waved his arm. Stop it! he exclaimed peremptorily. There's a fight, lads! And still rolling his sleeve, he went out onto the porch. The factory hands followed him, these men, who under the leadership of the tall lad were drinking in a dram shop that morning, had brought the publican some skins from the factory, and for this had had drink served them. The blacksmiths from the neighbouring smithy, hearing the sounds of revelry in the tavern and supposing it to have been broken into, wished to force their way in too, and a fight in the porch had resulted. The publican was fighting one of the smiths at the door, and when the workman came out, the smith, wrenching himself free from the tavern-keeper, fell face downward on the pavement. Another smith tried to enter the doorway, pressing against the publican with his chest. The lad with a turned-up sleeve gave the smith a blow in the face and cried wildly, They're fighting us, lads! At that moment the first smith got up and, scratching his bruised face to make it bleed, shouted in a tearful voice, oh, Police! Murder! They've killed a man, lads! Oh, gracious me, a man beaten to death, killed! screamed a woman coming out of a gate close by. A crowd gathered around the blood-stained smith. Haven't you robbed people enough, taking their last shirts? said a voice addressing the publican. What have you killed a man for, you thief? 
The tall lad, standing in the porch, turned his bleared eyes from the publican to the smith, and back again, as if considering whom he ought to fight now. "'Murderer!' he shouted suddenly to the publican. "'Bind him, lads!' "'I dare say you would like to bind me!' shouted the publican, pushing away the men advancing on him, and snatching his cap from his head, he flung it on the ground. As if this action had some mysterious and menacing significance, the workmen surrounding the publican paused in indecision. "'I know the Lord very well, mates. I'll take the matter to the captain of police. "'You think I won't get to him? "'Robbery is not permitted to anybody nowadays,' shouted the publican, picking up his cap. "'Come along, then! Come along, then!' the publican and the tall young fellow repeated one after the other, and they moved up the street together. The blood-stained smith went beside them. The factory hands and the others followed behind, talking and shouting. At the corner of the Morasekia, opposite a large house with closed shutters and bearing a bootmaker's signboard, stood a score of thin, worn-out, gloomy-faced bootmakers, wearing overalls and long, tattered coats. "'You should pay folks off properly,' a thin working man with frowning brows and a straggly beard was saying. "'But he sucked our blood, and now he thinks he's quit of us. He's been misleading us all the week, and now that he's brought us to this pass, he's made off. On seeing the crowd and the blood-stained man, the workmen ceased speaking, and with eager curiosity all the bookmakers joined the moving crowd. Where are all the folks going? Why, to the police, of course. I say, is it true that we have been beaten? What do you think? Look what the folks are saying. Questions and answers were heard. The publican, taking advantage of the increased crowd, dropped behind and returned to his tavern. The tall youth, not noticing the disappearance of his foe, waved his bare arm and went on talking incessantly, attracting general attention to himself. It was around him that the people chiefly crowded, expecting answers from him to the questions that occupied all their minds. "'He must keep order, keep the law. That's what the government is there for. Am I not right, good Christians?' said the tall youth, with a scarcely perceptible smile. "'He thinks there's no government. How can one do without government? Or else there'd be plenty who'd rob us.' "'Ah, oh, why talk nonsense?' rejoined voices in the crowd. "'Will they give up Moscow like this? They told you that for fun, and you believed it. Aren't there plenty of troops on the march? Let him in, indeed. That's what the government is for. You'd better listen to what the people are saying.' said some of the mob, pointing to the tall youth. By the wall of Chinatown a smaller group of people were gathered around a man in a frieze coat who held a paper in his hand. An ukaze! They are reading an ukaze! Reading an ukaze! cried voices in the crowd, and the people rushed towards the reader. The man in the frieze coat was reading the broadsheet of August 31. When the crowd collected round him he seemed confused, but at the demand of the tall lad, who had pushed his way up to him, he began in a rather tremulous voice to read the sheet from the beginning. Um, early tomorrow, I shall go to his Serene Highness, he read. Serene Highness, said the tall fellow, with a triumphant smile on his lips and a frown on his brow. To consult with him to act and to aid the army to exterminate these scoundrels. "'We too will take part,' the reader went on, and then paused. "'Do you see?' shouted the youth victoriously. "'He's going to clear up the whole affair for you. "'In destroying them, and will send these visitors to the devil. "'I will come back to dinner, and will set to work. "'We will do completely do and undo these scoundrels.' "'These last words were read out in the midst of complete silence.' The tall lad hung his head gloomily. It was evident that no one had understood the last part. In particular, the words, I will come back to dinner, evidently displeased both the reader and the audience. The people's minds were tuned to a high pitch, and this was too simple and needlessly comprehensible. It was what any one of them might have said, and therefore was what a Nukaze emanating from the highest authority should not say. They all stood despondent and silent. 
The tall youth moved his lips and swayed from side to side. We should ask him. That's he himself. Yes, ask him. Indeed, why not? He'll explain. Voices in the rear of the crowd were suddenly heard saying, and the general attention turned to the police superintendent's trap, which drove into the square, attended by two mounted dragoons. The superintendent of police who had that morning by Count Rostopchin's orders to burn the barges and, in connection with that matter, acquired a large sum of money which was, at that moment, in his pocket, on seeing a crowd bearing down upon him, told his coachman to stop. "'What people are these?' he shouted to the men, who were moving singly and timidly in the direction of his trap. "'What people are these?' he shouted again, receiving no answer. "'Your Honour,' replied the shopman in the frieze coat, "'Your Honour, in accord with the proclamation of His Highest Excellency the Count, "'they desire to serve, not sparing their lives, and it is not any kind of right, "'but as His Highest Excellency said, "'The Count has not left. He is here, and an order will be issued concerning you,' "'said the Superintendent of Police. "'Go on,' he ordered his coachman. The crowd halted, pressing around those who had heard what the superintendent had said, and looking at the departing trap. The superintendent of police turned around at that moment with a scared look, said something to his coachman, and his horses increased their speed. "'It's a fraud, lads! Lead the way to him himself!' shouted the tall youth. "'Don't let him go, lads! Let him answer us! Keep him!' shouted different people, and the people dashed off in pursuit of the trap. Following the superintendent of police and talking loudly, the crowd went in the direction of the Lubyanka Street. There now, the gentry and the merchants have gone away and left us to perish. Do they think we're dogs? Voices in the crowd were heard saying more and more frequently. End of chapter 23 Recording by Harry Inc. Melbourne Australia. War and Peace, Book Eleven, Chapter Twenty Four. Read for LibriVox dot org by Paul McCartan. On the evening of the 1st of September, after his interview with Kutuzov, Count Rostopchin had returned to Moscow mortified and offended because he had not been invited to attend the Council of War, and because Kutuzov had paid no attention to his offer to take part in the defense of the city. Amazed also at the novel outlook revealed to him at the camp, which treated the tranquillity of the capital and his patriotic fervour, as not merely secondary, but quite irrelevant and unimportant matters. Distressed, offended, and surprised by all of this, Rostopchin had returned to Moscow. After supper, he lay down on a sofa without undressing, and was awakened soon after midnight by a courier bringing him a letter from Kutuzov. This letter requested the Count to send police officers to guide the troops through the town, as the army was retreating to the Ryazan Road beyond Moscow. This was not news to Rostopchin. He had known that Moscow would be abandoned, not merely since his interview the previous day with Kutuzov on the Pokloni Hill, but ever since the Battle of Borodino. For all the generals who came to Moscow after that battle had said unanimously that it was impossible to fight another battle, and since then the government property had been removed every night, and half the inhabitants had left the city with Rostopchin's own permission. Yet all the same, this information astonished and irritated the Count, coming as it did in the form of a simple note with an order from Kutuzov, and received at night, breaking in on his beauty sleep. When, later on in his memoirs, 
Count Rostovshin explained his actions at this time. He repeatedly says that he was then actuated by two important considerations. To maintain tranquillity in Moscow and expedite the departure of the inhabitants. If one accepts this twofold aim, all Rostopchin's actions appear irreproachable. Why were the holy relics, the arms, ammunition, gunpowder, and stores of corn not removed? Why were thousands of inhabitants deceived into believing that Moscow would not be given up, and thereby ruined? To presence the tranquillity of the city, explains Count Rostopchin. Why were bundles of useless papers from the government offices and Lepage's balloon and other articles removed? To leave the town empty, explains Count Nostopchin. One need only admit that public tranquillity is in danger and any action finds a justification. All the horrors of the reign of terror were based only on solicitude for public tranquillity. On what, then, was Count Rostopchin's fear for the tranquillity of Moscow based in 1812? What reason was there for assuming any probability of an uprising in the city? The inhabitants were leaving it, and the retreating troops were filling it. Why should that cause the masses to riot? Neither in Moscow nor anywhere in Russia did anything resembling an insurrection ever occur when the enemy entered a town. More than 10,000 people were still in Moscow on the 1st and 2nd of September. And, except for a mob in the governor's courtyard, assembled there at his bidding, nothing happened. It is obvious that there would have been even less reason to expect a disturbance among the people, if after the Battle of Borodino, when the surrender of Moscow became certain or at least probable, Rostopchin, instead of exciting the people by distributing arms and broadsheets, had taken steps to remove all the holy relics, the gunpowder, munitions, and money, and had told the population plainly that the town would be abandoned. Rostopchin, though he had patriotic sentiments, was a sanguine and impulsive man who had always moved in the highest administrative circles and had no understanding at all of the people he supposed himself to be guiding. Ever since the enemy's entry into Smolensk, he had, in imagination, been playing the role of director of the popular feeling of the heart of Russia. Not only did it seem to him, as to all administrators, that he controlled the external actions of Moscow's inhabitants, but he also thought he controlled their mental attitude by means of his broadsheets and posters written in a coarse tone which the people despise in their own class and do not understand from those in authority. Rostopchin was so pleased with the fine role of leader of popular feeling, and had grown so used to it, that the necessity of relinquishing that role and abandoning Moscow without any heroic display took him unawares, and he suddenly felt the ground slip away from under his feet so that he positively did not know what to do. Though he knew it was coming, he did not till the last moment wholeheartedly believe that Moscow would be abandoned, and did not prepare for it. The inhabitants are left against his wishes. If the government offices were removed, this was only done on the demand of officials to whom the count yielded reluctantly. He was absorbed in the role he had created, for himself, as is often the case with those gifted with an ardent imagination. Though he had long known that Moscow would be abandoned, he knew it only with his intellect. He did not believe it in his heart, and did not adapt himself mentally to this new position of affairs. All his painstaking and energetic activity, in how far it was useful, and had any effect on the people is another question, had been simply directed toward arousing in the masses his own feeling of patriotic hatred of the French. But when events assumed their true historical character, 
when expressing hatred for the French in words proved insufficient, when it was not even possible to express that hatred by fighting a battle, when self-confidence was of no avail in relation to the one question before Moscow, when the whole population streamed out of Moscow as one man, abandoning their belongings and proving by that negative action all the depth of their national feeling, then the role chosen by Rostovshin suddenly appeared senseless. He unexpectedly felt himself ridiculous, weak, and alone, with no ground to stand on. When, awakened from his sleep, he received that cold, peremptory note from Kutuzov. He felt the more irritated, the more he felt himself to blame. All that he had been specially put in charge of, the state property which he should have removed, was still in Moscow, and it was no longer possible to take the whole of it away. Who is to blame for it? Who has let things come to such a pass? he ruminated. Not I, of course. I had everything ready. I had Moscow firmly in hand. And this is what they have let it come to? Villains. Traitors, he thought, without clearly defining who the villains and traitors were. But feeling it necessary to hate those traitors, whoever they might be, who were to blame for the false and ridiculous position in which he found himself. All that night, Count Rostopchin issued orders, for which people came to him from all parts of Moscow. Those about him had never seen the Count so morose and irritable. Your Excellency, the Director of the Registrar's Department has sent for instructions. From the Consistory, from the Senate, from the university, from the foundling hospital, the suffragan has sent, asking for information. What are your orders about the fire brigade? From the governor of the prison, from the superintendent of the lunatic asylum. All night long such announcements were continually being received by the count. To all these inquiries he gave brief and angry replies, indicating that orders from him were not now needed, that the whole affair, carefully prepared by him, had now been ruined by somebody, and that that somebody would have to bear the whole responsibility for all that might happen. Oh, tell that blockhead, he said in reply to the question from the registrar's department that he should remain to guard his documents. Now, why are you asking silly questions about the fire brigade? They have horses. Let them be off to Vladimir, and not leave them to the French. Your Excellency, the superintendent of the lunatic asylum has come. What are your commands? My commands? Let them go away, that's all. And let the lunatics out into the town. When lunatics command our armies, God evidently means these other madmen to be free. In reply to an inquiry about the convicts in the prison, Count Rostopchin shouted angrily at the governor, Do you expect me to give you two battalions, which we have not got, for a convoy? Release them. That's all about it. Your Excellency, there are some political prisoners, Meshkov, Verskagen. Verskagen? Hasn't he been hanged yet? shouted Rostopchin. Bring him to me. End of chapter 24 Recording by Paul McCartan in April 2009War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 25, read for LibriVox.org. Toward nine o'clock in the morning, when the troops were already moving through Moscow, no one came to the Count anymore for instructions. 
Those who were able to get away were already going of their own accord. Those who remained behind decided for themselves what they must do. The Count ordered his carriage that he might drive to Sokolniki, and sat in his study with folded hands, morose, sallow, and taciturn. In quiet and untroubled times, it seems to every administrator that it is only by his effort that the whole population under his rule is kept going. And in this consciousness of being indispensable, every administrator finds the chief reward of his labor and efforts. While the sea of history remains calm, the ruler administer in his frail bark, holding on with a boat hook to the ship of the people and himself moving, naturally imagines that his efforts move the ship he is holding on to. But as soon as a storm arises and the sea begins to heave and the ship to move, such a delusion is no longer possible. The ship moves independently, with its own enormous motion. The boat hook no longer reaches the moving vessel, and suddenly the administrator, instead of appearing a ruler and source of power, becomes an insignificant, useless, feeble man. Rostopchin felt this, and it was this which exasperated him. The superintendent of police, whom the crowd had stopped, went in to see him at the same time as an adjutant who informed the count that the horses were harnessed. They were both pale, and the superintendent of police, after reporting that he had executed the instructions he had received, informed the count that an immense crowd had collected in the courtyard and wished to see him. Without saying a word, Rostopchin rose and walked hastily to his light, luxurious drawing room, went to the balcony door, took hold of the handle, let it go again, and went to the window, from which he had a better view of the whole crowd. The tall lad was standing in front, flourishing his arm and saying something with a stern look. The blood-stained smith stood beside him with a gloomy face. A drone of voices was audible through the closed window. "'Is my carriage ready?' asked Rostopchin, stepping back from the window. "'It is, Your Excellency,' replied the adjutant. Rostopchin went again to the balcony door. "'But what do they want?' he asked the superintendent of police. "'Your Excellency, they say they have got ready, according to your orders, to go against the French, and they shouted something about treachery. But it is a turbulent crowd, Your Excellency.' I hardly managed to get away from it. Your Excellency, I venture to suggest— You may go! I don't need to, you to tell me what to do! exclaimed Rostopchin angrily. He stood at the balcony door, looking at the crowd. This is what they have done with Russia. This is what they have done with me, he thought, full of an irrepressible fury that welled up within him against the someone to whom what was happening might be attributed. As often happens with passionate people, he was mastered by anger, but was still seeking an object on which to vent it. Here is that mob, the dregs of the people, he thought as he gazed at the crowd. This rabble that they have roused by their folly. They want a victim, he thought as he looked at the tall lad flourishing his arm. And this thought occurred to him just because he himself desired a victim, something on which to vent his rage. "'Is the carriage ready?' he asked again. "'Yes, Your Excellency. "'What are your orders about Varish Chagan? "'He is waiting at the porch,' said the adjutant. "'Ah!' exclaimed Rostopchin, "'as if struck by an unexpected recollection. "'And rapidly opening the door, "'he went resolutely out onto the balcony. "'The talking instantly ceased. "'Hats and capes were doffed, "'and all eyes were raised to the Count.' "'Good morning, lads,' said the Count, briskly and loudly. "'Thank you for coming. I'll come out to you in a moment, but we must first settle with this villain. We must punish the villain who has caused the ruin of Moscow. Wait for me.' And the Count stepped as briskly back into the room and slammed the door behind him. A murmur of approbation and satisfaction ran through the crowd. "'He'll settle with all the villains. You'll see. And you said the French. He'll show you what law is.' 
the mob were saying, as if reproving one another for their lack of confidence. A few minutes later, an officer came hurriedly out of the front door, gave an order, and the dragoons formed up in a line. The crowd moved eagerly from the balcony towards the porch. Rostop Shin, coming out there with quick, angry steps, looked hastily around, as if seeking someone. "'Where is he?' he inquired. As he spoke, he saw a young man coming round the corner of the house between two dragoons. He had a long, thin neck, and his head, that had been half-shaved, was again covered by short hair. This young man was dressed in a threadbare blue cloth coat lined with fox fur that had once been smart, and dirty hempen convict trousers, over which were pulled his thin, dirty, trodden-down boots. On his thin, weak legs were heavy chains, which hampered his irresolute movements. "'Ah,' said Rostopchin, hurriedly turning away his eyes from the young man in the fur-lined coat, and pointing to the bottom step of the porch, "'Put him there!' The young man, in his clattering chains, stepped clumsily to the spot indicated, holding away with one finger the coat collar which chafed his neck, turning his long neck twice this way and that, sighed, and submissively folded before him his thin hands, unused to work. For several seconds, while the young man was taking his place on the step, the silence continued. Only among the back rows of the people, who were all pressing towards the one spot, could sighs, groans, and the shuffling of feet be heard. While waiting for the young man to take his place on the step, Rostopchin stood, frowning and rubbing his face with his hand. Lads, said he, with a metallic ring in his voice. This man, Vereshagin, is the scoundrel by whose doing Moscow is perishing. The young man in the fur-lined coat, stooping a little, stood in a submissive attitude, his finger clasped before him, his emaciated young face, disfigured by the half-shaven head, hung down hopelessly. At the Count's first words, he raised it slowly, and looked up at him, as if wishing to say something, or at least to meet his eye. But Rostop Chen did not look at him. A vein in the young man's long, thin neck swelled like a cord, and went blue behind the ear, and suddenly his face flushed. All eyes were fixed on him. He looked at the crowd, and rendered more hopeful by the expression he read on the faces there, he smiled sadly and timidly, and lowering his head, shifted his feet on the step. He has betrayed his Tsar and his country. He had gone over to Bonaparte. He alone of all the Russians has disgraced the Russian name. He has caused Moscow to perish, said Rostopchin in a sharp, even voice. But suddenly he glanced down at Vereshagin, who continued to stand in the same submissive attitude, as if almost inflamed by the sight. He raised his arm and addressed the people, almost shouting, Deal with him as you see fit. I hand him over to you. The crowd remained silent, and only pressed closer and closer to one another, to keep one another back, to breathe in that stifling atmosphere, to be unable to stir, and to await something unknown, uncomprehended, and terrible, was becoming unbearable. Those standing in the front, who had seen and heard what had taken place before them, all stood with wide open eyes and mouths, straining with all their strength, and held back the crowd that was pushing behind him. "'Beat him! Let the traitor perish, and not disgrace the Russian name!' shouted Rostopchin. "'Cut him down! I command it!' Hearing not so much the words as the angry tone of Rostopchin's voice, the crowd moaned and heaved forward, but again paused. "'Count!' exclaimed the timid yet theatrical voice of Vereshagin 
in the midst of the momentary silence that ensued. Count! One god is above us both! He lifted his head again, and the thick vein in his neck filled with blood, and the color rapidly came and went in his face. He did not finish what he wished to say. Cut him down! I command it! shouted Rostopchin, suddenly growing pale like Vereshchagin. "'Draw sabers!' cried the dragoon officer, drawing his own. Another, still stronger wave flowed through the crowd, and reaching the front ranks, carried it, swaying to the very steps of the porch. The tall youth, with a stony look on his face, and rigid and uplifted arm, stood beside Vereshchagin. "'Saber him!' the dragoon officer almost whispered. And one of the soldiers, his face all at once distorted with fury, struck Vereshchagin on the head with the blunt side of his saber. Ah! cried Vereshchagin in meek surprise, looking round with a frightened glance, as if not understanding why this was done to him. A similar moan of surprise and horror ran through the crowd. Oh, Lord! exclaimed a sorrowful voice. But after the exclamation of surprise that had escaped from Vereshchagin, he uttered a plaintive cry of pain, and that cry was fatal. The barrier of human feeling, strained to the utmost, that had held the crowd in check, suddenly broke. The crime had begun, and must now be completed. The plaintive moan of reproach was drowned by the threatening and angry roar of the crowd. Like the seventh and last wave that shatters a ship, the last irresistible wave burst from the rear and reached the front ranks, carrying them off their feet and engulfing them all. The dragoon was about to repeat his blow. Vereshchagin, with a cry of horror, covering his head with his hands, rushed toward the crowd. The tall youth, against whom he stumbled, seized his thin neck with his hands, and, yelling wildly, fell with him under the feet of the pressing, struggling crowd. Some beat and tore at Vereshchagin, others at the tall youth, and the screams of those being trampled and of those who tried to rescue the tall lad, only increased the fury of the crowd. It was a long time before the dragoons could extricate the bleeding youth beaten almost to death, and for a long time, despite the feverish haste with which the mob tried to end the work that had been begun, those who were hitting, throttling, and tearing at Vereshchagin were unable to kill him, for the crowd pressed, from all sides, swaying as one mass with them in the center, and rendering it impossible for them either to kill him or let him go. Hit him with an axe, eh? Crushed, traitor, he sold Christ, still alive, tenacious, serves him right, torture serves a thief right, use the hatchet, what, still alive? Only when the victim ceased to struggle, and his cries changed to a long-drawn, measured death rattle did the crowd around his prostrate bleeding corpse begin rapidly to change places each one came up glanced at what had been done and with horror reproach and astonishment pushed back again oh lord the people are like wild beasts how could he still be alive voices in the crowd could be heard saying quite a young fellow too must have been a merchant's son what men and they're saying he's not the right one how not the right one? Oh, Lord, and there's another. Has been beaten, too. They say he's nearly done for. Oh, the people. Aren't they afraid of sinning? Said the same mob now, looking with pained distress at the dead body, with its long, thin, half-severed neck, and its livid face stained with blood and dust. A painstaking police officer, considering the presence of a corpse, in his excellently's courtyard unseemly, told the dragoons to take it away. Two dragoons took it by its distorted legs and dragged it along the ground. 
The gory, dust-stained, half-shaven head, with its long neck, trailed, twisting along the ground. The crowd shrank back from it. At the moment when Vershagen fell, and the crowd closed in with savage yells and swayed about him, Rostopchin suddenly turned pale, and, instead of going back to the entrance where his carriage awaited him, went with hurried steps and bent head, not knowing where and why, along the passage leading to the rooms on the ground floor. The Count's face was white, and he could not control the feverish twitching of his lower jaw. "'This this way, Your Excellency! Where, where are you going? This way, please!' said a trembling, frightened voice behind him. Count Rostopchin was unable to reply, and turning obediently, went in the direction indicated. At the back entrance stood his calèche. The distant roar of the yelling crowd was audible even there. He hastily took his seat, and told the coachman to drive him to his country house in Sokolniki. When they reached Miosnitsky Street, and could no longer hear the shouts of the mob, the Count began to repent. He remembered with dissatisfaction the agitation and fear he had betrayed before his subordinates. "'The mob is terrible, disgusting,' he said to himself in French. "'They are like wolves whom nothing but flesh can appease.' "'Count, one god is above us both.' Vereshagin's words suddenly recurred to him, and a disagreeable shiver ran down his back. But this was only a momentary feeling, and Count Rostopchin smiled disdainfully at himself. I had other duties, thought he. The people had to be appeased. My other victims have perished, and are perishing for the public good. And he began thinking of his social duties to his family, and to the city entrusted to him, and of himself, not himself as Theodore Vasilyevich Rostopchin. He fancied that Theodore Vasilyevich Rostopchin was sacrificing himself for the public good, but himself as governor, the representative of authority and of the Tsar. Had I simply been Theodore Vasilyevich, my course of action would have been quite different, but it was my duty to safeguard my life and dignity as commander-in-chief. Lightly swaying on the flexible springs of his carriage, and no longer hearing the terrible sounds of the crowd, Rostopchin grew physically calm, and, as always happens, as soon as he became physically tranquil, his mind devised reasons why he should be mentally tranquil too. The thought which tranquilized Rostopchin was not a new one. Since the world began, and men have killed one another, no one has ever committed such a crime against his fellow man without comforting himself with this same idea. This idea is le bien public, the hypothetical welfare of other people. To a man not swayed by passion, that welfare is never certain. But he who commits such a crime always knows just where that welfare lies, and Rostopchin now knew it. Not only did his reason not reproach him for what he had done, but he even found a cause for self-satisfaction in having so successfully contrived to avail himself of a convenient opportunity to punish a criminal and at the same time pacify the mob. Vereshogin was tried and condemned to death, thought Rostopchin though the Senate had only condemned Vereshagin to hard labor. He was a traitor and a spy. I could not let him go unpunished, and so I have killed two birds with one stone. To appease the mob, I gave them a victim, and at the same time punished a miscreant. Having reached his country house and begun to give orders about domestic arrangements, the Count grew quite tranquil. Half an hour later, he was driving with his fast horses across the Sokolniki field. No longer thinking of what had occurred, but considering what was to come. 
he was driving to the Yauza Bridge, where he had heard that Kutuzov was. Count Rostopchin was mentally preparing the angry and stinging reproaches he meant to address to Kutuzov for his deception. He would make that foxy old courtier feel that the responsibility for all the calamities that would follow the abandonment of the city and the ruin of Russia, as Rostopchin regarded it, would fall upon his doting old head. Planning beforehand what he would say to Kutuzov, Rostopchin turned angrily in his kalash and gazed sternly from side to side. The Sokolniki field was deserted. Only at the end of it, in front of the almshouse and the lunatic asylum, could be seen some people in white, and others like them walking singly across the fields, shouting and gesticulating. One of these was running to cross the path of Count Rostopchin's carriage, and the Count himself, his coachman, and his dragoons, and curiosity at these released lunatics, and especially at the one running towards them. Swaying from side to side, his long, thin fingers in his fluttering dressing gown, this lunatic was running impetuously, his gaze fixed on Rostopchin, shouting something in a hoarse voice and making signs to him to stop. The lunatic's solemn, gloomy face was thin and yellow, with its beard growing in uneven tufts. His black, agate pupils, with saffron-yellow whites, moved restlessly near the lower eyelids. Stop! Pull up, I tell you! he cried in a piercing voice, and again shouted something breathlessly, with emphatic intonations and gestures. Coming abreast of the kalosh, he ran beside it. Thrice they have slain me! Thrice I have risen from the dead! They stoned me! Crucified me! I shall rise! Shall rise! Shall rise! They have torn my body! The kingdom of God will be overthrown! Thrice I will overthrow it! And thrice reestablish it! He cried, raising his voice higher and higher. Count Rostopchin suddenly grew pale, as he had done when the crowd closed in on Vereshagin. He turned away. Go fast, faster, he cried in a trembling voice to his coachman. The kalosh flew over the ground as fast as the horses could draw it. But for a long time, Count Rostopchin still heard the insane despairing screams growing fainter in the distance while his eyes saw nothing but the astonished, frightened, blood-stained face of the traitor in the fur-lined coat. Recent as that mental picture was, Rostopchin already felt that it had cut deep into his heart and drawn blood. Even now he felt clearly that the gory trace of that recollection would not pass with time, but that the terrible memory would, on the contrary, dwell in his heart ever more cruelly and painfully toward the end of his life. He seemed still to hear the sound of his own words. Cut him down! I command it! Why did I utter those words? It was by some accident I said them. I need not have said them, he thought, and then nothing would have happened. He saw the frightened and then infuriated face of the dragoon who dealt the blow, the look of silent, timid reproach that boy in the fur-lined coat had turned upon him. But, but I did not do it for my own sake. I was bound to act that way. The mob, the, tra the traitor, the public welfare, thought he. Troops were still crowding at the Yauza Bridge. It was hot. Kutuzov, dejected and frowning, sat on a bench by the bridge, toying with his whip in the sand, when a kalosh dashed up noisily. A man in a general's uniform, with plumes in his hat, went up to Kutuzov and said something in French. It was Count Rostopchin. He told Kutuzov that he had come because Moscow, the capital, 
was no more, and only the army remained. Things would have been different if your Serene Highness had not told me that you would not abandon Moscow without another battle. All this would not have happened, he said. Kutuzov looked at Rostopchin, as if, not grasping what was said to him, he was trying to read something peculiar, written that moment on the face of the man addressing him. Rostopchin grew confused and became silent. Kutuzov silently shook his head, and not taking his penetrating gaze from Rostopchin's face, muttered softly, No, I shall not give Moscow up without a battle. Whether Kutuzov was thinking of something entirely different when he spoke those words, or uttered them purposely, knowing them to be meaningless. At any rate, Rostopchin made no reply, and hastily left him. And strange to say, the governor of Moscow, the proud Count Rostopchin, took up a Cossack whip, and went to the bridge, where he began with shouts to drive on the carts that blocked the way. End of chapter 25「War and Peace」Book 11 Chapter 26 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick Toward four o'clock in the afternoon Murat's troops were entering Moscow. In front rode a detachment of Württemberg hussars and behind them rode the King of Naples himself accompanied by a numerous suite. About the middle of the Arbat Street, near the Church of the Miraculous Icon of St. Nicholas, Murat halted to await news from the advanced detachment as to the condition in which they had found the citadel, Le Kremlin. Around Murat, gathered a group of those who had remained in Moscow. They all stared in timid bewilderment at the strange, long-haired commander dressed up in feathers and gold. Is that the Tsar himself? He's not bad, low voices could be heard saying. An interpreter rode up to the group. Take off your cap! your caps. These words went from one to another in the crowd. The interpreter addressed an old porter and asked if it was far to the Kremlin. The porter, listening in perplexity to the unfamiliar Polish accent and not realizing that the interpreter was speaking Russian, did not understand what was being said to him, and slipped behind the others. Murat approached the interpreter and told him to ask where the Russian army was. One of the Russians understood what was asked, and several voices at once began answering the interpreter. A French officer, returning from the advanced detachment, rode up to Murat, and reported that the gates of the citadel had been barricaded and that there was probably an ambuscade there. Good, said Murat, and turning to one of the gentlemen in his suite, ordered four light guns to be moved forward to fire at the gates. The guns emerged at a trot from the column following Murat and advanced up the arbit. When they reached the end of the Vozdvizienska street, they halted and drew in the square. Several French officers superintended the placing of the guns and looked at the Kremlin through field glasses. The bells in the Kremlin were ringing for vespers, and this sound troubled the French. They imagined it to be a call to arms. 
A few infantrymen ran to the Kutafiev gate. Beams and wooden screens had been put there, and two musket shots rang out from under the gate as soon as an officer and man began to run toward it. A general, who was standing by the guns, shouted some words of command to the officer, and the latter ran back again with his man. The sound of three more shots came from the gate. One shot struck a French soldier's foot, and from behind the screens came the strange sound of a few voices shouting. Instantly, as at a word of command, the expression of cheerful serenity on the faces of the French general, officers, and men changed to one of determined, concentrated readiness for strife and suffering. To all of them, from the marshal to the least soldier, that place was not the Vozdvizemska, Mok Havaya, or Kuta Fiev Street, nor the Troitsa Gate, places familiar in Moscow, but a new battlefield which would probably prove sanguinary. And all made ready for that battle. The cries from the gates ceased, the guns were advanced, the artillerymen blew the ash off their linstocks, and an officer gave the word, Fire! This was followed by two whistling sounds of canister shot, one after another. The shot rattled against the stone of the gate and upon the wooden beams and screens, and two wavering clouds of smoke rose over the square. A few instants after the echo of the reports resounding over the stone-built Kremlin had died away, the French heard a strange sound above their head. Thousands of crows rose above the walls and circled in the air, cawing and noisily flapping their wings. Together with that sound came a solitary human cry from the gateway, and amid the smoke appeared the figure of a bareheaded man in a peasant's coat. He grasped a musket and took aim at the French. Fire, repeated the officer once more, and the reports of a musket and of two cannon shots were heard simultaneously. The gate was again hidden by smoke. Nothing more stirred behind the screens, and the French infantry soldiers and officers advanced to the gate. In the gateway lay three wounded and four dead. Two men in peasant coats ran away at the foot of the wall towards the Znamenka. Clear that away, said the officer, pointing to the beams and the corpses, and the French soldiers, after dispatching the wounded, threw the corpses over the parapet. Who these men were, nobody knew. Clear that away was all that was said of them, and they were thrown over the parapet and removed later on that they may not stink. Thiers alone dedicates a few eloquent lines to their memory. These wretches had occupied the sacred citadel, having supplied themselves with guns from the arsenal and fired the wretches at the French. Some of them were sabred, and the Kremlin was purged of their presence. Murat was informed that the way had been cleared. The French entered the gates and began pitching their camp in the Senate Square. Out of the windows of the Senate House, the soldiers threw chairs into the square for fuel and kindled fires there. Other detachments passed through the Kremlin and encamped along the Morosaika, the Lubyanka, and Pokrovka streets. Others quartered themselves along the Vozdvizhenka, the Nikolsky, and the Tverskoy streets. No masters of the houses being found anywhere, the French were not billeted on the inhabitants as is usual in towns, but lived in it as in a camp. Though tattered, hungry, worn out, and reduced to a third of their original number, 
The French entered Moscow in good marching order. It was a weary and famished, but still a fighting and menacing army. But it remained an army only until its soldiers had dispersed into their different lodgings. As soon as the men of the various regiments began to disperse among the wealthy and deserted houses, the army was lost forever, and there came into being something nondescript, neither citizens nor soldiers, but what are known as marauders. When five weeks later these same men left Moscow, they no longer formed an army. They were a mob of marauders, each carrying a quantity of articles which seemed to him valuable or useful. The aim of each man when he left Moscow was no longer as it had been to conquer, but merely to keep what he had acquired. Like a monkey which puts its paw into the narrow neck of a jug and having seized a handful of nuts will not open its fist for fear of losing what it holds and therefore perishes, the French when they left Moscow had inevitably to perish because they carried their loot with them, yet to abandon what they had stolen was as impossible for them as it is for the monkey to open its paw and let go of its nuts. Ten minutes after each regiment had entered the Moscow district, not a soldier or officer was left. Men in military uniforms and hessian boots could be seen through the windows, laughing and walking through the rooms. In cellars and storerooms similar men were busy among the provisions, and in the yards unlocking or breaking open coach house and stable doors, lighting fires in kitchens and kneading and baking bread with rolled up sleeves and cooking, or frightening, amusing, or caressing women and children. There were many such men, both in the shops and houses, but there was no army. Order after order was issued by the French commanders that day, forbidding the men to disperse about the town, sternly forbidding any violence to the inhabitants or any looting, and announcing a roll call for that very evening. But despite all these measures, the men, who had till then constituted an army, flowed all over the wealthy deserted city with its comforts and plentiful supplies. As a hungry herd of cattle keeps well together when crossing a barren field, but gets out of hand and at once disperses uncontrollably as soon as it reaches rich pastures, so did the army disperse all over the wealthy city. No residents were left in Moscow, and the soldiers, like water percolating through sand, spread irresistibly through the city in all directions from the Kremlin into which they had first marched. The cavalry, on entering a merchant's house, that had been abandoned and finding their stabling more than sufficient for their horses, went on all the same to the next house, which seemed to them better. Many of them appropriated several houses, chalked their names on them, and quarreled and even fought with other companies for them. Before they had had time to secure quarters, the soldiers ran out into the streets to see the city, and hearing that everything had been abandoned, rushed to places where valuables were to be had for the taking. The officers followed to check the soldiers and were involuntarily drawn into doing the same. In carriage row, carriages had been left in the shops, and generals flocked there to select calashes and coaches for themselves. 
The few inhabitants who had remained invited the commanding officers to their houses, hoping thereby to secure themselves from being plundered. There were masses of wealth, and there seemed no end to it. All around the quarters occupied by the French were other regions still unexplored and unoccupied where they thought yet greater riches might be found. And Moscow engulfed the army ever deeper and deeper. When water is spilled on dry ground, both the dry ground and the water disappear and mud results. And in the same way, the entry of the famished army into the rich and deserted city resulted in fires and looting and the destruction of both the army and the wealthy city. The French attributed the fire of Moscow O patriotism feroz the Rostopchin. Asterisk. Rostopchin's ferocious patriotism. The Russians to the barbarity of the French. In reality, however, it was not and could not be possible to explain the burning of Moscow by making any individual or any group of people responsible for it. Moscow was burned because it found itself in a position in which any town built of wood was bound to burn quite apart from whether it had or had not a hundred and thirty inferior fire engines. Deserted Moscow had to burn as inevitably as a heap of shavings has to burn on which sparks continually fall for several days. A town built of wood where scarcely a day passes without conflagrations when the house owners are in residence and the police force is present cannot help burning when its inhabitants have left it and it is occupied by soldiers who smoke pipes, make campfires of the Senate chairs in the Senate Square, and cook themselves meals twice a day. In peacetime, it is only necessary to billet troops in the villages of any district, and the number of fires in that district immediately increases. How much then must the probability of fire be increased in an abandoned wooden town where foreign troops are quartered. Le patriotism feroce de Rostopchin and the barbarity of the French were not to blame in the matter. Moscow was set on fire by the soldiers' pipes, kitchens and campfires, and by the carelessness of enemy soldiers occupying houses they did not own. Even if there was any arson, which is very doubtful, for no one had any reason to burn the houses, in any case a troublesome and dangerous thing to do, arson cannot be regarded as the cause, for the same thing would have happened without any incendiarism. However tempting it might be for the French to blame Rostopchin's ferocity and for Russians to blame the scoundrel Bonaparte or later on to place a heroic torch in the hands of their own people, it is impossible not to see that there could be no such direct cause of the fire. For Moscow had to burn, as every village, factory or house must burn, which is left by its owners, and in which strangers are allowed to live and cook their porridge. Moscow was burned by its inhabitants, it is true, but by those who had abandoned it, and not by those who remained in it. Moscow, when occupied by the enemy, did not remain intact like Berlin, Vienna, and other towns simply because its inhabitants abandoned it and did not welcome the French with bread and salt nor bring them the keys of the city. End of chapter 26
Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida. War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 27, read for LibriVox.org by David Rehm. The absorption of the French by Moscow, radiating star-wise as it did, only reached the quarter where Pierre was staying by the evening of the 2nd of September. After the last two days spent in solitude and unusual circumstances, Pierre was in a state bordering on insanity. He was completely obsessed by one persistent thought. He did not know how or when this thought had taken such possession of him, but he remembered nothing of the past, understood nothing of the present, and all he saw and heard appeared to him like a dream. He had left home only to escape the intricate tangle of life's demands that enmeshed him, and which in his present condition he was unable to unravel. He had gone to Joseph Alexeyevich's house, on the plea of sorting the deceased's books and papers, only in search of rest from life's turmoil, for in his mind the memory of Joseph Alexeyevich was connected with a world of eternal, solemn, and calm thoughts quite contrary to the restless confusion into which he felt himself being drawn. He sought a quiet refuge, and in Joseph Alexeyevich's study he really found it. When he sat with his elbows on the dusty writing-table in the death-like stillness of the study, calm and significant memories of the last few days rose one after another in his imagination, particularly of the Battle of Borodino, and of the vague sense of his own insignificance and insincerity compared with the truth, simplicity, and strength of the class of men he mentally classed as they. When Garrison roused him from his reverie, the idea occurred to him of taking part in the popular defense of Moscow, which he knew was projected. And with that object, he had asked Garrison to get him a peasant's coat and a pistol, confiding to him his intention of remaining in Joseph Alexeyevich's house and keeping his name secret. Then, during the first day spent in an action and solitude, he tried several times to fix his attention on the Masonic manuscripts, but was unable to do so. The idea that had previously occurred to him of the Kabbalistic significance of his name in connection with Bonaparte's more than once vaguely presented itself. But the idea that he, Larus Bozuhov, was destined to set a limit to the power of the beast was, as yet, only one of the fancies that often passed through his mind and left no trace behind. When, having bought the coat merely with the object of taking part among the people of the defense of Moscow, Pierre had met the Rostovs and Natasha, had said to him, "'Are you remaining in Moscow? How splendid!' The thought flashed into his mind that it really would be a good thing, even if Moscow were taken, for him to remain there and do what he was predestined to do. Next day, with the sole idea of not spurring himself and not lagging in any way behind them, Pierre went to the Three Hills Gate. But when he returned to the house convinced that Moscow would not be defended, he suddenly felt that what before had seemed to him merely a possibility had now become absolutely necessary and inevitable. He must remain in Moscow, concealing his name, and must meet Napoleon and kill him, and either perish or put an end to the misery of all Europe, which it seemed to him was solely due to Napoleon. Pierre knew all the details of the attempt on Bonaparte's life in 1809 by a German student in Vienna, and knew that the student had been shot, and the risk to which he would expose his life by carrying out his design excited him still more. Two equally strong feelings drew Pierre irresistibly to this purpose. The first was a feeling of the necessity of sacrifice and suffering in view of the common calamity, the same feeling that had caused him to go to Mojaisk on the 25th and to make his way to the very thick of the battle, and had now caused him to run away from his home and, in place of the luxury and comfort to which he was accustomed, to sleep on a hard sofa without undressing and eat the same food as garrison. The other was that vague and quite Russian feeling of contempt for everything conventional, artificial, and human, for everything the majority of men regard as the greatest good in the world. Pierre had first experienced this strange and fascinating feeling at the Sloboda Palace, when he had suddenly felt that wealth, power, and life, all that men so painstakingly acquire and guard, if it has any worth, has so only by reason the joy with which it can all be renounced. It was the feeling that induces a volunteer recruit to spend his last penny on drink, and a drunken man to smash mirrors or glasses for no apparent reason, and knowing that it will cost him all the money he possesses. The feeling which causes a man to perform actions which, from an ordinary point of view, are insane, to test, as it were, his personal power and strength, affirming the existence of a higher non-human criterion of life. 
From the very day Pierre had experienced this feeling for the first time at the Sloboda Palace, he had been continuously under its influence, but only now found full satisfaction for it. Moreover, at this moment Pierre was supported in his design and prevented from renouncing it by what he had already done in that direction. If he were now to leave Moscow like everyone else, his flight from home, the peasant coat, the pistol, and his announcement to the Rostovs that he would remain in Moscow would all become not merely meaningless, but contemptible and ridiculous, and to this Pierre was very sensitive. Pierre's physical condition, as is always the case, corresponded to his mental state. The unaccustomed coarse food, the vodka he drank during those days, the absence of wine and cigars, his dirty unchanged linen, two almost sleepless nights passed on a short sofa without bedding, all this kept him in a state of excitement bordering on insanity. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. The French had already entered Moscow. Pierre knew this, but instead of acting he only thought about his undertaking, going over its minutest details in his mind. In his fancy he did not clearly picture to himself either the striking of the blow or the death of Napoleon, but with extraordinary vividness and melancholy enjoyment imagined his own destruction and heroic endurance. Yes, alone, for the sake of all, I must do it or perish, he thought. Yes, I will approach, and then suddenly, with pistol or dagger, but that is all the same. It is not I but the hand of providence that punishes thee, I shall say, thought he, imagining what he would say when killing Napoleon. Well then, take me and execute me, he went on, speaking to himself and bowing his head with a sad but firm expression. While Pierre, standing in the middle of the room, was talking to himself in this way, the study door opened, and on the threshold appeared the figure of Makar Alexeyevich, always so timid before, but now quite transformed. His dressing gown was unfastened, his face red and distorted. He was obviously drunk. On seeing Pierre, he grew confused at first, but noticing embarrassment on Pierre's face, immediately grew bold and, staggering on his thin legs, advanced into the middle of the room. They're frightened, he said confidentially in a hoarse voice. I say, I won't surrender. I say, am I not right, sir? He paused, and then suddenly, seeing the pistol on the table, seized it with unexpected rapidity and ran out into the corridor. Garrison and the porter, who had followed Makar Alexeyevich, stopped him in the vestibule and tried to take the pistol from him. Pierre, coming out into the corridor, looked with pity and repulsion at the half-crazy old man. Makar Alexeyevich, frowning with exertion, held on to the pistol and screamed hoarsely, evidently with some heroic fancy in his head. To arms! Board them! No, you shan't get it! he yelled. That will do. Please, that will do. Have the goodness. Please, sir, to let go. Please, sir pleaded Garrison, trying carefully to steer Makar Alexeyevich by the elbows back to the door. "'Who are you? Bonaparte!' shouted Makar Alexeyevich. "'That's not right, sir. Come to your room, please, and rest. Allow me to have the pistol. Be off, thou base slave. Touch me not. See this?' shouted Makar Alexeyevich, brandishing the pistol. "'Board them! Catch hold!' whispered Garrison to the porter. They seized Makar Alexeyevich by the arms and dragged him to the door. The vestibule was filled with the discordant sounds of a struggle and of a tipsy hoarse voice. Suddenly a fresh sound, a piercing feminine scream, reverberated from the porch, and the cook came running into the vestibule. "'It's them! Gracious heavens! Oh, Lord! Four of them! Horsemen!' she cried. Garrison and the porter let Makar Alexeyevich go, and in the now silent corridor the sound of several hands knocking at the front door could be heard. End of chapter 27, July 2nd, 2009《War and Peace》Book Eleven, Chapter Twenty Eight, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Pierre, having decided that until he had carried out his design, he would disclose neither his identity nor his knowledge of French, stood at the half-open door of the corridor, intending to conceal himself as soon as the French entered. But the French entered, and still Pierre did not retire. An irresistible curiosity kept him there. There were two of them. One was an officer, a tall, soldierly, handsome man, the other evidently a private or an orderly, sunburned, short, and thin, with sunken cheeks and a dull expression. The officer walked in front, leaning on a stick and slightly limping. When he had advanced a few steps, he stopped, having apparently decided that these were good quarters, turned round to the soldiers standing at the entrance, 
and in a loud voice of command ordered them to put up the horses. Having done that, the officer, lifting his elbow with a smart gesture, stroked his moustache and lightly touched his hat. "'Bonjour la compagnie,' said he gaily, smiling and looking about him. No one gave any reply. "'Vous êtes le bourgeois?' the officer asked Gerasim. Gerasim gazed at the officer with an alarmed and inquiring look. "'Cartier, quartier, logement!' said the officer, looking down at the little man with a condescending and good-natured smile. "'Les Français sont des bons enfants. Que diable! Voyons! Ne nous fâchons pas, mon vieux!' Translation. "'Quarters, quarters, lodgings! The French are good fellows. What the devil! There, don't let us be cross, old fellow!' added he, clapping the scared and silent Gerasim on the shoulder. "'Well, does no one speak French in this establishment?' he asked again in French looking around and meeting Pierre's eyes. Pierre moved away from the door. Again the officer turned to Gerasim, and asked him to show him the rooms in the house. "'Master, not here. Don't understand me, you,' said Gerasim, trying to render his words more comprehensible by contorting them. Still smiling, the French officer spread out his hands before Gerasim's nose, intimating that he did not understand him either, and moved, limping, to the door at which Pierre was standing. Pierre wished to go away and conceal himself, but at that moment he saw Makar Alexeyevich appearing at the open kitchen door with a pistol in his hand. With a madman's cunning, Makar Alexeyevich eyed the Frenchman, raised his pistol, and took aim. "'Board them!' yelled the tipsy man, trying to press the trigger. Hearing the yell, the officer turned round, and at the same moment Pierre threw himself on the drunkard, just when Pierre snatched at and struck up the pistol, Makar Elzevich at last got his fingers on the trigger. There was a deafening report, and all were enveloped in a cloud of smoke. The Frenchman turned pale and rushed to the door. Forgetting his intention of concealing his knowledge of French, Pierre, snatching away the pistol and throwing it down, ran up to the officer and addressed him in French. "'You are not wounded?' he asked. "'I think not,' answered the Frenchman, feeling himself over. "'But I've had a lucky escape this time,' he added, pointing to the damaged plaster of the wall. "'Who is that man?' said he, looking sternly at Pierre. "'Oh, I'm really in despair at what has occurred,' said Pierre rapidly, quite forgetting the part he had intended to play. "'He's an unfortunate madman who did not know what he was doing.' The officer went up to Makar Alexeyevich and took him by the collar. Makar Alexeyevich was standing with parted lips, swaying as if about to fall asleep as he leant against the wall. "'Brigand! You shall pay for this!' said the Frenchman, letting go of him. "'We French are merciful after victory, but we do not pardon traitors,' he added, with a look of gloomy dignity and a fine energetic gesture. Pierre continued, in French, to persuade the officer not to hold that drunken imbecile to account. The Frenchman listened in silence with the same gloomy expression, but suddenly turned to Pierre with a smile. For a few seconds he looked at him in silence. His handsome face assumed a melodramatically gentle expression, and he held out his hand. "'You have saved my life. You are French,' said he. For a Frenchman that deduction was indubitable. Only a Frenchman could perform a great deed, and to save his life, the life of Monsieur Rambal, captain of the 13th Light Regiment, was undoubtedly a very great deed. But however indubitable that conclusion and the officer's conviction based upon it, Pierre felt it necessary to disillusion him. "'I am Russian,' he said quickly. "'Tut, tut, tut! Tell that to others,' said the officer, waving his finger before his nose and smiling. "'You shall tell me all about that presently. I am delighted to meet a compatriot. Well, and what are we to do with this man?' he added, addressing himself to Pierre as to a brother. Even if Pierre were not a Frenchman, having once received that loftiest of human appellations, he could not renounce it, said the officer's look and tone. In reply to his last question, Pierre again explained who Makar Alexeyevich was, and how, just before their arrival, that drunken imbecile had seized the loaded pistol, which they had not had time to recover from him, and begged the officer to let the deed go unpunished. The Frenchman expanded his chest, and made a majestic gesture with his arm. "'You have saved my life. You are French. You ask his pardon? I grant it you. Lead that man away,' said he quickly and energetically and taking the arm of Pierre, whom he had promoted to be a Frenchman for saving his life, he went with him into the room. The soldiers in the yard, hearing the shot, came into the passage, asking what had happened, 
and expressed their readiness to punish the culprits, but the officer sternly checked them. "'You'll be called in when you're wanted,' he said. The soldiers went out again, and the orderly, who had meanwhile had time to visit the kitchen, came up to his officer. "'Captain, there is soup and a leg of mutton in the kitchen,' said he. "'Shall I serve them up?' "'Yes, and some wine,' answered the captain. End of chapter 28「War and Peace」Book 11 Chapter 29 Read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon When the French officer went into the room with Pierre, the latter again thought it his duty to assure him that he was not French and wished to go away, but the officer would not hear of it. He was so very polite, amiable, good-natured, and genuinely grateful to Pierre for saving his life that Pierre had not the heart to refuse and sat down with him in the parlour, the first room they entered. To Pierre's assurances that he was not a Frenchman, the captain, evidently not understanding how anyone could decline so flattering an appellation, shrugged his shoulders and said that if Pierre absolutely insisted on passing for a Russian, let it be so, but for all that he would be forever bound to Pierre by gratitude for saving his life. Had this man been endowed with the slightest capacity for perceiving the feelings of others, and had he at all understood what Pierre's feelings were, the latter would probably have left him, but the man's animated obtuseness to everything other than himself disarmed Pierre. "'A Frenchman, or a Russian prince incognito,' said the officer, looking at Pierre's fine, though dirty linen, and at the ring on his finger. "'I owe my life to you, and offer you my friendship. A Frenchman never forgets either an insult or a service. I offer you my friendship. That is all I can say.' There was so much good nature and nobility, in the French sense of the word, in the officer's voice, in the expression of his face and in his gestures, that Pierre, unconsciously smiling in response to the Frenchman's smile, pressed the hand held out to him. "'Captain Rambal, of the 13th Light Regiment, Chevalier of the Legion of Honour for the affair on the 7th of September,' he introduced himself, a self-satisfied, irrepressible smile puckering his lips under his moustache. "'Will you now be so good as to tell me with whom I have the honour of conversing so pleasantly?' instead of being in the ambulance with that maniac's bullet in my body. Pierre replied that he could not tell him his name, and, blushing, began to try to invent a name and to say something about his reason for concealing it, but the Frenchman hastily interrupted him. "'Oh, please,' said he, "'I understand your reasons. You are an officer, a superior officer, perhaps. You have borne arms against us. That's not my business. I owe you my life. That is enough for me. I'm quite at your service.' "'You belong to the gentry?' he concluded, with a shade of inquiry in his tone. Pierre bent his head. "'Your baptismal name, if you please, that is all I ask. Monsieur Pierre, you say? That's all I want to know.' When the mutton and an omelette had been served, and a samovar and vodka brought, with some wine which the French had taken from a Russian cellar and brought with them, Rambal invited Pierre to share his dinner, and himself began to eat greedily and quickly like a healthy and hungry man, munching his food rapidly with his strong teeth, continually smacking his lips, and repeating, "'Excellent! Delicious!' His face grew red and was covered with perspiration. Pierre was hungry and shared the dinner with pleasure. Morel, the orderly, brought some hot water in a saucepan and placed a bottle of claret in it. He also brought a bottle of quass, taken from the kitchen for them to try. That beverage was already known to the French, and had been given a special name. They called it limonade de cochon, pig's lemonade, and Morel spoke well of the limonade de cochon he had found in the kitchen. But as the captain had the wine they had taken while passing through Moscow, he left the quasse to Morel and applied himself to the bottle of Bordeaux. He wrapped the bottle up to its neck in a table napkin and poured out wine for himself and for Pierre. The satisfaction of his hunger and the wine rendered the captain still more lively, and he chatted incessantly all through dinner. "'Yes, my dear Monsieur Pierre, I owe you a fine votive candle for saving me from that maniac. You see, I've bullets enough in my body already. Here's one I got at Rakram. he touched his side, and a second at Smolensk. He showed his scar on his cheek. And this leg, which as you see does not want to march, I got that on the seventh at the great battle of La Moscova. Sacre Dieu, it was splendid. That deluge of fire was worth seeing. It was a tough job you set us there, my word. You may be proud of it. 
and on my honour, in spite of the cuff I caught there, I should be ready to begin again. I pity those who did not see it. I was there, said Pierre. <laughs> bah, really? So much the better. You're certainly brave foes. The great redoubt held out well by my pipe, continued the Frenchman, and you made us pay dear for it. I was at it three times, sure as I sit here. Three times we reached the guns, and three times we were thrown back like carpet figures. Oh, it was beautiful, Monsieur Pierre. Your grenadiers were splendid, by heaven. I saw them close up their ranks six times in succession, and march as if on parade. Fine fellows! Our king of Naples, who knows what's what, cried, Bravo! <laughs> so you're one of us soldiers, he added, smiling, after a momentary pause. So much the better, so much the better, Monsieur Pierre. Terrible in battle. Gallant with the fair, he winked and smiled. That's what the French are, Monsieur Pierre, aren't they? The captain was so naively and good-humouredly gay, so real, and so pleased with himself, that Pierre almost winked back as he looked merrily at him. Probably the word gallant turned the captain's thoughts to the state of Moscow. A propos, tell me, please, is it true that the women have all left Moscow? What a queer idea! What had they to be afraid of? Would not the French ladies leave Paris if the Russians entered it? asked Pierre. <laughs> The Frenchman emitted a merry, sandrine chuckle, patting Pierre on the shoulder. "'What a thing to say!' he exclaimed. "'Paris! But Paris! Paris!' "'Paris, the capital of the world,' Pierre finished his remark for him. The captain looked at Pierre. He had a habit of stopping short in the middle of his talk and gazing intently with his laughing, kindly eyes. "'Well, if you hadn't told me you were Russian, I should have wagered that you were Parisian. You have that... I don't know what, that... And having uttered this compliment, he again gazed at him in silence. I've been in Paris. I spent years there, said Pierre. Oh, yes, one sees that plainly. Paris. A man who doesn't know Paris is a savage. You can tell a Parisian two leagues off. Paris is Talma, La Duchesnois, Potier, the Sorbonne, the Boulevards. And noticing that his conclusion was weaker than what had gone before, he added quickly, there is only one Paris in the world. You have been to Paris and have remained Russian. Well, I don't esteem you the less for it. Under the influence of the wine he had drunk, and after the days he had spent alone with his distressing thoughts, Pierre involuntarily enjoyed talking with his cheerful and good-natured man. To return to your ladies, I hear they are lovely. What a wretched idea to go and bury themselves in the steppes when the French army is in Moscow. What a chance those girls have missed. You're peasant now, that's another thing. But you civilized people, you ought to know us better than that. We took Vienna, Berlin, Madrid, Naples, Rome, Warsaw, all the world's capitals. We are feared, but we are loved. We are nice to know. And then the Emperor, he began, but Pierre interrupted him. The Emperor, Pierre repeated, and his face suddenly became sad and embarrassed. Is the Emperor... The Emperor? He is generosity, mercy. Justice, order, genius, that's what the emperor is. It is I, Rambal, who tell you so. I assure you, I was his enemy eight years ago. My father was an emigrant count. But that man has vanquished me. He has taken hold of me. I could not resist the sight of the grandeur and glory with which he has covered France. When I understood what he wanted, when I saw that he was preparing a bed of laurels for us, you know, I said to myself, that is a monarch, and I devoted myself to him. So there... Oh, yes, mon cher, he is the greatest man of the ages, past or future. Is he in Moscow? Pierre stammered, with a guilty look. The Frenchman looked at his guilty face and smiled. No, he'll make his entry tomorrow, he replied, and continued his talk. Their conversation was interrupted by the cries of several voices at the gate, and by Morel, who came to say that some Württemberg hussars had come and wanted to put up their horses in the yard where the captain's horses were. This difficulty had arisen chiefly because the hussars did not understand what was said to them in French. The captain had their senior sergeant called in, and in a stern voice asked him to what regiment he belonged, who was his commanding officer, and by what right he allowed himself to claim quarters that were already occupied. The German, who knew little French, answered the two first questions by giving the names of his regiment and of his commanding officer, but in reply to the third question, which he did not understand, said, introducing broken French into his own German. 
that he was the quartermaster of the regiment, and his commander had ordered him to occupy all the houses one after another. Pierre, who knew German, translated what the German said to the captain, and gave the captain's reply to the Württemberg hussar in German. When he had understood what was said to him, the German submitted, and took his men elsewhere. The captain went out into the porch, and gave some orders in a loud voice. When he returned to the room, Pierre was sitting in the same place as before, with his head in his hands. His face expressed suffering. He really was suffering at that moment. When the captain went out and he was left alone, suddenly he came to himself and realized the position he was in. It was not that Moscow had been taken, or that the happy conquerors were masters in it, and were patronizing him. Painful as that was, it was not that which tormented Pierre at the moment. He was tormented by the consciousness of his own weakness. The few glasses of wine he had drunk, and the conversation with this good-natured man, had destroyed the mood of concentrated gloom in which he had spent the last few days, and which was essential for the execution of his design. The pistol, dagger, and peasant coat were ready. Napoleon was to enter the town next day. Pierre still considered that it would be a useful and worthy action to slay the evil doer, but now he felt that he would not do it. He did not know why, but he felt a foreboding that he would not carry out his intention. He struggled against the confession of his weakness, but dimly felt that he could not overcome it, and that his former gloomy frame of mind, concerning vengeance, killing, and self-sacrifice, had been dispersed like dust by contact with the first man he met. The captain returned to the room, limping slightly and whistling a tune. The Frenchman's chatter, which had previously amused Pierre, now repelled him. The tune he was whistling, his gait, and the gesture with which he twirled his moustache, all now seemed offensive. "'I will go away immediately. I won't say another word to him,' thought Pierre. He thought this, but still sat in the same place. A strange feeling of weakness tied him to the spot. He wished to get up and go away, but could not do so. The captain, on the other hand, seemed very cheerful. He paced up and down the room twice. His eyes shone and his moustache twitched as if he were smiling to himself at some amusing thought. "'The colonel of those Württembergers is delightful,' he suddenly said. "'He's a German, but a nice fellow all the same. But he's a German,' he sat down, facing Pierre. "'By the way, you know German, then?' Pierre looked at him in silence. "'What is the German for shelter?' "'Shelter?' Pierre repeated. "'The German for shelter is Unterkunft.' "'How do you say it?' the captain asked quickly and doubtfully. Unterkunft, Pierre repeated. Unterkunft, said the captain, and looked at Pierre for some seconds with laughing eyes. These Germans are first-rate fools, don't you think so, Monsieur Pierre? he concluded. Well, let's have another bottle of this Moscow Bordeaux, shall we? Morel will warm us up another little bottle. Morel, he called out gaily. Morel brought candles and a bottle of wine. The captain looked at Pierre by the candlelight, and was evidently struck by the troubled expression on his companion's face. Rambal, with genuine distress and sympathy in his face, went up to Pierre and bent over him. "'There, now, we're sad,' said he, touching Pierre's hand. "'Have I upset you?' "'No, really, have you anything against me?' he asked Pierre. "'Perhaps it's the state of affairs.' Pierre did not answer, but looked cordially into the Frenchman's eyes, whose expression of sympathy was pleasing to him. Honestly, without speaking of what I owe you, I feel friendship for you. Can I do anything for you? Dispose of me. It is for life and death. I say it with my hand on my heart, said he, striking his chest. Thank you, said Pierre. The captain gazed intently at him as he had done when he learned that shelter was Unterkunft in German, and his face suddenly brightened. Well, in that case, I drink to our friendship, he cried gaily, filling two glasses with wine. Pierre took one of the glasses and emptied it. Rambal emptied his too, again pressed Pierre's hand, and leaned his elbows on the table in a pensive attitude. "'Yes, my dear friend,' he began, "'such is fortune's caprice. Who would have said that I should be a soldier and a captain of dragoons in the service of Bonaparte, as we used to call him? Yet here I am in Moscow with him. I must tell you, mon cher,' he continued, in the sad and measured tones of a man who intends to tell a long story, that our name is one of the most ancient in France. And with a Frenchman's easy and naive frankness, the captain told Pierre the story of his ancestors, his childhood, youth, and manhood, and all about his relations and his financial and family affairs, ma pauvre mère playing, of course, an important part in the story. 
But all that is only life's setting. The real thing is love. Love. Am I not right, Monsieur Pierre? said he, growing animated. Another glass. Pierre again emptied his glass and poured himself out a third. Oh, women! Women! And the captain, looking with glistening eyes at Pierre, began talking of love and of his love affairs. There were very many of these, as one could easily believe, looking at the officer's handsome, self-satisfied face and noting the eager enthusiasm with which he spoke of women. Though all Rambal's love stories had the sensual character which Frenchmen regard as the special charm and poetry of love, yet he told his story with such sincere conviction that he alone had experienced and known all the charm of love, and he described women so alluringly that Pierre listened to him with curiosity. It was plain that l'amour which the Frenchman was so fond of was not that low and simple kind that Pierre had once felt for his wife, nor was it the romantic love, stimulated by himself, that he experienced for Natasha. Rambal despised both these kinds of love equally, the one he considered the love of clodhoppers, and the other the love of simpletons. L'amour which the Frenchman worshipped consisted principally in the unnaturalness of his relation to the woman, and in the combination of incongruities giving the chief charm to the feeling. Thus the captain touchingly recounted the story of his love for a fascinating marquise of thirty-five, and at the same time for a charming innocent child of seventeen, daughter of the bewitching marquise. The conflict of magnanimity between the mother and the daughter, ending in the mother's sacrificing herself and offering her daughter in marriage to her lover, even now agitated the captain, though it was the memory of a distant past. Then he recounted an episode in which the husband played the part of the lover, and he, the lover, assumed the role of the husband, as well as several droll incidents from his recollections of Germany, where shelter is called Unterkunft, and where the husbands eat sauerkraut, and the young girls are too blonde. Finally, the latest episode in Poland, still fresh in the captain's memory, in which he narrated with rapid gestures and glowing face, was of how he had saved the life of a Pole. In general, the saving of life continually occurred in the captain's stories, and the Pole had entrusted to him his enchanting wife, Parisienne de Coeur, while himself entering the French service. The captain was happy, the enchanting Polish lady wished to elope with him, but, prompted by magnanimity, the captain restored the wife to the husband, saying as he did so, I have saved your life, and I save your honour. Having repeated these words, the captain wiped his eyes, and gave himself a shake, as if driving away the weakness which assailed him at this touching recollection. Listening to the captain's tales, Pierre, as often happens late in the evening, and under the influence of wine, followed all that was told him, understood it all, and at the same time followed a train of personal memories which, he knew not why, suddenly arose in his mind. While listening to these love stories, his own love for Natasha unexpectedly rose to his mind, and going over the pictures of that love in his imagination, he mentally compared them with Rambal's tales. Listening to the story of the struggle between love and duty, Pierre saw before his eyes every minutest detail of his last meeting with the object of his love at the Sukharev water tower. At the time of that meeting it had not produced an effect upon him, he had not even once recalled it but now it seemed to him that that meeting had had in it something very important and poetic. "'Peter Kirillovich, come here, we've recognized you.' He now seemed to hear the words she had uttered, and to see before him her eyes, her smile, her travelling hood, and a stray lock of her hair, and there seemed to him something pathetic and touching in all this. Having finished his tale about the enchanting Polish lady, the captain asked Pierre if he had ever experienced a similar impulse to sacrifice himself for love and a feeling of envy of the legitimate husband. Challenged by this question, Pierre raised his head and felt a need to express the thoughts that filled his mind. He began to explain that he understood love for a woman somewhat differently. He said that in all his life he had loved and still loved only one woman, and that she could never be his. Tiens, said the captain. Pierre then explained that he had loved this woman from his earliest years, but that he had not dared to think of her because she was too young, and because he had been an illegitimate son without a name. Afterwards, when he had received a name and wealth, he dared not think of her because he loved her too well, placing her far above everything in the world, and especially, therefore, above himself. When he had reached this point, Pierre asked the captain whether he understood that. 
The captain made a gesture, signifying that even if he did not understand it, he begged Pierre to continue. Platonic love, clouds, he muttered. Whether it was the wine he had drunk, or an impulse of frankness, or the thought that this man did not, and never would, know any of those who played a part in his story, or whether it was all these things together, something loosened Pierre's tongue. Speaking thickly and with a faraway look in his shining eyes, he told the whole story of his life, his marriage, Natasha's love for his best friend, her betrayal of him, and all his own simple relations with her. Urged on by Rambal's questions, he also told what he had at first concealed, his own position, and even his name. More than anything else in Pierre's story, the captain was impressed by the fact that Pierre was very rich, had two mansions in Moscow, and that he had abandoned everything, and not left the city, but remained there concealing his name and station. When it was late at night, they went out together into the street. The night was warm and light. To the left of the house on the Pokrovka, a fire glowed, the first of those that were beginning in Moscow. To the right, and high up in the sky, was the sickle of the waning moon, and opposite to it hung that bright comet which was connected in Pierre's heart with his love. At the gate stood Gerasim, the cook, and two Frenchmen. Their laughter and their mutually incomprehensible remarks in two languages could be heard. They were looking at the glow seen in the town. There was nothing terrible in the one small distant fire in the immense city. Gazing at the high starry sky, at the moon, at the comet, and at the glow from the fire, Pierre experienced a joyful emotion. There now, how good it is! What more does one need? thought he. And suddenly remembering his intention, he grew dizzy, and felt so faint that he leaned against the fence to save himself from falling. Without taking leave of his new friend, Pierre left the gate with unsteady steps, and, returning to his room, lay down on the sofa, and immediately fell asleep. End of chapter 29《War and Peace》Book Eleven, Chapter Thirty, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. The glow of the first fire that began on the second of September was watched from the various roads by the fugitive Muscovites and by the retreating troops with many different feelings. The Rostov party spent the night at Mistichi, fourteen miles from Moscow. They had started so late on the first of September. The road had been so blocked by vehicles and troops so many things had been forgotten for which servants were sent back that they had decided to spend that night at a place three miles out of moscow the next morning they woke late and were again delayed so often that they only got as far as great mystici at ten o'clock that evening the rostov family and the wounded travelling with them were all distributed in the yards and huts of that large village the rostov's servants and coachmen and the orderlies of the wounded officers after attending to their masters, had supper, fed the horses, and came out into the porches. In the neighbouring hut lay Ravsky's adjutant with a fractured wrist. The awful pain he suffered made him moan incessantly and piteously, and his moaning sounded terrible in the darkness of the autumn night. He had spent the first night in the same yard as the Rostovs. The countess said she had been unable to close her eyes on account of his moaning, and at Mistichi, she moved into a worse hut simply to be farther away from the wounded man. In the darkness of the night one of the servants noticed, above the high body of a coach standing before the porch, the small glow of another fire. One glow had long been visible, and everybody knew that it was little Mistichi burning, set on fire by Mamonov's Cossacks. "'But look here, brothers, there's another fire,' remarked an orderly. All turned their attention to the glow." "'But they told us little Mistichi had been set on fire by Mamonov's Cossacks.' "'But that's not Mistichi. It's farther away.' "'Look, it must be in Moscow.' Two of the gazers went round to the other side of the coach, and sat down on its steps. "'It's more to the left. Why, little Mistichi is over there, and this is right on the other side.' Several men joined the first two. "'See how it's flaring,' said one. "'That's a fire in Moscow, either in the Sushesky or the Rogoski. Quarter. No one replied to this remark, and for some time they all gazed silently at the spreading flames of the second fire in the distance. Old Daniel Tarantich, 
the Count's valet, as he was called, came up to the group and shouted at Mishka. "'What are you staring at, you good-for-nothing? The Count will be calling, and there's nobody there. Go and gather the clothes together.' "'I only ran out to get some water,' said Mishka. "'But what do you think, Daniel Tauntich? Doesn't it look as if that glow were in Moscow?' remarked one of the footmen. Daniel Tauntich made no reply, and again for a long time they were all silent. The glow spread, rising and falling, farther and farther still. "'God have mercy! It's windy and dry,' said another voice. "'Just look! See what it's doing now!' Oh, Lord, you can even see the crows flying. Lord, have mercy on us sinners. They'll have it put out, no fear. Who's to put it out? Daniel Tantich, who had hitherto been silent, was heard to say. His voice was calm and deliberate. Moscow it is, brothers, said he. Mother Moscow, the white. His voice faltered, and he gave way to an old man's sob. And it was as if they had all only waited for this to realize the significance for them of the glow they were watching. Sighs were heard, words of prayer, and the sobbing of the Count's old valet. End of chapter 30《War and Peace》Book 11 Chapter 31 Read for LibriVox.org by David Anton. The valet, returning to the cottage, informed the Count that Moscow was burning. The Count donned his dressing gown and went out to look. Sonya and Madame Chasse, who had not yet undressed, went out with him. Only Natasha and the Countess remained in the room. Petya was no longer with the family. He had gone with his regiment, which was making for Troitsa. The Countess, on hearing that Moscow was on fire, began to cry. Natasha, pale with a fixed look, was sitting on the bench under the icons, just where she had sat down on arriving, and paid no attention to her father's words. She was listening to the ceaseless moaning of the adjutant, three houses off. "'Oh, how terrible!' said Sonya, returning from the yard, chilled and frightened. "'I believe the whole of Moscow will burn.' "'There's an awful glow. Natasha, do look. You can see it from the window,' she said to her cousin, evidently wishing to distract her mind. But Natasha looked at her as if not understanding what was said to her, and again fixed her eyes on the corner of the stove. She had been in this condition of stupor since the morning, when Sonya, to the surprise and annoyance of the Countess, had for some unaccountable reason found it necessary to tell Natasha of Prince Andrew's wound, and of his being with their party. The Countess had seldom been so angry with anyone as she was with Sonya. Sonya had cried and begged to be forgiven, and now, as if trying to atone for her fault, paid unceasing attention to her cousin. "'Look, Natasha, how dreadfully it is burning!' said she. "'What's burning?' asked Natasha. "'Oh, yes.' Moscow. And as if in order not to offend Sonya, and to get rid of her, she turned her face to the window, looked out in such a way that it was evident that she could not see anything, and again settled down in her former attitude. But you didn't see it! Yes, really, I did, Natasha replied, in a voice that pleaded to be left in peace. Both the Countess and Sonya understood that, naturally, neither Moscow nor the burning of Moscow, nor anything else, could seem of importance to Natasha. The Count returned and laid down behind the partition. The Countess went up to her daughter and touched her head with the back of her hand, as she was wont to do when Natasha was ill, then touched her forehead with her lips, as if to feel whether she was feverish, and finally kissed her. "'You are cold. You are trembling all over. You'd better lie down,' said the Countess. "'Lie down?' "'All right, I will. I'll lie down at once,' said Natasha. When Natasha had been told that morning that Prince Andrew was seriously wounded and was traveling with their party, she had first asked many questions. Where was he going? How was he wounded? Was it serious? And could she see him?' 
but after she had been told that she could not see him, that he was seriously wounded, but that his life was not in danger, she ceased to ask questions or to speak at all, evidently disbelieving what they told her, and convinced that, say what she might, she would still be told the same. All the way she had sat motionless in a corner of the coach with wide open eyes, and the expression in them which the Countess knew so well and feared so much, and now she sat in the same way on the bench where she had seated herself on arriving. She was planning something, and either deciding or had already decided something in her mind. The Countess knew this, but what it might be she did not know, and this alarmed and tormented her. Natasha, undress, darling. Lie down on my bed. A bed had been made on a bedstead for the Countess only. Madame Chasse and the two girls were to sleep on some hay on the floor. No, Mama, I will lie down here on the floor. Natasha replied irritably, and she went to the window and opened it. Through the open window, the moans of the adjutant could be heard more distinctly. She put her head out into the damp night air, and the countess saw her slim neck shaking with sobs and throbbing against the window frame. Natasha knew it was not Prince Andrew who was moaning. She knew Prince Andrew was in the same yard as themselves, and in a part of the hut across the passage. But this dreadful, incessant moaning made her sob. The countess exchanged a look with Sonia. "'Lie down, darling, lie down, my pet,' said the countess, softly touching Natasha's shoulders. "'Come, lie down.' "'Oh, yes, I'll lie down at once,' said Natasha, and began hurriedly undressing, tugging at the tapes of her petticoat. When she had thrown off her dress and put on a dressing jacket, she sat down with her foot under her on the bed that had been made up on the floor, jerked her thin and rather short plate of hair to the front, and began replating it. Her long, thin, practiced fingers rapidly unplated, replated, and tied up her plate. Her head moved from side to side from habit, but her eyes, feverishly wide, looked fixedly before her. When her toilet for the night was finished, she sank gently onto the sheet spread over the hay on the side nearest the door. "'Natasha, you'd better lie in the middle,' said Sonia. "'I'll stay here,' muttered Natasha. "'Do lie down,' she added crossly, and buried her face in the pillow. The Countess, Madame Chasse, and Sonia undressed hastily and lay down. The small lamp in front of the icons was the only light left in the room, but in the yard there was a light from the fire at little Metishi, a mile and a half away, and through the night came the noise of people shouting at a tavern Mamanov's Cossacks had set up across the street, and the adjutant's unceasing moans could still be heard. For a long time Natasha listened attentively to the sounds that reached her from inside and outside the room and did not move. First she heard her mother praying and sighing, and the creaking of her bed under her, then Madame Chasse's familiar whistling snore, and Sonia's gentle breathing. Then the Countess called to Natasha. Natasha did not answer. "'I think she's asleep, Mama," said Sonia softly. After a short silence the Countess spoke again, but this time no one replied. Soon after that, Natasha heard her mother's even breathing. Natasha did not move, though her little bare foot, thrust out from under the quilt, was growing cold on the bare floor. As if to celebrate a victory over everybody, a cricket chirped in a crack in the wall. A cock crowed far off, and another replied nearby. The shouting in the tavern had died down. Only the moaning of the adjutant was heard. Natasha sat up. Sonia, are, are you asleep? Mama, she whispered. No one replied. Natasha rose slowly and carefully crossed herself and stepped cautiously on the cold and dirty floor with her slim, supple, bare feet. The boards of the floor creaked. 
Stepping cautiously from one foot to the other, she ran like a kitten the few steps to the door and grasped the cold door handle. It seemed to her that something heavy was beating rhythmically against all the walls of the room. It was her own heart, sinking with alarm and terror and overflowing with love. She opened the door and stepped across the threshold and onto the cold, damp earthen floor of the passage. The cold she felt refreshed her. With her bare feet she touched a sleeping man, stepped over him, and opened the door into the part of the hut where Prince Andrew lay. It was dark in there. In the farthest corner, on a bench beside a bed, on which something was lying, stood a tallow candle with a long, thick, and smoldering wick. From the moment she had been told that morning of Prince Andrew's wound and his presence there, Natasha had resolved to see him. She did not know why she had to. She knew the meeting would be painful, but felt all the more convinced that it was necessary. All day she had lived only in hope of seeing him that night, but now that the moment had come she was filled with dread of what she might see. How was he maimed? What was left of him? Was he like that incessant moaning of the adjutants? Yes, he was altogether like that. In her imagination he was that terrible moaning personified. When she saw an indistinct shape in the corner, and mistook his knees, raised under the quilt for his shoulders, she imagined a horrible body there, and stood still in terror. But an irresistible impulse drew her forward. She cautiously took one step and then another, and found herself in the middle of a small room containing baggage. Another man, Tamakin, was lying in a corner on the benches beneath the icons, and two others, the doctor and a valet, lay on the floor. The valet sat up and whispered something. Tamakin, kept awake by the pain in his wounded leg, gazed with wide-open eyes at this strange apparition of a girl in a white chemise, dressing jacket, and nightcap. The valet's sleepy, frightened exclamation, "'What do you want? What's the matter?' made Natasha's approach more swiftly to what was lying in the corner. Horribly unlike a man as that body looked, she must see him. She passed the valet, the snuff fell from the candle wick, and she saw Prince Andrew clearly with his arms outside the quilt, and such as she had always seen him. He was the same as ever, but the feverish color of his face, his glittering eyes rapturously turned toward her, and especially his neck, delicate as a child's, revealed by the turned-down collar of his shirt, gave him a peculiarly innocent, childlike look, such as she had never seen on him before. She went up to him, and with a swift, flexible, youthful movement, dropped on her knees. He smiled, and held out his hand to her. End of chapter 31「War and Peace」Book 11 Chapter 32 Read for LibriVox.org by David Anton Seven days had passed since Prince Andrew found himself in the ambulance station on the field of Borodino. His feverish state and the inflammation of his bowels, which were injured, were in the doctor's opinion sure to carry him off. But on the seventh day he ate with pleasure a piece of bread with some tea and the doctor noticed that his temperature was lower. He had regained consciousness that morning. The first night after they left Moscow had been fairly warm, and he had remained in the Kalesh, but at Matishi the wounded man himself asked to be taken out and given some tea. The pain caused by his removal into the hut had made him groan aloud and again lose consciousness. When he had been placed on his camp bed, he lay for a long time motionless with closed eyes. Then he opened them and whispered softly, "'And the tea!' His remembering such a small detail of everyday life astonished the doctor. He felt Prince Andrew's pulse, and to his surprise and dissatisfaction found it had improved. He was dissatisfied because he knew by experience that if his patient did not die now, 
he would do so a little later with great suffering. Tamakin, the red-nosed major of Prince Andrew's regiment, had joined him in Moscow and was being taken along with him, having been wounded in the leg at the Battle of Borodino. They were accompanied by a doctor, Prince Andrew's valet, his coachman, and two orderlies. They gave Prince Andrew some tea. He drank it eagerly, looking with feverish eyes at the door in front of him, as if trying to understand and remember something. I don't want any more. Is Tamakin here? he asked. Tamakin crept along the bench to him. I am here, Your Excellency. How's your wound? Mine, sir? All right. How about you? Prince Andrew again pondered, as if trying to remember something. Couldn't one get a book? he asked. What book? The Gospels. I haven't one. The doctor promised to procure it for him, and began to ask how he was feeling. Prince Andrew answered all his questions reluctantly, but reasonably, and then said he wanted a bolster placed under him, as he was uncomfortable and in great pain. The doctor and valet lifted the cloak with which he was covered, and, making wry faces at the noisome smell of mortifying flesh that came from the wound, began examining that dreadful place. The doctor was very much displeased about something, and made a change in the dressings, turning the wounded man over so that he groaned again and grew unconscious and delirious from the agony. He kept asking them to get him the book and put it under him. "'What trouble would it be to you?' he said. "'I have not got one. Please get it for me and put it under me for a moment,' he pleaded in a piteous voice. The doctor went into the passage to wash his hands. "'You fellows have no conscience,' said he to the valet, who was pouring water over his hands. "'For just one moment I didn't look after you. "'It's such pain, you know, that I wonder how he can bear it.' "'By the Lord Jesus Christ, I thought we had put something under him,' said the valet. "'The first time Prince Andrew understood where he was and what was the matter with him, "'and remembered being wounded and how, was when he asked to be carried into the hut after his kalesh had stopped at Matishi. After growing confused from pain while being carried into the hut, he again regained consciousness, and while drinking tea once more recalled all that had happened to him, and above all vividly remembered the moment at the ambulance station when, at the sight of the sufferings of a man he disliked, those new thoughts had come to him, which promised him happiness. And those thoughts though now vague and indefinite, again possessed his soul. He remembered that he had now a new source of happiness, and that this happiness had something to do with the Gospels. That was why he had asked for a copy of them. The uncomfortable position in which they had put him and turned him over again confused his thoughts, and when he came to himself a third time, it was in the complete stillness of the night. Everybody near him was sleeping. A cricket chirped from across the passage, Someone was shouting and singing in the street. Cockroaches rustled on the table, on the icons, and on the walls, and a big fly flopped at the head of the bed and around the candle beside him, the wick of which was charred and had shaped itself like a mushroom. His mind was not in a normal state. A healthy man usually thinks of, feels, and remembers innumerable things simultaneously, but has the power and will to select one sequence of thoughts or events on which to fix his whole attention. A healthy man can tear himself away from the deepest reflections to say a civil word to someone who comes in and can then return again to his own thoughts. But Prince Andrew's mind was not in a normal state in that respect. All the powers of his mind were more active and clearer than ever, but they acted apart from his will. Most diverse thoughts and images occupied him simultaneously. At times his brain suddenly began to work with a vigor, clearness, and depth it had never reached when he was in health, but suddenly in the midst of its work it would turn to some unexpected idea, and he had not the strength to turn it back again. Yes, a new happiness was revealed to me, of which man cannot be deprived, he thought as he lay in the semi-darkness of the quiet hut, gazing fixedly before him with feverish, wide-open eyes. A happiness lying beyond material forces, outside the material influences that act on man. A happiness of the soul alone, the happiness of loving. Every man can understand it, but 
to conceive it and enjoin it was possible only for God. But how did God enjoin that law? And why was the sun... And suddenly the sequence of these thoughts broke off, and Prince Andrew heard, without knowing whether it was a delusion or reality, a soft whispering voice, incessantly and rhythmically repeating, Pity, pity, pity. And then, Ti, ti. And then again, Pity, pity, pity. And Ti, ti. Once more, at the same time, he felt that above his face, above the very middle of it, some strange airy structure was being erected out of slender needles or splinters, to the sound of this whispered music. He felt that he had to balance carefully, though it was difficult, so that this airy structure should not collapse. But nevertheless, it kept collapsing, and again slowly rising to the sound of whispered rhythmic music. It stretches, stretches, spreading out and stretching, said Prince Andrew to himself. While listening to this whispering and feeling the sensation of this drawing out and the construction of this edifice of needles, he also saw by glimpses a red halo round the candle, and heard the rustle of the cockroaches and the buzzing of the fly that flopped against his pillow and his face. Each time the fly touched his face, it gave him a burning sensation, and yet, to his surprise, it did not destroy the structure, though it knocked against the very region of his face where it was rising. But besides this, there was something else of importance. It was something white by the door, the statue of a sphinx, which also oppressed him. But perhaps that's my shirt on the table, he thought, and that's my legs, and that is the door. But why is it always stretching and drawing itself out, and pity, 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 and ti ti and pity, pity, pity? It's enough. Please leave off. Prince Andrew painfully entreated someone. And suddenly, thoughts and feelings again swam to the surface of his mind, with peculiar clearness and force. Yes, love, he thought again quite clearly, but not love which loves for something, for some quality, for some purpose, or for some reason, but the love which I, while dying, first experienced when I saw my enemy and yet loved him. I experienced that feeling of love which is the very essence of the soul, and does not require an object. Now again I feel that bliss. To love one's neighbors, to love one's enemies, to love everything, to love God and all his manifestations. It is possible to love someone dear to you with human love, but an enemy can only be loved by divine love. That is why I experienced such joy when I felt that I loved that man. What has become of him? Is he alive? When loving with human love, one may pass from love to hatred, but divine love cannot change. No, neither death nor anything else can destroy it. It is the very essence of the soul. Yet how many people have I hated in my life? And of them all, I loved and hated none as I did her and he vividly pictured to himself Natasha, not as he had done in the past, with nothing but her charms, which gave him delight, but for the first time picturing to himself her soul. And he understood her feelings, her sufferings, shame, and remorse. He now understood for the first time all the cruelty of his rejection of her, the cruelty of his rupture with her. If only it were possible for me to see her once more, just once, looking into those eyes to say, Pity, 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 and ti, ti, and pity, 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 boom, flopped the fly, and his attention was suddenly carried into another world, a world or reality and delirium in which something particular was happening. In that world, some structure was still being erected and did not fall. Something was still stretching out and the candle with its red halo was still burning, and the same shirt-like sphinx lay near the door. But besides all this, something creaked. There was a whiff of fresh air, and a new white sphinx appeared, standing at the door. And that sphinx had the pale face and shining eyes of the very Natasha of whom he had just been thinking. Oh, how oppressive this continual delirium is, thought Prince Andrew, trying to drive that face from his imagination. But the face remained before him with the force of reality and drew nearer. 
Prince Andrew wished to return to that former world of pure thought, but he could not, and delirium drew him back into its domain. The soft, whispering voice continued its rhythmic murmur. Something oppressed him and stretched out, and the strange face was before him. Prince Andrew collected all his strength in an effort to recover his senses. He moved a little, and suddenly there was a ringing in his ears, a dimness in his eyes, and like a man plunged into water, he lost consciousness. When he came to himself, Natasha, that same living Natasha, whom of all people he most longed to love with this new, pure divine love that had been revealed to him, was kneeling before him. He realized that it was the real, living Natasha, and he was not surprised, but quietly happy. Natasha, motionless on her knees, she was unable to stir, with frightened eyes riveted on him, was restraining her sobs. Her face was pale and rigid. Only in the lower part of it something quivered. Prince Andrew sighed with relief, smiled, and held out his hand. You, he said, how fortunate. With a rapid but careful movement, Natasha drew nearer to him on her knees, and, taking his hand carefully, bent her face over it and began kissing it, just touching it lightly with her lips. Forgive me, she whispered, raising her head and glancing at him. Forgive me. I love you, said Prince Andrew. Forgive. Forgive what? he asked. Forgive me for what I have done, faltered Natasha in a scarcely audible, broken whisper, and began kissing his hand more rapidly, just touching it with her lips. I love you more, better than before, said Prince Andrew, lifting her face with his hand so as to look into her eyes. Those eyes, filled with happy tears, gazed at him timidly, compassionately, and with joyous love. Natasha's thin, pale face, with its swollen lips, was more than plain. It was dreadful. But Prince Andrew did not see that. He saw her shining eyes, which were beautiful. They heard the sound of voices behind them. Peter, the valet, who was now wide awake, had roused the doctor. Tomokin, who had not slept at all because of the pain in his leg, had long been watching all that was going on, carefully covering his bare body with the sheet as he huddled up on his bench. "'What's this?' said the doctor, rising from his bed. "'Please go away, madam!' At that moment a maid sent by the countess, who had noticed her daughter's absence, knocked at the door. Like a sonambulist, aroused from her sleep, Natasha went out of the room, and, returning to her hut, fell sobbing on her bed. From that time, during all the rest of the Rostovs' journey, at every halting place and wherever they spent the night, Natasha never left the wounded Balkonsky, and the doctor had to admit that he had not expected from a young girl either such firmness or such skill in nursing a wounded man. Dreadful as the countess imagined it would be should Prince Andrew die in her daughter's arms during the journey, as, judging by what the doctor said, it seemed might easily happen, she could not oppose Natasha. Though with the intimacy now established between the wounded man and Natasha, the thought occurred that, should he recover, their former engagement would be renewed. No one, least of all Natasha and Prince Andrew, spoke of this. The unsettled question of life and death which hung not only over Bolkonsky, but over all Russia, shut out all other considerations. End of chapter 32「War and Peace」Book 11 Chapter 33 Read for LibriVox.org by Philippa Brody On the 3rd of September Pierre awoke late. His head was aching, the clothes in which he had slept without undressing felt uncomfortable on his body, and his mind had a dim consciousness of something shameful he had done the day before. That something shameful was his yesterday's conversation with Captain Rambal. 
It was eleven by the clock, but it seemed peculiarly dark out of doors. Pierre rose, rubbed his eyes, and seeing the pistol with an engraved stock which Gerasim had replaced on the writing table, he remembered where he was and what lay before him that very day. Am I not too late? he thought. No, probably he won't make his entry into Moscow before noon. Pierre did not allow himself to reflect on what lay before him, but hastened to act. After arranging his clothes, he took the pistol and was about to go out. But then it occurred to him for the first time that he certainly could not carry the weapon in his hand through the streets. It was difficult to hide such a big pistol, even under his white coat. He could not carry it unnoticed in his belt or under his arm. Besides, it had been discharged, and he had not had time to reload it. No matter, dagger will do. He said to himself, though when planning his design, he had more than once come to the conclusion that the chief mistake made by the student in eighteen o nine had been to try to kill Napoleon with a dagger. But as his chief aim consisted not in carrying out his design, but in proving to himself that he would not abandon his intention and was doing all he could to achieve it, Pierre hastily took the blunt, jagged dagger in the green sheath which he had bought at the Sukhodev market with the pistol and hid it under his waistcoat. Having tied a girdle over his coat and pulled his cap low on his head, Pierre went down the corridor, trying to avoid making a noise or meeting the captain, and passed out into the street. The conflagration, at which he had looked with so much indifference the evening before, had greatly increased during the night. Moscow was on fire in several places. The buildings in Carriage Row, across the river, in the Bazaar and the Povarskoy, as well as the barges on the Moskva River and the timber yards by the Dorogomilov Bridge. Were all ablaze. Pierre's way led through side streets to the Povarskoy, and from there to the church of Saint Nicholas on the Arbat, where he had long before decided that the deed should be done. The gates of most of the houses were locked and the shutters up. The streets and lanes were deserted. The air was full of smoke and the smell of burning. Now and then he met Russians with anxious and timid faces, and Frenchmen with an air of not of the city but of the camp, walking in the middle of the streets. Both the Russians and the French looked at Pierre with surprise. Besides his height and stoutness, and the strange morose look of suffering in his face and whole figure, the Russians stared at Pierre because they could not make out to what class he could belong. The French followed him with astonishment in their eyes, chiefly because Pierre, unlike all the other Russians who gazed at the French with fear and curiosity, paid no attention to them. At the gate of one house, three Frenchmen, who were explaining something to some Russians who did not understand them. Stopped Pierre, asking if he did not know French. Pierre shook his head and went on. In another side street, a sentinel standing beside a green caisson shouted at him, but only when the shout was threateningly repeated and he heard the click of the man's musket as he raised it, did Pierre understand that he had to pass on the other side of the street. He heard nothing and saw nothing of what went on around him. He carried his resolution within himself in terror and haste. Like something dreadful and alien to him, for after the previous night's experience, he was afraid of losing it. But he was not destined to bring his mood safely to his destination, and even had he not been hindered by anything on the way, his intention could not now have been carried out. For Napoleon had passed the Arbat more than four hours previously on his way from the Dorogomilov suburb to the Kremlin, and was now sitting in a very gloomy frame of mind in the royal study in the Kremlin, giving detailed and exact orders as to measures to be taken immediately to extinguish the fire, to prevent looting, and to reassure the inhabitants. But Pierre did not know this; he was entirely absorbed in what lay before him, and was tortured. As those are who obstinately undertake a task that is impossible for them, not because of its difficulty, but because of its incompatibility with their natures, by the fear of weakening at the decisive moment and so losing his self-esteem. Though he heard and saw nothing around him, he found his way by instinct and did not go wrong in the side streets that led to the Bovarskoy. As Pierre approached that street, the smoke became denser and denser. He even felt the heat of the fire. Occasionally, curly tongues of flame rose from under the roofs of the houses. He met more people in the streets, and they were more excited. But Pierre, though he felt that something unusual was happening around him, did not realize that he was approaching the fire. As he was going along a footpath across a wide open space adjoining the Pavarskoy on one side and the gardens of Prince Grzinski's house on the other, Pierre suddenly heard the desperate weeping of a woman close to him. He stopped as if awakening from a dream. And lifted his head. 
By the side of the path, on the dusty dry grass, all sorts of household goods lay in a heap, feather beds, a samovar, icons and trunks. On the ground beside the trunks sat a thin woman, no longer young, with long prominent upper teeth and wearing a black cloak and cap. This woman swaying to and fro and muttering something was choking with sobs. Two girls of about ten and twelve, dressed in dirty short frocks and cloaks, were staring at their mother with a look of stupefaction on their pale, frightened faces. The youngest child, a boy of about seven, who wore an overcoat and an immense cap, evidently not his own, was crying in his old nurse's arms. A dirty, barefooted maid was sitting on a trunk, and having undone her pale-coloured plait, was pulling it straight and sniffing at her singed hair. The woman's husband, a short, round-shouldered man in the undress uniform of a civilian official, with sausage-shaped whiskers, and showing under his square-set cap the hair smoothly brushed forward over his temples, with expressionless face, was moving the trunks, which were placed one on another, and was dragging some garments from under them. As soon as she saw Pierre, the woman almost threw herself at his feet. "'Dear people, good Christians, save me! Help me, dear friends! Help us, somebody!' she muttered between her sobs. "'My girl! My daughter! My youngest daughter is left behind! She's burned! Oh! Was it for this I nursed you? Oh!' "'Don't marry Nikolaevna," said her husband to her in a low voice evidently only to justify himself before the stranger. "'Sister must have taken her, or else where can she be?' he added. "'Monster! Villain!' shouted the woman angrily, suddenly ceasing to weep. "'You have no heart! You don't feel for your own child! Another man would have rescued her from the fire, but this is a monster and neither a man nor a father. You, honoured sir, are a noble man!' she went on, addressing Pierre rapidly between her sobs. The fire broke out alongside and blew our way. The maid called out fire, and we rushed to collect our things. We ran out just as we were. This is, this is what we have brought away, the icons and my dowry bed. All the rest is lost. We seized the children. But not Katie. Oh, oh, Lord! And again she began to sob. My child, my dear one, burned! burned. But where was she left? asked Pierre. From the expression of his animated face the woman saw that this man might help her. Oh dear sir, she cried, seizing him by the legs, my benefactor, set my heart at ease. Aniska, go, you horrid girl, show him the way, she cried to the maid, angrily opening her mouth and still farther exposing her long teeth. Show me the way, show me, I, I'll do it gasped Pierre rapidly. The dirty maidservant stepped from behind the trunk, put up her plait, sighed, and went on her short, bare feet along the path. Pierre felt as if he had come back to life after a heavy swoon. He held his head higher. His eyes shone with the light of life, and with swift steps he followed the maid, overtook her, and came out on the Pavarskoy. The whole street was full of clouds of black smoke. Tongues of flame here and there broke through that cloud. A great number of people crowded in front of the conflagration. In the middle of the street stood a French general saying something to those around him. Pierre, accompanied by the maid, was advancing to the spot where the general stood, but the French soldiers stopped him. "'On ne passe pas!' cried a voice. "'You can't pass!' "'This way, uncle!' cried the girl. "'We'll pass through the side streets by the Nicolines.' Pierre turned back, giving a spring now and then to keep up with her. She ran across the street, turned down a side street to the left, and passing three houses, turned into a yard on the right. "'It's here, close by,' said she, and, running across the yard, opened a gate in a wooden fence, and, stopping, pointed out to him a small wooden wing of the house, which was burning brightly and fiercely. One of its sides had fallen in, another was on fire, and bright flames issued from the openings of the windows and from under the roof. As Pierre passed through the fence gate, he was enveloped by hot air, and involuntarily stopped. "'Which is it? Which is your house?' he asked. "'Oh!' wailed the girl, pointing to the wing. "'That's it! That was our lodging! You've burned to death our treasure, Katie, my precious little missy! Oh!' lamented Aniska, 
who, at the sight of the fire, felt that she too must give expression to her feelings. Pierre rushed to the wing, but the heat was so great that he involuntarily passed round in a curve and came upon the large house that was as yet burning only at one end, just below the roof, and around which swarmed a crowd of Frenchmen. At first Pierre did not realize what these men, who were dragging something out, were about, but seeing before him a Frenchman hitting a peasant with a blunt sabre and trying to take from him a fox fur coat, he vaguely understood that looting was going on there, but he had no time to dwell on that idea. The sounds of crackling and the din of falling walls and ceilings, the whistle and hiss of the flames, the excited shouts of the people, and the sight of the swaying smoke, now gathering into thick black clouds and now soaring up with glittering sparks, with here and there dense sheaves of flame, now red and now like golden fish scales creeping along the walls, and the heat and smoke and rapidity of motion, produced on Pierre the usual animating effects of a conflagration. It had a peculiarly strong effect on him, because at the sight of the fire he felt himself suddenly freed from the ideas that had weighed him down. He felt young, bright, adroit, and resolute. He ran round to the other side of the lodge and was about to dash into that part of it which was still standing, when just above his head he heard several voices shouting, and then a cracking sound, and the ring of something heavy falling close beside him. Pierre looked up and saw at a window of the large house some Frenchmen, who had just thrown out the drawer of a chest, filled with metal articles. Other French soldiers standing below went up to the drawer. "'What does this fellow want?' shouted one of them, referring to Pierre. "'There's a child in that house. Haven't you seen a child?' cried Pierre. "'What's he talking about? Get along,' said several voices and one of the soldiers, evidently afraid that Pierre might want to take from them some of the plate and bronzes that were in the drawer, moved threateningly towards him. "'A child!' shouted a Frenchman from above. "'I did hear something squealing in the garden. Perhaps it's his breath that the fellow is looking for. After all, one must be human, you know.' "'Where is it? Where?' said Pierre. "'There! There!' shouted the Frenchman at the window, pointing to the garden at the back of the house. "'Wait a bit! I'm coming down!' And a minute or two later the Frenchman, a black-eyed fellow with a spot on his cheek, in shirt-sleeves, really did jump out of a window on the ground floor, and, clapping Pierre on the shoulder, ran with him into the garden. "'Hurry up, you others!' he called out to his comrades. "'It's getting hot!' When they reached a gravel path behind the house, the Frenchman pulled Pierre by the arm and pointed to a round gravelled space where a three-year-old girl in a pink dress was lying under a seat. "'There is your child.' "'Oh, a girl, so much the better,' said the Frenchman. "'Good-bye, fatty. We must be human. We are all mortal, you know.' And the Frenchman, with a spot on his cheek, ran back to his comrades. Breathless with joy, Pierre ran to the little girl and was going to take her in his arms. But seeing a stranger, the sickly, scrofulous-looking child, unattractively like her mother, began to yell and run away. Pierre, however, seized her and lifted her in his arms. She screamed desperately and angrily, and tried with her little hands to pull Pierre's hands away and to bite them with her slobbering mouth. Pierre was seized by a sense of horror and repulsion, such as he had experienced when touching some nasty little animal. But he made an effort not to throw the child down, and ran with her to the large house. It was now, however, impossible to get back the way he had come. The maid, Aniska, was no longer there, and Pierre, with a feeling of pity and disgust, pressed the wet, painfully sobbing child to himself as tenderly as he could, and ran with her through the garden, seeking another way out. End of chapter 33 Recording by Philippa Brody Laspecula.blogspot.com War and Peace, Book 11, Chapter 34, read for LibriVox.org, by Philippa Brody. Having run through different yards and side streets, Pierre got back with his little burden to the Grzynski garden at the corner of the Povarskoy. He did not at first recognize the place from which he had set out to look for the child, so crowded was it now with people and goods that had been dragged out of the houses. Besides Russian families who had taken refuge here from the fire with their belongings, 
There were several French soldiers in a variety of clothing. Pierre took no notice of them. He hurried to find the family of that civil servant in order to restore the daughter to her mother and go to save someone else. Pierre felt that he had still much to do and to do quickly. Glowing with the heat and from running, he felt at that moment more strongly than ever the sense of youth, animation, and determination that had come on him when he ran to save the child. She had now become quiet and clinging with her little hands to Pierre's coat, sat on his arm gazing about her like some little wild animal. He glanced at her occasionally with a slight smile. He fancied he saw something pathetically innocent in that frightened, sickly little face. He did not find the civil servant or his wife where he had left them. He walked among the crowd with rapid steps, scanning the various faces he met. Involuntarily he noticed a Georgian or Armenian family, consisting of a very handsome old man of Oriental type, wearing a new, cloth-covered, sheepskin coat and new boots, an old woman of similar type, and a young woman. That very young woman seemed to Pierre the perfection of Oriental beauty, with her sharply outlined, arched black eyebrows, and extraordinarily soft, bright colour of her long, beautiful, expressionless face. Amid the scattered property and the crowd and the open space, she, in her rich satin cloak with a bright lilac shawl on her head, suggested a delicate, exotic plant thrown out onto the snow. She was sitting on some bundles a little behind the old woman, and looked from under her long lashes with motionless, large, almond-shaped eyes at the ground before her. Evidently she was aware of her beauty, and fearful because of it. Her face struck Pierre, and hurrying along by the fence, he turned several times to look at her. When he had reached the fence, still without finding those he sought, he stopped and looked about him. With the child in his arms his figure was now more conspicuous than before, and a group of Russians, both men and women, gathered about him. "'Have you lost anyone, my dear fellow? You're the gentry yourself, aren't you? Whose child is it?' they asked him. Pierre replied that the child belonged to a woman in a black coat who had been sitting there with her other children, and he asked whether anyone knew where she had gone. "'Why, that must be the Anferovs,' said an old deacon, addressing a pock-marked peasant woman. "'Lord have mercy! Lord have mercy!' he added in his customary bass. "'The Anferovs? No,' said the woman. "'They left in the morning. That must be either Mary Nikolievna or the Ivanovs.' "'He says a woman, and Mary Nikolievna is a lady,' remarked a house serf. "'Do you know her?' "'She's thin, with long teeth,' said Pierre. "'That's Mary Nikolievna. They went inside the garden when these wolves swooped down,' said the woman, pointing to the French soldiers. "'Oh, Lord, have mercy,' added the deacon. "'Go over that way. They're there. It's she. She kept on lamenting and crying,' continued the woman. "'It's she. Here, this way.' But Pierre was not listening to the woman. He had for some seconds been intently watching what was going on a few steps away. He was looking at the Armenian family, and at two French soldiers, who had gone up to them. One of these, a nimble little man, was wearing a blue coat tied around the waist with a rope. He had a nightcap on his head, and his feet were bare. The other, whose appearance particularly struck Pierre, was a long, lank, round-shouldered, fair-haired man, slow in his movements and with an idiotic expression of face. He wore a woman's loose gown of frieze, blue trousers, and large, torn, hessian boots. The little barefooted Frenchman in the blue coat went up to the Armenians and, saying something, immediately seized the old man by his legs, and the old man at once began pulling off his boots. The other in the frieze gown stopped in front of the beautiful Armenian girl, and with his hands in his pockets stood staring at her, motionless and silent. "'Here, take the child,' said Pierre peremptorily, and hurried to the woman, handing the little girl to her. "'Give her back to them! Give her back!' he almost shouted, putting the child, who began screaming, on the ground, and again looking at the Frenchman and the Armenian family. The old man was already sitting barefoot. The little Frenchman had secured his second boot, and was slapping one boot against the other. The old man was saying something in a voice broken by sobs, but Pierre caught but a glimpse of this. His whole attention was directed to the Frenchman in the frieze gown, who, meanwhile, swaying slowly from side to side, 
had drawn nearer to the young woman, and taking his hands from his pockets, had seized her by the neck. The beautiful Armenian still sat motionless and in the same attitude, with her long lashes drooping as if she did not see or feel what the soldier was doing to her. While Pierre was running the few steps that separated him from the Frenchman, the tall marauder in the frieze gown was already tearing from her neck the necklace the young Armenian was wearing, and the young woman, clutching at her neck, screamed piercingly. "'Let that woman alone!' exclaimed Pierre hoarsely in a furious voice, seizing the soldier by his round shoulders and throwing him aside. The soldier fell, got up, and ran away, but his comrade, throwing down the boots and drawing his sword, moved threateningly towards Pierre. "'Voyons, pas de bêtises!' he cried. "'Look here, no nonsense!' Pierre was in such a transport of rage that he remembered nothing, and his strength increased tenfold. He rushed at the barefooted Frenchman, and before the latter had time to draw his sword, knocked him off his feet and hammered him with his fists. Shouts of approval were heard from the crowd around, and at the same moment a mounted patrol of French Uhlans appeared from round the corner. The Uhlans came up at a trot to Pierre and the Frenchmen, and surrounded them. Pierre remembered nothing of what happened after that. He only remembered beating someone and being beaten, and finally feeling that his hands were bound, and that a crowd of French soldiers stood around him and were searching him. "'Lieutenant, he has a dagger,' were the first words Pierre understood. "'Ah, uh, a weapon?' said the officer, and turned to the barefooted soldier who had been arrested with Pierre. "'All right, you can tell all about it at the court martial Then he turned to Pierre. "'Do you speak French?' Pierre looked around him with bloodshot eyes, and did not reply. His face probably looked very terrible, for the officer said something in a whisper, and four more Uhlans left the ranks and placed themselves on both sides of Pierre. "'Do you speak French?' the officer asked again, keeping at a distance from Pierre. "'Call the interpreter.' A little man, in Russian civilian clothes, rode out from the ranks, and by his clothes and manner of speaking Pierre at once knew him to be a French salesman from one of the Moscow shops. "'He does not look like a common man,' said the interpreter, after a searching look at Pierre. "'Ah, he looks very much like an incendiary,' remarked the officer. "'And ask him who he is,' he added. "'Who are you?' asked the interpreter in poor Russian. "'You must answer the chief.' "'I will not tell you who I am.' "'I am your prisoner. Take me!' Pierre suddenly replied in French. "'Ah! Ah!' muttered the officer with a frown. "'Well, then, march!' A crowd had collected round the Uhlans. Nearest to Pierre stood the pock-marked peasant woman with a little girl, and when the patrol started she moved forward. "'Where are they taking you to, you poor dear?' said she. "'And the little girl! The little girl! What am I to do with her if she's not theirs?' said the woman. "'What does that woman want?' asked the officer. Pierre was as if intoxicated. His elation increased at the sight of the little girl he had saved. "'What does she want?' he murmured. "'She is bringing me my daughter, whom I have just saved from the flames,' said he. "'Good-bye!' And without knowing how this aimless lie had escaped him, he went along with resolute and triumphant steps between the French soldiers. The French patrol was one of those sent out through the various streets of Moscow by Durasnel's order to put a stop to the pillage, and especially to catch the incendiaries who, according to the general opinion which had that day originated among the higher French officers, were the cause of the conflagrations. After marching through a number of streets, the patrol arrested five more Russian suspects, a small shopkeeper, two seminary students, a peasant and a house serf, besides several looters. But of all of these various suspected characters, Pierre was considered to be the most suspicious of all. When they had all been brought for the night to a large house on the Zubov rampart that was being used as a guardhouse, Pierre was placed apart under strict guard. End of chapter 34 Recording by Philippa Brody End of War and Peace, Book 11 by Leo Tolstoy This recording is in the public domain.
War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Elmer and Louise Maud Book 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Tim, Sheep Ridge, Oregon, overlooking the beautiful Wallowa Mountains War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Book 12, Chapter 1 in Petersburg at that time, a complicated struggle was being carried on with greater heat than ever in the highest circles between the parties of Rumyantsev, the French, Maria Fedorovna, the Tsarevich, and others, drowned as usual by the buzzing of the court drones. But the calm, luxurious life of Petersburg, concerned only about phantoms and reflections of real life, went on its old way and made it hard, except by a great effort, to realize the danger and the difficult position of the Russian people. There were the same receptions and balls, the same French theater, the same court interests and service interests, and intrigues as usual. Only in the very highest circles were attempts made to keep in mind the difficulties of the actual position. Stories were whispered of how differently the two empresses behaved in these difficult circumstances. The Empress Maria, concerned for the welfare of the charitable and educational institutions under her patronage, had given directions that they should all be removed to Kazan, and the things belonging to these institutions had already been packed up. The Empress Elizabeth, however, when asked what instructions she would be pleased to give, with her characteristic Russian patriotism, had replied that she could give no directions about state institutions, for that was the affair of the sovereign. But as far as she personally was concerned, she would be the last to quit Petersburg. At Anna Pavlovna's on the 26th of August, the very day of the Battle of Borodino, there was a soiree, the chief feature of which was to be the reading of the letter from his lordship the bishop, while sending the emperor an icon of the venerable Sergius. It was regarded as a model of ecclesiastical patriotic eloquence. Prince Vasily himself, famed for his elocution, was to read it. He used to read at the empress's. The art of his reading was supposed to lie in rolling out the words, quite independently of their meaning, in a loud and sing-song voice, alternating between a despairing wail and a tender murmur, so that the wail felt quite at random on one word and the murmur on another. This reading, as was always the case at Anna Pavlovna's soirees, had a political significance. That evening she expected several important personages who had to be made ashamed of their visits to the French theater and aroused to a patriotic temper. A good many people had already arrived, but Anna Pavlovna, not yet seeing all those whom she wanted in her drawing room, did not let the reading begin, but wound up the springs of a general conversation. The news of the day in Petersburg was the illness of Countess Buzokova. She had fallen ill unexpectedly a few days previously, had missed several gatherings of which she was usually ornament, and was said to be receiving no one, and instead of the celebrated Petersburg doctors, who usually attended her, had entrusted herself to some Italian doctor who was treating her in some new and unusual way. They all knew very well that the enchanting countess's illness arose from an inconvenience resulting from marrying two husbands at the same time, and that the Italian's cure consisted in removing such inconvenience. But in Anna Pavlovna's presence, no one dared to think of this or even appear to know it. They say the poor countess is very ill. The doctor says it is angina pectoris. Angina? Oh, that's a terrible illness. They say that the rivals are reconciled thanks to the angina, and the word angina was repeated with great satisfaction. The count is pathetic, they say. He cried like a child when the doctor told him the case was dangerous. Oh, it would be a terrible loss. She is an enchanting woman. You are speaking of the poor countess, said Anna Pavlovna, coming up just then. I sent to ask for news, and hear that she is a little better. Oh, she is certainly the most charming woman in the world, she went on, with a smile at her own enthusiasm. We belong to different camps, but that does not prevent my esteeming her as she deserves. She is very unfortunate, added Anna Pavlovna. Supposing that by these words Anna Pavlovna was somewhat lifting the veil from the secret of the countess's malady, an unwary young man ventured to express surprise that well-known doctors had not been called in and the countess was being attended by a charlatan who might employ dangerous remedies. Your information may be better than mine, Anna Pavlovna suddenly and venomously retorted on the inexperienced young man, but I know on good authority that this doctor is a very learned and able man. He is private physician to the Queen of Spain. And having thus demolished the young man, Anna Pavlovna turned to another group where Bilibin was talking about the Austrians. Having wrinkled up his face, he was evidently preparing to smooth it out again and utter one of his mots. I think it is delightful, he said, referring to a diplomatic note that had been sent to Vienna with some Austrian banners captured from the French by Wigenstein. The hero of Petropol, as he was then called in Petersburg. What? 
What's that? asked Anna Pavlovna, securing silence for the mot, which she had heard before. And Bilibin repeated the actual words of the diplomatic dispatch, which he had himself composed. The emperor returns these Austrian banners, said Bilibin. Friendly banners gone astray and found on a wrong path, and his brow became smooth again. Charming, charming, observed Prince Vasily. The path to Warsaw, perhaps, Prince Hippolyte remarked loudly and unexpectedly. Everybody looked at him, understanding what he meant. Prince Hippolyte himself glanced around with amused surprise. He knew no more than the others what his words meant. During his diplomatic career he had more than once noticed that such utterances were received as very witty, and at every opportunity he uttered in that way the first words that entered his head. It may turn out very well, he thought, but if not, they'll know how to arrange matters. And really, during the awkward silence that ensued, that insufficiently patriotic person entered whom Anna Pavlovna had been waiting for and wished to convert, and she, smiling and shaking a finger at Hippolyte, invited Prince Vasily to the table, and bringing him two candles and the manuscript, begged him to begin. Everyone became silent. Most gracious sovereign and emperor, Prince Vasily sternly declaimed, looking round at his audience to inquire whether anyone had anything to say to the contrary. But no one said anything. Moscow, our ancient capital, the New Jerusalem, receives her Christ. He placed a sudden emphasis on the word her. As a mother receives her zealous sons into her arms, and through the gathering mists, foreseeing the brilliant glory of thy rule, sings in exultation, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh. Prince Vasily pronounced these last words in a tearful voice. Bilibin attentively examined his nails, and many of those present appeared intimidated, as if asking in what they were to blame. Anna Pavlovna whispered the next words in advance, like an old woman muttering the prayer at communion. Let the bold and insolent Goliath, she whispered. Prince Vasily continued, Let the bold and insolent Goliath from the borders of France encompass the realms of Russia with death-bearing terrors. Humble faith, the sling of the Russian David, shall suddenly smite his head in his bloodthirsty pride. This icon of the venerable Sergius, the servant of God and zealous champion of old of our country's wheel, is offered to your imperial majesty. I grieve that my waning strength prevents rejoicing in the sight of your most gracious presence. I rise fervent prayers to heaven that the Almighty may exalt the race of the just and mercifully fulfill the desires of your majesty. What force! What a style! was uttered in approval both of reader and of author. Animated by that address, Anna Pavlovna's guests talked for a long time of the state of the fatherland and offered various conjectures as to the result of the battle to be fought in a few days. You will see, said Anna Pavlovna, that tomorrow, on the Emperor's birthday, we shall receive news. I have a favorable presentment. End of chapter. War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 2, read for LibriVox.org by M. White. Anna Pavlovna's presentiment was in fact fulfilled. Next day, during the service at the palace church in honor of the emperor's birthday, Prince Volkonsky was called out of the church and received a dispatch from Prince Kutuzov. It was Kutuzov's report, written from Tataranova on the day of the battle. Kutuzov wrote that the Russians had not retreated a step, that the French losses were much heavier than ours, and that he was riding in haste from the field of battle before collecting full information. It followed that there must have been a victory, and at once, without leaving the church, thanks were rendered to the Creator for his help and for the victory. Anna Pavlovna's presentiment was justified, and all that morning a joyously festive mood reigned in the city. Everyone believed the victory to have been complete, and some even spoke of Napoleon's having been captured, of his deposition, and of the choice of a new ruler for France. It is very difficult for events to be reflected in their real strength and completeness amid the conditions of court life and far from the scene of action. General events involuntarily group themselves around some particular incident. So now the courtier's pleasure was based as much on the fact that the news had arrived on the emperor's birthday as on the fact of the victory itself. It was like a successfully arranged surprise. Mention was made in Kutuzov's report of the Russian losses, among which figured the names of Tukhov, Bagration, and Kutuzov. In the Petersburg world, this sad side of the affair again involuntarily centered round a single incident, Kutaisov's death. Everybody knew him, the emperor liked him, 
and he was young and interesting. That day everyone met with the words, What a wonderful coincidence! Just during the service! But what a loss Kutaisov is! How sorry I am! What did I tell about Kutaisov? Prince Vasily now said with a prophet's pride, I always said he was the only man capable of defeating Napoleon. But next day no news arrived from the army, and the public mood grew anxious. The courtiers suffered because of the suffering the suspense occasioned the emperor. Fancy the emperor's position, said they, and instead of extolling Kutuzov as they had done the day before, they condemned him as the cause of the emperor's anxiety. That day Prince Vasily no longer boasted of his protege Kutuzov, but remained silent when the commander-in-chief was mentioned. Moreover, toward evening, as if everything conspired to make Petersburg's society anxious and uneasy, a terrible piece of news was added. Countess Helene Buzakova had suddenly died of that terrible malady it had been so agreeable to mention. Officially, at large gatherings, everyone said that Countess Buzakova had died of a terrible attack of angia pectoris. But in intimate circles, details were mentioned of how the private physician of the Queen of Spain had prescribed small doses of a certain drug to produce a certain effect. But Helen, tortured by the fact that the old count suspected her, and that her husband, to whom she had written, that wretched profligate Pierre, had not replied, had suddenly taken a very large dose of the drug, and had died in agony before assistance could be rendered her. It was said that Prince Vasily and the old count had turned upon the Italian, but the latter had produced such letters from the unfortunate deceased that they had immediately let the matter drop. Talk in general centered round the three melancholy facts, the emperor's lack of news, the loss of Kutuzov, and the death of Helen. On the third day after Kutuzov's report, a country gentleman arrived from Moscow, and news of the surrender of Moscow to the French spread through the whole town. This was terrible! What a position for the emperor to be in! Kutuzov was a traitor! And Prince Vasily, during the visits of condolence paid to him on the occasion of his daughter's death, said of Kutuzov, whom he had formerly praised, it was excusable for him in his grief to forget what he had said, that it was impossible to expect anything else from a blind and depraved old man. I only wonder that the fate of Russia could have been entrusted to such a man. As long as the news remained unofficial, it was possible to doubt it, but the next day the following communication was received from Count Rostoplin. Prince Kutuzov Zagentin has brought me a letter in which he demands police officers to guide the army to the rising road. He writes that he is regretfully abandoning Moscow. Sire, Kutuzov's action decides the fate of the capital and of your empire. Russia will shudder to learn of the abandonment of the city in which her greatness is centered and in which lie the ashes of your ancestors. I shall follow the army. I have had everything removed, and it only remains for me to weep over the fate of my fatherland. On receiving this dispatch, the emperor sent Prince Volkonsky to Kutuzov with the following rescript. Prince Michael Ilarionovich, since the 29th of August, I have received no communication from you, yet on the 1st of September, I received from the commander-in-chief of Moscow, Vyar Yaroslav, the sad news that you, with the army, have decided to abandon Moscow. You can yourself imagine the effect this news has had on me, and your silence increases my astonishment. I am sending this by Adjutant General Prince Volkonsky, to hear from you the situation of the army and the reasons that have induced you to take this melancholy decision. End of chapter 2 by M. White this recording is in the public domain. War and Peace Book 12 Chapter 3 Read for LibriVox.org By M. White Nine days after the abandonment of Moscow, a messenger from Kutuzov reached Petersburg with the official announcement of that event. This messenger was Michou, a Frenchman who did not know Russian, but who was pourquoi étranger, russe de cœur et d'âme, or, though a foreigner, Russian in heart and soul, as he said of himself. The emperor at once received this messenger in his study at the palace on Stone Island. Michou, who had never seen Moscow before the campaign, and who did not know Russian, yet felt deeply moved, as he wrote, when he appeared before notre très gracieux souverain, or our most gracious sovereign, with the news of the burning of Moscow, 
Don le flamme éclairé sa route, or whose flames illuminated his route. Though the source of Michu's chagrin must have been different from that which caused Russians to grieve, he had such a sad face when shown into the emperor's study that the latter at once asked, Have you brought me sad news, colonel? Very sad, sire, replied Mashu, covering his eyes with a sigh. The abandonment of Moscow. Have they surrendered my ancient capital without a battle? asked the emperor quickly, his face suddenly flushing. Mishu respectfully delivered the message Kutuzov had entrusted to him, which was that it had been impossible to fight before Moscow, and that as the only remaining choice was between losing the army as well as Moscow or losing Moscow alone, the field marshal had to choose the later. The emperor listened in silence, not looking at Mishu. Has the enemy entered the city? he asked. Yes, sire, and Moscow is now in ashes. I left it all in flames, replied Mashu in a decided tone. But glancing at the emperor, he was frightened by what he had done. The emperor began to breathe heavily and rapidly. His lower lip trembled, and tears instantly appeared in his fine blue eyes. But this lasted only a moment. He suddenly frowned, as if blaming himself for his weakness, and raising his head, addressed Mashu in a firm voice. I see, Colonel, from all that is happening, that Providence requires great sacrifices of us. I am ready to submit myself in all things to his will. But tell me, Mishu, how did you leave the army when it saw my ancient capital abandoned without a battle? Did you not notice discouragement? Seeing that his most gracious ruler was calm once more, Mishu also grew calm, but was not immediately ready to reply to the emperor's direct and relevant question, which required a direct answer. "'Sire, will you allow me to speak frankly as befits a loyal soldier?' he asked to gain time. "'Colonel, I always require it,' replied the Emperor. "'Conceal nothing from me. I wish to know absolutely how things are.' "'Sire,' said Michu, with a subtle, scarcely perceptible smile on his lips, having now prepared a well-phrased reply, "'Sire, I left the whole army, from its chiefs to the lowest soldier, without exception, in desperate and agonized terror.' How is that? the emperor interrupted him, frowning sternly. Would misfortune make my Russians lose heart? Never. Michu had only waited for this to bring out the phrase he had prepared. Sire, he said, with respectful playfulness, they are only afraid lest your majesty, in the goodness of your heart, should allow yourself to be persuaded to make peace. They are burning for the combat, declared this representative of the Russian nation, and to prove to your majesty, by the sacrifice of their lives, how devoted they are. Ah, said the emperor, reassured. And with a kindly gleam in his eyes, he patted Mishu on the shoulder. You set me at ease, colonel. He bent his head and was silent for some time. Well then, go back to the army, he said, drawing himself up to his full height and addressing Mishu with a gracious and majestic gesture. And tell our brave men and all my good subjects, wherever you go, that when I have not a soldier left, I shall put myself at the head of my beloved nobility and my good peasants, and so use the last resources of my empire. It still offers me more than my enemies suppose, said the emperor, growing more and more animated. But should it ever be ordained by divine providence, he continued, raising to heaven his fine eyes, shining with emotion, that my dynasty should cease to reign on the throne of my ancestors, then after exhausting all the means at my command, I shall let my beard grow to here, he pointed halfway down his chest, and go and eat potatoes with the meanest of my peasants, rather than sign the disgrace of my country and of my beloved people whose sacrifices I know how to appreciate. Having uttered these words in an agitated voice, the emperor suddenly turned away as if to hide from Mishu the tears that rose to his eyes and went to the further end of his study. Having stood there a few moments, he strode back to Mishu, and pressed his arm below the elbow with a vigorous movement. The emperor's mild and handsome face was flushed, and his eyes gleamed with resolution and anger. Colonel Mishu, do not forget what I say to you here. Perhaps we may recall it with pleasure some day, Napoleon or I, said the emperor, touching his breast. We can no longer both reign together. I have learned to know him, and he will not deceive me any more. And the emperor paused with a frown. When he heard those words and saw the expression of firm resolution in the emperor's eyes, Michu, quoique étranger, russe de cœur et d'âme, at that solemn moment felt himself enraptured by all that he had heard, as he used afterwards to say, and gave expression to his own feelings and those of the Russian people whose representative he considered himself to be in the following words. Sire, said he, 
Your Majesty is at this moment singing the glory of the nation and the salvation of Europe. With an inclination of the head, the Emperor dismissed him. End of chapter 3. Recording by M. White. War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 4, read for LibriVox.org by M. White. It is natural for us who were not living in those days to imagine that when half Russia had been conquered and the inhabitants were fleeing to distant provinces and one levy after another was being raised for the defense of the fatherland, all Russians from the greatest to the least were solely engaged in sacrificing themselves, saving the fatherland, or weeping over its downfall. The tales and descriptions of that time without exception speak only of the self-sacrifice, patriotic devotion, despair, grief, and the heroism of the Russians. But it was not really so. It appears so to us, because we see only the general historic interest of that time and do not see all the personal human interest that people had. Yet in reality, those personal interests of the moment so much transcend the general interests that they always prevent the public interest from being felt or even noticed. Most of the people at that time paid no attention to the general progress of events, but were guided only by their private interests, and they were the very people whose activities at that period were most useful. Those who tried to understand the general course of events and to take part in it by self-sacrifice and heroism were the most useless members of society. They saw everything upside down, and all they did for the common good turned out to be useless and foolish. Like Pierre's and Mamanov's regiments which looted Russian villages, and the lint the young ladies prepared, and that never reached the wounded, and so on. Even those, fond of intellectual talk and of expressing their feelings, who discussed Russia's position at the time involuntarily introduced into their conversation either a shade of pretense and falsehood or useless condemnation and anger directed against people accused of actions no one could possibly be guilty of. In historic events, the rule forbidding us to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge is specially applicable. Only unconscious action bears fruit, and he who plays a part in an historic event never understands its significance. If he tries to realize it, his efforts are fruitless. The more closely a man was engaged in the events then taking place in Russia, the less did he realize their significance. In Petersburg, and in the provinces at a distance from Moscow, ladies and gentlemen in military uniforms wept for Russia and its ancient capital, and talked of self-sacrifice and so on. But in the army, which retired beyond Moscow, there was little talk or thought of Moscow. And when they caught sight of its burned ruins, no one swore to be avenged on the French, but they thought about their next pay, their next quarters, of Matreshka the Vivendier, and like matters. As the war had caught him in the service, Nicholas Rostov, took a close and prolonged part in the defense of his country, but did so casually, without any aim at self-sacrifice. And he therefore looked at what was going on in Russia without despair and without dismally racking his brains over it. Had he been asked what he thought of the state of Russia, he would have said that it was not his business to think about it, that Kutuzov and others were there for that purpose, but that he had heard that the regiments were to be made up to their full strength, that fighting would probably go on for a long time yet, and that things being so, it was quite likely he might be in command of a regiment in a couple of years' time. As he looked at the matter in this way, he learned that he was being sent to Veronze to buy remounts for his division, not only without regret at being prevented from taking part in the coming battle, but with the greatest pleasure, which he did not conceal and which his comrades fully understood. A few days before the Battle of Borodino, Nicholas received the necessary money and warrants, and having sent some hussars out in advance, he set out with post-horses for Veronze. Only a man who has experienced it, that is, has passed some months continuously in an atmosphere of campaigning and war, can understand the delight Nicholas felt when he escaped from the region covered by the army's foraging operations, provision trains, and hospitals. 
when, free from soldiers, wagons, and the filthy traces of a camp, he saw villages with peasants and peasant women, gentlemen's country houses, fields where cattle were grazing, post houses with station masters asleep in them, he rejoiced as though seeing all this for the first time. What for a long while specially surprised and delighted him were the women, young and healthy, without a dozen officers making up to each of them, women, too, who were pleased and flattered that a passing officer should joke with them. In the highest spirits, Nicholas arrived at night at a hotel in Veronese, ordered things he had long been deprived of in camp, and next day, very clean-shaven, and in a full-dress uniform he had not worn for a long time, went to present himself to the authorities. The commander of the militia was a civilian general, an old man, who was evidently pleased with his military designation and rank. He received Nicholas brusquely, imagining this to be characteristically military, and questioned him with an important air, as if considering the general progress of affairs and approving and disapproving with full right to do so. Nicholas was in such good spirits that this merely amused him. From the commander of the militia he drove to the governor. The governor was a brisk little man, very simple and affable. He indicated the stud farms at which Nicholas might procure horses, recommended to him a horse dealer in the town and a landowner fourteen miles out of town who had the best horses and promised to assist him in every way. You are Count Ilya Rostov's son. My wife was a great friend of your mother's. We are at home on Thursdays. Today is Thursday. So please, come and see us quite informally, said the governor, taking leave of him. Immediately on leaving the governor's, Nicholas hired post horses and, taking his squadron quartermaster with him, drove at a gallop to the landowner, fourteen miles away, who had the stud. Everything seemed to him pleasant and easy during the first part of his stay in Veronza, and, as usually happens when a man is in a pleasant state of mind, everything went well and easily. The landowner to whom Nicholas went was a bachelor, an old cavalryman, a horse fancier, a sportsman, the possessor of some century-old brandy and some old Hungarian wine, who had a snuggery where he smoked, and who owned some splendid horses. In very few words, Nicholas bought seventeen picked stallions for six thousand roubles, to serve, as he said, as samples of his remounts. After dining and taking rather too much of the Hungarian wine, Nicholas, having exchanged kisses with the landowner, with whom he was already on the friendliest terms, galloped back over abominable roads, in the brightest frame of mind, continually urging on the driver so as to be in time for the governor's party. When he had changed, poured water over his head, and scented himself, Nicholas arrived at the governor's rather late, but with the phrase, better late than never, on his lips. It was not a ball, nor had dancing been announced, but everyone knew that Catherine Petronova would play valses and the écossier on the clavichord, and that there would be dancing, and so everyone had come as to a ball. Provincial life in 1812 went on very much as usual, but with this difference, that it was livelier in the towns in consequence of the arrival of many wealthy families from Moscow, and as in everything that went on in Russia at that time, a special recklessness was noticeable. An in for a penny, in for a pound, who cares, spirit, and the inevitable small talk, instead of turning on the weather and mutual acquaintances, now turned on Moscow, the army, and Napoleon. The society gathered together at the governor's was the best in Vronze. There were a great many ladies and some of Nicholas's Moscow acquaintances, but there were no men who could all vie with the cavalier of St. George, the hussar remount officer, the good-natured and well-bred Count Rostov. Among the men was an Italian prisoner, an officer of the French army, and Nicholas felt that the presence of that prisoner enhanced his own importance as a Russian hero. The Italian was, as it were, a war trophy. Nicholas felt this. It seemed to him that everyone regarded the Italian in the same light, and he treated him cordially, though with dignity and restraint. As soon as Nicholas entered in his hussar uniform, diffusing around him a fragrance of perfume and wine, and had uttered the words, better late than never, and heard them repeated several times by others, people clustered around him, all eyes turned on him, and he felt at once that he had entered into his proper position in the province, that of a universal favorite, a very pleasant position, and intoxicatingly so after his long privations. At posting stations, at inns, and in the landowner's snuggery, maid servants had been flattered by his notice, 
And here, too, at the governor's party there were, as it seemed to Nicholas, an inexhaustible number of pretty young women, married and unmarried, impatiently awaiting his notice. The women and girls flirted with him, and, from the first day, the people concerned themselves to get this fine young daredevil of a hussar married and settled down. Among these was the governor's wife herself, who welcomed Rostov as a near relative and called him Nicholas. Catherine Petronova did actually play valses and the Econcier, and dancing began, in which Nicholas still further captivated the provincial society by his agility. His particularly free manner of dancing even surprised them all. Nicholas was himself rather surprised at the way he danced that evening. He had never danced like that in Moscow, and would even have considered such a very free and easy manner improper and in bad form, but here he felt it incumbent on him to astonish them all by something unusual, something they would have to accept as the regular thing in the capital, though new to them in the provinces. All the evening Nicholas paid attention to a blue-eyed, plump, and pleasing little blonde, the wife of one of the provincial officials, with the naive conviction of young men in a merry mood that other men's wives were created for them, Rostov did not leave the lady's side and treated her husband in a friendly and conspiratorial style, as if, without speaking of it, they knew how capitally Nicholas and the lady would get on together. The husband, however, did not seem to share that conviction and tried to behave morosely with Rostov. But the latter's good-natured naivete was so boundless that sometimes even he involuntarily yielded to Nicholas's good humor. Toward the end of the evening, however, as the wife's face grew more flushed and animated, the husband's became more and more melancholy and solemn, as though there were but a given amount of animation between them, and as the wife's share increased, the husband's diminished. End of chapter 4 By M. White War and Peace, Chapter Twelve, Book Five, read for LibriVox.org by Jessica Louise. Nicholas sat leaning slightly forward in an armchair, bending closely over the blonde lady and paying her mythological compliments with a smile that never left his face. Jauntily shifting the position of his legs in their tight riding breeches, diffusing an odor of perfume, and admiring his partner, himself, and the fine outlines of his legs in their well-fitting Hessian boots, Nicholas told the blonde lady that he wished to run away with a certain lady here in Voronez. Which lady? A charming lady, a divine one. Her eyes. Nicholas looked at his partner are blue, her mouth coral and ivory, her figure, he glanced at her shoulders, like Diana's. The husband came up and sullenly asked his wife what she was talking about. Ah, Nikita Ivanitch, cried Nicholas, rising politely, and as if wishing Nikita Ivanitch to share his joke, he began to tell him of his intention to elope with a blonde lady. The husband smiled gloomily, the wife gaily, the governor's good-natured wife came up with a look of disapproval. "'Anna Ignatievna wants to see you, Nicholas,' said she, pronouncing the name so that Nicholas at once understood that Anna Ignatievna was a very important person. "'Come, Nicholas, you know you let me call you so.' "'Oh, yes, aunt, who is she?' "'Anna Ignatievna Malvintseva. She has heard from her niece how you rescued her. Can you guess?' I rescued such a lot of them, said Nicholas. Her niece, Princess Bolkonskaya. She's here in Voronezh with her aunt. Oh, oh how you blush. Why are... Uh, not a bit. Please don't, aunt. Very well, very well. Oh, what a fellow you are. The governor's wife led him up to a tall and very stout old lady with a blue headdress, who had just finished her game of cards with the most important personages of the town. This was Malvintseva, Princess Mary's aunt on her mother's side, a rich, childless widow who always lived in Verona's. When Rostov approached her, she was standing, settling up for the game. She looked at him and, screwing up her eyes sternly, continued to upbraid the general who had won from her. "'Very pleased, mon cher,' 
she then said, holding out her hand to Nicholas. Pray come and see me. After a few words about Princess Mary and her late father, whom Malvintseva had evidently not liked, and having asked what Nicholas knew of Prince Andrew, who was also evidently no favorite of hers, the important old lady dismissed Nicholas after repeating her invitation to come and see her. Nicholas promised to come, and blushed again as he bowed. At the mention of Princess Mary he experienced a feeling of shyness, and even of fear, which he himself did not understand. When he had parted from Malvintseva, Nicholas wished to return to the dancing, but the governor's little wife placed her plump hand on his sleeve, and saying that she wanted to have a talk with him, led him to her sitting-room, from which those who were there immediately withdrew so as not to be in her way. "'Do you know, dear boy,' began the governor's wife, with a serious expression on her kind little face, "'that really would be the match for you. Would you like me to arrange it?' "'Whom do you mean, aunt?' asked Nicholas. "'I will make a match for you with the princess. "'Catherine Petrovna speaks of Lily, but I say, no, the princess. "'Do you want me to do it? "'I'm sure your mother will be grateful to me. "'What a charming girl she is, really. "'And she is not at all so plain, either.' "'Not at all,' replied Nicholas, as if offended at the idea. As befits a soldier, aunt, I don't force myself on anyone or refuse anything, he said before he had time to consider what he was saying. Well, then, remember, this is not a joke. Of course not. Yes, yes, the governor's wife said as if talking to herself. But, my dear boy, among other things, you are too attentive to the other, the blonde. One is sorry for the husband, really. Ah, uh, no, we are good friends with him, said Nicholas in the simplicity of his heart. It did not enter his head that a pastime so pleasant to himself might not be pleasant to someone else. But what nonsense I have been saying to the governor's wife, thought Nicholas suddenly at supper. She will really begin to arrange a match, and Sonia. And on taking leave of the governor's wife, when she again smilingly said to him, "'Well, then, remember,' he drew her aside. "'But see here, to tell the truth, aunt, what is it, my dear? Come, let's sit down here,' said she. Nicholas suddenly felt a desire and need to tell his most intimate thoughts, which he would not have told to his mother, his sister, or his friend, to this woman who was almost a stranger." When he afterwards recalled that impulse to unsolicited and inexplicable frankness which had very important results for him, it seemed to him, as it seems to everyone in such cases, that it was merely some silly whim that seized him. Yet that burst of frankness, together with other trifling events, had immense consequences for him and for all his family. "'You see, aunt, Mama has long wanted me to marry an heiress, but the very idea of marrying for money is repugnant to me.' "'Oh, yes, I understand,' said the governor's wife. "'But Princess Bolkonskaya, that's another matter. I will tell you the truth. In the first place, I like her very much. I feel drawn to her. And then, after I met her under such circumstances, so strangely, the idea often occurred to me, this is fate. Especially if you remember that Mama had long been thinking of it, but I had never happened to meet her before. Somehow it had always happened that we did not meet. And as long as my sister Natasha was engaged to her brother, it was of course out of the question for me to think of marrying her. And it must needs happen that I should meet her just when Natasha's engagement had been broken off. And then everything... So, you see, I never told this to anyone, and never will, only to you. The governor's wife pressed his elbow gratefully. You know, Sonia, my cousin? I love her, and promise to marry her, and will do so. So, you see, there can be no question about, said Nicholas, incoherently and blushing. My dear boy, what a way to look at it. You know Sonia has nothing. And you yourself say your papa's affairs are in a very bad way. And what about your mother? It would kill her, that's one thing. And what sort of life would it be for Sonia, if she's a girl with a heart? Your mother in despair and you all ruined? No, my dear, you and Sonia ought to understand that. Nicholas remained silent. 
it comforted him to hear these arguments all, all the same aunt it is impossible he rejoined with a sigh after a short pause besides would the princess have me and besides she is now in mourning how can one think of it but you don't suppose i'm going to get you married at once there is always a right way of doing things replied the governor's wife what a matchmaker you are aunt said nicholas kissing her plump little hand end of chapter five recording by jessica louise st paul minnesota War and Peace, Book Twelve, Chapter Six, read for LibriVox.org by David Ream. On reaching Moscow after her meeting with Rostov, Princess Mary had found her nephew there with his tutor and a letter from Prince Andrew giving her instructions how to get to her aunt Malvintseva at Voronezh. That feeling akin to temptation which had tormented her during her father's illness, since his death, and especially since her meeting with Rostov, was smothered by arrangements for the journey, anxiety about her brother, settling in a new house, meeting new people, and attending to her nephew's education. She was sad. Now, after a month passed in quiet surroundings, she felt more and more deeply the loss of her father, which was associated in her mind with the ruin of Russia. She was agitated and incessantly tortured by the thought of the dangers to which her brother, the only intimate person now remaining to her, was exposed. She was worried, too, about her nephew's education for which she had always felt herself incompetent, but in the depths of her soul she felt at peace, a peace arising from consciousness of having stifled those personal dreams and hopes that had been on the point of awakening within her and were related to her meeting with Rostov. The day after her party, the governor's wife came to see Malvintseva, and, after discussing her plan with the aunt, remarked that, though under present circumstances, a formal betrothal was, of course, not to be thought of, all the same the young people might be brought together, and could get to know one another. Malvintseva expressed approval, and the governor's wife began to speak of Rostov in Mary's presence, praising him and telling how he had blushed when Princess Mary's name was mentioned but Princess Mary experienced a painful rather than a joyful feeling. Her mental tranquility was destroyed, and desires, doubts, self-reproach, and hopes reawoke. During the two days that elapsed before Rostov called, Princess Mary continually thought of how she ought to behave to him. First she decided not to come to the drawing-room when he called to see her aunt, that it would not be proper for her in her deep mourning to receive visitors. Then she thought this would be rude after what he had done for her. Then it occurred to her that her aunt and the governor's wife had intentions concerning herself and Rostov. Their looks and words at times seemed to confirm this supposition. Then she told herself that only she, with her sinful nature, could think this of them. They could not forget that, situated as she was, while still wearing deep mourning, such matchmaking would be an insult to her and to her father's memory. Assuming that she did go down to see him, Princess Mary imagined the words he would say to her and what she would say to him, and these words sometimes seemed undeservedly cold and then to mean too much. More than anything, she feared lest the confusion she felt might overwhelm her and betray her as soon as she saw him. But when on Sunday after church the footman announced in the drawing-room that Count Rostov had called, the princess showed no confusion. Only a slight blush suffused her cheeks, and her eyes lit up with a new and radiant light. "'You have met him, aunt,' said she in a calm voice, unable herself to understand that she could be outwardly so calm and natural. When Rostov entered the room, the princess dropped her eyes for an instant, as if to give the visitor time to greet her aunt, and then, just as Nicholas turned to her, she raised her head and met his look with shining eyes. With a movement full of dignity and grace, she half rose with a smile of pleasure, held out her slender, delicate hand to him, and began to speak in a voice in which, for the first time, new deep womanly notes vibrated. Mademoiselle Bourienne, who was in the drawing-room, looked at Princess Mary in bewildered surprise. Herself a consummate coquette, she could not have maneuvered better on meeting a man she wished to attract either black is particularly becoming to her or she really has greatly improved without my having noticed it and above all what tact and grace thought mademoiselle brienne 
Had Princess Mary been capable of reflection at that moment, she would have been more surprised than Mademoiselle Bourienne at the change that had taken place in herself. From the moment she recognized that dear, loved face, a new life force took possession of her and compelled her to speak and act apart from her own will. From the time Rostov entered, her face became suddenly transformed. It was as if a light had been kindled in a carved and painted lantern, and the intricate, skillful, artistic work on its sides that previously seemed dark, coarse, and meaningless was suddenly shown up in unexpected and striking beauty. For the first time, all that pure, spiritual, inward travail through which she had lived appeared on the surface. All her inward labor, her dissatisfaction with herself, her sufferings, her strivings after goodness, her meekness, love, and self-sacrifice, all this now shone in those radiant eyes, in her delicate smile, and in every trait of her gentle face. Rostov saw all this as clearly as if he had known her her whole life. He felt that the being before him was quite different from, and better than, any one he had met before, and above all, better than himself. Their conversation was very simple and unimportant. They spoke of the war, and like everyone else unconsciously exaggerated their sorrow about it. They spoke of their last meeting, Nicholas, trying to change the subject, talked of the governor's kind wife, of Nicholas' relations, and of Princess Mary's. She did not talk about her brother, diverting the conversation as soon as her aunt mentioned Andrew. Evidently, she could speak of Russia's misfortunes with a certain artificiality, but her brother was too near her heart, and she neither could nor would speak lightly of him. Nicholas noticed this, as he noticed every shade of Princess Mary's character with an observation unusual to him, and everything confirmed his conviction that she was a quite unusual and extraordinary being. Nicholas blushed and was confused when people spoke to him about the princess, as she did when he was mentioned, and even when he thought of her, but in her presence he felt quite at ease, and said not at all what he had prepared, but what quite appropriately occurred to him at the moment. When a pause occurred during his short visit, Nicholas, as is usual when there are children, turned to Prince Andrew's little son, caressing him and asking whether he would like to be an hussar. He took the boy on his knee, played with him, and looked round at Princess Mary. With a softened, happy, timid look she watched the boy she loved in the arms of the man she loved. Nicholas also noticed that look and, as if understanding it, flushed with pleasure and began to kiss the boy with good-natured playfulness. As she was in mourning, Princess Mary did not go out into society, and Nicholas did not think it the proper thing to visit her again. But all the same, the governor's wife went on with her matchmaking passing on to Nicholas the flattering things Princess Mary said of him, and vice versa, and insisting on his declaring himself to Princess Mary. For this purpose she arranged a meeting between the young people at the bishop's house before Mass. Though Rostov told the governor's wife that he would not make any declaration to Princess Mary, he promised to go. As at Tilsit, Rostov had not allowed himself to doubt that what everybody considered right was right, so now, after a short but sincere struggle between his effort to arrange his life by his own sense of justice, and in obedient submission to circumstances, he chose the latter and yielded to the power he felt irresistibly carrying him he knew not where. He knew that after his promise to Sonia it would be what he deemed base to declare his feelings to Princess Mary, and he knew that he would never act basely. But he also knew, or rather felt at the bottom of his heart, that by resigning himself now to the force of circumstances and to those who were guiding him, he was not only doing nothing wrong, but was doing something very important, more important than anything he had ever done in his life. After meeting Princess Mary, though the course of his life went on externally as before, all his former amusements lost their charm for him and he often thought about her. But he never thought about her as he had thought of all the young ladies without exception whom he had met in society, nor as he had for a long time, and at one time rapturously, thought about Sonia. He had pictured each of those young ladies as almost all honest-hearted young men do, that is, as a possible wife, adapting her in his imagination to all the conditions of married life, a white dressing gown, his wife at the tea-table, his wife's carriage, little ones, mamma and papa, their relations to her, and so on. And these pictures of the future had given him pleasure. But with Princess Mary, to whom they were trying to get him engaged, he could never picture anything of future married life. If he tried, his picture seemed incongruous and false. It made him afraid. 
End of Book 12, Chapter 6《ワーント・ピース・ブック・トゥ・エルフ・チャプター・セブン》Read for LibriVox.org by David Ream The dreadful news of the Battle of Borodino, of our losses in killed and wounded, and the still more terrible news of the loss of Moscow reached Voronezh in the middle of September. Princess Mary, having learned of her brother's wound only from the Gazette and having no definite news of him, prepared, so Nicholas heard, he had not seen her again himself, to set off in search of Prince Andrew. When he received the news of the Battle of Borodino and the abandonment of Moscow, Rostov was not seized with despair, anger, the desire for vengeance, or any feeling of that kind. But everything in Voronezh suddenly seemed to him dull and tiresome, and he experienced an indefinite feeling of shame and awkwardness. The conversations he heard seemed to him insincere. He did not know how to judge all these affairs, and felt that only in the regiment would everything again become clear to him. He made haste to finish buying the horses, and often became unreasonably angry with his servant and squadron quartermaster. A few days before his departure a special thanksgiving, at which Nicholas was present, was held in the cathedral for the Russian victory. He stood a little behind the governor, and held himself with military decorum through the service, meditating on a great variety of subjects. When the service was over, the governor's wife beckoned him to her. "'Have you seen the princess?' she asked, indicating with a movement of her head a lady standing on the opposite side beyond the choir. Nicholas immediately recognized Princess Mary, not so much by the profile he saw under her bonnet as by the feeling of solicitude, timidity, and pity that immediately overcame him. Princess Mary, evidently engrossed by her thoughts, was crossing herself for the last time before leaving the church. Nicholas looked at her face with surprise. It was the same face he had seen before. There was the same general expression of refined inner spiritual labor, but now it was quite differently lit up. There was a pathetic expression of sorrow, prayer, and hope in it. As had occurred before when she was present, Nicholas went up to her without waiting to be prompted by the governor's wife, and not asking himself whether or not it was right and proper to address her here in church, and told her he had heard of her trouble and sympathized with his whole soul. As soon as she heard his voice, a vivid glow kindled in her face, lighting up both her sorrow and her joy. "'There is one thing I wanted to tell you, Princess,' said Rostov. "'It is that if your brother, Prince Andrew Nikolaevich, were not living, it would have been at once announced in the Gazette, as he is a colonel.' The princess looked at him, not grasping what he was saying, but cheered by the expression of regretful sympathy on his face. "'And I have known so many cases of a splinter wound,' the Gazette said it was a shell, "'either proving fatal at once, or being very slight,' continued Nicholas. We must hope for the best, and I am sure— Princess Mary interrupted him. Oh, that would be so dread, she began, and prevented by agitation from finishing, she bent her head with a movement as graceful as everything she did in his presence, and, looking up at him gratefully, went out following her aunt. That evening Nicholas did not go out, but stayed at home to settle some accounts with the horse-dealers. When he had finished that business it was already too late to go anywhere, but still too early to go to bed and for a long time he paced up and down the room, reflecting on his life, a thing he rarely did. Princess Mary had made an agreeable impression on him when he had met her in Smolensk province. His having encountered her in such exceptional circumstances, and his mother having at one time mentioned her to him as a good match, had drawn his particular attention to her. When he met her again in Voronezh, the impression she made on him was not merely pleasing but powerful. Nicholas had been struck by the peculiar moral beauty he observed in her at this time. He was, however, preparing to go away, and it had not entered his head to regret that he was thus depriving himself of chances of meeting her. But that day's encounter in church had, he felt, sunk deeper than was desirable for his peace of mind. That pale, sad, refined face, that radiant look, those gentle, graceful gestures, and especially the deep and tender sorrow expressed in all her features agitated him and evoked his sympathy. In men, Rostov could not bear to see the expression of a higher spiritual life. 
That was why he did not like Prince Andrew, and he referred to it contemptuously as philosophy and dreaminess. But in Princess Mary, that very sorrow, which revealed the depth of a whole spiritual world foreign to him, was an irresistible attraction. She must be a wonderful woman, a real angel, he said to himself. Why am I not free? Why was I in such a hurry with Sonia? And he involuntarily compared the two, the lack of spirituality in the one and the abundance of it in the other, a spirituality he himself lacked and therefore valued most highly. He tried to picture what would happen were he free, how he would propose to her, and how she would become his wife. But no, he could not imagine that. He felt odd, and no clear picture presented itself to his mind. He had long ago pictured to himself a future with Sonia, and that was all clear and simple, just because it had all been thought out, and he knew all there was in Sonia. But it was impossible to picture a future with Princess Mary, because he did not understand her, but simply loved her. Reveries about Sonia had had something merry and playful in them, but to dream of Princess Mary was always difficult and a little frightening. How she prayed, he thought. It was plain that her whole soul was in her prayer. Yes, that was the prayer that moves mountains, and I am sure her prayer will be answered. Why don't I pray for what I want, he suddenly thought. What do I want? To be free, released from Sonia. She was right, he thought, remembering what the governor's wife had said. Nothing but misfortune can come of marrying Sonia. Muddles, grief for Mama, business difficulties, muddles, terrible muddles. Besides, I don't love her, not as I should. Oh, God! Release me from this dreadful, inextricable position, he suddenly began to pray. Yes, prayer can move mountains, but one must have faith, and not pray as Natasha and I used to his children, that the snow might turn into sugar, and then run out into the yard to see whether it had done so. No, but I am not praying for trifles now, he thought, as he put his pipe down in a corner, and folding his hands placed himself before the icon. Softened by memories of Princess Mary, he began to pray, as he had not done for a long time. Tears were in his eyes, and in his throat, when the door opened and Lavrushka came in with some papers. "'Blockhead! Why do you come in without being called?' cried Nicholas, quickly, changing his attitude. "'From the governor,' said Lavrushka, in a sleepy voice. "'A courier has arrived, and there's a letter for you.' "'Well, all right. Thanks. You can go.' Nicholas took the two letters, one of which was from his mother and the other from Sonia. He recognized them by the handwriting and opened Sonia's first. He had read only a few lines when he turned pale and his eyes opened wide with fear and joy. No, it's not possible, he cried aloud. Unable to sit still, he paced up and down the room, holding the letter and reading it. He glanced through it, then read it again, and then again, and standing still in the middle of the room, he raised his shoulders, stretching out his hands with his mouth wide open and his eyes fixed. What he had just been praying for with confidence that God would hear him had come to pass, but Nicholas was as much astonished as if it were something extraordinary and unexpected, and as if the very fact that it had happened so quickly proved that it had not come from God to whom he had prayed, but by some ordinary coincidence. This unexpected and, as it seemed to Nicholas, quite voluntary letter from Sonia freed him from the knot that fettered him, and from which there had seemed no escape. She wrote that, the last unfortunate events, the loss of almost the whole of the Rostovs' Moscow property, and the Countess's repeatedly expressed wish that Nicholas should marry Princess Bolkonskaya, together with his silence and coldness of late, had all combined to make her decide to release him from his promise and set him completely free. It would be too painful to me to think that I might be a cause of sorrow or discord in the family that has been so good to me, she wrote, and my love has no aim but the happiness of those I love. So, Nicholas, I beg you to consider yourself free, and to be assured that, in spite of everything, no one can love you more than does your Sonia. Both letters were written from Troitsa, the other from the Countess, described their last days in Moscow, their departure, the fire, and the destruction of all their property. In this letter the Countess also mentioned that Prince Andrew was among the wounded traveling with them. His state was very critical, but the doctor said there was now more hope. Sonia and Natasha were nursing him. Next day, Nicholas took his mother's letter and went to see Princess Mary. Neither he nor she said a word about what Natasha nursing him might mean, but thanks to this letter, Nicholas suddenly became almost as intimate with the princess as if they were relations. The following day, 
he saw Princess Mary off on her journey to Yaroslavl, and a few days later left to rejoin his regiment. End of chapter 7, June 26, 2009《War and Peace》Book Twelve, Chapter Eight, read for LibriVox.org by Heba. Sonia's letter, written from Choitza, which had come as an answer to Nicholas's prayer, was prompted by this: the thought of getting Nicholas married to an heiress occupied the old countess's mind more and more. She knew that Sonia was the chief obstacle to this happening, and Sonia's life in the countess's house had grown harder and harder especially after they had received a letter from Nicholas telling of his meeting with Princess Mary in Bogucharovo. The Countess let no occasion slip of making humiliating or cruel allusions to Sonia. But a few days before they left Moscow, moved and excited by all that was going on, she called Sonia to her and, instead of reproaching and making demands on her, tearfully implored her to sacrifice herself and repay all that the family had done for her by breaking off her engagement with Nicholas. I shall not be at peace till you promise me this. Sonia burst into hysterical tears and replied through her sobs that she would do anything and was prepared for anything, but gave no actual promise and could not bring herself to decide to do what was demanded of her. She must sacrifice herself for the family that had reared and brought her up. To sacrifice herself for others was Sonia's habit. Her position in the house was such that only by sacrifice could she show her worth, and she was accustomed to this and loved doing it. But in all her former acts of self-sacrifice, she had been happily conscious that they raised her in her own esteem, and in that of others, and so made her more worthy of Nicholas, whom she loved more than anything in the world. But now they wanted her to sacrifice the very thing that constituted the whole reward for her self-sacrifice and the whole meaning of her life. And for the first time she felt bitterness against those who had been her benefactors, only to torture her the more painfully. She felt jealous of Natasha who had never experienced anything of this sort, had never needed to sacrifice herself, but made others sacrifice themselves for her, and yet was beloved by everybody. And for the first time, Sonia felt that out of her pure, quiet love for Nicholas, a passionate feeling was beginning to grow up which was stronger than principle, virtue, or religion. Under the influence of this feeling, Sonia, whose life of dependence had taught her involuntarily to be secretive, having answered the Countess in vague general terms, avoided talking with her, and resolved to wait till she should see Nicholas, not in order to set him free, but on the contrary at that meeting to bind him to her forever. The bustle and terror of the Rostovs' last days in Moscow stifled the gloomy thoughts that oppressed Sonia. She was glad to find escape from them in practical activity, but when she heard of Prince Andrew's presence in their house, despite her sincere pity for him and for Natasha, she was seized by a joyful and superstitious feeling that God did not intend her to be separated from Nicholas. She knew that Natasha loved no one but Prince Andrew, and had never ceased to love him. She knew that being thrown together again, under such terrible circumstances, they would again fall in love with one another, and that Nicholas would then not be able to marry Princess Mary, as they would be within the prohibited degrees of affinity. Despite all the terror of what had happened during those last days, and during the first days of their journey, this feeling that Providence was intervening in her personal affairs cheered Sonia. At the Troitsa Monastery, the Rostovs first broke their journey for a whole day. Three large rooms were assigned to them in the monastery hostelry, one of which was occupied by Prince Andrew. The wounded man was much better that day, and Natasha was sitting with him. In the next room sat the Count and Countess respectfully conversing with the prior, who was calling on them as old acquaintances and benefactors of the monastery. Sonia was there too, tormented by curiosity as to what Prince Andrew and Natasha were talking about. She heard the sound of their voices through the door. That door opened, and Natasha came out, looking excited. Not noticing the monk, who had risen to greet her, and was drawing back the wide sleeve on his right arm, she went up to Sonia and took her hand. Natasha, what are you about? Come here, said the countess. Natasha went up to the monk for his blessing, and advised her to pray for aid to God and his saint. As soon as the prior withdrew, Natasha took her friend by the hand and went with her into the unoccupied room. Sonia, will he live? she asked. Sonia, how happy I am and how unhappy! Sonia, Dovey, everything is as it used to be. If only he lives, he cannot... because... 
because of... And Natasha burst into tears. Yes, I knew it. Thank God, murmured Sonia. He will live. Sonia was not less agitated than her friend by the latter's fear and grief, and by her own personal feelings which she shared with no one. Sobbing, she kissed and comforted Natasha. If only he lives, she thought. Having wept, talked, and wiped away their tears, the two friends went together to Prince Andrew's door. Natasha opened it cautiously and glanced into the room, Sonia standing beside her at the half-open door. Prince Andrew was lying raised high on three pillows. His pale face was calm, his eyes closed, and they could see his regular breathing. Oh, Natasha! Sonia suddenly almost screamed, catching her companion's arm and stepping back from the door. What? What is it? asked Natasha. It's that... that... said Sonia, with a white face and trembling lips. Natasha softly closed the door and went with Sonia to the window, not yet understanding what the latter was telling her. You remember, said Sonia, with a solemn and frightened expression. You remember when I looked in the mirror for you, at Otwood at Christmas? Do you remember what I saw? Yes, yes, cried Natasha, opening her eyes wide, and vaguely recalling that Sonia had told her something about Prince Andrew, whom she had seen lying down. You remember, Sonia went on? I saw it then, and told everybody, you and Danyasha. I saw him lying on a bed, said she, making a gesture with her hand and a lifted finger at each detail, and that he had his eyes closed and was covered just with a pink quilt, and that his hands were folded, she concluded, convincing herself that the details she had just seen were exactly what she had seen in the mirror. She had, in fact, seen nothing then, but had mentioned the first thing that came into her head, but what she had invented then seemed to her now as real as any other recollection. She not only remembered what she had then said, that he turned to look at her and smiled and was covered with something red, but was firmly convinced that she had then seen and said that he was covered with a pink quilt and that his eyes were closed. Yes, yes, it really was pink, cried Natasha, who now thought she too remembered the word pink being used, and saw in this the most extraordinary and mysterious part of the prediction. But what does it mean? she added meditatively. Oh, I don't know, it is all so strange, replied Sonia, clutching at her head. A few minutes later, Prince Andrew rang, and Natasha went to him, but Sonia, feeling unusually excited and touched, remained at the window thinking about the strangeness of what had occurred. They had an opportunity that day to send letters to the army, and the countess was writing to her son. Sonia, said the countess, raising her eyes from her letter as her niece passed. Sonia, won't you write to Nicholas? She spoke in a soft, tremulous voice, and in the weary eyes that looked over her spectacles, Sonia read all that the countess meant to convey with these words. Those eyes expressed entreaty, shame at having to ask, fear of a refusal, and readiness for relentless hatred in case of such refusal. Sonia went up to the countess and, kneeling down, kissed her hand. Yes, mamma, I will write, said she. Sonia was softened, excited, and touched by all that had occurred that day, especially by the mysterious fulfillment she had just seen of her vision. Now that she knew that the renewal of Natasha's relations with Prince Andrew would prevent Nicholas from marrying Princess Mary, she was joyfully conscious of a return of that self-sacrificing spirit in which she was accustomed to live and loved to live. So with the joyful consciousness of performing a magnanimous deed, interrupted several times by the tears that dimmed her velvety black eyes, she wrote that touching letter, the arrival of which had so amazed Nicholas. End of chapter 8《War and Peace》Book 12, Chapter 9, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. The officer and soldiers who had arrested Pierre treated him with hostility, but yet with respect, in the guardhouse to which he was taken. In their attitude toward him could still be felt both uncertainty as to who he might be, perhaps a very important person, and hostility as a result of their recent personal conflict with him. But when the guard was relieved next morning, Pierre felt that for the new guard, both officers and men, he was not as interesting as he had been to his captors. And, in fact, the guard of the second day did not recognize, in this big stout man in a peasant coat, the vigorous person who had fought so desperately with the marauder and the convoy, and had uttered those solemn words about saving a child. They saw in him only number seventeen of the captured Russians, 
arrested and detained for some reason, by order of the higher command. If they noticed anything remarkable about Pierre, it was only his unabashed meditative concentration and thoughtfulness, and the way he spoke French, which struck them as surprisingly good. In spite of this, he was placed that day with the other arrested suspects, as the separate room he had occupied was required by an officer. All the Russians confined with Pierre were men of the lowest class, and recognizing him as a gentleman, they all avoided him, more especially as he spoke French. Pierre felt sad at hearing them make fun of him. That evening he learned that all these prisoners, he probably among them, were to be tried for incendiarism. On the third day he was taken with the others to a house where a French general with a white mustache sat with two colonels and other Frenchmen with scarves on their arms. With the precision and definiteness customary in addressing prisoners, and which is supposed to preclude human frailty, Pierre, like the others, was questioned as to who he was, where he had been, with what object, and so on. These questions, like questions put at trials generally, left the essence of the matter aside, shut out the possibility of that essence's being revealed, and were designed only to form a channel through which the judges wished the answers of the accused to flow, so as to lead to the desired result, namely, a conviction. As soon as Pierre began to say anything that did not fit in with that aim, the channel was removed, and the water could flow to waste. Pierre felt, moreover, what the accused always feel at their trial, perplexity as to why these questions were put to him. He had a feeling that it was only out of condescension or a kind of civility that this device of placing a channel was employed. He knew he was in these men's power, that only by force had they brought him there, that force alone gave them the right to demand answers to their questions, and that the sole object of that assembly was to inculpate him. And so, as they had the power and wish to inculpate him, this expedient of an inquiry and trial seemed unnecessary. It was evident that any answer would lead to conviction. When asked what he was doing when he was arrested, Pierre replied, in a rather tragic manner, that he was restoring to its parents a child he had saved from the flames. Why had he fought the marauder? Pierre answered that he was protecting a woman, and that to protect a woman who was being insulted was the duty of every man, that they interrupted him, for this was not to the point. Why was he in the yard of a burning house where witnesses had seen him? He replied that he had gone out to see what was happening in Moscow. Again they interrupted him. They had not asked where he was going, but why he was found near the fire. Who was he? they asked, repeating their first question, which he had declined to answer. Again he replied that he could not answer it. Put that down. That's bad, very bad, sternly remarked the general with the white mustache and red flushed face. On the fourth day, fires broke out on the Zubovsky rampart. Pierre and thirteen others were moved to the coach house of a merchant's house near the Crimean Bridge. On his way through the streets, Pierre felt stifled by the smoke which seemed to hang over the whole city. Fires were visible on all sides. He did not then realize the significance of the burning of Moscow, and looked at the fires with horror. He passed four days in the coach house near the Crimean Bridge, and during that time learned, from the talk of the French soldiers, that all those confined there were awaiting a decision which might come any day from the marshal. What marshal this was, Pierre could not learn from the soldiers. Evidently, for them, the marshal represented a very high and rather mysterious power. These first days, before the 8th of September, when the prisoners were had up for a second examination, were the hardest of all for Pierre. End of chapter 9. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 10, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. On the 8th of September, an officer, a very important one, judging by the respect the guards showed him, entered the coach house where the prisoners were. This officer, probably someone on the staff, was holding a paper in his hand, and called over all the Russians there, naming Pierre as the man who does not give his name. 
Glancing indolently and indifferently at all the prisoners, he ordered the officer in charge to have them decently dressed and tidied up before taking them to the marshal. An hour later a squad of soldiers arrived, and Pierre, with thirteen others, was led to the Virgin's Field. It was a fine day, sunny after rain, and the air was unusually pure. The smoke did not hang low as on the day when Pierre had been taken from the guardhouse on the Zubovsky rampart, but rose through the pure air in columns. No flames were seen, but columns of smoke rose on all sides, and all Moscow, as far as Pierre could see, was one vast charred ruin. On all sides there were waste spaces, with only stoves and chimney stacks still standing, and here and there the blackened walls of some brick houses. Pierre gazed at the ruins and did not recognize districts he had known well. Here and there he could see churches that had not been burned. The Kremlin, which was not destroyed, gleamed white in the distance with its towers and the belfry of Ivan the Great. The domes of the new convent of the Virgin glittered brightly, and its bells were ringing particularly clearly. These bells reminded Pierre that it was Sunday and the feast of the Nativity of the Virgin. But there seemed to be no one to celebrate this holiday. Everywhere were blackened ruins, and the few Russians to be seen were tattered and frightened people who tried to hide when they saw the French. It was plain that the Russian nest was ruined and destroyed, but in place of the Russian order of life that had been destroyed, Pierre unconsciously felt that a quite different, firm French order had been established over this ruined nest. He felt this in the looks of the soldiers who, marching in regular ranks, briskly and gaily, were escorting him and the other criminals. He felt it in the looks of an important French official in a carriage and pair driven by a soldier whom they met on the way. He felt it in the merry sounds of regimental music he heard from the left side of the field, and felt and realized it especially from the list of prisoners the French officer had read out when he came that morning. Pierre had been taken by one set of soldiers, and led first to one and then to another place with dozens of other men, and it seemed that they might have forgotten him or confused him with the others. But no, the answers he had given when questioned had come back to him in his designation as the man who does not give his name, and under that appellation, which to Pierre seemed terrible, they were now leading him somewhere with unhesitating assurance on their faces that he and all the other prisoners were exactly the ones they wanted, and that they were being taken to the proper place. Pierre felt himself to be an insignificant chip fallen among the wheels of a machine whose action he did not understand, but which was working well. He and the other prisoners were taken to the right side of the Virgin's Field, to a large white house with an immense garden not far from the convent. This was Prince Sherbatov's house, where Pierre had often been in other days, and which, as he learned from the talk of the soldiers, was now occupied by the marshal, the Duke of Ekmul, Davu. They were taken to the entrance and led into the house one by one. Pierre was the sixth to enter. He was conducted through a glass gallery, an anteroom, and a hall, which were familiar to him, into a long, low study at the door of which stood an adjutant. Davu, spectacles on nose, sat bent over a table at the further end of the room. Pierre went close up to him, but Davu, evidently consulting a paper that lay before him, did not look up. Without raising his eyes, he said in a low voice, "'Who are you?' Pierre was silent, because he was incapable of uttering a word. To him, de Vaux was not merely a French general, but a man notorious for his cruelty. Looking at his cold face, as he sat like a stern schoolmaster who was prepared to wait a while for an answer, Pierre felt that every instant of delay might cost him his life. But he did not know what to say. He did not venture to repeat what he had said at his first examination yet to disclose his rank and position was dangerous and embarrassing. So he was silent. But before he had decided what to do, Davu raised his head, pushed his spectacles back on his forehead, screwed up his eyes, and looked intently at him. "'I know that man,' he said in a cold, measured tone, evidently calculated to frighten Pierre. The chill that had been running down Pierre's back now seized his head as in a vise. You cannot know me, General. I have never seen you. He is a Russian spy. 
Davout interrupted, addressing another general who was present, but whom Pierre had not noticed. Davout turned away. With an unexpected reverberation in his voice, Pierre rapidly began. "'No, Monseigneur,' he said, suddenly remembering that Davout was a duke. "'No, Monseigneur, you cannot have known me. I am a militia officer and have not quitted Moscow.' "'Your name?' asked Davout. Bezukhov. "'What proof have I that you are not lying?' "'Monseigneur,' exclaimed Pierre, not in an offended, but in a pleading voice. Davout looked up and gazed intently at him. For some seconds they looked at one another, and that look saved Pierre. Apart from conditions of war and law, that look established human relations between the two men. At that moment an immense number of things passed dimly through both their minds, and they realized that they were both children of humanity and were brothers. At the first glance, when Davout had only raised his head from the papers where human affairs and lives were indicated by numbers, Pierre was merely a circumstance, and Davout could have shot him without burdening his conscience with an evil deed. But now he saw in him a human being. He reflected for a moment. "'How can you show me that you are telling the truth?' said Davout coldly. Pierre remembered Rambal, and named him and his regiment, and the street where the house was. "'You are not what you say,' returned Davout. In a trembling, faltering voice, Pierre began adducing proofs of the truth of his statements. But at that moment an adjutant entered, and reported something to Davout. Davout brightened up at the news the adjutant brought, and began buttoning up his uniform. It seemed that he had quite forgotten Pierre. When the adjutant reminded him of the prisoner, he jerked his head in Pierre's direction with a frown and ordered him to be led away. But where they were to take him, Pierre did not know. Back to the coach house, or to the place of execution his companions had pointed out to him as they crossed the Virgin's Field. He turned his head and saw that the adjutant was putting another question to Davout. "'Yes, of course,' replied Davout, but what this yes meant Pierre did not know. Pierre could not afterwards remember how he went, whether it was far, or in which direction. His faculties were quite numbed. He was stupefied, and noticing nothing around him, went on moving his legs as the others did, till they all stopped, and he stopped too. The only thought in his mind at that time was, who was it that had really sentenced him to death? Not the men on the commission that had first examined him. Not one of them wished to, or evidently, could have done it. It was not Davout who had looked at him in so human a way. In another moment Davout would have realized that he was doing wrong, but just then the adjutant had come in and interrupted him. The adjutant, also, had evidently had no evil intent though he might have refrained from coming in. Then who was executing him, killing him, depriving him of life? Him, Pierre, with all his memories, aspirations, hopes, and thoughts. Who was doing this? And Pierre felt that it was no one. It was a system, a concurrence of circumstances. A system of some sort was killing him, Pierre, depriving him of life, of everything, annihilating him. End of chapter 10. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 11. Read for LibriVox.org by Barry Eads. Chapter 11. From Prince Shcherbatov's house, the prisoners were led straight down the Virgin's Field, to the left of the nunnery, as far as a kitchen garden, in which a post had been set up. Beyond that post a fresh pit had been dug in the ground, and near the post and the pit a large crowd stood in a semicircle. The crowd consisted of a few Russians and many of Napoleon's soldiers who were not on duty, Germans, Italians, and Frenchmen, in a variety of uniforms. To the right and left of the post stood rows of French troops in blue uniforms with red epaulets and high boots and shakos. The prisoners were placed in a certain order, according to the list, Pierre was sixth, and were led to the post. 
several drums suddenly began to beat on both sides of them, and at that sound Pierre felt as if part of his soul had been torn away. He lost the power of thinking or understanding. He could only hear and see, and he had only one wish, that the frightful thing that had to happen should happen quickly. Pierre looked round at his fellow prisoners and scrutinized them. The two first were convicts with shaven heads. One was tall and thin, the other dark, shaggy, and sinewy, with a flat nose. The third was a domestic serf, about forty-five years old, with grizzled hair and a plump, well-nourished body. The fourth was a peasant, a very handsome man, with a broad, light brown beard and black eyes. The fifth was a factory hand, a thin, sallow-faced lad of eighteen in a loose coat. Pierre heard the French consulting whether to shoot them separately or two at a time. "'In couples,' replied the officer in command, in a calm voice. There was a stir in the ranks of the soldiers, and it was evident that they were all hurrying. Not as men hurry to do something they understand, but as people hurry to finish a necessary but unpleasant and incomprehensible task. A French official wearing a scarf came up to the right of the row of prisoners, and read out the sentence in Russian and in French. Then two pairs of Frenchmen approached the criminals, and at the officer's command took the two convicts who stood first in the row. The convicts stopped when they reached the post, and, while sacks were being brought, looked dumbly around as a wounded beast looks at an approaching huntsman. One crossed himself continually, the other scratched his back, and made a movement of the lips resembling a smile. With hurried hands the soldiers blindfolded them, drawing the sacks over their heads, and bound them to the post. Twelve sharpshooters with muskets stepped out of the ranks with a firm, regular tread, and halted eight paces from the post. Pierre turned away to avoid seeing what was going to happen. Suddenly a crackling, rolling noise was heard which seemed to him louder than the most terrific thunder, and he looked round. There was some smoke, and the Frenchmen were doing something near the pit, with pale faces and trembling hands. Two more prisoners were let up. In the same way, and with similar looks, these two glanced vainly at the onlookers with only a silent appeal for protection in their eyes, evidently unable to understand or believe what was going to happen to them. They could not believe it because they alone knew what their life meant to them, and so they neither understood nor believed that it could be taken from them. Again Pierre did not wish to look, and again turned away. But again the sound as of a frightful explosion struck his ear, and at the same moment he saw smoke, blood, and the pale scarred faces of the Frenchmen who were again doing something by the post, their trembling hands impeding one another. Pierre, breathing heavily, looked around as if asking what it meant. The same question was expressed in all the looks that met his. On the faces of all the Russians, and of the French soldiers, and officers without exception, he read the same dismay, horror, and conflict that were in his own heart. But who, after all, is doing this? They are all suffering as I am. Who, then, is it? Who? Flashed for an instant through his mind. Sharpshooters of the eighty-six! Forward! shouted someone. The fifth prisoner, the one next to Pierre, was led away, alone. Pierre did not understand that he was saved, that he and the rest had been brought there only to witness the execution. With ever-growing horror, and no sense of joy or relief, he gazed at what was taking place. The fifth man was the factory lad in the loose cloak. The moment they laid hands on him, he sprang aside in terror and clutched at Pierre. Pierre shuddered and shook himself free. The lad was unable to walk. They dragged him along, holding him up under the arms, and he screamed. When they got him to the post, he grew quiet, as if he suddenly understood something. Whether he understood that screaming was useless, or whether he thought it incredible that men should kill him, at any rate he took his stand at the post, waiting to be blindfolded like the others, and like a wounded animal, looked around him with glittering eyes. Pierre was no longer able to turn away and close his eyes. His curiosity and agitation, like that of the whole crowd, reached the highest pitch at this fifth murder. Like the others, this fifth man seemed calm. He wrapped his loose cloak closer, and rubbed one bare foot with the other. When they began to blindfold him, he himself adjusted the knot which hurt the back of his head. 
Then when they propped him against the blood-stained post, he leaned back, and not being comfortable in that position, straightened himself, adjusted his feet, and leaned back again more comfortably. Pierre did not take his eyes from him, and did not miss his slightest movement. Probably a word of command was given, and was followed by the reports of eight muskets. But try as he would, Pierre could not afterwards remember having heard the slightest sound of the shots. He only saw how the workman suddenly sank down on the cords that held him, how blood showed itself in two places, how the ropes slackened under the weight of the hanging body, and how the workman sat down, his head hanging unnaturally, and one leg bent under him. Pierre ran up to the post. No one hindered him. Pale, frightened people were doing something around the workman. The lower jaw of an old Frenchman with a thick mustache trembled as he untied the ropes. The body collapsed. The soldiers dragged it awkwardly from the post and began pushing it into the pit. They all plainly and certainly knew that they were criminals who must hide the traces of their guilt as quickly as possible. Pierre glanced into the pit and saw that the factory lad was laying with his knees close to his head and one shoulder higher than the other. That shoulder rose and fell rhythmically and convulsively, but spadefuls of earth were already being thrown over the whole body. One of the soldiers, evidently suffering, shouted gruffly and angrily at Pierre to go back. But Pierre did not understand him, and remained near the post, and no one drove him away. When the pit had been filled up, a command was given. Pierre was taken back to his place, and the rows of troops on both sides of the post made a half-turn and went past it at a measured pace. The twenty-four sharpshooters with discharged muskets, standing in the center of the circle, ran back to their places as the companies passed by. Pierre gazed now with dazed eyes at these sharpshooters who ran in couples out of the circle. All but one rejoined their companies. This one, a young soldier, his face deadly pale, his shako pushed back, and his musket resting on the ground, still stood near the pit at the spot from which he had fired. He swayed like a drunken man, taking some steps forward and back to save himself from falling. An old, non-commissioned officer ran out of the ranks, and taking him by the elbow, dragged him to his company. The crowd of Russians and Frenchmen began to disperse. They all went away silently and with drooping heads. "'That will teach them to start fires,' said one of the Frenchmen. Pierre glanced round at the speaker, and saw that it was a soldier who was trying to find some relief after what had been done, but was not able to do so. Without finishing what he had begun to say, he made a hopeless movement with his arm, and went away. End of chapter 11《War and Peace》Book Twelve, Chapter Twelve, read for LibriVox.org by Barry Eads. Chapter Twelve. After the execution, Pierre was separated from the rest of the prisoners and placed alone in a small, ruined, and befouled church. Toward evening, a non-commissioned officer entered with two soldiers and told him that he had been pardoned and would now go to the barracks for the prisoners of war. Without understanding what was said to him. Pierre got up and went with the soldiers. They took him to the upper end of the field, where there were some sheds built of charred planks, beams, and battens, and led him into one of them. In the darkness some twenty different men surrounded Pierre. He looked at them without understanding who they were, why they were there, or what they wanted of him. He heard what they said, but did not understand the meaning of the words, and made no kind of deduction from or application of them. He replied to questions they put to him but did not consider who was listening to his replies, nor how they would understand them. He looked at their faces and figures, but they all seemed to him equally meaningless. From the moment Pierre had witnessed those terrible murders committed by men who did not wish to commit them, it was as if the mainspring of his life, on which everything depended and which made everything appear alive, had suddenly been wrenched out and everything had collapsed into a heap of meaningless rubbish. Though he did not acknowledge it to himself, his faith in the right ordering of the universe, in humanity, in his own soul, and in God, had been destroyed. He had experienced this before, but never so strongly as now. When similar doubts had assailed him before, 
they had been the result of his own wrongdoing, and at the bottom of his heart he had felt that relief from his despair and from those doubts was to be found within himself. But now he felt that the universe had crumbled before his eyes, and only meaningless ruins remained, and this not by any fault of his own. He felt that it was not in his power to regain faith in the meaning of life. Around him in the darkness men were standing, and evidently something about him interested them greatly. They were telling him something, and asking him something. Then they led him away somewhere, and at last he found himself in a corner of the shed, among men who were laughing and talking on all sides. "'Well, then, mates, that very prince who—' some voice at the other end of the shed was saying, with a strong emphasis on the word who. Sitting silent and motionless on a heap of straw against the wall, Pierre sometimes opened and sometimes closed his eyes. But as soon as he closed them he saw before him the dreadful face of the factory lad, especially dreadful because of its simplicity, and the faces of the murderers, even more dreadful because of their disquiet. And he opened his eyes again and stared vacantly into the darkness around him. Beside him in a stooping position sat a small man of whose presence he was first made aware by a strong smell of perspiration which came from him every time he moved. This man was doing something to his legs in the darkness, and though Pierre could not see his face, he felt that the man continually glanced at him. On growing used to the darkness, Pierre saw that the man was taking off his leg bands, and the way he did it aroused Pierre's interest. Having unwound the string that tied the band on one leg, he carefully coiled it up and immediately set to work on the other leg, glancing up at Pierre. While one hand hung up the first string, the other was already unwinding the band on the second leg. In this way, having carefully removed the leg bands by deft circular motions of his arm, following one another uninterruptedly, the man hung the leg bands up on some pegs fixed above his head. Then he took out a knife, cut something, closed the knife, placed it under the head of his bed, and seating himself comfortably, clasped his arms round his lifted knees, and fixed his eyes on Pierre. The latter was conscious of something pleasant, comforting, and well-rounded in these deft movements, in the man's well-ordered arrangements in his corner, and even in his very smell, and he looked at the man without taking his eyes from him. "'You've seen a lot of trouble, sir, eh?' the little man suddenly said, and there was so much kindliness and simplicity in his sing-song voice that Pierre tried to reply, but his jaw trembled and he felt tears rising to his eyes. The little fellow, giving Pierre no time to betray his confusion, instantly continued in the same pleasant tones. "'Eh, hey, lad, don't fret,' said he, in the tender sing-song caressing voice old Russian peasant women employ. "'Don't fret, friend. Suffer an hour. Live for an age. That's how it is, my dear fellow. And here we live, thank heaven, without offence. Among these folk, too, there are good men as well as bad,' said he, and still speaking, he turned on his knees with a supple movement, got up, coughed, and went off to another part of the shed. "'Eh, hey, you rascal!' Pierre heard the same kind voice saying at the other end of the shed. "'So you've come, you rascal. She remembers. Now, now, that'll do.' And the soldier, pushing away a little dog that was jumping up at him, returned to his place and sat down. In his hands he had something wrapped in a rag. "'Here, eat a bit, sir,' said he resuming his former respectful tone as he unwrapped and offered Pierre some baked potatoes. We had soup for dinner, and the potatoes are grand. Pierre had not eaten all day, and the smell of the potatoes seemed extremely pleasant to him. He thanked the soldier and began to eat. Well, are you all right? said the soldier with a smile. You should do like this. He took a potato, drew out his clasp knife, cut the potato into two equal halves on the palm of his hand, sprinkled some salt on it from the rag, and handed it to Pierre. "'The potatoes are grand,' he said once more. "'Eat some like that.' Pierre thought he had never eaten anything that tasted better. "'Oh, I'm all right,' said he. "'But why did they shoot those poor fellows? The last one was hardly twenty. "'Tis, tch, said the little man. "'Ah, what a sin, what a sin,' he added quickly and as if his words were always waiting ready in his mouth, and flew out involuntarily, he went on. How was it, sir, that you stayed in Moscow? 
I didn't think they would come so soon. I stayed accidentally, replied Pierre. And how did they arrest you, dear lad? At your house? No, I went to look at the fire, and they arrested me there, and tried me as an incendiary. Where there's law, there's injustice, put in the little man. And have you been here long? Pierre asked as he munched the last of the potato. I? It was last Sunday they took me, out of a hospital in Moscow. Why, you are a soldier, then? Yes, we are soldiers in the Asphoron Regiment. I was dying of fever. We weren't told anything. There were some twenty of us lying there. We had no idea, never guessed at all. And do you feel sad here? Pierre inquired. How can one help it, lad? My name is Platon, and the surname is Karatav, he added, evidently wishing to make it easier for Pierre to address him. They call me Little Falcon in the regiment. How is one to help feeling sad? Moscow, she's the mother of cities. How can one see all this and not feel sad? But the maggot gnaws the cabbage, yet dies first. That's what the old folks used to tell us, he added rapidly. What? What did you say? asked Pierre. Who, I? said Karatev. I say things happen not as we plan, but as God judges, he replied, thinking that he was repeating what he had said before, and immediately continued. Well, and you, have you a family estate, sir, and a house? So you have abundance, then, and a housewife? And your old parents, are they still living? he asked. And though it was too dark for Pierre to see, he felt that a suppressed smile of kindliness puckered the soldier's lips as he put these questions. He seemed grieved that Pierre had no parents, especially that he had no mother. A wife for counsel, a mother-in-law for welcome, but there's none as dear as one's own mother, said he. Well, and have you little ones? he went on asking. Again Pierre's negative answer seemed to distress him, and he hastened to add, Never mind, you're young folks yet, and please God may still have some. The great thing is to live in harmony. But it's all the same now, Pierre could not help saying. Ah, my dear fellow, rejoined Karatev, never decline a prison or a beggar's sack. He seated himself more comfortably and coughed, evidently preparing to tell a long story. Well, my dear fellow, I was still living at home, he began. We had a well-to-do homestead, plenty of land, we peasants lived well, and our house was one to thank God for. When father and we went out mowing, there were seven of us. We lived well. We were real peasants. It so happened, and Platon Karatov told a long story of how he had gone into someone's cosp to take wood, how he had been caught by the keeper, had been tried, flogged, and sent to serve as a soldier. Well, lad, and a smile changed the tone of his voice, we thought it was a misfortune, but it turned out a blessing. If it had not been for my sin, my brother would have had to go as a soldier. But he, my younger brother, had five little ones, while I, you see, only left a wife behind. We had a little girl, but God took her before I went as a soldier. I came home on leave, and I'll tell you how it was. I look and see that they are living better than before. The yard full of cattle, the women at home, two brothers away earning wages, and only Michael the youngest at home. Father, he says, all my children are the same to me. It hurts the same whichever finger gets bitten. But if Platon hadn't been shaved for a soldier, Michael would have had to go, called us all to him, and, will you believe it, placed us in front of the icons. Michael, he says, come here and bow down to his feet. And you, young woman, you bow down too. And you, grandchildren, also bow down before him. Do you understand? He says. That's how it is, dear fellow. Fate looks for a head. But we are always judging. That's not well. That's not right. But our luck is like water in a dragnet. You pull at it, and it bulges. But when you've drawn it out, it's empty. That's how it is. And Platon shifted his seat on the straw. After a short silence, he rose. Well, I think you must be sleepy said he, and began rapidly crossing himself and repeating, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy St. Nicholas, Frola and Lavra, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy St. Nicholas, Frola and Lavra, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. He concluded, then bowed to the ground, got up, sighed, and sat down again on his heap of straw. 
That's the way. Lay me down like a stone, O God, and raise me up like a loaf. He muttered as he lay down, pulling his coat over him. What prayer was that you were saying? asked Pierre. Eh? murmured Platon, who had almost fallen asleep. What was I saying? I was praying. Don't you pray? Yes, I do, said Pierre. Well, but what was that you said? Frola and Lavra? Well, of course, replied Platon quickly. The horses, saints. One must pity the animals, too. Eh, hey, the rascal! Now you've curled up and got warm, you daughter of a bitch, said Karatov, touching the dog that lay at his feet. And again, turning over, he fell asleep immediately. Sounds of crying and screaming came from somewhere in the distance outside, and flames were visible through the cracks of the shed, but inside it was quiet and dark. For a long time Pierre did not sleep, but lay with eyes open in the darkness, listening to the regular snoring of Platon, who lay beside him, and he felt that the world that had been shattered once more was stirring in his soul with a new beauty and on new and unshakable foundations. End of chapter 12「War and Peace, Book Twelve, Chapter Thirteen, Read for LibriVox.org by Heba. Twenty three soldiers, three officers, and two officials were confined in the shed in which Pierre had been placed and where he remained for four weeks. When Pierre remembered them afterwards, they all seemed misty figures to him except Platon and Karatev, who always remained in his mind a most vivid and precious memory, and the personification of everything Russian, kindly and round. When Pierre saw his neighbor next morning at dawn, the first impression of him, as of something round, was fully confirmed. Platon's whole figure, in a French overcoat girdled with a cord, a soldier's cap, and vast shoes, was round. His head was quite round, his back, chest, shoulders, and even his arms, which he held as if ever ready to embrace something, were rounded. His pleasant smile and his large, gentle brown eyes were also round. Platon Karatev must have been fifty, judging by his stories of campaigns he had been in, told as by an old soldier. He did not himself know his age, and was quite unable to determine it. But his brilliantly white, strong teeth, which showed in two unbroken semicircles when he laughed, as he often did, were all sound and good, there was not a grey hair in his beard or on his head, and his whole body gave an impression of suppleness, and especially of firmness and endurance. His face, despite its fine rounded wrinkles, had an expression of innocence and youth. His voice was pleasant and musical. But the chief peculiarity of his speech was its directness and appositeness. It was evident that he never considered what he had said or was going to say, and consequently the rapidity and justice of his intonation had an irresistible persuasiveness. His physical strength and agility during the first days of his imprisonment were such that he seemed not to know what fatigue and sickness meant. Every night before lying down, he said, Lord, lay me down as a stone and raise me up as a loaf. And every morning on getting up, he said, I lay down and curled up, I get up and shake myself. And indeed, he only had to lie down, to fall asleep like a stone, and he only had to shake himself, to be ready without a moment's delay for some work, just as children are ready to play directly they awake. He could do everything, not very well, but not badly. He baked, cooked, sewed, planed, and mended boots. He was always busy, and only at night allowed himself conversation, of which he was fond, and songs. He did not sing like a trained singer who knows he is listened to, but like the birds, evidently giving vent to the sounds in the same way that one stretches oneself or walks about to get rid of stiffness. And the sounds were always high-pitched, mournful, delicate, and almost feminine and his face at such times was very serious. Having been taken prisoner and allowed his beard to grow, he seemed to have thrown off all that had been forced upon him, everything military and alien to himself, and had returned to his former peasant habits. A soldier on leave, a shirt at side breeches, he would say. He did not like talking about his life as a soldier, though he did not complain, and often mentioned that he had not been flogged once during the whole of his army service. When he related anything, it was generally some old and evidently precious memory of his Christian life, as he called his peasant existence. The proverbs, of which his talk was full, were for the most part not the coarse and indecent saws soldiers employ, but those folk sayings which taken without a context seemed so insignificant, 
but when used appositely, suddenly acquire a significance of profound wisdom. He would often say the exact opposite of what he had said on a previous occasion, yet both would be right. He liked to talk, and he talked well, adorning his speech with terms of endearment and with folk sayings which Pierre thought he invented himself. But the chief charm of his talk lay in the fact that the commonest events, sometimes just such as Pierre had witnessed without taking notice of them, assumed in Karatev's a character of solemn fitness. He liked to hear the folk tales one of the soldiers used to tell of an evening. They were always the same. But most of all, he liked to hear stories of real life. He would smile joyfully when listening to such stories, now and then putting in a word or asking a question to make the moral beauty of what he was told clear to himself. Karatev had no attachments, friendships, or love, as Pierre understood them, but loved and lived affectionately with everything life brought him in contact with, particularly with man, not any particular man, but those of whom he happened to be. He loved his dog, his comrades, the French, and Pierre, who was his neighbor. But Pierre felt that in spite of Karatev's affectionate tenderness for him, by which he unconsciously gave Pierre's spiritual life its due, he would not have grieved for a moment at parting from him, and Pierre began to feel in the same way toward Karatev. To all the other prisoners, Platon Karatev seemed a most ordinary soldier. They called him Little Falcon, or Platosha, chaffed him good-naturedly, and sent him on errands. But to Pierre he always remained what he had seen that first night, an unfathomable, rounded, eternal personification of the spirit of simplicity and truth. Platon Karatev knew nothing by heart except his prayers. When he began to speak, he seemed not to know how he would conclude. Sometimes Pierre, struck by the meaning of his words, would ask him to repeat them, but Platon could never recall what he had said a moment before, just as he never could repeat to Pierre the words of his favorite song, Native and Birch Tree, and My Heart is Sick, occurred in it, but when spoken and not sung, no meaning could be got out of it. He did not, and could not, understand the meaning of words apart from their context. Every word and action of his was the manifestation of an activity unknown to him, which was his life. But his life, as he regarded it, had no meaning as a separate thing. It had meaning only as part of a whole of which he was always conscious. His words and actions flowed from him as evenly, inevitably, and spontaneously as fragrance exhales from a flower. He could not understand the value or significance of any word or deed taken separately. End of chapter 13「War and Peace」Book 12 Chapter 14 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick When Princess Mary heard from Nicholas that her brother was with the Rostovs at Yaroslav, she at once prepared to go there in spite of her aunt's efforts to dissuade her and not merely to go herself but to take her nephew with her. Whether it were difficult or easy, possible or impossible, she did not ask and did not want to know. It was her duty, not only herself, to be near her brother, who was perhaps dying, but to do everything possible to take his son to him, and so she prepared to set off. That she had not heard from Prince Andrew himself, Princess Mary attributed to his being too weak to write or to his considering the long journey too hard and too dangerous for her and his son. In a few days, Princess Mary was ready to start. Her equipage were the huge family coach in which she had traveled to Woroznes, a semi-open trap, and the baggage cart. With her traveled Mademoiselle Bourienne, little Nicholas and his tutor, her old nurse, three maids, Tikon, and a young footman and courier her aunt had sent to accompany her. The usual route through Moscow could not be thought of, and the roundabout way Princess Mary was obliged to take through Lipetsk, Ryazan, Vladimir, and Shuya was very long and, as post horses were not everywhere obtainable, very difficult. 
and near Riazan, where the French were said to have shown themselves, was even dangerous. During this difficult journey, Mademoiselle Bourienne, Dessals, and Princess Mary's servants were astonished at her energy and firmness of spirit. She went to bed later and rose earlier than any of them, and no difficulties daunted her. Thanks to her activity and energy, which infected her fellow travelers, they approached Yaroslav by the end of the second week. The last day of her stay in Voronezh had been the happiest of her life. Her love for Rostov no longer tormented or agitated her. It filled her whole soul, had become an integral part of herself, and she no longer struggled against it. Latterly, she had become convinced that she loved and was beloved, though she never said this definitely to herself in words. She had become convinced of it at her last interview with Nicholas, when he had come to tell her that her brother was with the Rostovs. Not by a single word had Nicholas alluded to the fact that Prince Andrew's relations with Natasha might, if he recovered, be renewed, but Princess Mary saw by his face that he knew and thought of this. Yet, in spite of that, his relation to her, considerate, delicate and loving, not only remained unchanged, but it sometimes seemed to Princess Mary that he was even glad that the family connection between them allowed him to express his friendship more freely. She knew that she loved for the first and only time in her life and felt that she was beloved and was happy in regard to it. But this happiness on one side of her spiritual nature did not prevent her feeling grief for her brother with full force. On the contrary, that spiritual tranquility on the one side made it the more possible for her to give full play to her feeling for her brother. That feeling was so strong at the moment of leaving Voronezh that those who saw her off as they looked at her careworn, despairing face, felt sure she would fall ill on the journey. But the very difficulties and preoccupations of the journey, which she took so actively in hand, saved her for a while from her grief and gave her strength. As always happens when traveling, Princess Mary thought only of the journey itself forgetting its object. But as she approached Yaroslav, the thought of what might await her there, not after many days, but that very evening, again presented itself to her, and her agitation increased to its utmost limit. The courier, who had been sent on in advance to find out where the Rostovs were staying in Yaroslav and in what condition Prince Andrew was when he met the big coach just entering the town gates was appalled by the terrible pallor of the princess's face that looked out at him from the window. I have found out everything, Your Excellency. The Rostovs are staying at the merchant Bronikov's house in the square, not far from here. Right above the Volga, said the courier. Princess Mary looked at him with frightened inquiry, not understanding why he did not reply to what she chiefly wanted to know, how was her brother. Mademoiselle Bourienne put that question for her. How is the prince? she asked. His Excellency is staying in the same house with them. Then he is alive, thought Princess Mary, and asked in a low voice, How is he? The servants say he is still the same. What still the same might mean, Princess Mary did not ask, 
but with an unnoticed glance at little seven-year-old Nicholas, who was sitting in front of her, looking with pleasure at the town, she bowed her head and did not raise it again till the heavy coach, rumbling, shaking and swaying, came to a stop. The carriage steps clattered as they were let down. The carriage door was opened. On the left there was water, a great river, and on the right a porch. There were people at the entrance, servants, and a rosy girl with a large plait of black hair, smiling as it seemed to Princess Mary in an unpleasantly affected way. This was Sonia. Princess Mary ran up the steps. This way, this way, said the girl with the same artificial smile, and the princess found herself in the hall facing an elderly woman of oriental type who came rapidly to meet her with a look of emotion. This was the countess. She embraced Princess Mary and kissed her. Mon enfant, she muttered, je vous aime. Et vous connaît depuis longtemps, Asterix. My child, I love you and have known you a long time. Despite her excitement, Princess Mary realized that this was the countess and that it was necessary to say something to her. Hardly knowing how she did it, she contrived to utter a few polite phrases in French in the same tone as those that had been addressed to her, and asked, How is he? The doctor says that he is not in danger, said the countess, but as she spoke she raised her eyes with a sigh, and her gesture conveyed a contradiction of her words. Where is he? Can I see him? Can I? asked the princess. One moment, princess, one moment, my dear. Is this his son? said the countess, turning to little Nicholas, who was coming in with the sulls. There will be room for everybody. This is a big house. Oh, what a lovely boy! The countess took Princess Mary into the drawing room, where Sonia was talking to Mademoiselle Bourienne. The countess caressed the boy and the old count came in and welcomed the princess. He had changed very much since Princess Mary had last seen him. Then he had been a brisk, cheerful, self-assured old man. Now he seemed a pitiful, bewildered person. While talking to Princess Mary, he continually looked round as if asking everyone whether he was doing the right thing. After the destruction of Moscow and of his property, thrown out of his accustomed groove, he seemed to have lost the sense of his own significance and to feel that there was no longer a place for him in life. In spite of her one desire to see her brother as soon as possible, and her vexation, that at the moment when all she wanted was to see him, they should be trying to entertain her and pretending to admire her nephew. The princess noticed all that was going on around her and felt the necessity of submitting for a time to this new order of things which she had entered. She knew it to be necessary and though it was hard for her, she was not vexed with these people. This is my niece, said the count, introducing Sonia. You don't know her, princess. Princess Mary turned to Sonia, and trying to stifle the hostile feeling that aroused in her toward the girl, she kissed her. But she felt oppressed by the fact that the mood of everyone around her was so far from what was in her own heart. Where is he? she asked again, addressing them all. He's downstairs. Natasha is with him, answered Sonia, flushing. We have sent to ask. 
I think you must be tired, princess. Tears of vexation showed themselves in Princess Mary's eyes. She turned away and was about to ask the countess again how to go to him, when light, impetuous, and seemingly buoyant steps were heard at the door. The princess looked round and saw Natasha coming in, almost running. That Natasha, whom she had liked so little at their meeting in Moscow long since. But hardly had the princess looked at Natasha's face before she realized that here was a real comrade in her grief and consequently a friend. She ran to meet her, embraced her, and began to cry on her shoulder. As soon as Natasha, sitting at the head of Prince Andrew's bed, heard of Princess Mary's arrival, she softly left his room and hastened to her with those swift steps that had sounded buoyant to Princess Mary. There was only one expression on her agitated face when she ran into the drawing-room, that of love, boundless love for him, for her, and for all that was near to the man she loved, and of pity, suffering for others, and passionate desire to give herself entirely to helping them. It was plain that at that moment there was in Natasha's heart no thought of herself or of her own relations with Prince Andrew. Princess Mary, with her acute sensibility, understood all this at the first glance at Natasha's face and wept on her shoulder with sorrowful pleasure. Come, come to him, Mary said Natasha, leading her into the other room. Princess Mary raised her head, dried her eyes, and turned to Natasha. She felt that from her she would be able to understand and learn everything. How? She began her question, but stopped short. She felt that it was impossible to ask or to answer in words. Natasha's face, eyes, would have to tell her all more clearly and profoundly. Natasha was gazing at her, but seemed afraid and in doubt whether to say all she knew or not. She seemed to feel that before those luminous eyes which penetrated into the very depths of her heart, it was impossible not to tell the whole truth which she saw. And suddenly Natasha's lips twitched, ugly wrinkles gathered round her mouth, and covering her face with her hands, she burst into sobs. Princess Mary understood. But she still hoped and asked in words she herself did not trust. But how is his wound? What is his general condition? You, you'll see, was all Natasha could say. They sat a little while downstairs near his room till they had left off crying and were able to go to him with calm faces. How has his whole illness gone? Is it long since he grew worse? When did this happen? Princess Mary inquired. Natasha told her that at first there had been danger from his feverish condition and the pain he suffered. But at Troitsa that had passed, and the doctor had only been afraid of gangrene. That danger had also passed. When they reached Yaroslav, the wound had begun to fester. Natasha knew all about such things as festering and the doctor had said that the festering might take a normal course. Then fever set in, but the doctor had said the fever was not very serious. But two days ago this suddenly happened, said Natasha, struggling with her sobs. I don't know why, but you will see 
what he is like. Is he weak, sinner? asked the princess. No, it is not that, but worse. You'll see. Oh, Mary, he is too good. He cannot, cannot live, because... End of chapter 14 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 15 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick when Natasha opened Prince Andrew's door with a familiar movement and let Princess Mary pass into the room before her, the princess felt the sobs in her throat, hard as she had tried to prepare herself, and now tried to remain tranquil. She knew that she would be unable to look at him without tears. The princess understood what Natasha had meant by the words, two days ago this suddenly happened. She understood those words to mean that he had suddenly softened and that this softening and gentleness were signs of approaching death. As she stepped to the door, she already saw in imagination Andrew's face as she remembered it, in childhood, a gentle, mild, sympathetic face which he had rarely shown and which therefore affected her very strongly. She was sure he would speak soft, tender words to her, such as her father had uttered before his death, and that she would not be able to bear it and would burst into sobs in his presence. Yet, sooner or later, it had to be, and she went in. The sobs rose higher and higher in her throat as she more and more clearly distinguished his form and her short-sighted eyes tried to make out his features, and then she saw his face and met his gaze. He was lying in a squirrel fur dressing gown on a divan, surrounded by pillows. He was thin and pale. In one thin, translucently white hand he held a handkerchief, while with the other he stroked the delicate moustache he had grown, moving his fingers slowly. His eyes gazed at them as they entered. On seeing his face and meeting his eyes, Princess Mary's pace suddenly slackened. She felt her tears dry up and her sobs ceased. She suddenly felt guilty and grew timid on catching the expression of his face and eyes. But in what am I to blame? she asked herself. And his cold, stern look replied, Because you are alive and thinking of the living, while I, in the deep gaze that seemed to look not outwards but inwards, there was an almost hostile expression as he slowly regarded his sister and Natasha. He kissed his sister, holding her hand in his, as was their wont. How are you, Mary? How did you manage to get here? said he in a voice as calm and aloof as his look. Had he screamed in agony, that scream would not have stuck such horror into Princess Mary's heart as the tone of his voice. And have you brought little Nicholas, he asked in the same slow, quiet manner and with an obvious effort to remember. How are you now? said Princess Mary, herself surprised at what she was saying. That, my dear, you must ask the doctor, he replied, and again making an 
evident effort to be affectionate, he said with his lips only, his words clearly did not correspond to his thoughts, Merci, cher ami d'être venu, Asterik, thank you for coming, my dear. Princess Mary pressed his hand. The pressure made him wince just perceptibly. He was silent, and she did not know what to say. She now understood what had happened to him two days before. In his words, his tone, and especially in that calm, almost antagonistic look, could be felt an estrangement from everything belonging to this world, terrible in one who is alive. Evidently, only with an effort did he understand anything living but it was obvious that he failed to understand, not because he lacked the power to do so, but because he understood something else, something the living did not and could not understand, and which wholly occupied his mind. There, you see, how strangely fate has brought us together, said he, breaking the silence and pointing to Natasha. She looks after me all the time. Princess Mary heard him and did not understand how he could say such a thing. He, the sensitive, tender Prince Andrew, how could he say that before her, whom he loved and who loved him? Had he expected to live, he could not have said those words in that offensively cold tone. If he had not known that he was dying, how could he have failed to pity her, and how could he speak like that in her presence? The only explanation was that he was indifferent because something else, much more important, had been revealed to him. The conversation was cold and disconnected and continually broke off. Mary came by way of Riazan, said Natasha. Prince Andrew did not notice that she called his sister Mary, and only after calling her so in his presence did Natasha notice it herself. Really? he asked. They told her that all Moscow had been burned down, and that... Natasha stopped. It was impossible to talk. It was plain that he was making an effort to listen, but could not do so. Yes, they say it is burnt, he said. It is a great pity. He gazed straight before him, absently stroking his moustache with his fingers. And so you have met Count Nicholas, Mary, Prince Andrew suddenly said, evidently wishing to speak pleasantly to them. He wrote here that he took a great liking to you. He went on simply and calmly, evidently unable to understand all the complex significance his words had for living people. If you liked him too, it would be a good thing for you to get married. He added rather more quickly, as if pleased at having found words he had long been seeking. Princess Mary heard his words, but they had no meaning for her, except as a proof of how far away he now was from everything living. Why talk of me? she said quietly and glanced at Natasha. Natasha, who felt her glance, did not look at her. All three were again silent. Andrew, would you like... Princess Mary suddenly said in a trembling voice, Would you like to see little Nicholas? He's always talking about you. Prince Andrew smiled just perceptibly and for the first time, but Princess Mary, who knew his face so well, saw with horror that he did not smile with pleasure or affection for his son, but with quiet, gentle irony, 
because he thought she was trying what she believed to be the last means of arousing him. Yes, I shall be very glad to see him. Is he quite well? When little Nicholas was brought into Prince Andrew's room, he looked at his father with frightened eyes, but did not cry, because no one else was crying. Prince Andrew kissed him, and evidently did not know what to say to him. When Nicholas had been led away, Princess Mary again went up to her brother, kissed him, and unable to restrain her tears any longer, began to cry. He looked at her attentively. Is it about Nicholas? he asked. Princess Mary nodded her head, weeping. Mary, you know the gospel? But he broke off. What did you say? Nothing. You mustn't cry here, he said, looking at her with the same cold expression. When Princess Mary began to cry, he understood that she was crying at the thought that little Nicholas would be left without a father. With a great effort, he tried to return to life and to see things from their point of view. Yes, to them it must seem sad, he thought, but how simple it is. The fowls of the air sow not, neither do they reap, yet your father feedeth them he said to himself and wished to say to Princess Mary. But no, they will take it their own way. They won't understand. They can't understand that all those feelings they prize so, all our feelings, all those ideas that seem so important to us, are unnecessary. We cannot understand one another, and he remained silent. Prince Andrew's little son was seven. He could scarcely read and knew nothing. After that day he lived through many things, gaining knowledge, observation, and experience, but had he possessed all the faculties he afterwards acquired, he could not have had a better or more profound understanding of the meaning of the scene he had witnessed between his father, Mary, and Natasha then, he had then. He understood it completely, and leaving the room without crying, went silently up to Natasha, who had come out with him, and looked shyly at her with his beautiful, thoughtful eyes, then his uplifted rosy upper lip trembled and leaning his head against her he began to cry after that he avoided dessals and the countess who caressed him and either sat alone or came timidly to princess mary or to natasha of whom he seemed even fonder than of his aunt and clung to them quietly and shyly when Princess Mary had left Prince Andrew, she fully understood what Natasha's face had told her. She did not speak any more to Natasha of hopes of saving his life. She took turns with her beside his sofa and did not cry any more, but prayed continually, turning in soul to that eternal and unfathomable whose presence above the dying man was now so evident. End of chapter 15 Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida War and Peace, Book 12, Chapter 16 Recording for LibriVox.org by Eva Harnick
Not only did Prince Andrew know he would die, but he felt that he was dying and was already half dead. He was conscious of an aloofness from everything earthly and the strange and joyous lightness of existence. Without haste or agitation, he awaited what was coming. That inexorable, eternal, distant, and unknown, the presence of which he had felt continually all his life, was now near to him, and by the strange lightness he experienced, almost comprehensible and palpable. Formerly he had feared the end. He had twice experienced the terribly tormenting fear of death, the end, but now he no longer understood that fear. He had felt it for the first time when the shell spun like a top before him, and he looked at the fallow field, the bushes, and the sky, and knew that he was face to face with death. When he came to himself after being wounded, and the flower of eternal, unfettered love had instantly unfolded itself in his soul, as if freed from the bondage of life that had restrained it, he no longer feared death and ceased to think about it. During the hours of solitude, suffering, and partial delirium, he spent, after he was wounded, the more deeply he penetrated into the new principle of eternal love revealed to him, the more he unconsciously detached himself from earthly life. To love everything and everybody, and always to sacrifice oneself for love, meant not to love anyone, not to live this earthly life. And the more imbued he became with that principle of love, the more he renounced life and the more completely he destroyed that dreadful barrier which, in the absence of such love, stands between life and death. When during those first days he remembered that he would have to die, he said to himself, Well, what of it? So much the better. But after that night in Mistishi, when half delirious he had seen her for whom he longed appear before him, and having pressed her hand to his lips, he shed gentle, happy tears, love for a particular woman again crept unobserved into his heart, and once more bound him to life and joyful and agitating thoughts began to occupy his mind. Recalling the moment at the ambulance station when he had seen Kuragin, he could not now regain the feeling he then had, but was tormented by the question whether Kuragin was alive, and he dared not inquire. His illness pursued its normal physical course, but what Natasha referred to when she said this suddenly happened had occurred two days before Princess Mary arrived. It was the last spiritual struggle between life and death in which death gained the victory. It was the unexpected realization of the fact that he still valued life as presented to him in the form of his love for Natasha and a last, though ultimately vanquished, attack of terror before the unknown. It was evening. As usual, after dinner, he was slightly feverish, and his thoughts were preternaturally clear. Sonia was sitting by the table. He began to doze. Suddenly a feeling of happiness seized him. Ah, oh, she has come, thought he. And so it was, in Sonia's place sat Natasha, who had just come in noiselessly. Since she had begun looking after him, he had always experienced this physical consciousness of her nearness. She was sitting in an armchair placed sideways, screening the light of the candle from him, and was knitting a stocking. 
She had learned to knit stockings since Prince Andrew had casually mentioned that no one nursed the sick so well as old nurses who knit stockings and that there is something soothing in the knitting of stockings. The needles clicked lightly in her slender, rapidly moving hands. And he could clearly see the thoughtful profile of her drooping face. She moved, and the ball rolled off her knees. She started, glanced round at him, and screening the candle with her hand, stooped carefully with a supple and exact movement, picked up the ball, and regained her former position. He looked at her without moving and saw that she wanted to draw a deep breath after stooping, but refrained from doing so and breathed cautiously. At the Troitsa monastery they had spoken of the past, and he had told her that if he lived he would always thank God for his wound which had brought them together again. But after that they never spoke of the future. Can it or can it not be, he now thought as he looked at her and listened to the light click of the steel needles, can fate have brought me to her so strangely only for me to die? Is it possible that the truth of life has been revealed to me only to show me that I have spent my life in falsity? I love her more than anything in the world. But what am I to do if I love her? he thought, and he involuntarily groaned from a habit acquired during his sufferings. On hearing that sound, Natasha put down the stocking, leaned nearer to him, and suddenly noticing his shining eyes, stepped lightly up to him and bent over him. You are not asleep? No, I have been looking at you a long time. I felt you come in. No one else gives me that sense of soft tranquility that you do. That light. I want to weep for joy. Natasha drew closer to him. Her face shone with rapturous joy. Natasha, I love you too much, more than anything in the world. And I... She turned away for an instant. Why too much? She asked. Why too much? Well, what do you? What do you feel in your soul, your whole soul? Shall I live? What do you think? I am sure of it, sure, Natasha almost shouted, taking hold of both his hands with a passionate movement. He remained silent a while. How good it would be! And taking her hand, he kissed it. Natasha felt happy and agitated, but at once remembered that this would not do and that he had to be quiet. But you have not slept, she said, repressing her joy. Try to sleep, please. He pressed her hand and released it and she went back to the candle and sat down again in her former position. Twice she turned and looked at him, and her eyes met his beaming at her. She set herself a task on her stocking and resolved not to turn round till it was finished. Soon he really shut his eyes and fell asleep. He did not sleep long and suddenly awoke with a start and in a cold perspiration. As he fell asleep, he had still been thinking of the subject that now always occupied his mind, about life and death, and chiefly about death. He felt himself nearer to it. Love! What is love? he thought. Love hinders death. Love is life. All, everything that I understand, I understand only because I love. Everything is, everything exists only because I love. 
Everything is united by it alone. Love is God, and to die means that I, a particle of love, shall return to the general and eternal source. These thoughts seemed to him comforting, but they were only thoughts. Something was lacking in them. They were not clear. They were too one-sidedly personal and brain-spun. And there was the former agitation and obscurity. He fell asleep. He dreamed that he was lying in the room he really was in, but he was quite well and unwounded. Many various indifferent and insignificant people appeared before him. He talked to them and discussed something trivial. They were preparing to go away somewhere. Prince Andrew dimly realized that all this was trivial and that he had more important cares, but he continued to speak, surprising them by empty witticism. Gradually, unnoticed, all these persons began to disappear, and a single question, that of the closed door, superseded all else. He rose and went to the door to bolt and lock it. Everything depended on whether he was or was not in time to lock it. He went and tried to hurry, but his legs refused to move, and he knew he would not be in time to lock the door, though he painfully strained all his powers. He was seized by an agonizing fear, and that fear was the fear of death. It stood behind the door, but just when he was clumsily creeping toward the door, that dreadful something on the other side was already pressing against it and forcing its way in. Something not human, death was breaking in through that door and had to be kept out. He seized the door, making a final effort to hold it back. To lock it was no longer possible, but his efforts were weak and clumsy, and the door, pushed from behind by the terror, opened and closed again. Once again it pushed from outside. His last superhuman efforts were vain, and both halves of the door noiselessly opened. It entered, and it was death and Prince Andrew died. But at the instant he died, Prince Andrew remembered that he was asleep, and the very instant he died, having made an effort, he awoke. Yes, it was death. I died and woke up. Yes, death is an awakening. And all at once it grew light in his soul, and the veil that had till then concealed the unknown was lifted from his spiritual vision. He felt as if powers till then confined within him had been liberated, and that strange lightness did not again leave him. When, waking in a cold perspiration, he moved on the divan, Natasha went up and asked him what was the matter. He did not answer and looked at her strangely, not understanding. That was what had happened to him two days before Princess Mary's arrival. From that day, as the doctor expressed it, the wasting fever assumed a malignant character. But what the doctor said did not interest Natasha. She saw the terrible moral symptoms, which to her were more convincing. From that day an awakening from life came to Prince Andrew together with his awakening from sleep, and compared to the duration of life, it did not seem to him slower 
than an awakening from sleep compared to the duration of a dream. There was nothing terrible or violent in this comparatively slow awakening. His last days and hours passed in an ordinary and simple way. Both Princess Mary and Natasha, who did not leave him, felt this. They did not weep or shudder, and during these last days they themselves felt that they were not attending on him, he was no longer there, he had left them, but on what reminded them most closely of him, his body. Both felt this so strongly that the outward and terrible side of death did not affect them, and they did not feel it necessary to foment their grief. Neither in his presence nor out of it did they weep, nor did they ever talk to one another about him. They felt that they could not express in words what they understood. They both saw that he was sinking slowly and quietly, deeper and deeper away from them. And they both knew that this had to be so, and it was right. He confessed and received communion. Everyone came to take leave of him. When they brought his son to him, he pressed his lips to the boys and turned away, not because he felt it hard and sad. Princess Mary and Natasha understood that but simply because he thought it was all that was required of him. But when they told him to bless the boy, he did what was demanded and looked round as if asking whether there was anything else he should do. When the last convulsions of the body which the spirit was leaving occurred, Princess Mary and Natasha were present. Is it over? said Princess Mary, when his body had for a few minutes lain motionless, growing cold before them. Natasha went up, looked at the dead eyes, and hastened to close them. She closed them, but did not kiss them, but clung to that which reminded her most nearly of him, his body. Where has he gone? Where is he now? When the body, washed and dressed, lay in the coffin on a table, everyone came to take leave of him, and they all wept. Little Nicholas cried because his heart was rent by painful perplexity. The countess and Sonia cried from pity for Natasha, and because he was no more. The old count cried because he felt that before long he too must take the same terrible step. Natasha and Princess Mary also wept now, but not because of their own personal grief. They wept with a reverent and softening emotion which had taken possession of their souls at the consciousness of the simple and solemn mystery of death that had been accomplished in their presence. End of chapter 16 End of War and Peace, Book 12 by Leo Tolstoy Recording by Eva Harnick, Pontevedra, Florida this recording is in the public domain. War and Peace by Liv Tolstoy Translated by Aylmer and Louise Maud Book 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ernst Patinama. War and Peace by Liv Tolstoy. Book 13, Chapter 1. 1812. 
man's mind cannot grasp the causes of events in their completeness but the desire to find those causes is implanted in man's soul and without considering the multiplicity and complexity of the conditions any one of which taken separately may seem to be the cause he snatches at the first approximation to a cause that seems to him intelligible and says this is the cause in historical events where the actions of men are the subject of observation the first and most primitive approximation to present itself was the will of the gods and after that the will of those who stood in the most prominent position the heroes of history but we need only penetrate to the essence of any historic event which lies in the activity of the general mass of men who take part in it to be convinced that the will of the historic hero does not control the actions of the mass but is itself continually controlled it may seem to be a matter of indifference whether we understand the meaning of historical events this way or that yet there is the same difference between a man who says that the people of the west moved on the east because napoleon wished it and a man who says that this happened because it had to happen as there is between those who declared that the earth was stationary and that the planets moved round it and those who admitted that they did not know what upheld the earth but knew there were laws directing its movement and that of the other planets there is and can be no cause of an historical event except the one cause of all causes but there are laws directing events and some of these laws are known to us while we are conscious of others we cannot comprehend the discovery of these laws is only possible when we have quite abandoned the attempt to find the cause in the will of some one man just as the discovery of the laws of the motion of the planets was possible only when men abandoned the conception of the fixity of the earth the historians consider that next to the battle of borodino and the occupation of moscow by the enemy and its destruction by fire the most important episode of the war of eighteen hundred and twelve was the movement of the russian army from the ryazan to the kaluga road and to the tarutino camp the so-called flank march across the krasnaya pakhra river they ascribe the glory of that achievement of genius to different men and dispute as to whom the honor is due even foreign historians including the french acknowledge the genius of the russian commanders when they speak of that flank march but it is hard to understand why military writers and following them others consider this flank march to be the profound conception of some one man who saved russia and destroyed napoleon in the first place it is hard to understand where the profundity and genius of this movement lay for not much mental effort was needed to see that the best position for an army when it is not being attacked is where there are most provisions and even a dull boy of thirteen could have guessed that the best position for an army after its retreat from moscow in eighteen hundred and twelve was on the kaluga road so it is impossible to understand by what reasoning the historians reached the conclusion that this manoeuvre was a profound one and it is even more difficult to understand just why they think that this manoeuvre was calculated to save russia and destroy the french for this flank march had it been preceded accompanied or followed by other circumstances might have proved ruinous to the russians and salutary for the french if the position of the russian army really began to improve from the time of that march it does not at all follow that the march was the cause of it that flank march might not only have failed to give any advantage to the russian army but might in other circumstances have led to its destruction what would have happened had moscow not burned down if murat had not lost sight of the russians if napoleon had not remained inactive if the russian army at krasnaya pakhra had given battle as bennigsen and barclay advised what would have happened had the french attacked the russians while they were marching beyond the pakhra what would have happened if on approaching tarutino napoleon had attacked the russians with but a tenth of the energy 
he had shown when he attacked them at Smolensk? What would have happened had the French moved on Petersburg? In any of these eventualities, that flank march that brought salvation might have proved disastrous. The third and most incomprehensible thing is that people studying history deliberately avoid seeing that this flank march cannot be attributed to, to any one man, that no one ever foresaw it, and that in reality, like the retreat from Philly, it did not suggest itself to anyone in its entirety, but resulted, moment by moment, step by step, event by event, from an endless number of most diverse circumstances, and was only seen in its entirety when it had been accomplished and belonged to the past. At the council at Philly, the prevailing thought in the minds of the Russian commanders was the one naturally suggesting itself, namely, a direct retreat by the Nizhny road. In proof of this, there is the fact that the majority of the council voted for such a retreat, and above all there is the well-known conversation after the council between the commander-in-chief and Lanskoy, who was in charge of the commissariat department. Lanskoy informed the commander-in-chief that the army supplies were for the most part stored along the Oka in the Tula and Ryazan provinces, and that, if they retreated on Nizhny, the army would be separated from its supplies by the broad river Oka, which cannot be crossed early in winter. This was the first indication of the necessity of deviating from what had previously seemed the most natural course, a direct retreat on Nizhny Novgorod. The army turned more to the south, along the Ryazan road, and nearer to its supplies. Subsequently, the inactivity of the French, who even lost sight of the Russian army, concern for the safety of the arsenal at Tula, and especially the advantages of drawing nearer to its supplies, caused the army to turn still further south to the Tula road. Having crossed over, by a forced march, to the Tula road beyond the Pachra, the Russian commanders intended to remain at Podolsk, and had no thought of the Tarutino position. But innumerable circumstances, and the reappearance of French troops, who had for a time lost touch with the Russians, and projects of giving battle, and, above all, the abundance of provisions in Kaluga province, obliged our army to turn still more to the south, and to cross from the Tula to the Kaluga road, and go to Tarutino, which was between the roads along which those supplies lay. Just as it is impossible to say when it was decided to abandon Moscow, so it is impossible to say precisely when, or by whom, it was decided to move to Tarutino. Only when the army had got there, as the result of innumerable and varying forces, did people begin to assure themselves that they had desired this movement, and long ago foreseen its result. End of chapter 1 Recording by Ernst Patinama Amsterdam, the Netherlands War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 2, read for LibriVox.org by Alex Pirangeli. The famous flank movement merely consisted in this. After the advance of the French had ceased, the Russian army, which had been continually retreating straight back from the invaders, deviated from that direct course, and not finding itself pursued, was naturally drawn toward the district where supplies were abundant. If, instead of imagining to ourselves commanders of genius leading the Russian army, we picture that army without any leaders, it could not have done anything but make a return movement toward Moscow, describing an arc in the direction where most provisions were to be found, and where the country was richest. That movement from the Nizhny to the Ryazan, Tula, and Kaluga roads was so natural that even the Russian marauders moved in that direction, and demands were sent from Petersburg for Kutuzov to take his army that way. At Tarutino, 
Kutuzov received what was almost a reprimand from the emperor for having moved his army along the Riazan road, and the emperor's letter indicated to him the very position he had already occupied near Kaluga. Having rolled like a ball in the direction of the impetus given by the whole campaign and by the battle of Borodino, the Russian army, when the strength of that impetus was exhausted and no fresh push was received, assumed the position natural to it. Kutuzov's merit lay not in any strategic maneuver of genius, as it is called, but in the fact that he alone understood the significance of what had happened. He alone then understood the meaning of the French army's inactivity. He alone continued to assert that the Battle of Borodino had been a victory. He alone, who as a commander-in-chief might have been expected to be eager to attack, employed his whole strength to restrain the Russian army from useless engagements. The beast wounded at Borodino was lying where the fleeing hunter had left him, but whether he was still alive, whether he was strong and merely lying low, the hunter did not know. Suddenly the beast was heard to moan. The moan of that wounded beast, the French army, which betrayed its calamitous condition, was the sending of Loriston to Kutuzov's camp with overtures for peace. Napoleon, with his usual assurance that whatever entered his head was right, wrote to Kutuzov the first words that occurred to him, though they were meaningless. Monsieur le Prince Kutuzov, I am sending one of my adjutants general to discuss several interesting questions with you. I beg your highness to credit what he says to you, especially when he expresses the sentiment of esteem and special regard I have long entertained for your person. This letter, having no other object, I pray God, Monsieur le Prince Kutuzov, to keep you in his holy and gracious protection. Napoleon, Moscow, October 30, 1812. Kutuzov replied, I should be cursed by posterity were I looked on as the initiator of a settlement of any sort. Such is the present spirit of my nation. But he continued to exert all his powers to restrain his troops from attacking. During the month that the French troops were pillaging in Moscow, and the Russian troops were quietly encamped at Tarutino, a change had taken place in the relative strength of the two armies, both in spirit and in number, as a result of which the superiority had passed to the Russian side. Though the condition and the numbers of the French army were unknown to the Russians, as soon as that change occurred, the need of attacking at once showed itself by countless signs. These signs were, Loiston's mission, the abundance of provisions at Tarutino, the reports coming in from all sides of the inactivity and disorder of the French, the flow of recruits to our regiments, the fine weather, the long rest the Russian soldiers had enjoyed, and the impatience to do what they had been assembled for, which usually shows itself in an army that has been resting, curiosity as to what the French army, so long lost sight of, was doing, the boldness with which our outposts now scouted close up to the French stationed at Tarotino, the news of easy successes gained by peasants and guerrilla troops over the French, the envy aroused by this, the desire for revenge that lay in the heart of every Russian as long as the French were in Moscow, and above all, a dim consciousness in every soldier's mind that the relative strength of the armies had changed and that the advantage was now on our side. There was a substantial change in the relative strength, and an advance had become inevitable. And at once, as a clock begins to strike and chime, as soon as the minute hand has completed a full circle, this change was shown by an increased activity, whirring and chiming in the higher spheres. End of chapter 2 Recording by Alex Pierangeli War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 3, read for LibriVox.org, by Anna Simon.
The Russian army was commanded by Kutuzov and his staff, and also by the Emperor from Petersburg. Before the news of the abandonment of Moscow had been received in Petersburg, a detailed plan of the whole campaign had been drawn up and sent to Kutuzov for his guidance. Though this plan had been drawn up on the supposition that Moscow was still in our hands, it was approved by the staff and accepted as a basis for action. Kutuzov only replied that movements arranged from a distance were always difficult to execute. So fresh instructions were sent for the solution of difficulties that might be encountered, as well as fresh people who were to watch Kutuzov's actions and report upon them. Besides this, the whole staff of the Russian army was now reorganized. The posts left vacant by Bagration, who had been killed, and by Barclay, who had gone away in dudgeon, had to be filled. Very serious consideration was given to the question whether it would be better to put A in B's place and B in D's, or, on the contrary, to put D in A's place, and so on, as if anything more than A's or B's satisfaction depended on this. As a result of the hostility between Kutuzov and Benningsen, his chief of staff, the presence of confidential representatives of the Emperor and these transfers, a more than usually complicated play of parties was going on among the staff of the army. A was undermining B, D was undermining C, and so on, in all possible combinations and permutations. In all these plottings the subject of intrigue was generally the conduct of the war, which all these men believed they were directing. But this affair of the war went on independently of them, as it had to go, that is, never in the way people devised, but flowing always from the essential attitude of the masses. Only in the highest spheres did all these schemes, crossings, and interminglings appear to be a true reflection of what had to happen. Prince Mikhail Ilarionovitch, wrote the Emperor on the 2nd of October in a letter that reached Kutuzov after the battle at Tarotino, since September the 2nd, Moscow has been in the hands of the enemy. Your last reports were written on the 20th, and during all this time, not only has no action been taken against the enemy, or for the relief of the ancient capital, but, according to your last report, you have even retreated farther. Serpokov is already occupied by an enemy detachment, and Tula, with its famous arsenal, so indispensable to the army, is in danger. From General Witzingerod's reports, I see that an enemy corps of 10,000 men is moving on the Petersburg Road. Another corps of several thousand men is moving on Mitrov. A third has advanced along the Vladimir Road, and a fourth, rather considerable detachment, is stationed between Ruza and Mozajk. Napoleon himself was in Moscow as late as the 25th. In view of all this information, when the enemy has scattered his forces in large detachments, and with Napoleon and his guards in Moscow, is it possible that the enemy's forces confronting you are so considerable as not to allow of your taking the offensive? On the contrary, he is probably pursuing you with detachments, or at most with an army corps much weaker than the army entrusted to you. It would seem that, availing yourself of these circumstances, you might advantageously attack a weaker one and annihilate him, or at least oblige him to retreat retaining in our hands an important part of the provinces now occupied by the enemy, and thereby averting danger from Tula and other towns in the interior. You will be responsible, if the enemy is able to direct a force of any size against Petersburg to threaten this capital, in which it has not been possible to retain many troops. For with the army entrusted to you, and acting with resolution and energy, you have ample means to avert this fresh calamity." Remember that you have still to answer to our offended country for the loss of Moscow. You have experienced my readiness to reward you. That readiness will not weaken in me, but I and Russia have a right to expect from you all the zeal, firmness, and success which your intellect, military talent, and the courage of the troops you command justify us in expecting. But by the time this letter, which proved that the real relation of the forces had already made itself felt in Petersburg, was dispatched, Kutuzov had found himself unable any longer to restrain the army he commanded from attacking, and a battle had taken place. On the 2nd of October, a Cossack, Shapovalov, who was out scouting, killed one hare and wounded another. Following the wounded hare, he made his way far into the forest and came upon the left flank of Murat's army, 
and camped there without any precautions. The Cossack laughingly told his comrades how he had almost fallen into the hands of the French. A cornet, hearing the story, informed his commander. The Cossack was sent for and questioned. The Cossack officers wished to take advantage of this chance to capture some horses, but one of the superior officers, who was acquainted with the higher authorities, reported the incident to a general on the staff. The state of things on the staff had of late been exceedingly strained. Ermolov had been to see Benningsen a few days previously, and had entreated him to use his influence with the commander-in-chief to induce him to take the offensive. "'If I did not know you, I should think you did not want what you are asking for. I need only advise anything, and His Highness is sure to do the opposite,' replied Benningsen. The Cossack's report, confirmed by horse patrols who were sent out, was the final proof that events had matured. The tightly coiled spring was released, the clock began to whir, and the chimes to play. Despite all his supposed power, his intellect, his experience, and his knowledge of men, Kutuzov, having taken into consideration the Cossack's report, a note from Benningsen who sent personal reports to the Emperor, the wishes he supposed the Emperor to hold, and the fact that all the generals expressed the same wish, could no longer check the inevitable movement and gave the order to do what he regarded as useless and harmful, gave his approval, that is, to the accomplished fact. End of chapter 3《War and Peace》Book Thirteen, Chapter Four, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. Benningsen's note and the Cossacks' information that the left flank of the French was unguarded were merely final indications that it was necessary to order an attack, and it was fixed for the fifth of October. On the morning of the fourth of October, Kutuzov signed the dispositions. Toll read them to Ermolov, asking him to attend to the further arrangements. All right, all right. I haven't time just now," replied Ermolov, and left the hut. The dispositions drawn up by Toll were very good, as in the Austerlitz dispositions. It was written, though not in German this time. The first column will march here and here, the second column will march there and there, and so on. And on paper, all these columns arrived at their places at the appointed time and destroyed the enemy. Everything had been admirably thought out, as is usual in dispositions, and, as is always the case, not a single column reached its place at the appointed time. When the necessary number of copies of the dispositions had been prepared, an officer was summoned and sent to deliver them to Ermolov to deal with. A young officer of the horse guards, Kutuzov's orderly, pleased at the importance of the mission entrusted to him, went to Ermolov's quarters. "'Gone away,' said Ermolov's orderly. The officer of the horse guards went to a general with whom Ermolov was often to be found. "'No, and the general's out, too.' The officer, mounting his horse, rode off to someone else. "'No, he's gone out.' "'If only they don't make me responsible for this delay! What a nuisance it is!' thought the officer, and he rode round the whole camp. One man said he had seen Ermolov ride past with some other generals. Others said he must have returned home. The officer searched till six o'clock in the evening without even stopping to eat. Ermolov was nowhere to be found, and no one knew where he was. The officer snatched a little food at a comrade's, and rode again to the vanguard to find Miloradovich. Miloradovich, too, was away but here he was told that he had gone to a ball at General Kikin's, and that Ermolov was probably there, too. "'But where is it?' "'Why, there, over at Eshkino,' said a Cossack officer, pointing to a country house in the far distance. "'What? Outside our line?' "'They've put two regiments as outposts, and they're having such a spree there it's awful. Two bands and three sets of singers.' The officer rode out beyond our lines to Eshkino. While still at a distance, he heard as he rode the merry sounds of a soldier's dance song proceeding from the house. In the meadows, in the meadows, he heard, accompanied by whistling and the sound of a torban, drowned every now and then by shouts. 
These sounds made his spirits rise, but at the same time he was afraid that he would be blamed for not having executed sooner the important order entrusted to him. It was already past eight o'clock. He dismounted and went up into the porch of a large country house, which had remained intact between the Russian and French forces. In the refreshment room and the hall, footmen were bustling about with wine and viands. Groups of singers stood outside the windows. The officer was admitted, and immediately saw all the chief generals of the army together, and among them Ermolov's big imposing figure. They all had their coats unbuttoned, and were standing in a semicircle with flushed and animated faces, laughing loudly. In the middle of the room a short, handsome general with a red face was dancing the trepak, with much spirit and agility. "'Ha, ha, ha! Bravo, Nicholas Ivanitch! Ha, ha, ha!' The officer felt that, by arriving with important orders at such a moment, he was doubly to blame, and he would have preferred to wait. But one of the generals espied him, and hearing what he had come about, informed Ermolov. Ermolov came forward with a frown on his face, and, hearing what the officer had to say, took the papers from him without a word. "'You think he went off just by chance?' said a comrade, who was on the staff that evening, to the officer of the horse guards, referring to Ermolov. It was a trick. It was done on purpose to get Konovnitsyn into trouble. You'll see what a mess there'll be tomorrow. End of chapter 4. This recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 5, read for LibriVox.org by Laurie Ann Walden. Next day the decrepit Kutuzov, having given orders to be called early, said his prayers, dressed, and, with an unpleasant consciousness of having to direct a battle he did not approve of, got into his kalesh and drove from Letashovka, a village three and a half miles from Tarotino, to the place where the attacking columns were to meet. He sat in the kalesh, dozing and waking up by turns, and listening for any sound of firing on the right as an indication that the action had begun. But all was still quiet. A damp, dull autumn morning was just dawning. On approaching Tarotino, Kutuzov noticed cavalrymen leading their horses to water across the road along which he was driving. Kutuzov looked at them searchingly, stopped his carriage, and inquired what regiment they belonged to. They belonged to a column that should have been far in front and in ambush long before then. It may be a mistake, thought the old commander-in-chief. But a little farther on he saw infantry regiments with their arms piled and the soldiers, only partly dressed, eating their rye porridge and carrying fuel. He sent for an officer. The officer reported that no order to advance had been received. How? Not re Kutuzov began, but checked himself immediately and sent for a senior officer. Getting out of his kalesh, he waited with drooping head and breathing heavily, pacing silently up and down. When Eichen, the officer of the general staff whom he had summoned, appeared, Kutuzov went purple in the face, not because that officer was to blame for the mistake, but because he was an object of sufficient importance for him to vent his wrath on. Trembling and panting, the old man fell into that state of fury in which he sometimes used to roll on the ground, and he fell upon Eichen, threatening him with his hands, shouting and loading him with gross abuse. Another man, Captain Brosen, who happened to turn up, and who was not at all to blame, suffered the same fate. "'What sort of another blackguard are you? I'll have you shot! Scoundrels!' yelled Kutuzov, in a hoarse voice, waving his arms and reeling. He was suffering physically. He, the commander-in-chief, a serene highness who, everybody said, possessed powers such as no man had ever had in Russia, to be placed in this position, made the laughingstock of the whole army. I needn't have been in such a hurry to pray about today, or have kept awake thinking everything over all night, thought he to himself. When I was a chit of an officer, no one would have dared to mock me so. And now... He was in a state of physical suffering, as if from corporal punishment, and could not avoid expressing it by cries of anger and distress. But his strength soon began to fail him, and looking about him, conscious of having said much that was amiss, 
He again got into his calèche and drove back in silence. His wrath, once expended, did not return, and blinking feebly he listened to excuses and self-justifications. Ermolov did not come to see him till the next day, and to the insistence of Benningsen, Konovnitsyn, and Toll that the movement that had miscarried should be executed next day. And once more Kutuzov had to consent. End of chapter 5 this recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 6, read for LibFox.org by Anna Simon. Next day, the troops assembled in their appointed places in the evening and advanced during the night. It was an autumn night with dark purple clouds but no rain. The ground was damp but not muddy, and the troops advanced noiselessly. Only occasionally a jingling of the artillery could be faintly heard. The men were forbidden to talk out loud, to smoke their pipes or to strike a light, and they tried to prevent their horses neighing. The secrecy of the undertaking heightened its charm, and they marched gaily. Some columns, supposing they had reached their destination, halted, piled arms, and settled down on the cold ground, but the majority marched all night, and arrived at places where they evidently should not have been. Only Count Orlov Denisov, with his Cossacks, the least important detachment of all, got to his appointed place at the right time. This detachment halted at the outskirts of a forest, on the path leading from the village of Stromilova to Dmitrovsk. Toward dawn, Count Orlov Denisov, who had dozed off, was awakened by a deserter from the French army being brought to him. This was a Polish sergeant of Poniatowski's corps, who explained in Polish that he had come over because he had been slighted in the service, that he ought long ago to have been made an officer, that he was braver than any of them, and so he had left them and wished to pay them out. He said that Murat was spending the night less than a mile from where they were, and that if they would let him have a convoy of a hundred men, he would capture him alive. Count Orlov Denisov consulted his fellow officers. The offer was too tempting to be refused. Every one volunteered to go, and everybody advised making the attempt. After much disputing and arguing, Major General Grekov, with two Cossack regiments, decided to go with the Polish sergeant. "'Now remember,' said Count Orlov Denisov to the sergeant at parting, "'if you have been lying, I'll have you hanged like a dog. But if it's true, you shall have a hundred gold pieces.' Without replying, the sergeant with a resolute air, mounted and rode away with Grekov, whose men had quickly assembled. They disappeared into the forest, and Count Olaf Denisov, having seen Grekov off, returned, shivering from the freshness of the early dawn, and excited by what he had undertaken on his own responsibility, and began looking at the enemy camp, now just visible in the deceptive light of dawn and the dying campfires. Our columns ought to have begun to appear on an open declivity to his right. He looked in that direction, but, though the columns would have been visible quite far off, they were not to be seen. It seemed to the Count that things were beginning to stir in the French camp, and his keen-sighted adjutant confirmed this. "'Oh, it is really too late,' said Count Orlov, looking at the camp. As often happens when someone we have trusted is no longer before our eyes, it suddenly seemed quite clear and obvious to him that the sergeant was an impostor, that he had lied and that the whole Russian attack would be ruined by the absence of those two regiments, which he would lead away heaven only knew where. How could one capture a commander-in-chief from among such a mass of troops? "'I am sure that rascal was lying,' said the Count. "'They can still be called back,' said one of his suite, who, like Count Orlov, felt distrustful of the adventure when he looked at the enemy's camp. "'Eh, really? What do you think? Should we let them go on or not?' "'Will you have them fetched back?' "'Fetch them back! Fetch them back!' said Count Orlov, with sudden determination, looking at his watch. "'It will be too late. It is quite light.' And the adjutant galloped through the forest after Grekov. When Grekov returned, Count Orlov Denisov, excited both by the abandoned attempt and by vainly awaiting the infantry columns that still did not appear, as well as by the proximity of the enemy, resolved to advance. All his men felt the same excitement. "'Mount!' he commanded in a whisper. The men took their places and crossed themselves. "'Forward, with God's aid!' 
Hurrah! reverberated in the forest, and the Cossack companies, trailing their lances and advancing one after another as if poured out of a sack, dashed gaily across the brook toward the camp. One desperate, frightened yell from the first French soldier who saw the Cossacks, and all who were in the camp, undressed and only just waking up, ran off in all directions, abandoning cannons, muskets, and horses. Had the Cossacks pursued the French without heeding what was behind and around them, they would have captured Murat and everything there. That was what the officers desired, but it was impossible to make the Cossacks budge when once they had got booty and prisoners. None of them listened to orders. Fifteen hundred prisoners and thirty-eight guns were taken on the spot, besides standards and, what seemed most important to the Cossacks, horses, saddles, horse-cloths, and the like. All this had to be dealt with, the prisoners and guns secured, the booty divided, not without some shouting and even a little themselves, and it was on this that the Cossacks all busied themselves. The French, not being farther pursued, began to recover themselves. They formed into detachments and began firing. Orlov Denisov, still waiting for the other columns to arrive, advanced no further. Meantime, according to the dispositions which said that the first column will march, and so on, the infantry of the belated columns, commanded by Benningsen and directed by Toll, had started in due order, and, as always happens, had got somewhere, but not to their appointed places. As always happens, the men, starting cheerfully, began to halt. Murmurs were heard, there was a sense of confusion, and finally a backward movement. Adjutants and generals galloped about, shouted, grew angry, quarrelled, said they had come quite wrong and were late, gave vent to a little abuse, and at last gave it all up and went forward, simply to get somewhere. We shall get somewhere or other. And they did indeed get somewhere, though not to their right places. A few eventually even got to their right place, but too late to be of any use, and only in time to be fired at. Toll, who in this battle played the part of Weirotter at Austerlitz, galloped assiduously from place to place, finding everything upside down everywhere. Thus he stumbled on Bagovut's corpse in a wood when it was already broad daylight, though the corpse should long before have joined Orlov Denisov. Excited and vexed by the failure, and supposing that someone must be responsible for it, Toll galloped up to the commander of the corpse and began upbraiding him severely, saying that he ought to be shot. General Bagovut, a fighting old soldier of placid temperament, being also upset by all the delay, confusion, and cross-purposes, fell into a rage to everybody's surprise, and quite contrary to his usual character, and said disagreeable things to Toll. "'I prefer not to take lessons from anyone, but I can die with my man as well as anybody,' he said, and advanced with a single division. Coming out onto a field under the enemy's fire, this brave general went straight ahead, leading his men under fire, without considering in his agitation whether going into action now, with a single division, would be of any use or no. Danger, cannonballs, and bullets were just what he needed in his angry mood. One of the first bullets killed him, and other bullets killed many of his men. And his division remained under fire for some time quite uselessly. End of chapter 6《War and Peace》Book Thirteen, Chapter Seven, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Meanwhile, another column was to have attacked the French from the front, but Kutuzov accompanied that column. He well knew that nothing but confusion would come of this battle undertaken against his will, and as far as was in his power, held the troops back. He did not advance. He rode silently on a small grey horse indolently answering suggestions that they should attack. The word attack is always on your tongue, but you don't see that we are unable to execute complicated manoeuvres, said he to Miloradovich, who asked permission to advance. We couldn't take Murat prisoner this morning, or get to the place in time, and nothing can be done now, he replied to someone else. When Kutuzov was informed that the French rear, where according to the reports of the Cossacks there had previously been nobody, there were now two battalions of Poles, he gave a sidelong glance at Ermolov, who was behind him, 
and to whom he had not spoken since the previous day. You see, they are asking to attack and making plans of all kinds, but as soon as one gets to the business, nothing is ready, and the enemy, forewarned, takes measures accordingly. Ermolov screwed up his eyes and smiled faintly on hearing these words. He understood that for him the storm had blown over, and that Kutuzov would content himself with that hint. "'He's having a little fun at my expense,' said Ermolov softly, nudging with his knee Raevsky, who was at his side. Soon after this, Ermolov moved up to Kutuzov and respectfully remarked, "'It is not too late yet, Your Highness. The enemy has not gone away. If you were to order an attack, if not, the guards will not so much as see a little smoke.' Kutuzov did not reply, but when they reported to him that Murat's troops were in retreat, he ordered an advance, though at every hundred paces he halted for three-quarters of an hour. The whole battle consisted in what Olaf Denisov's Cossacks had done. The rest of the army merely lost some hundreds of men, uselessly. In consequence of this battle, Kutuzov received a diamond decoration, and Benningsen some diamonds and a hundred thousand rubles. Others also received pleasant recognitions corresponding to their various grades, and following the battle fresh changes were made in the staff. "'That's how everything's done with us, all topsy-turvy said the Russian officers and generals after the Tautino battle, letting it be understood that some fool there is doing all things wrong, but that we ourselves should not have done so, just as people speak today. But people who talk like that either do not know what they are talking about, or deliberately deceive themselves. No battle, Tautino, Borodino, or Austerlitz, takes place as those who planned it anticipated. That is an essential condition." A countless number of free forces, for nowhere is man freer than during a battle, where it is a question of life and death, influence the course taken by the fight, and that course never can be known in advance, and never coincides with the direction of any one force. If many simultaneously and variously directed forces act on a given body, the direction of its motion cannot coincide with any one of those forces, but will always be a mean what in mechanics is represented by the diagonal of a parallelogram of forces. If in the descriptions given by historians, especially French ones, we find their wars and battles carried out in accordance with previously formed plans, the only conclusion to be drawn is that those descriptions are false. The Battle of Tarotino obviously did not attain the aim Toll had in view, to lead the troops into action in the order prescribed by the dispositions nor that which Count Olaf Denisov may have had in view, to take Murat prisoner, nor the result of immediately destroying the whole corps which Benningsen and others may have had in view, nor the aim of the officer who wished to go into action to distinguish himself, nor that of the Cossack who wanted more booty than he got, and so on. But if the aim of the battle was what actually resulted, and what all the Russians of that day desired, to drive the French out of Russia and destroy their army. It is quite clear that the Battle of Tarotino, just because of its incongruities, was exactly what was wanted at that stage of the campaign. It would be difficult and even impossible to imagine any result more opportune than the actual outcome of this battle. With a minimum of effort and insignificant losses, despite the greatest confusion, the most important results of the whole campaign were attained. The transition from retreat to advance, an exposure of the weakness of the French, and the administration of that shock which Napoleon's army had only awaited to begin its flight. End of chapter 7《War and Peace》Book Thirteen, Chapter Eight, read for LibriVox.org by Anna Simon. Napoleon enters Moscow after the brilliant victory at La Moscova. There can be no doubt about the victory, for the battlefield remains in the hands of the French. The Russians retreat and abandon their ancient capital. Moscow, abounding in provisions, arms, munitions, and incalculable wealth, is in Napoleon's hands. The Russian army only half the strength of the French, 
does not make a single attempt to attack for a whole month. Napoleon's position is most brilliant. He can either fall on the Russian army with double its strength and destroy it, negotiate an advantageous peace, or in case of a refusal make a menacing move on Petersburg, or even, in the case of a reverse, return to Smolensk or Vilna, or remain in Moscow. In short, no special genius would seem to be required to retain the brilliant position the French held at that time. For that, only very simple and easy steps were necessary, not to allow the troops to loot, to prepare winter clothing, of which there was sufficient in Moscow for the whole army, and methodically to collect the provisions, of which, according to the French historians, there were enough in Moscow to supply the whole army for six months. Yet Napoleon, that greatest of all geniuses, who the historians declare had control of the army, took none of these steps. He not merely did nothing of the kind, but, on the contrary, he used his power to select the most foolish and ruinous of all the courses open to him. Of all that Napoleon might have done, wintering in Moscow, advancing on Petersburg or on Nizhny Novgorod, or retiring by a more northerly or more southerly route, say by the road Kutuzov afterwards took, nothing more stupid or disastrous can be imagined than what he actually did. He remained in Moscow till October, letting the troops plunder the city. Then, hesitating whether to leave a garrison behind him, he quitted Moscow, approached Kutuzov without joining battle, turned to the right and reached Malo Yaroslavitz, again without attempting to break through and take the road Kutuzov took, but retiring instead to Mozhaisk, along the devastated Smolensk road. Nothing more stupid than that could have been devised, or more disastrous for the army, as the sequel showed. Had Napoleon's aim been to destroy his army, the most skilful strategist could hardly have devised any series of actions that would so completely have accomplished that purpose, independently of anything the Russian army might do. Napoleon, the man of genius, did this. But to say that he destroyed his army because he wished to, or because he was very stupid, would be as unjust as to say that he had brought his troops to Moscow because he wished to, and because he was very clever and a genius. In both cases, his personal activity, having no more force than the personal activity of any soldier, merely coincided with the laws that guided the event. The historians quite falsely represent Napoleon's faculties as having weakened in Moscow, and do so only because the results did not justify his actions. He employed all his ability and strength to do the best he could for himself and his army, as he had done previously, and as he did subsequently in 1813. His activity at that time was no less astounding than it was in Egypt, in Italy, in Austria, and in Prussia. We do not know for certain in how far his genius was genuine in Egypt, where forty centuries looked down upon his grandeur, for his great exploits there are all told us by Frenchmen. We cannot accurately estimate his genius in Austria or Prussia, for we have to draw our information from French or German sources, and the incomprehensible surrender of whole corps without fighting, and of fortresses without a siege, must incline Germans to recognize his genius as the only explanation of the war carried on in Germany. But we, thank God, have no need to recognize his genius in order to hide our shame. We have paid for the right to look at the matter plainly and simply, and we will not abandon that right. His activity in Moscow was as amazing and as full of genius as elsewhere. Order after order and plan after plan were issued by him, from the time he entered Moscow till the time he left it. The absence of citizens and of a deputation, and even the burning of Moscow, did not disconcert him. He did not lose sight either of the welfare of his army, or of the doings of the enemy, or of the welfare of the people of Russia, or of the direction of affairs in Paris, or of diplomatic considerations concerning the terms of the anticipated peace. End of chapter 8「War and Peace」Book 13 Chapter 9 Read for LibriVox.org by Tim Kyle With regard to military matters, 
Napoleon immediately on his entry into Moscow gave General Sabastiani strict orders to observe the movements of the Russian army, sent army corps out along the different roads, and charged Murat to find Kutuzov. Then he gave careful directions about the fortification of the Kremlin and drew up a brilliant plan for a future campaign over the whole map of Russia. With regard to diplomatic questions, Napoleon summoned Captain Yukolev, who had been robbed and was in rags and did not know how to get out of Moscow, minutely explained to him his whole policy and his magnanimity, and having written a letter to the Emperor Alexander in which he considered it his duty to inform his friend and brother that Rostopchin had managed affairs badly in Moscow, he dispatched Yukolev to Petersburg. Having similarly explained his views and his magnanimity to Tudelman, he dispatched that old man to Petersburg to negotiate. With regard to legal matters, immediately after the fires he gave orders to find and execute the incendiaries, and the scoundrel Rostopchin was punished by an order to burn down his houses. With regard to administrative matters, Moscow was granted a constitution. A municipality was established and the following announcement issued. Inhabitants of Moscow your misfortunes are cruel, but His Majesty the Emperor and King desires to arrest their course. Terrible examples have taught you how he punishes disobedience and crime. Strict measures have been taken to put an end to disorder and to re-establish public security. A paternal administration, chosen from among yourselves, will form your municipality or city government. It will take care of you, of your needs, and of your welfare. Its members will be distinguished by a red ribbon worn across the shoulder, and the mayor of the city will wear a white belt as well. But when not on duty, they will only wear a red ribbon around the left arm. The city police is established on its former footing, and better order already prevails in consequence of its activity. Activity. The government has appointed two commissaries general, or chiefs of police, and twenty commissaries or captains of wards have been appointed to the different wards of the city. You will recognize them by the white ribbon they wear on the left arm. Several churches of different denominations are open, and divine service is performed in them unhindered. Your fellow citizens are returning every day to their homes, and orders have been given that they should find in them the help and protection due to their misfortunes. These are the measures the government has adopted to re-establish order and relieve your condition. But to achieve this aim, it is necessary that you should add your efforts and should, if possible, forget the misfortunes you have suffered, should entertain the hope of a less cruel fate, should be certain that inevitable and ignominious death waits those who make any attempt on your persons or on what remains of your property, and finally that you should not doubt that these will be safeguarded, since such is the will of the greatest and most just of monarchs, soldiers and citizens, of whatever nation you may be, re-establish public confidence, the source of the welfare of a state. Soldiers and citizens, of whatever nation you may be, re-establish public confidence, the source of the welfare of a state. Live like brothers, render mutual aid and protection one to another, unite to defeat the intentions of the evil-minded, obey the military and civil authorities, and your tears will soon cease to flow. With regard to supplies for the army, Napoleon decreed that all the troops in turn should enter Moscow a la Marad as looters to obtain provisions for themselves, so that the army might have its future provided for. With regard to religion, Napoleon ordered the priests to be brought back and services to be again performed in the churches. With regard to commerce and to provisioning the army, following was placarded everywhere. Proclamation. You, peaceful inhabitants of Moscow, artisans and workmen whom misfortune has driven from the city, and you, scattered tillers of the soil, still kept out in the gardens by groundless fear, listen. Tranquility is returning to this capital, and order is being restored in it. Your fellow countrymen are emerging boldly from their hiding places on finding that they are respected. Any violence to them or to their property is promptly punished. His Majesty the Emperor and King protects them and considers no one among you his enemy except those who disobey his orders. He desires to end your misfortunes and restore you to your homes and families. Respond, therefore, to his benevolent intentions, and come to us without fear. Inhabitants, return with confidence to your abodes. You will soon find means of satisfying your needs. Craftsmen and industrious artisans, return to your work, your houses, your shops, where the protection of guards awaits you. You shall receive proper pay for your work. And lastly, you too, peasants, come from the forest where you are hiding in terror, return to your huts without fear, in full assurance that you will find protection. Markets are established in the city, where peasants can bring their surplus supplies and the products of the soil. The government has taken the following steps to ensure freedom of sale for them. 1. From today, peasants, husbandmen, 
and those living in the neighborhood of Moscow may without any danger bring their supplies of all kinds to two appointed markets, of which one is on the Mukhovna Street and the other is at the Provision Market. 2. Such supplies will be bought from them at such prices as seller and buyer may agree on, and if a seller is unable to obtain a fair price, he will be free to take his goods back to his village and no one may hinder him under any pretense. 3. Sunday and Wednesday of each week are appointed as the chief market days, and to that end a sufficient number of troops will be stationed along the high roads on Tuesdays and Saturdays at such distances from the town as to protect the carts. 4. Similar measures will be taken that peasants with their carts and horses may meet with no hindrance on their return journey. 5. Steps will immediately be taken to re-establish ordinary trading. Inhabitants of the city and villages, and you, working men and artisans, to whatever nation you belong, you are called on to carry out the paternal intentions of His Majesty the Emperor and King, and to cooperate with him for the public welfare. Lay your respect and confidence at his feet, and do not delay to unite with us. With the object of raising the spirits of the troops and of the people, reviews were constantly held and rewards distributed. The Emperor rode through the streets to comfort the inhabitants and, despite his preoccupation with state affairs, himself visited the theaters that were established by his order. In regard to philanthropy, the greatest virtue of crowned heads, Napoleon also did all in his power. He caused the words Maison de ma mire to be inscribed on the charitable institutions, thereby combining tender filial affection with the majestic benevolence of a monarch. He visited the foundling hospital and, allowing the orphan saved by him to kiss his white hands, graciously conversed with Tutelemen. Then, as Thiers eloquently recounts, he orders his soldiers to be paid in forged Russian money which he had prepared. Raising the use of these means by an act worthy of himself and of the French army, he let relief be distributed to those who had been burned out. But as food was too precious to be given to foreigners, who were for the most part enemies, Napoleon preferred to supply them with money with which to purchase food from outside and had paper rubles distributed to them. With reference to army discipline, orders were continually being issued to inflict severe punishment for the non-performance of military duties and to suppress robbery. End of chapter 9. Recording by Tim. Cabbage Hill, Oregon. www.timgineer.com T-I-M-G-I-N-E-E-R.com this recording is in the public domain. War and Peace, Book 13, Chapter 10 Read for LibriVox.org by Joe Maywalt Chapter 10 But strange to say, all these measures, efforts, and plans, which were not at all worse than others issued in similar circumstances, did not affect the essence of the matter, but, like the hands of a clock detached from the mechanism, swung about in an arbitrary and aimless way without engaging the cogwheels. With reference to the military side, the plan of campaign, that work of genius of which Tyr remarks that his genius never devised anything more profound, more skillful, or more admirable, and enters into a polemic with M. Fain to prove that this work of genius must be referred not to the 4th, but to the 15th of October. That plan never was or could be executed, for it was quite out of touch with the facts of the case. The fortifying of the Kremlin, for which Lomuski, as Napoleon termed the Church of Basil the Beatified, was to have been raised to the ground, proved quite useless. The mining of the Kremlin only helped toward fulfilling Napoleon's wish that it should be blown up when he left Moscow as a child wants a floor on which he has hurt himself to be beaten. The pursuit of the Russian army, about which Napoleon was so concerned, produced an unheard of result. The French generals lost touch with the Russian army of 60,000 men, and according to Tyr, it was only eventually found, like a lost pin, by the skill and apparently the genius of Marat. With reference to diplomacy, all Napoleon's arguments as to his magnanimity and justice both to Tutelman and to Yakovlev, whose chief concern was to obtain a greatcoat and a conveyance, proved useless. Alexander did not receive these envoys and did not reply to their embassage. With regard to legal matters, after the execution of the supposed incendiaries, the rest of Moscow burned down. With regard to administrative matters, 
the establishment of a municipality did not stop the robberies and was only of use to certain people who formed part of that municipality and under pretext of preserving order looted moscow or saved their own property from being looted with regard to religion as to which in egypt matters had so easily been settled by napoleon's visit to a mosque no results were achieved two or three priests who were found in moscow did try to carry out napoleon's wish but one of them was slapped in the face by a french soldier while conducting service and a french official reported of another that the priest whom i found and invited to say mass cleaned and locked up the church that night the doors were again broken open the padlock smashed the books mutilated and other disorders perpetrated with reference to commerce the proclamation to industrious workmen and to peasants evoked no response there were no industrious workmen and the peasants caught the commissaries who ventured too far out of town with the proclamation and killed them as to the theaters for the entertainment of the people and the troops these did not meet with success either the theaters set up in the kremlin and in poznikov's house were closed again at once because the actors and actresses were robbed even philanthropy did not have the desired effect the genuine as well as the false paper money which flooded moscow lost its value the french collecting booty cared only for gold not only was the paper money valueless which napoleon so graciously distributed to the unfortunate but even silver lost its value in relation to gold but the most amazing example of the ineffectiveness of the orders given by the authorities at that time was napoleon's attempt to stop the looting and re-establish discipline this is what the army authorities were reporting looting continues in the city despite the decrees against it order is not yet restored and not a single merchant is carrying on trade in a lawful manner the sutlers alone venture to trade and they sell stolen goods the neighborhood of my ward continues to be pillaged by soldiers of the third corps who not satisfied with taking from the unfortunate inhabitants hiding in the cellars the little they have left even have the ferocity to wound them with their sabers as i have repeatedly witnessed nothing new except that the soldiers are robbing and pillaging october nine robbery and pillaging continue there is a band of thieves in our district who ought to be arrested by a strong force october eleven the emperor is extremely displeased that despite the strict orders to stop pillage parties of marauding guards are continually seen returning to the kremlin among the old guard disorder and pillage were renewed more violently than ever yesterday evening last night and today the emperor sees with regret that the picked soldiers appointed to guard his person who should set an example of discipline carry disobedience to such a point that they break into the cellars and stores containing army supplies others have disgraced themselves to the extent of disobeying sentinels and officers and have abused and beaten them the grand marshal of the palace wrote the governor complains bitterly that in spite of repeated orders the soldiers continue to commit nuisances in all the courtyards and even under the very windows of the emperor that army like a herd of cattle run wild and trampling underfoot the provender which might have saved it from starvation disintegrated and perished with each additional day it remained in moscow but it did not go away it began to run away only when suddenly seized by a panic caused by the capture of transport trains on the smolensk road and by the battle of tarotino the news of that battle of tarotino unexpectedly received by napoleon at a review evoked in him a desire to punish the russians tyr says and he issued the order for departure which the whole army was demanding fleeing from moscow the soldiers took with them everything they had stolen napoleon too carried away his own personal trezor but on seeing the baggage trains that impeded the army he was tyr says horror struck and yet with his experience of war he did not order all the superfluous vehicles to be burned as he had done with those of a certain marshal when approaching moscow 
he gazed at the calashes and carriages in which soldiers were riding and remarked that it was a very good thing as those vehicles could be used to carry provisions the sick and the wounded the plight of the whole army resembled that of a wounded animal which feels it is perishing and does not know what it is doing to study the skillful tactics and aims of napoleon and his army from the time it entered moscow till it was destroyed is like studying the dying leaps and shudders of a mortally wounded animal very often a wounded animal hearing a rustle rushes straight at the hunter's gun runs forward and back again and hastens its own end napoleon under pressure from his whole army did the same thing the rustle of the battle of tarotino frightened the beast and it rushed forward onto the hunter's gun reached him turned back and finally like any wild beast ran back along the most disadvantageous and dangerous path where the old scent was familiar during the whole of that period napoleon who seems to us to have been the leader of all these movements as the figurehead of a ship may seem to a savage to guide the vessel acted like a child who holding a couple of strings inside a carriage thinks he is driving it end of chapter ten recording by joe maywalt in the bronx new york ministry dash of dash fun dot com this is a recording in the public domain war and peace book thirteen section eleven read for librivox dot org by Miriam Esther Goldman. Early in the morning of the 6th of October, Pierre went out of the shed and on returning stopped by the door to play with a little blue-gray dog with a long body and short bandy legs that jumped about him. This little dog lived in their shed, sleeping beside Karatayev at night. It sometimes made excursions into the town but always returned again. Probably it had never had an owner and it still belonged to nobody and had no name. The French called it Azor. The soldier who told stories called it Femgalka. Karatayev and others called it Grey, or sometimes Flabby. Its lack of a master, a name, or even a breed, or any definite color, did not seem to trouble the blue-gray dog in the least. Its furry tail stood up firm and round as a plume. Its bandy legs served it so well that it would often gracefully lift a hind leg and run very easily and quickly on three legs, as if disdaining to use all four. Everything pleased it. Now it would roll on its back, yelping with delight, now bask in the sun with a thoughtful air of importance, and now frolic about playing with a chip of wood or a straw. Pierre's attire by now consisted of a dirty, torn shirt, the only remnant of his former clothing a pair of soldiers' trousers, which by Karatayev's advice he had tied with string round the ankles for warmth, and a peasant coat and cap. Physically he had changed much during this time. He no longer seemed stout, though he still had the appearance of solidity and strength hereditary in his family. A beard and moustache covered the lower part of his face, and a tangle of hair infested with lice curled round his head like a cap. The look of his eyes was resolute, calm and animatedly alert as never before the former slackness which had shown itself even in his eyes was now replaced by an energetic readiness for action and resistance his feet were bare pierre first looked down the fields across which vehicles and horsemen were passing that morning then into the distance across the river then at the dog who was pretending to be in earnest about biting him and then at his bare feet which he placed with pleasure in various positions moving his dirty, thick, big toes. Every time he looked at his bare feet, a smile of animated self-satisfaction flitted across his face. The sight of them reminded him of all he had experienced and learned during these weeks, and this recollection was pleasant to him. For some days the weather had been calm and clear, with slight frosts in the morning, what is called an old wives' summer. In the sunshine, the air was warm, and that warmth was particularly pleasant with the invigorating freshness of the morning frost still in the air. On everything far and near, 
lay the magic crystal glitter seen only at that time of autumn. The Sparrow Hills were visible in the distance with the village, the church, and the large white house. The bare trees, the sand, the bricks and roofs of the houses, the green church spire, and the corner of the white house in the distance all stood out in the transparent air in most delicate outline and with unnatural clearness. Nearby could be seen the familiar ruins of a half-burned mansion occupied by the French, with lilac bushes still showing dark green beside the fence. And even that ruined and befouled house, which in dull weather was repulsively ugly, seemed quietly beautiful now in the clear, motionless brilliance. A French corporal, with coat unbuttoned in a homely way, a skullcap on his head, and a short pipe in his mouth, came from behind a corner of the shed and approached Pierre with a friendly wink. "'What sunshine, Monsieur Quirot?' their name for Peter. "'Eh, just like spring.' And the corporal leaned against the door and offered Pierre his pipe, though whenever he offered it, Pierre always declined it. "'To be on the march in such weather,' he began. Pierre inquired what was being said about leaving, and the corporal told him that nearly all the troops were starting, and there ought to be an order about the prisoners that day. Sokolov, one of the soldiers in the shed with Pierre, was dying, and Pierre told the corporal that something should be done about him. The corporal replied that Pierre need not worry about that, as they had an ambulance and a permanent hospital, and arrangements would be made for the sick, and that in general everything that could happen had been foreseen by the authorities. Besides, Monsieur Quirot, you have only to say a word to the captain, you know. He is a man who never forgets anything. Speak to the captain when he makes his round. He will do anything for you. The captain, of whom the corporal spoke, often had long chats with Pierre and showed him all sorts of favors. You see, St. Thomas, he said to me the other day, Monsieur Kirill is a man of education who speaks French. He is a Russian seigneur who has had misfortunes, but he is a man. He knows what's what. If he wants anything and asks me, he won't get a refusal. When one has studied, you see, one likes education and well-bred people. It is for your sake I mention it, Monsieur Kirill. The other day, if it had not been for you, that affair would have ended ill. And after chatting a while longer, the corporal went away. The affair he had alluded to had happened a few days before, a fight between the prisoners and the French soldiers, in which Pierre had succeeded in pacifying his comrades. Some of the prisoners who had heard Pierre talking to the corporal immediately asked what the Frenchman had said. While Pierre was repeating what he had been told about the army leaving Moscow, a thin, sallow, tattered French soldier came up to the door of the shed. Rapidly and timidly raising his fingers to his forehead by way of greeting, he asked Pierre whether the soldier Platoche, to whom he had given a shirt to sew, was in that shed. A week before, the French had had boot leather and linen issued to them, which they had given out to the prisoners to make up into boots and shirts for them. "'Ready, ready, dear fellow,' said Karatayev, coming out with a neatly folded shirt. Karatayev, on account of the warm weather and for convenience at work, was wearing only trousers and a tattered shirt as black as soot. His hair was bound round, workman fashion, with a wisp of lime-tree bast, and his round face seemed rounder and pleasanter than ever. "'A promise, his own brother to performance.' I said Friday, and here it is, ready, said Platon, smiling and unfolding the shirt he had sewn. The Frenchman glanced around uneasily, and then, as if overcoming his hesitation, rapidly threw off his uniform and put on the shirt. He had a long, greasy, flowered silk waistcoat next to his sallow, thin, bare body, but no shirt. He was evidently afraid the prisoners looking on would laugh at him, and thrust his head into the shirt hurriedly. None of the prisoners said a word. "'See, it fits well,' Platon kept repeating, pulling the shirt straight. The Frenchman, having pushed his head and hands through without raising his eyes, looked down at the shirt and examined the seams. "'You see, dear man, this is not a sewing shop. 
and I had no proper tools, and, as they say, one needs a tool even to kill a louse, said Platon with one of his round smiles, obviously pleased with his work. It's good, quite good, thank you, said the Frenchman, in French, but there must be some linen left over. It will fit better still when it sets to your body, said Karateev, still admiring his handiwork. You'll be nice and comfortable. Thanks, thanks, old fellow, but the bits left over, said the Frenchman again and smiled. He took out an assignation ruble note and gave it to Karateev, but give me the pieces that are over. Pierre saw that Platon did not want to understand what the Frenchman was saying, and he looked on without interfering. Karateyev thanked the Frenchman for the money and went on admiring his own work. The Frenchman insisted on having the pieces returned that were left over and asked Pierre to translate what he said. "'What does he want the bits for?' said Karateyev. "'They'd make fine leg bands for us. "'Well, never mind.' And Karateyev, with a suddenly changed and saddened expression, took a small bundle of scraps from inside his shirt and gave it to the Frenchman without looking at him. "'Oh, dear,' muttered Karateyev, and went away. The Frenchman looked at the linen, considered for a moment, then looked inquiringly at Pierre, and, as if Pierre's look had told him something, suddenly blushed and shouted in a squeaky voice. "'Platouche! Hey, Platouche, keep them yourself!' And handing back the odd bits, he turned and went out. There, look at that, said Karateyev, swaying his head. People said they were not Christians, but they too have souls. It's what the old folk used to say. A sweating hand's an open hand, a dry hand's close. He's naked, but yet he's given it back. Karateyev smiled thoughtfully and was silent a while looking at the pieces. "'But they'll make grand leg bands, dear friend,' he said, and went back into the shed. End of section 11. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman.